Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Pike County Carnage. The crime committed against eight Roden family members became one of Ohio's most notorious and complex cases. Overnight, the motto all for one, one for all proved fatal for each family member. Only minor children were spared from the widespread violence. The investigation spanned 10 states in the United States and detectives conducted over 600 interviews resulting in approximately 700 witness statements. Several theories were proposed, including self-harm retaliation by illegal drug dealers and cult sacrifices. Attorney General Mike DeWine suspected local residents of withholding critical information. The investigation appeared to have reached a dead end until a solution appeared on the surface. As it turns out, the most complex situations are frequently rooted in simplicity. This story shows how familial bonds turned into a bloodbath. In Pike County, Ohio, USA, it all started with a crush. Hannah Mae Roden was 13 when she met Edward Jake Wagner, who was 18 years old. The young man asked her to the prom. They became inseparable after that evening, and their relationship elicited mixed feelings. Unquestionably, the love that grew between them was visible to the naked eye. On the other hand, the age gap raised numerous questions and concerns. However, the young couple's parents did not interfere with their relationship. After all, everybody was young once. Over time, the Roden and Wagner families began spending weekends and parties together. Love was passionate and carefree. Hannah announced her pregnancy at the age of 15. Jake was overjoyed when he heard the news. He anticipated how excited his family would be about the new addition. Wagner highly valued traditions and lineage, which is why he adored his children, who represented the continuation of their lineage. Even ancestral names were passed down through generations. Jake's father was named George Wagner III, and his brother George Wagner for the Rodens had a more straightforward, less ostentatious approach to children. However, this did not diminish their family values. Hannah's parents, Christopher and Dana Roden, remained close and united after their divorce. They adored their three children and worked tirelessly to ensure their well-being. Unlike Wagner, the Rodens had a modest income. Christopher, 40, worked as a handyman at the Big Bear Lake family complex. Dana was 37 years old and worked as a nurse's aide at a youth rehabilitation center. Nonetheless, they instilled humanity and diligence in Christopher J.R. Hannah and Clarence Frankie were overjoyed with the arrival of little Sophie. To commemorate her birthday, a large party was planned. Soon after, Jake suggested that Hannah move in with him and his family claiming that it would make their lives more comfortable. Living in a trailer makes it difficult to argue this point. His logic appeared sound, but Hannah declined. By then, she had a better understanding of her partner and saw the invitation as an attempt to limit her independence. Furthermore, the caring and attentive young man had developed suspicion and aggression. Jake had used physical aggression on several occasions, and his rough behavior soured Hannah's feelings for him. Her refusal became a source of contention for Wagner. Now, both Sophie's parents were determined to gain full custody of the girl. The families started advocating for their own interests. Driven by his desire, Jake threatened his beloved after she refused to sign a document transferring custody rights to him and his brother. In a fit of rage, he intended to message her, stating that if necessary, he would take the daughter by force. If you truly loved her, you would not be able to resist. He claimed that you would have given her up long ago to be raised in a safe environment. For some reason, he thought the rodents were a danger to Sophie. Such conversations continued for two years, during which Jake became increasingly tyrannical. Hannah grew tired of being in complete control and ended the relationship in March 2015. Furthermore, she had learned something alarming Jake's brother, George IV, had taken custody of a son by threatening the boy's mother with a weapon. This confirmed that the Wagners saw moral and physical coercion as acceptable ways to protect themselves and their daughter from this unscrupulous family, and the young Roden decided to distance herself. She intended to raise her daughter alone while working as a nurse's assistant and finishing school. The situation deteriorated when everyone learned of Hannah's second pregnancy. Jake questioned her claim that the child was from another man. He attempted to find out if she was seeing anyone else. So in December 2015, he hacked her social media accounts but discovered nothing incriminating. At the end of his search, he discovered that the woman was communicating with Georgia about her former mother-in-law, 
which piqued his interest. A court case was soon to follow, during which the Wagners had numerous interactions with the woman. They'll have to kill me before they can take custody of my daughter, Hannah stated in her message. Jake infuriated his family when he revealed the details of the correspondence. Then his maternal grandmother, Rita Newcomb, 65, forged an important custody document. Furthermore, during a court hearing to determine the granddaughter's residence, Christopher Roden and George Wagner, the third, had a heated argument. The family's relationship eventually deteriorated completely. The Wagner family soon came up with a terrible idea. Hannah was so uncooperative that they felt compelled to eliminate her, as well as the entire Roden family, who could potentially claim custody of Sophie. This insane thought evolved into a monstrous plan that was finalized by Christmas 2016. People's thoughts during the holiday season are typically focused on love and creation, which is not true for the Wagner couple who organized the vote. It was decided whether they would carry out their plan, and all family members agreed. The only thing left to do was assign roles and prepare. Five months were spent investigating the Roten homes and surveillance cameras. They pay special attention to their daily routines and work schedules. Everyone involved in the criminal plot was accountable for something. For example, Angela Wagner purchased sneakers for all family members to wear at a specific time. To keep victims from seeking help, she purchased a special communication blocking device and intended to secretly install it on the Roden TS phones to minimize noise. George III suggested creating homemade silencers. He also handled the transportation on the night of the crime, attempting to secure a van that would not attract attention. Sophie was to remain safe at home with Angela because the court had granted Hannah and Jake joint custody. The Wagners chose a time when it was their turn to care for the girl, meticulously planning every detail to ensure a perfect execution. On the night of April 21, 2016, George Wagner, I, I, I decided to pay Christopher Roden a visit, allegedly to offer him a job opportunity that would improve his financial situation. The job offer was simply a ruse to gain unwitting access to the house. Roden Sr. opened the door in the morning of April 22, 2016. At approximately 8 p.m., Bobby Joe Manley's sister, Dana Roden, entered Christopher's trailer. She has done this every day since he offered her a job. Bobby cared for the Roden family's animals. She noticed someone inside, which was unusual for the time when everyone was going about their business. Christopher and his cousin Gary, 38, lay in a pool of blood inside the trailer. The men lived together in horror. She picked up the phone and called emergency services, reporting what she had seen and requesting assistance at 4077 Union Hill Road. Barbie, shocked, went to the homes of her other relatives. She gave a loud knock on one of their doors. Soon, a three-year-old boy named Clarence Roden appeared. She asked where his parents were, but he did not respond, instead pointing to the bed. Entering the house, she screamed at the sight of Clarence 20 and his wife Hannah Hazel. The couple had died, and their six-month-old baby was alive but splattered with his parents' blood. Following Bobby's 911 call, the police went straight to the given address. As they approached the road and property, a neighbor stopped them. Sensing trouble, he requested that the officers check additional addresses of the family members. He was correct. In the third trailer, police discovered bloody bodies. The victims were identified as Dana. Hannah is 19 years old and Christopher is 16. The attackers spared Hannah's youngest child, a baby girl who was only a few days old. Another victim was discovered later Kenneth, the elder Roden's brother, aged 44, who lived a 15-minute walk away from the others. By 2 p.m., eight victims had been identified. Christopher Dana, Clarence, Hannah Hazel, Christopher Jr., Hannah May, Kenneth, and Gary. The only survivors were small children, a three-year-old, a six-month-old baby, and a newborn only four days old, as well as two-year-old Sophie, who was at the Wagner's home at the time of the incident. After examining the bodies, police concluded that all of the victims had died in their sleep from gunshot wounds. Detectives eventually pieced together the events of that night. The patriarch of the family was awake when the attackers broke into the house, as evidenced by a wound on his right arm. Christopher attempted to defend himself but received nine shots to the head, torso, and limbs. Dana Roden had five bullets removed from her neck and head. The remaining members of the family were killed by gunshot wounds to the head. Gary was shot five times. Christopher Jr. was shot four times. 
Clarence and his wife Hannah were shot three times, each Hannah May was shot twice and Kenneth was shot once. The assailants fired 32 shots in total, including some posthumously. In addition, bruises were discovered on some of the bodies, indicating physical abuse. Because no one in the vicinity heard anything, investigators concluded that the perpetrators used silencers, indicating a well-planned and executed act. The victims were clearly not at random. Someone sought vengeance on the entire family. During the search, police discovered five different types of Remington shell casings, as well as an unused bullet from another gun model. Furthermore, the scattered nature of the trailer suggested that more than one person committed the crime. Leonard Manley Dana's father claimed the criminals were aware of the rodents well, or the dogs would have been barking all over the pike. The question of who would dare to commit such an act kept police officers busy. The Attorney General's office contributed more than $20,000 to the road and family's funeral. The deceased were interred in multiple stages. Gary was the first victim buried on April 28, 2016, in South Shore, Kentucky. Hannah Hazel followed him and her farewell was held on May 1st in the village of Otway, Scioto County, Ohio. The other victims were buried on May 3rd in West Portsmouth, the same county. Many locals came to bid the family farewell and pay their respects. The surviving children were placed in the custody of relatives. A wave of panic swept through the neighborhood. The police urged the rodents' relatives to exercise caution and advised all Pike residents to stay away from their homes at night. The cold-blooded mass murderer enraged residents across the state, who demanded that the investigation's findings be made public and the perpetrators apprehended as soon as possible. Jeff Ruby, a Cincinnati businessman, offered $25,000 for information that could help arrest and convict those responsible for the murder, but he later declined the offer. The investigative task force working on the Roden case included over 100 people. Following the funerals, as part of the investigation, Three trailers belonging to the deceased family were towed away. The next day, several more vehicles met the same fate and were transported to a secure facility. This was done to protect the deceased's personal belongings while also preserving evidence. Following the investigation, the family's cars and farm equipment were scheduled to be returned to the victim's relatives. Forensic experts joined the investigation. Trailers were meticulously inspected. However, no DNA from the suspects was discovered in any of them. Cameras were installed in the mobile homes, but they too provided no information because they had been disabled. The perpetrators meticulously planned every detail of the crime. It appeared that there were no significant leads until detectives discovered one. Three crime scenes in one location yielded approximately 200 cannabis plants. Officers suspected the cannabis was grown for sale rather than personal use prompting speculation about the involvement of Mexican drug traffickers. However, the amount of cannabis discovered was insufficient to support an attack by an entire cartel. In January 2017, a close relative of the road and family was arrested for drug trafficking, which was deemed an unrelated incident. Leonard Manley claimed that his daughter had no involvement in the cannabis operations. They're trying to drag Dana through the mud, which I don't like, he asserted. Some family members confirmed that Christopher and Kenneth Roden, the older brothers, grew marijuana, but they were unaware of any large-scale production. The theory of a family feud over illegally obtained funds was also refuted. Along with the prohibited substances, specialized equipment for breeding chickens for cockfighting and cages with fighting cocks were discovered at the Roden T. It quickly became clear that illegal cockfighting was not the cause of the homicides. Months passed without uncovering the true motive for the crime. On April 13, 2017, local authorities announced that there was insufficient evidence to make any arrests. Nonetheless, Prosecutor Rob Young stated that the investigation was ongoing, implying that they had some leads they were not yet ready to share. Another year passed, and the second anniversary of the mass murder received little attention, with no coverage in the local press and no sheriff or prosecutor attending the memorial service. The community concluded that the investigation had unexpectedly stalled, on May 12, 2017, a SWAT team raided a home in Pike County, about 10 miles from the crime scene, initially looking for suspects but later revealing that they were gathering evidence. Detectives also searched a house in Adams County that Jake Wagner once owned, but it sold by June 20, 2017. The investigation shifted the spotlight to the Wagner family 26-year-old Jake, 27-year-old Georgia, 
the third, 47-year-old Georgia, the fourth, and 48-year-old Angela, who lived 15 miles away from the victims. The Wagners relocated to Kenai, Alaska, citing difficulties in settling in the area. They claimed to have loved the road and their family, and that their deaths caused them great grief. Rob Young's words from a year ago proved correct, as the investigation had made a breakthrough and was now looking for information from the public on the Wagner's discussions about firearms, ammunition, vehicles, and so on, two years earlier. It wasn't long before the suspects, desperate for money, returned to Ohio, where detectives had gathered enough evidence to make arrests, including proof Jake had hacked Hannah's account. During the examination of the Wagner family's devices, search queries for guardianship were discovered. It was also discovered that Angela had bought sneakers for the entire family just a few weeks before the crime. The tread pattern on one of these matched that of one of the trailers. The officers believed Angela was the mastermind of the horrific scheme, with Jake serving as the primary executor. According to the investigation, all family members were involved in the criminal act. On November 13, 2018, the Attorney General announced the arrest of the Wagner couple and their sons. They were charged with planning and carrying out life-ending procedures. Angela's mother, Rita Newcomb, is 65 years old, as is Frederick Wagner. George III's mother was also arrested. They were charged with perjury and obstructing justice. Rita Newcomb underwent handwriting analysis in 2019, proving her involvement in the forgery of Sophie's guardianship document. Later, to avoid imprisonment, she agreed to a plea deal. The charges against Federica Wagner were dropped in June 2019. The other Wagner has remained incarcerated after refusing to cooperate with the investigation. They denied any involvement in the rodents' deaths and expressed sorrow for their loss, hoping that the true perpetrators would be apprehended. However, on April 22, 2021, five years after the tragic incident, Jake decided to reach an agreement with the prosecution. The agreement stated that he would reveal details of the crime in exchange for all family members receiving life sentences rather than the death penalty. Wagner Jr admitted to killing five out of eight people. He pleaded guilty to 23 criminal charges, including eight counts of aggravated crime. The remaining charges were burglary, conspiracy, illegal possession of dangerous ammunition, and forgery of evidence and documents, interception of telegrams and oral communications, unauthorized use of property, obstructing justice, participating in corrupt activities, and engaging in unlawful intimate relations with a young woman. He stated that eliminating the mother was the only way to ensure custody of his daughter. By killing Hannah, he felt compelled to do the same to the other rodents, fearing they would seek vengeance and refuse to give up the girl. Angela was the next person to stand trial. On September 10th, she pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit aggravated felony, robbery, and evidence tampering. She also agreed to testify against the remaining defendants. In exchange, the charge of killing a person was dropped. Angela was sentenced to 30 years in prison. The trial of George Wagner started on August 28, 2022. The man denied any involvement in the crimes and claimed he was completely unaware. In contrast, the prosecution argued that he was involved in the planning, execution, and concealment of the crimes. Georgia IV was ultimately found guilty of 22 counts and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The trial of George III is scheduled for February 2024. Despite the fact that his entire family has been convicted, he maintains his innocence and will most likely face the same fate as his older son. This person's harmonious relationship ended in tragedy Wagner's collective madness is beyond comprehension and forgiveness. Their actions rendered three children orphaned. What happens to Sophie when she grows up and realizes what happened during their struggle for custody and a false sense of security? Wagner deprived the young girl of loving parents, relatives, and a peaceful existence. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this video, we will talk about what happened in Windsor, Canada in 2018. Autumn Taggart, 31, lived on the third floor of this building with her son, Gavin. On June 10, the boy awoke and went into his mother's room. Her room was completely disorganized. He tried to wake up his mother, but Autumn lay motionless. 
the Autumn Taggart case received widespread attention and Canadian police enlisted the assistance of their American counterparts to locate and apprehend the suspect. Autumn Taggart was a single mom in 2018. Her son Gavin was nine years old and they lived in Windsor, about a mile from the border between Michigan and the United States and Ontario, Canada. On Saturday, June 9, 2018, Autumn and Gavin spent the afternoon with the child's father, Chris Sherwin. Autumn maintained friendly relations with him after their breakup. They both did their best to ensure that the breakup did not have a significant negative impact on Gavin. At the end of the day, the three of them went grocery shopping before Chris drove Autumn and Gavin to their third floor apartment. After that, Chris returned home. Before going to bed, Gavin played video games with his mother, unaware that the following night would be an unimaginable nightmare for him. Gavin awoke to a noise while it was still dark outside. He was startled and opened his eyes to see an unknown man standing next to his bed. Before leaving Gavin's room, the stranger instructed him to close his eyes and sleep. His mother's room was behind a wall. It's on the right in this image. After about a minute, Gavin heard her scream. The boy had never felt such fear before. A few minutes later, silence hung in the air. His mother stopped screaming, and he quickly fell asleep. When Gavin awoke, it was already morning, and he was getting out of bed. He first went to his mother's room. Everything there was shattered and destroyed. Autumn was lying on the bed. Gavin, nine, initially believed his mother was sleeping. But when he saw the blood on her nose, he knew she was dead. It shocked him. The boy was unwilling to believe it was true. He spent the first half of the day playing on the console and watching YouTube videos, attempting to distract himself from the fact that his deceased mother was lying in the next room. In the afternoon, he couldn't take the pressure anymore. He began crying and decided to tell someone about it. After entering his mother's room, he took her phone and used Messenger to contact his father. He texted him that Autumn hadn't woken up. Chris and his girlfriend drove immediately to Autumn and Gavin's house. After parking and exiting his car, Chris noticed his son standing behind a sliding glass door on the third floor. Chris did not have an electronic key to enter the building, so Gavin went downstairs and let him in. He asked his son to stay with his girlfriend while he investigated why Autumn hadn't woken up, then entered the apartment and the bedroom. Chris noticed that Autumn was very pale. She's noticed that Autumn was very pale. She had bruises on her face and body, and her nose was bleeding. The man immediately dialed 911. The police and an ambulance arrived at the address he provided, but the paramedics were forced to declare Autumn dead due to the injuries on her body and the signs of a struggle in the bedroom. It was clear that it was not an accident. Investigators began searching for possible evidence in the apartment. Meanwhile, a child interrogation specialist speaks with Gavin and learns about the overnight guests who told him to sleep. The boy claimed he heard his mother's screams, but they quickly stopped. He described the man he had seen in his room at night. The boy thought the man was white, about average height, and had messy hair. He looked like he'd just gotten out of bed, the boy testified. I believe he was thin, but not too thin. I believe he was skinny. The forensic experts who conducted the autopsy determined that Autumn died as a result of strangulation. Someone beat her up before she died. Furthermore, there were injuries in her genital area and male DNA samples found on her body. Among other things, the police had to answer the following questions. How did the perpetrator enter the apartment? What was his motivation? And, most importantly, who was the man who entered the building? People required an electronic key. The police immediately ruled out the possibility that the killer was one of the building's tenants because Gavin knew all of his neighbors and the man he saw on the night of the crime was not one of them. In addition to obtaining an electron key to enter the building, the perpetrator had to enter the victim's apartment. However, there were no signs of forced entry on the door leading to Autumn's apartment. This could indicate that she let the perpetrator in herself or that she failed to lock the door. Eventually, the police will discard both of these assumptions after discovering evidence that the perpetrator climbed to the third floor. He began by ascending to the second floor balcony and then to the third. The door was open and he entered the apartment without difficulty. In addition to the DNA sample, the police discovered fingerprints whose owner they were attempting to locate. Only 12 days after the body was discovered did the police release the victim's identity in the hopes of receiving tips from the public. 
Authorities have urged anyone with information that could aid the investigation to contact detectives. On the night of the crime, someone noticed a new black SUV, possibly a Honda Pilot, in the parking lot next to the building. It was there until around 6 a.m. Detectives suspected that the owner of the SUV was involved in Autumn's death. They believed he first climbed onto his car's roof and then went higher from there. The building's corners have repetitive, decorative protrusions that could have served as steps for the criminal as he climbed from the second to the third floor. The crime happened at night, so investigators began looking into the activity of mobile phones in the area where Autumn lived. In this case, the fact that the crime occurred at night simplified the task because most people are asleep at that time. There were few phone numbers that were active near the crime scene. During the investigation, the detectives learned that one of the phone numbers belonged to Autumn's neighbor, despite living in the same building as Autumn. She stated during the police interview that she knew nothing. However, she was not only talking on the phone in her apartment, she had moved around the city several times and turned off the phone around the same time that someone had killed her. She was either in her apartment or close to it at the time. It was impossible to say for certain because there is always an error rate when determining the phone's location. But there was no doubt that this woman was concealing information from the detectives investigating the case. So they went to speak with her again. Her name was Michelle, and she insisted that she didn't know or hear anything. But the police warned her that if she withheld critical information for the investigation, she could become an accomplice to the crime. She therefore began to speak. She said that around 2 a.m. That night, a man they knew as Jay contacted her boyfriend, who was looking to buy an illegal substance and hire an escort girl. All three drove to the ATM, where Jay took out cash. They then gave Jay some of the substance. Michelle admitted that she and her boyfriend were dealing with the issues themselves. Jay eventually asked them to sell him more. Then, according to Michelle, she directed Jay to the parking lot near her building. The woman admitted that she and her boyfriend intended to rob Jay. When they arrived at the building, all three consumed illegal substances, and Michelle and her boyfriend decided to flee with the remainder. Interestingly, before fleeing, Michelle hid a bag of the substance in her genitals. Fortunately, there are no details on how she did it, but it's worth remembering this moment. It will be necessary in the future. According to Michelle, she and her boyfriend fled, taking not only the substance but also some of Jay's money. They dashed to the building's entrance and then went upstairs to their apartment, where they locked themselves in, sat quietly, and did not turn on the lights. Jay was unable to enter the building because he did not have an electronic key. He couldn't shout or honk because someone would have called the cops. Furthermore, according to Michelle, when they looked out the window, they noticed shoe marks on Jay's car roof. The man drove away around 6 a.m., and investigators assumed Jay climbed into the building to find the people who stole the substance and money from him, but he had no idea where Michelle lived. So he probably entered Autumn's apartment by mistake. The police now had the suspect's phone number and photo. These images are from a camera at the bank's entrance, where he was withdrawing cash to buy the substance, as well as an ATM camera. After checking the phone number, investigators discovered that his name was not Jay. Van's real name was Jaitesh Bogle, and he was a 27-year-old Canadian citizen living and working as a car development engineer in Warren, Michigan. He also owned a black Honda Pilot SUV and used to visit Canada almost every day. To get to Windsor, he only needed to cross the river via bridge or tunnel. Authorities were able to track his movements and discovered that he had left Canada on the morning of June 10. The day Autumn died, he left the country and has not returned since. Jaitesh sold his car after the police released details about the black SUV incident at the victim's home. The Canadian police contacted their American counterparts and asked for assistance. They learned that Jaitesh was planning to relocate from Michigan to Washington State. His parents lived in Kent. After leaving a good job for unknown reasons, he returned to his parents' home. The fact that he decided to relocate, get rid of his car, and stop visiting Canada was very suspicious. However, the police required irrefutable evidence to arrest and extradite him to Canada. The Windsor police asked the U.S. National Security Agency to assist with the investigation and track the suspect's movements. The male DNA discovered on Autumn's body most likely belongs to Jaitesh. To prove it, they needed to collect a sample of his DNA for comparison. Agents from the United States tracked the suspect's movements. They were aware that he was planning to relocate to Washington State and were concerned that he might leave for a third country. 
Jaitesh also tried to change his appearance by removing his beard and wearing blue contact lenses. Fortunately, Jaitesh was not particularly cautious. One day, he went to one of Warren's bars and drank. When he finished his last class and left the bar, the agent seized the glass, obtaining a sample of his DNA. It took some time to compare it to the sample on Autumn's body, but the results were not unexpected. The victim's body contained male DNA that matched Jaitesh Bogle. On August 17, 2018, more than two months after Autumn Taggart's death, Jaitesh was arrested at his parents' home in Kent, Washington. The arrest surprised him. The arrest surprised him. The man appeared to believe that the police would not track him down. The U.S. authorities have begun the extradition process to his homeland. In the extradition documents, the prosecutor stated that Jaitesh was a threat to society, posing a flight risk and being unpredictable. Shortly after, Canadian police charged him with the murder of Autumn Taggart. The trial was postponed for an extended period of time due to country imposed restrictions. It started in November 2020. One, there were three separate courtrooms allowing for social distance. The main courtroom housed the judge, the prosecutor, the jury, and the defendant, along with his defense. The other two courtrooms featured large screens that showed the trial to Autumn's relatives and others. Jitesh Bogle pleaded not guilty to first degree homicide claiming that he accidentally killed Autumn. He described how some dealers stole money and an illegal substance from his car. It upset him, so he got out of the car to find them. He didn't remember much of what happened that night because he had consumed so much alcohol and other substances. He remembered climbing onto the balcony before entering the apartment. Autumn was asleep in her bed when he mistook her for Michelle, the woman who had robbed him. When Autumn awoke, she began screaming. He told her to stop making noise, but Autumn did not listen. He put his hand over her mouth, causing her to suffocate. According to the man, he realized he had accidentally killed Autumn after the scream stopped. He then performed CPR on her, but it didn't work. Jaitesh couldn't remember how the genital injuries appeared on Autumn's body or how he left her apartment. Jaitesh and his attorneys asked the prosecution to dismiss the first degree life deprivation charges because they believed it was an unintentional crime. According to them, Jaitesh was unaware of his actions due to the large quantity of substances he consumed. The hand over the mouth indicates that they want to be quiet, not that they want to die. Bogle lacked the ability to form intent or understand the consequences of his actions. According to defense attorney Peter Thorning, there is only one explanation for his behavior, intoxication. It is true that terrible things can happen without our knowledge. That is what happened here. This death was unintentional. He was intoxicated or didn't realize that his actions would not result in death. He added, his lawyers also claimed that there was no evidence that the defendant had intercourse with the victim. This is an important consideration because it will have an impact on Jaitesh's sentence. Yes, Autumn's body contained Bogle's DNA, but it was not seminal fluid. The lawyers believe it could have been caused by cross, contamination, or DNA transfer from one surface to another. For instance, through a forensic expert's gloves. Bogle's lawyers attempted to persuade the jury that John Lasorda, who worked in the forensic unit during the investigation, performed his duties incorrectly by transferring their client's DNA to Autumn Taggart's body. Lasorda's role was to photograph the scene and collect any evidence that came into direct contact with the victim. Bogle's defense lawyer, Peter Thorning, suggested to Lasorda that rotating the body on the bedsheet which the police seized, could result in DNA or fluid transfer from the body to the sheath or vice versa. This is known as cross-contamination. It is not impossible, Lasorda stated during cross-examination. Thorning asked Lasorda if he had the necessary training to work as a forensic identification expert. Lasorda stated that he changed gloves between touching each piece of evidence and grabbing his camera to photograph it to avoid cross-contamination. Lasorda examined the evidence in Taggart's room, looking for fluids, urine, saliva, and sperm. Lasorda testified that the likelihood of actual assault increases when there is a deceased female victim compared to a male victim. The court heard that Lasorda discovered no fluid depositions consistent with a jewel assault. He admitted his examination of the body was limited because he was not a trained medical official, such as a coroner. Nothing overt on or around the body would indicate a sexual assault. Lasorda stated in court. He also stated that there were no visible signs of a struggle. 
Lasorda clarified in court that signs of a struggle would include broken furniture or glass, forced entry, tampered locks, or blood spatter, none of which were found in Autumn's apartment. However, the prosecutor held a different view. Recalling that Michelle hid the substance in her genital area, the prosecution claimed that the defendant was aware of it and searched for it in the same part of Autumn's body, and that even though he did so with his hand, nothing changed. He committed all of the assaults. You searched her, the prosecutor said, which is disgusting. I disagree, said Bogal. Why didn't he call 911, the prosecutor asked. Autumn stopped breathing. Jaitesh responded that he was afraid the police would arrest him because he was sure no one would believe him. Nobody believed me. I barely believe myself. Bogle testified that he does not remember much of what happened in Autumn's room. He said he recalls performing QPR on Autumn after she stopped screaming. He previously testified that he remembered counting five or six ribs down before beginning CPR and that he performed 15 compressions and three breaths. The prosecutor also disputed that the defendant's strangulation of the victim was accidental. After all, he could have simply placed his hand over Autumn's mouth to stop her screaming, but he also closed her nose, depriving her of the ability to breathe. And he needed to do it for a while, so he knew what he was doing. Autumn's son, Gavin, who has since turned 13, also testified at the trial. The boy testified at the trial. The boy testified in a separate room in the courthouse from the main room, which housed the judge, jury, lawyers, and accused. He was accompanied by a support worker as he gave his testimony. That was how he described the events of that night. Someone came into my room and said something I can't recall. He was kind of close. He also testified that no contact was ever made. When he left my room, it was quiet for a short while. Then I heard my mother scream that night. That scream lasted a while before ending. And then before I knew it, I had fallen asleep again and woke up. When the boy woke up in the morning, he went into his mother's room. Everything was knocked down, broken, and destroyed. My mom was sleeping. Well, that was what I thought at first, but there was blood on her nose, which led me to believe she had died. She was killed. He said I was shocked. He said I was shocked. I could not believe it. I cried, but I tried to cope with it. I simply went about my day unconcerned. The boy testified. He claimed to have spent some of the day playing video games and watching YouTube videos. The date was June 10, 2018. Later that day, he sent a message to his father using his mother's phone. I could not take it anymore. I needed to tell someone about it. Gavin said, Chris Sherwin Taggart, his former partner and their son's father, testified that he last heard from her via text message around 12.30 a.m. on June 10. In the morning, he texted again, but no one responded. At that point, he expressed concern. Later that day, he claimed to have received a text from Taggart's phone. He soon realized it was his son. A copy of the text messages was displayed in court for the jury to view. On December 1, 2021, a 12-person jury convicted Jatish Bogol of first-degree life deprivation. They discovered no conclusive evidence that Bogol had intercourse with Autumn. I can't say we were not nervous. It's definitely the correct decision. Autumn deserved it. Her son deserved it. John Taggart, Autumn's father. Justice. That's exactly what we wanted. That's what we have. The family members hugged and expressed relief. On January 5, 2022, the court sentenced Jitesh Bogle to life in prison. He will have to serve 25 years before being eligible for parole. He appeared on video in jail wearing an orange jumpsuit and a black mask. He sat against a wall away from the camera while listening to the victim's impact statements. Finally, the judge asked if he had anything to say. It's difficult to express my sorrow and remorse, but I'm glad for the family that they have a sense of justice and can move forward. That day, a part of my soul also died. Bogle stated that we would still like to see the laws in Canada change from life to actual life rather than 25 years and then parole. We want life to mean life for all victims, said John Taggart. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Gloomy Love T. 
teenage years are the most difficult of all stages of development you are no longer a child, but you are not yet an adult. This time, the body experiences a massive hormonal overhaul. This transitional period is further complicated by the fact that yesterday's obedient child has become unstable and rebellious. A teenager's worldview is a picture of contrasts in black and white shades. The dominant color in teenagers' judgments and actions is heavily influenced by their surroundings. The story we're about to tell took place in Medicine Hat, in the southeast of Alberta, Canada. The Richardson family suffered unspeakable cruelty and betrayal, and their tragedy captured national attention. Once again, the Gothic subculture came under fire. In town, the Richardson family was regarded as exemplary. Deborah and Mark, along with their two children, Tyler, eight, and Jasmine, 12, lived in a beautiful and cozy home. They were very hospitable and sociable, as are all Canadians their home was frequently full of guests, and the atmosphere was based on love and respect. Everything was going well until the eldest daughter reached puberty. The Kong girl transformed beyond recognition. First and foremost, Jasmine's personality shifted she became bold and frivolous. Conflicts between her and her parents began to arise, and her academic performance declined. Second, her music and clothing preferences changed she used to enjoy modern pop but now prefers heavy rock bright colors and clothing were replaced by shades of gray and black and her dressing style became provocative. Jasmine wanted to appeal to boys, so she started emphasizing her rounded features. Her interactions with former friends declined noticeably she began to spend more time alone in front of her computer screen and the door to her room was frequently closed. With the advent of the internet at home, she became interested in gothic themes, dark poetry, criminal psychology, and human anatomy. Miss Richardson even identified as a witch and preached the Wiccan religion. For this purpose, she visited various similar websites and discovered a circle of friends who shared her interests. The greeting on her social media page read, Welcome to my tragic world. It appeared to be a typical adolescence, complete with excessive dramaticism and mysticism. However, the girl's relationship with her family grew increasingly distant. In her profile, she used a fictitious name and stated her age is 15. She preferred older interlocutors and aspired to be like them. During this difficult time, her parents tried to support her by suggesting that they spend time together. They searched for common ground activities. However, she found this uninteresting. Jasmine thought her younger brother was an annoying nuisance. She spoke to him less and less, but she could spend hours on end on the computer talking to strangers. Deborah and Mark recognized that their current state was only temporary. She would grow up and gain wisdom. As a result, they were very accepting of her new hobbies. Jasmine one day expressed an interest in attending a punk rock concert. Her parents agreed. If only they knew what this excursion would lead to. Early 2006. Jasmine Richardson attended a local youth band concert, pursuing her own interests, knowing that he would be present. The boy who had been stirring her heart for months, Jeremy Allen Steinke, was also fascinated by gothic culture. They met on a vampire enthusiast website and occasionally communicated. Jeremy portrayed himself as a 300-year-old werewolf looking for blood, to prove it. He wore a vial of blood around his neck, but it was unclear whether the fluid was human or animal in origin. Nonetheless, the boy clearly considered himself unique, which Jasmine found appealing. The young people's feelings for each other grew stronger after meeting at the concert. Steinke eventually asked her out, and she happily agreed that everything would be fine, except that Jeremy was 23 years old. The couple knew her parents would not approve of their relationship, so they kept it a secret. Furthermore, his troubled past will not endear him to them. The young man was poor, living in a trailer with his mother and sister. His relationship with his mother was strained due to her heavy drinking. Jeremy had to deal with her constant stream of volatile partners, many of whom beat him in drunken rages. As a result, by the age of 13 he was struggling academically and had a fragile mental health. Steinke was tempted to commit suicide when he couldn't bear such a life, but he was saved just in time. Later, doctors diagnosed him with depression and hyperactivity. He dropped out of school after being bullied. Over time, Jeremy imagined himself immortal and began visiting websites with similar themes. His online profile included topics such as pain, self-harm, blood, and razor blades. Except for their friends, no one knew about the couple's forbidden relationship, which they found strange. 
Their communication would have remained private had the Richardsons not begun monitoring their daughter's excessive internet usage. Deborah and Mark discovered Jasmine was communicating with strangers, which alarmed them as any parent would. They therefore decided to remove the computer from the girl's reach. Furthermore, they were surprised to learn that she had fallen for an adult man with questionable interests. His nickname, Soul Eater, spoke volumes. As a result, Jasmine and Jeremy's relationship was forbidden in order to help their daughter break free from this toxic relationship. Deborah and Mark saw two psychologists and sincerely believed that counseling would improve their parent-child relationship. It worked out well for them. Jasmine demonstrated compliance and appeared to be returning to normal life, as if everything was behind her. She received her computer back. This became Richardson's final fateful decision, resulting in their demise. Saturday, April 22, 2006. Mrs. Richardson was getting ready for bed when she heard a noise in the basement. Rats again, she thought. As she descended, she turned on the light and noticed someone wearing a ski mask. He stood opposite her and looked at her. She screamed out, startled. The stranger rushed towards her, covering her mouth. His efforts were vain. Deborah struggled and screamed louder. He stepped back, drew his knife and stabbed her in the chest, then again and again. When Mark heard his wife scream, he dashed down and grabbed the first thing he could find a screwdriver. He had been fixing an outlet that day and, by chance, had left the tool out. When he entered the basement, he was confronted with a horrifying scene, his wife lying in a pool of blood with someone standing beside her. Mark immediately attacked the intruder, but was stabbed in the stomach, followed by more stabs as the agonizing pain subsided and his eyes closed. Mr. Richardson asked quietly, why because your daughter wanted it? The attacker responded, upstairs. Tyler was the only one remaining. The boy sat on his bed wearing his pajamas, too afraid to move. The approaching footsteps became louder and the bedroom door opened several days before the murder. Jasmine was overjoyed. Her parents believed in her remorse, which allowed them to communicate again. Mobile phones were just becoming popular at the time, so the computer was the only way to communicate. When Miss Richardson regained internet access, she immediately wrote to Jeremy it all begins with them disappearing and ends with us remaining together, she told him. During her visits to the psychologist, the young lady devised a terrible plan. It solidified after several days of punishment. Surprisingly, Steinke Co. found it enticing, but emphasized the importance of being creative and paying attention to detail. The couple knew they couldn't be together as long as the Richardsons were alive. Later, Jasmine's friends recalled how frequently she mentioned her parents, particularly how much she disliked them. Therefore, she wanted to end their lives. However, nobody took Jasmine's words seriously. Saturday, April 22, 2006. Garrett walked across the street to his friend Tyler's house. The boy wanted to play. Despite the cold weather, it was pleasant outside. This was the spring of that year. Garrett approached the house and noticed that the blinds were still closed. Nobody answered his knock at the door. Strangely, he assumed the Richardsons would be home. Their car was parked in the driveway. The child looked into the living room window, hoping to see someone, but there was no one there. Garrett then decided to walk around to the back of the basement, where he frequently plays with Tyler while peeking through the window, and he noticed something strange on the floor. It appeared as two silhouettes in a pool of blood. The boy informed his mother, who was skeptical, so she decided to check on the family across the street. They approached the house together. Garrett pointed to the window he'd looked through earlier. The woman looked inside and recoiled in horror. She immediately contacted emergency services. Something happened at the Richardsons. They appear to be lying on the basement floor, covered in blood. A neighbor reported. The police arrived promptly. They broke down the front door and descended to the location where Garrett and his mother had seen something. When the officers entered the dark basement, they had difficulty recognizing the people lying on the ground. Their bodies were mutilated and bleeding. However, there was no doubt. It was Mark and Deborah Richardson, and they had died. Blood was all over the floor, walls and ceiling, a bloody mess. There was no other way to describe what lay before them. Later, the police searched the house. In the upstairs children's room, they discovered a small child. The boy lay in bed among toys covered in blood and visible knife wounds. The child's throat was severely cut. Medicine had had never witnessed such horror. One officer said it would take me decades to forget what I witnessed today. After searching the house, police discovered that one family member was missing. Richardson's eldest daughter was gone. 
Officers are concerned she may be in danger. Everything indicated that the attack took place in the basement and child's room. The rest of the house was undisturbed. And at first glance, nothing was amiss. The state of the body suggested that the crime had occurred the night before. Apparently, the perpetrator broke into the house and assaulted the boy and his parents. So what happened to Jasmine? And where was she? The police began to develop theories about what had occurred. Perhaps by chance the girl was safe outside the house, where the perpetrator had abducted her and was now harming her, or a ransom demand from relatives would arrive in due course. However, as time passed, there were no obvious answers. Detectives quickly turned to the media, requesting assistance in the search for the missing girl. They hoped Jasmine would make contact or that someone would provide useful information. Meanwhile, the investigation into the crime continued. Investigators spoke with relatives, friends, and colleagues about every aspect of the slain family's life. Were there any adversaries or enemies capable of such heinous acts? However, as the investigation progressed, the situation became clearer. There was no reason to wish death upon anyone in the Richardson family. With the exception of the eldest daughter, they were truly wonderful people, faithful spouses, and loving parents. The officers discovered that the girl had been causing a lot of trouble lately. This time, the investigation aimed to find a person of interest. It was entirely possible that the girl was aware of the crime or had been involved in it. Given the suspect's age, the media could no longer publish her real name under Canadian law. As a result, news outlets began to refer to Jasmine Richardson as Junior. When her relationship with Jeremy Steinke was revealed, the couple was declared wanted. Initially, the search for the young lovers began among their friends and acquaintances, believing they were hiding with them. However, while this lead proved to be a dead end for the police, they did discover something intriguing. Several hours after the crime, the young couple was seen at a restaurant and a party hosted by an acquaintance. Someone in their circle of friends mentioned that Jasmine appeared unchanged. There was no evidence she had been abducted or was in shock. She was drinking and having fun. When friends asked how they got away from her parents, Jasmine laughed and Jeremy and I just took care of them. Yes, the boy agreed. I cut them up like fish. The party guests laughed, believing it was a cruel joke, not realizing that the statement was true. A comic found in Jasmine's school locker confirmed her involvement in the crime, as it detailed how she would deal with each of her family members, with her boyfriend acting as her accomplice. Photographs of the suspects were widely distributed. It was only a matter of time before a citizen came forward with information on their whereabouts. Soon enough, information arrived. A couple was spotted in the community of Leader, Saskatchewan, about 130 kilometers from Medicine Hat. They got caught off guard. Jasmine Richardson and Jeremy Steinke were discovered sleeping peacefully inside a pickup truck. They were escorted to the police station without resistance. Naturally, the couple was interrogated separately, beginning with Jasmine. She revealed that she was deeply in love with Steinke, and he reciprocated her feelings. However, their age and social status differences served as a barrier. Jasmine believes the Richardsons would never have accepted their relationship. As a result, Jeremy committed the ultimate act of love. He ended her parents' lives, giving them the opportunity to be together. When detectives asked if Jasmine was involved in the crime, she replied, I wasn't home when it happened, I wasn't sure what had happened. When I found out, I accepted it. I loved Jeremy so much that I ran away with him. Detectives needed to figure out who was the main instigator because breaking the suspects proved difficult. The investigation employed a cunning strategy. They placed an informant in the cell with Jeremy and he skillfully extracted details that contradicted Jasmine's statements. Jeremy admitted to the informant that the plan to end her parents' lives was Jasmine's idea. He wasn't initially supportive, but he agreed after they discovered the forbidden love and took her computer. I cared for Deborah and Mark Richardson, while Jasmine looked after her younger brother on her own. She begged me to leave Tyler for her. I was pleased to settle scores with all of them. Jeremy made a cruel revelation. Following the confession, investigators confronted Miss Richardson with the recording. She had no choice but to confess everything, admitting that she stabbed her younger brother out of mercy not wanting to leave him as an orphan. Later, the couple shared their social media profiles and passwords with the investigators, who began looking into their correspondence. They exchanged thousands of messages confirming Jeremy's statements. Jasmine devised the plan on her own. 
Steinke claimed that Jasmine was the only person who understood and approved of his tastes. He feared losing her as he replaced the society from which he felt alienated. He contributed to the realization of the dreadful idea. I want to cut their throats. They will regret what they have done. Especially when I know they're gone. They will pay for the insults. Finally, there will be silence and their blood will be the payment. Jeremy supported his beloved. His friends also claimed that just a few hours before the attack, they watched the 1994 film Natural Born Killers, which depicts a couple committing nine heinous murders. This story inspired their friend, who said he wanted to carry out a similar plan with his girlfriend. I think it's the greatest love story of all time. Steinke made this claim based on sufficient evidence. The suspects have been charged with three counts of homicide. The detectives pieced together the accused's confessions, witness testimonies and other case evidence to form a more complete picture of the crime. Jeremy was intoxicated prior to the act. Jasmine led him inside the house and directed him to the basement, where he assaulted her mother. Deborah was the first to die with 12 stab wounds to her body. The deepest wound pierced her chest, measuring 12 centimeters and striking her heart with rage. Jeremy mercilessly continued his assault on Mark, who received 24 wounds, nine of which were in the back. The family patriarch, like his wife, bled out on the basement floor. Tyler Richardson was the last to die. While Steinke dealt with the parents downstairs, Jasmine stabbed her younger brother five times upstairs. After finishing, Jeremy went upstairs to assist his girlfriend with the child, coldly slicing the boy's throat as if carving a pumpkin. After that, Jeremy went home to wash off the blood, while Jasmine took a taxi to the restaurant where the couple had planned to meet. After discussing the night's events, they went to a party. Kate Lancaster, a friend of Jeremy's, assisted them in disposing of the evidence and traveling to Saskatchewan. Words are insufficient to describe the horror they created. The couple went on their murderous spree with such ease and nonchalance, as if possessed by an otherworldly force. It is shocking that no one expressed regret or remorse for their actions during interrogation or while in custody. While detained, they wrote letters to each other, referring to themselves as legends and immortals. Steinke was able to propose to Richardson in a single letter, which he gladly accepted. However, their mad love began to fade like last year's snow during the trial. They shifted the blame to each other. Jasmine Richardson was the first person to go on trial in June 2007. She pleaded not guilty, claiming to have been in a zombie-like state and unable to act while Jeremy murdered her family. She also claimed that she only injured her younger brother and that Steinke was responsible for his death. Jasmine insisted that their discussions about ending her parents' lives were only hypothetical, but they appealed to Jeremy so much that he forced her to make them a reality. Miss Richardson was sentenced to only 10 years in prison for three counts of homicide, thanks to the nuances of Canadian juvenile criminal justice law, which states that people under the age of 14 cannot be sentenced to more than 10 years. The sentence was intended more to rehabilitate and restore the girl's psyche than to punish her. When Jeremy Steinke's trial began in 2008, he insisted that he had no intention of killing his girlfriend's parents. However, when he was found in the basement, he felt compelled to attack. He claimed he did not hurt Tyler, implying Jasmine was to blame while he simply watched from the doorway. The defense claimed that Jasmine intentionally seduced him in order to free her from her parents' strict control. Some friends testified that Jeremy had asked for their help with the act because he was so afraid of losing Jasmine that he was willing to do anything. The lawyers also requested that the charges be reduced to manslaughter, claiming Steinke was under the influence of drugs at the time of the incident. Steinke's inconsistent inconsistencies were revealed. When asked by the prosecution why he committed the act, he stated, when you find your other half, you do whatever it takes for them. Throughout the trial, he remained unconcerned, but broke down when his mother, Jacqueline May, testified in his defense. She admitted to bearing significant guilt for his upbringing, as he was frequently attacked by her partners, beaten, and rejected. Steinke was found guilty on three counts of first-degree homicide and sentenced to three life sentences. He would be eligible for parole no sooner than 25 years later, in 2033. Casey Lancaster's charges of complicity in the act were dropped in Medicine Hat Court, however, she was found guilty of obstruction of justice, sentenced to a year of house arrest, and prohibited from consuming drugs or alcohol. While in custody, Jeremy Steinke changed his name to Jackson May. 
Jasmine Richardson's 10-year sentence included four years in a psychiatric facility where she was diagnosed with conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder, which indicate a refusal to follow rules and socially unacceptable behavior that is typically associated with children rather than adults. This highlighted her psychological immaturity and instability throughout her relationship with Steinke. Medical professionals reported genuine remorse in her final years of conditional community supervision and attendance at special programs. After serving her full sentence, she was released in 2016. Jasmine Richardson currently lives in Canada under an assumed name her true identity is still hidden from the media. Her return sparked heated public debate, with some claiming she deserved a second chance and others believing she deserved a harsher sentence. Nonetheless, Medicine Hat residents would prefer not to have Miss Richardson as a neighbor again, given the brutality of her crime. It's unclear whether Jasmine has truly changed after spending her formative years in detention. Time will tell. Share your opinion with us in the comments, and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Today's story is a retelling of the biblical story of the first crime on earth, as recorded in the book of Genesis, in which Cain rose up against his brother Abel and murdered him. This occurred after Cain sacrificed the earth's fruits to the Almighty, as did Abel, the firstborn lambs. To the older man's disappointment, God accepted the younger man's sacrifice while rejecting his gifts, motivated by selfish jealousy. Cain summoned Abel to the field, where he committed suicide. Unfortunately, even in the modern world, unhealthy jealousy can lead to the older brother killing the younger one. Donna and Samuel Eckerd's family endured a difficult time at the end of June 2010. Their 19-year-old son, Sean, went missing. Sean had a fight with his older brother Stanley the night before and slammed the door when he left. Sean had never before allowed himself to leave the house for an extended period of time without calling or informing his mother. Late that night, the entire family was concerned about the young man's disappearance. However, the official search for the boy did not begin until 24 hours later. A missing person discovered that photos of a smiling, blonde-haired Sean were posted at all supermarkets and on the streets. However, after two days of searching, there were no results. The police held their hands up in the air as they searched for more than two days. Sean Paul Eckerd was officially missing relatives, acquaintances, and a few friends formed a group of activists who combed local establishments day and night, interviewed random passers-by, and minute by minute reconstructed the guy's route that night. Without pausing the search, the police began to delve deeper into the Eckerd family's habits and rhythms in order to piece together the events leading up to Sean's disappearance. Donna and Sam Eckerd, married with a history of familial relationships. They had six adult children from their previous marriages following difficulties and setbacks in their early unions. They found comfort in each other's company and settled in San Diego, California. They rented a large family home and went to the local church every weekend. The family was devout and led a quiet, unsociable life. A few years after moving in, the family welcomed a son, Stanley, and two years later, a second son, Sean. They both attended a good local school and every weekend, the entire family participated in church activities. The oldest children, having reached adulthood, flew away from their parents' nests across the continent to start their own families. But the Eckerds were friendly. They kept in touch, called each other frequently, and spent all family holidays together. Sean was a simple, fun-loving boy. His bright appearance, charisma, and insight drew people to him like magnets. He could listen and empathize, so he made friends easily. Stanley, on the other hand, had a more reserved personality and was cautious of everything. He was aware that he was shy, so interacting with others was much more difficult for him than for his brother. They shared a common group of friends and classmates. Despite their age difference, the brothers were like one, helping and looking out for each other. The boys developed good manners and excelled in school. They were always trusting and friendly with one another. Their parents laughed when they made jokes about each other. The family valued respect above all else. Donna and Samuel raised their children with a strong faith in God, and according to God's laws, the Eckerd family's life unfolded in its own unique way. The brothers' interests diverged significantly as they grew older. 
Sean, the youngest, participated in a music band, while Stanley, the eldest, became interested in martial arts. Each young boy's life was full of vivid memories and emotions that he shared with his family in the evenings. Sean was always first. When the family gathered before dinner to share their day's emotions, he spent the majority of the time telling stories about music, friends, and upcoming plans. Everyone listened to Sean, there was no time for Stanley, and it didn't appear that he had much to say. There are no grand plans for the future. There are no exciting stories to highlight, not even those of friends. So, Stanley humbly forwarded his brother's stories. On one such evening, Sean informed his family that he had met a neighbor girl named Mary Jane. A fragile young girl with bright brown eyes and long blonde hair put Sean in a trance. Through the open window of the girl's home, he heard a magical piano playing as if mesmerizing. Sean's confidence in his own charm enabled him to walk out of such a funny situation with dignity and meet the girl he liked. Despite the fact that she was a few years older than Sean, they maintained a friendly relationship. The company's soul shone through, and they organized picnics to which Mary Jane was invited. They walked a lot, went to parks, and visited observation decks. The burgeoning adolescent love affair was cut short by the harsh realities of adulthood. The Eckerds were devastated to learn of Donna's elderly mother, Sean, and Stanley's grandmother's illness. In search of prosperity, parents attempted to consider the interests of each family member. However, the decision makes a fundamental change in the life of the entire family. Sean did not want to leave his native land, his friends, or his mother, Mary Jane. But the parents' decision had already been made. The records leave the city where their children were born and raised and relocate to another state. So, as fate would have it, the Eckerd family moves into Donna's mother's house in the small town of Spring Hill, Florida, in 2005, and begins a new life. The move was a breath of fresh air for the entire family because it was the correct decision. Sean and Stanley's grandmother was on the mend. Sean was heartbroken. He missed his band, which he used to play on walks with Mary Jane and during hangouts in his favorite city. But Sean, who loves life, can't stay sad for long, and eventually, a new life becomes as full as the one he missed. Donna and Samuel landed a job at the Presbyterian Church, where they spent almost all of their time. Donna looked after the children in the nursery, while Samuel helped with the chapel. Over time, the brothers rekindle their bond and make new friends at school. Old life appears to be resurrected in a new environment. Sean participates in the school band again. Stanley goes to a martial arts school that is just a few blocks from their new home. Despite his new busy lifestyle, Sean can't stop thinking about Mary Jane. Every night after class, he locks himself in his room and talks on the phone for hours. The goodbyes are the same, with Sean saying he hopes to meet again. He always promises to come to see her after he gets his parents' permission. The younger brother, on the other hand, grew and held his first love close to his heart. The elder Stanley attempted to establish himself in the family in his own way. Stanley, despite his quiet and calm demeanor, appeared to be deprived of parental warmth and attention, in pursuit of self-expression. He makes a series of bad decisions that have serious consequences for the entire family. In May 2006, he tells his parents that he plans to drop out of school and devote his life to studying martial arts and starting a martial arts club. However, youthful maximalism leads the guy into bad company, where he begins to engage in petty fraud and experiment with illegal drugs. In 2007, Stanley's arrest resulted from dysfunctional connections. He was caught stealing and charged with felony fraud offenses. Donna suffers her first major setback when she learns of her elder son's antics. She ends up in the hospital with a heart attack, but the situation is quickly resolved thanks to the services of a lawyer hired by Jennifer's sister. He skillfully defends Stanley, demonstrating the lack of direct evidence, allowing the man to go free with only a suspended sentence. This episode terrified Stanley. He feels guilty and isolates himself in the hopes of being understood and accepted by his family. Sean does not discuss his decisions with his parents after surviving the frightening events that occurred to Stanley. During his summer vacation, he works as a waiter. I've saved up some money. He only leaves a note for his mother, telling her to go to California for Mary Jane. The two-day bus ride to his beloved felt like an eternity. The scenery changed outside the window. Tonight, the day changed. Sean imagined seeing Mary Jane at the final station. When the driver announced the final stop, the bus came to a stop. Sean was ready to run to her, 
because he'd seen her happy face through the window and her long hair, which she was tucking behind her ears with her fingers. They had shared some of their happiest days together. They'd had picnics, just as they had in his best high school years. Sean had confessed his desire to marry for the first time, and the feeling was mutual. After another walk, the youth sat down on a bench. Sean felt faint. His eyes turned black. Sean was admitted to the hospital after falling unconscious. The young boy was fading like a match in a matter of days. Mary Jane contacted Sean's sister, and Jennifer flew to California, where doctors determined what was causing a strong and sturdy man to fade so quickly. Tick-borne encephalitis begins suddenly and quickly, causing a variety of complications, including brain inflammation. A difficult struggle for Sean's life and health began. Doctors fought for the boy's life for a long time, more than a month in a coma, and six months of rehabilitation enabled him to return from the other side of the world. Sean struggled to recover for quite some time. An ordinary tick bite on a summer walk resulted in a serious injury for him. Jennifer returned her brother to Florida, where he underwent therapy in a long recovery. Mary Jane was left waiting. Again, the lover's only means of communication was the telephone. A slew of problems and unexpected illnesses brought the Eckerd family together. Donna does everything she can to completely free her beloved son Sean from the effects of a serious illness. She closely monitors his diet and exercise. Such attentive care leads to Sean's complete recovery, as well as Stanley's inner resentment and jealousy which he nurtures in bits and pieces. Sean regained his strength and resumed his studies in music. In 2009, he completes his studies and dreams of returning with his mother, Mary Jane, to introduce her to his parents as his favorite. However, Sean's plans are unlikely to come true. Stanley introduces his brother to Samantha Rowe, his dream girl. Samantha, a Florida native, quickly discovered a common language with the two brothers. Stanley adored and sympathized with her, but the girl was taken with Sean's cheerful and sociable personality. For a while, Stanley actively courted Samantha and she accepted his advances. Many romantic encounters conclude with a passionate kiss. Stanley is extremely happy. Samantha, who said yes to her older brother, continues to think about her younger brother. Samantha decides to send Sean a message in which she expresses her sympathy for him and invites him on a walk around the city. The guy agrees, and they spend the evening walking along the waterfront, discussing Stanley and Mary Jane. Sean does not seek to win the girl after all he has long belonged to or rejected her. Samantha sends a message to Stanley, informing him that Sean has been seeing her, and he admits that he also likes her. Stanley was infuriated. That same evening, he went up to his brother's room, where they talked. The brothers began by speaking quietly, but their words quickly became shouts, and then there was complete silence. The parents were present, but the brothers occasionally clarified relations quite loudly, so they saw nothing unusual in what had occurred. Mom was the first to notice Sean was missing. He had not returned her calls. Recalling the evening before Stanley's explanation, Sean had left home after an argument. After two days of searching, the police received a terrifying call. Jennifer, Sean's sister, made the call. The dispatcher who took the call only heard a woman scream into the receiver. A piercing male moan was heard in the background. After several requests to calm down, the dispatcher finally records the request for assistance. Jennifer continues to scream. She pleads for assistance and reports. Oh, damn it, my brother Stanley murdered Sean. He's inside the house, talking to his mother. His father is freaking out while lying over his dead son, who has been buried since early Saturday morning. Damn it. I'm begging for assistance. Police officers who arrived at the scene of the tragedy witnessed a horrific scene. In the backyard of the house, Samuel was kneeling, his hands dripping with earth. He was screaming as he pulled his son's body from the damp earth, attempting to wipe it away. In an instant, a quiet neighborhood with sculpted lawns, where the two young brothers frequently waved to neighbors, became the site of a violent tragedy. And now the Eckerd family, who once raised two sons, is haunted by the memory of digging in the ground and discovering one of their sons, while watching the other son be handcuffed and taken away. Stanley Eckerd was arrested on suspicion of premeditated murder. During his first interrogation, he admitted that he had no intention of killing his brother. In a fit of rage, he struck Sean on the head. Sean fell as a result of his injuries. Stanley checked his pulse. When he realized his younger brother had died, he tied up the body and carried it out the window to be buried on the lawn behind the house.
Stanley said at the inquest I buried him after all. That's what you do with the dead. These words sound like the cold-blooded calculations of a serial killer rather than a loving brother. In his defense, Stanley Eckerd stated that he did it for his mother. He wanted to shield her from any shock she might have felt at the news. After that, Stanley planned to relocate his brother's body and rebury it once his parents were gone. Stanley's behavior during the interrogation varied. He cried and confessed what he had done, clearly apologizing and presenting it as an accident, or he blamed Sean with hatred in his eyes. Stanley spoke harshly and unpleasantly about his younger brother. He blamed him for all of his problems and admitted that he had won the battle for his mother's and Samantha's affection. Stanley was charged with second-degree murder and arrested without bail the same day. Two days later, Dr. Barbara Wolf conducted an autopsy on Sean's body. She presented the court with the results of the forensic examination, which revealed that the victim's neck had bruising under the skin and rope marks, indicating that the neck had been compressed to make breathing difficult. The examination determined that the death was caused by an inflicted head injury and asphyxiation. Assistant State Attorney Pete Marino investigated the case. The first hearing began on February 25, 2011, and was presided over by District Judge Stephen. Donna and Samuel Eckerd, Stanley's parents, rushed to the second row. On April 9, 2013, they wept as they watched their oldest son be escorted into the courtroom. The trial began in Hernando Court, which was presided over by District Judge Anthony Taddy. Attorney Alan Hunter led the defense, while Pete remained on the prosecution's side. The primary goal of the prosecution was to persuade the jury that Stanley had meticulously planned the crime. According to defense attorney Allen, the tragic outcome stemmed from a spontaneous fight. In conclusion, Allen urged the jury to take note of Stanley's attempt to conceal the crime in the name of good intentions. Stanley Eckerd was charged with first-degree premeditated murder, which carries a mandatory life sentence if convicted. Sentencing was scheduled for May 13th. Stanley's fate lay in the hands of District Judge Anthony Tatey, who presided over the five-day trial. Second-degree murder carries a maximum sentence of life imprisonment. Stanley Elias Eckerd always claimed that he had no intention of killing his brother three years ago before burying him in the front yard of the house. Before trial, Eckerd turned down prosecutors offer to plead guilty to second-degree murder in exchange for a 20-year prison sentence. Eckerd remained stone-faced as the clerk read the verdict. The brothers' parents, Samuel and Donna, wept quietly. As the jury exited the courtroom, Samuel Eckerd's sobs turned into screams, and a crowd gathered around Donna and Samuel. The jury agreed that Eckerd did not intend to kill 19-year-old Sean, but they did not completely clear him of guilt. After two and a half hours of deliberation, nine women and three men convicted Eckerd of second-degree murder. All the while, according to the record, they believe Stanley's account of what happened early on June 19, 2010, and criticized the state attorney's office for filing the charges. Later Friday, Samuel Eckerd stated that Chief Assistant Public Defender Alan Lanter did an excellent job. The family questions whether the sentence is appropriate. They filed an appeal against the verdict but were denied. I don't understand how the jury returned a verdict of second-degree murder, and after about two hours, Samuel Eckerd stated that our faith had not been shaken. He stated that one fact was not disputed during the trial. After his brother died, Stanley removed his body from Sean's bedroom window and buried it in a shallow grave in the family's Spring Hill backyard. Samuel Eckerd discovered Sean's body two days later. During his closing arguments at trial, Assistant State's attorney Pete Marino showed jurors photos of Sean's dirt-covered body lying in a fetal position. This isn't a detective novel case, but Marino said. He stated that when detectives questioned Stanley on the day his brother's body was discovered, he changed his testimony. Six times he claimed he had no knowledge of Sean's death until two days after his brother's funeral. According to Marino, Stanley sent messages from Sean's cell phone to family members, claiming that Sean had traveled to California to stay with his girlfriend, Mary Jane. On Sean's behalf, he also wrote to Samantha, telling her that he didn't want to communicate and that she should focus on Stanley. After several hours of questioning, Stanley revealed that Sean died during a struggle in the bedroom that morning. He claimed to hear a snap in his brother's neck as they fell to the ground. He then hid Sean's body to protect his mother, Donna, who has a weakened heart. He stated that he planned to tell his father after his mother left on a trip. The defendant's hand injuries constitute murder, 
according to Magazino, who also cited testimony and Stanley's statements to detectives about rising tensions over Samantha Rowe. He also brought up testimony about a conversation Stanley had with his brother and a friend about revenge in the weeks leading up to Sean's death. During that conversation, the friend testified that Stanley stated that if he was going to kill someone, he would hit them in the back of the head and bury the body in the backyard. That evidence was shaky at best and could not dispel reasonable doubts. Alan Lanter told the jury that a crime is an act with an intended outcome. Lanter replied, Yes, I was involved in my brother's death, but he did not kill his brother. Lanter cited testimony from a forensic pathologist, who stated that the blow to the head was combined with other factors. Sean's death was most likely caused by high blood alcohol levels and possible lingering brain swelling from encephalitis. The pathologist also testified that hitting his head on the bedroom nightstand when the two men fell could have been enough to kill Sean Lantar, which reminded the jury of Donna Eckerd's testimony that Sean suffered from severe mood swings after contracting encephalitis. In her testimony, Donna Eckerd referred to Sean's death as an accident. The jury could have also convicted Stanley Eckerd of third-degree murder or manslaughter. In the case of pardonable homicide, Lanter urged jurors not to be distracted by gruesome photos of Sean's body or Stanley's poor decision to bury him in the yard. Stanley Eckerd did something horrible after Sean died, according to Lanter, but he is not a murderer. During the final sentencing, the record parents were filled with excitement. Judge Anthony sentenced the defendant to 50 years in prison without the possibility of parole. The parents were broken. One miserable day, they lost both of their sons at the same time. The cold-blooded murder of an innocent man, including a brother, is clearly beyond the scope of appropriate human response. In the Bible story, Cain, the brother killer, was banished from paradise as punishment. However, he approached the problem differently, eliminating the source of his remorse. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this video, we will discuss the events that took place in Texas. On April 4, 2011, Robert Frisbee arrived at the police station because he couldn't find his 17-year-old daughter, Bridget. Robert assumed she had spent the night at her friend's place, but when Bridget did not return home, he became concerned and attempted to contact her via phone. All of his attempts were unsuccessful. So Robert headed to the police station. Bridget was born December 17, 1993. There isn't much information about her early life because she was raised in an orphanage before being adopted by Catherine Randall Frisbee and Robert Frisby at the age of 18 months. When I mention Robert and Catherine, I'll refer to them as Bridget's father and mother, not her adoptive parents. Bridget grew up to be a cheerful, energetic, and inquisitive young lady. She enjoyed poetry, painting, and horseback riding. Unfortunately, the difficulties that had followed Bridget like a shadow since birth did not fade as she grew older. Catherine Frisbee, Bridget's mother, died from a long illness when she was six years old. Her passing was heartbreaking for both Bridget and her father, Robert Frisbee. Catherine died at age 49. Robert tried everything to make his daughter happy. They had a warm, trusting relationship, but Bridget was getting older and her rebellious side began to show. On April 3, 2011, teenagers riding motorcycles through the woods on the outskirts of Katy, Texas, noticed something suspicious on the ground among the trees. They decided to stop and take a closer look at what they saw. As they approached, they discovered a young woman lying on the ground. She was clearly dead and had been lying there for quite some time. They reported the discovery of the body to the police. The police officers who arrived at the crime scene quickly determined that the location where the teenagers discovered the young woman was the site of her death, but she didn't have any identification with her. The detectives had no idea who she was or how she ended up in the woods. Thus, one of the detectives' primary responsibilities was to identify the victim. She looked about 20 years old. When the expert examined the body, he discovered an entry bullet hole in the back of the victim's head. The bullet passed through and through as evidenced by the exit wound on the forehead. Police discovered a 9mm pistol shell casing next to the body. At the time, the shell casing was the only clue that could be used to solve the case. When investigators examined the crime scene, they discovered another suspicious detail. There was a small hole a few yards away from the body. It was clear that someone had removed the topsoil, 
but it was unclear whether this was related to the crime. In search of answers, the police began interviewing residents near the crime scene. It was a quiet, wooded area, and residents became concerned about their safety after learning about a brutal crime committed near their homes. The police wanted to know if they had seen anything strange. Perhaps someone noticed strangers or unfamiliar cars near their home. Any clue was valuable. The officers went door to door, but no one reported seeing anything unusual. However, one of the locals stated that she had heard something strange. She spent the night before with friends in the backyard. At approximately 2 or 3 a.m., they heard a loud bang, like a gunshot. They paid little attention to it and did not call the police. At the time, this was not a major concern. However, learning about the discovery of a dead young woman nearby has raised serious concerns. Thus, the police estimated that the crime occurred between 2 and 3 a.m. No other residents have provided significant information to the police. To solve this case, detectives first had to identify the victim. In most cases, the perpetrator and victim know each other's names, occupations, social circles, and enemies. The police were able to track down the criminal detective, who began reviewing missing person reports in the hopes of finding someone who matched the description of a young woman found in the woods, but no one did. The following day was April 4, 2011. Robert Frisbee visited the police station. He became concerned after learning that the police were investigating the death of a young woman whose identity had not yet been determined. Robert couldn't contact his 17-year-old daughter, Bridget. He informed detectives that he had last seen his daughter two days ago. She thought she was spending the night with a friend. He began to worry when she did not return home. Robert's worst fears were confirmed when the detective showed him photos of the crime scene. He recognized Bridget among them. And this, of course, caused him unimaginable emotional distress. Many years ago, he lost his wife. And now, he's lost his daughter, whom he loved despite her rebellious nature. The investigators asked him to describe everything about the last time he saw his daughter and the events leading up to his visit to the police station. The police now knew the victim's name, giving them hope that they would be able to find the person who killed Bridget quickly. Robert Frisbee testified that he had last seen his daughter on April 2, 2011. That day, he bought her a new rave outfit, including blue, green fox fur leggings, a skirt, and a top. Kendall Suto, Bridget's friend, visited them in the evening and stayed for dinner. Robert drove Bridget and Kendall to a rave party, but it was closed, so they returned home shortly after 10 p.m. Kendall's ride was supposed to pick him up at midnight, so he and Bridget settled in to watch a movie. Bridget was still dressed in her new rave outfit when Robert went to bed and set the alarm for midnight. When he awoke, Bridget informed him that the candle ride had not yet arrived. When Kendall left, Robert wanted to lock up the house. When Robert awoke at around 3 a.m., he discovered the back door and garage door open. Bridget could not return without the man's knowledge because he was locked up. Then he realized his cell phone was missing. He had recently taken away Bridget's phone, so he assumed she had taken his when she went out. Robert repeatedly called his cell phone and searched the internet for its GPS location. He gave up waiting for her to return after being unable to contact her or locate the phone. The next day, he called several of Bridget's friends, but none of them knew where she was. Later that evening, April 3, he read on the internet about a body discovered nearby and began to suspect it was Bridget. He therefore decided to contact the police. Thus, based on Robert's information, investigators had their first potential suspect, Bridget's friend, Kendall Sudo. But Robert Frisbee didn't think Kendall could hurt Bridget. He claimed that only one person could have personal motivations to harm her, Bridget's ex-boyfriend, Jonathan Larson, with whom she had a complicated relationship, became the second potential suspect. Bridget's boyfriend, Zach Richards, was also considered a suspect by investigators. They needed to know what these three people were doing and where they were during the crime. The first person investigators decided to speak with was Bridget's friend, Kendall Suto, who was at Frisbee's house and may have been the last person to see her alive. Kendall had no prior issues with the law. When the police called, he agreed to meet with them. During a conversation with detectives, he admitted to watching TV with Bridget on the night she died. However, Kendall allegedly left Frisbee's house shortly after Bridget's father went to bed. He denied involvement in Bridget's death, claiming they were friends, and he had no reason to harm her. The man was prepared to provide the investigators with any assistance they required. He mentioned it while he and Bridget were watching television. 
She was upset due to a disagreement with her ex-boyfriend Jonathan Larson. They were together for several months, but the relationship was troubled and they eventually split up. Investigators checked Kendall's alibi, which appeared to be confirmed. Nonetheless, he was not removed from the suspect list because the case was still unclear. Next, the investigators decided to approach Jonathan Larson, whose name they had already heard from several people, in the hopes of catching him off guard. They showed up at his house without warning. However, they were not expecting a pleasant surprise. The house was empty. Larson's family apparently left the house quickly. The most surprising thing, however, was what the investigators discovered outside the windows. The front door and walls were bullet ridden, as was revealed three weeks prior to the police visit. Someone fired all of those bullets at Larson's family home in a drive-by shooting. The police department investigating the murders was unaware of the shooting because no one was injured. When someone shot the house, the owner called the police, but the case remained unsolved. The police only had shell casings and bullets, but they had no idea who was responsible for them. After interviewing the neighbors, the investigators discovered that the next day after the drive, they shot Larson and fled because they felt unsafe. Detectives were now investigating whether Bridget Frisbee's death and the shooting at her ex-boyfriend's house were connected. Let me remind you that Bridget's body was discovered on April 3, 2011, and the drive-by shooting happened three weeks ago. On March 14, Jonathan Larson was identified as the primary suspect, so the police began searching for him. During the investigation, police went to Bridget Frisbee and Jonathan Larson's school. The school administration stated that Jonathan had not attended school in several days. When they couldn't find Jonathan, they decided to speak with Bridget's classmates. They wanted to know who she was feuding with, who might wish her harm, and if she had any enemies. Alexander Olivieri was among those with whom the investigators spoke. He claimed that he and Bridget were friends who frequently spent time together. Alexander claimed that Jonathan Larson was the only one with a motive to harm Bridget. When the investigators asked Alexander about the last time he saw Bridget, he stated that they were supposed to meet on the night she died. They agreed to meet at her house, then traveled to Houston together to pick up Bridget's boyfriend, Zach Richards, at the bus stop. Alexander stated that he arrived at Frisbee's house with his friend Alan Perez, but Bridget was not present. She was supposed to be waiting for him on the street near the house, but she was nowhere to be found. Alexandra Olivieri stated that he and Alan Perez returned to Frisbee's house a few hours later, but Bridget was still not present. According to him, it was around 5 a.m. No wonder Bridget was not at home. She had already died by that time. Olivieri stated that he learned about Bridget's death from a news report. After visiting the school, the investigators added two new names to their list of potential suspects. Alexander Olivieri and Alan Perez. However, the main person of interest in the investigation remained the same, Bridget's ex-boyfriend, Jonathan Larson. Detectives discovered that Jonathan's mother did not leave the city following the drive, by shooting. She lived in a friend's apartment for a while. During a conversation with investigators, she stated that she sent her son to live with relatives in Austin, Texas. Following the incident, the woman stated that her son frequently got into trouble and she was certain that their house had become bullet, ridden as a result of him. That incident, she believed, was a form of vengeance against her son. She also claimed Jonathan fought with another man shortly before the drive-by shooting. She was certain there was a connection between the fight and the shooting at their house. The woman's relationship with her son was not ideal. She had no idea where Jonathan was at the time of Bridget Frisbee's death. She gave officers the address of her relatives in Austin where she claimed Jonathan was supposed to be. However, the case's breakthrough came before the investigators discovered Jonathan. A lawyer representing the Perez family approached the police. He stated that his client, Alan Perez, has important information regarding Bridget Frisbee's death. When the investigators spoke with Bridget's classmate, Alexander Olivieri, they learned the name Alan Perez. The latter then stated that he came to Frisbee's house with Alan Perez. Alan was now prepared to share important information but only under certain conditions. He was willing to discuss Bridget's death in exchange for an immunity agreement. The authorities needed answers, so they accepted this condition. Alan Perez claimed that the drive-by shooting at Jonathan Larson's house was linked to Bridget Frisbee's death. This shooting occurred just one week after Jonathan and Bridget split up. Alexander Olivier Airy, 17, whom investigators had previously spoken with at school, 
assisted Bridget in exacting revenge on Jonathan and firing the shots at the house. Therese and Olivieri met in high school. They joined the National Guard together. But when Olivieri returned from basic training, he began attending a new school. According to Perez, Bridget was one of Olivieri's new friends at his new school. Perez testified that Bridget had been bragging about participating in a drive-by shooting with a friend and that Olivieri later told Perez that he was the shooter. Specifically, Olivieri told Perez that Bridget drove and he shot at her ex-boyfriend's house with his Hugo semi-automatic rifle. Perez testified that Olivieri approached him for a favor on the evening of April 2, 2011. Olivieri explained that he wanted to punish Bridget for informing friends about the drive. Bye. He wanted Perez as a backup. Olivieri told Perez to bring a weapon. Perez arrived carrying a 380 caliber pistol and dressed in a green military uniform, mask, and gloves. Olivieri carried a 9mm Beretta pistol in a shoulder holster beneath his jacket. According to Perez, they arrived at Olivieri's house after midnight. Olivieri then called Bridget and asked her to accompany him to pick up her boyfriend, Zach Richards, from the bus station. Bridget declined, citing her busy schedule. Olivieri went to Bridget's house and instructed Perez to hide under a blanket in the back of his Suburban. Olivieri informed Perez that he wanted to get Bridget into his car. That's why Perez had to sit under the covers and remain silent. Perez was supposed to follow them from a distance once they arrived at their destination and exited the vehicle. Bridget was leaving on her four-wheeler to meet friends when they arrived at her house, so they left. They went looking for her again a little later, and they found her pushing her four-wheeler because it had run out of fuel. Olivieri requested her assistance in locating a cache of random items. She initially declined, but he eventually persuaded her to go with him. Bridget parked her four-wheeler and got into the passenger seat of the Olivieri Suburban. Perez was still hiding in the back of the car, under blankets. Olivieri returned to the same neighborhood where he and Bridget had conducted the drive by shooting. They got out of their car. Perez waited a minute before following them. Perez spotted Olivieri carrying a shovel and leading Bridget with a flashlight. Olivieri pointed out a spot and instructed Bridget to begin digging. As she bent over to dig, Perez noticed Olivieri reaching into his jacket, pull out his gun, place it against the back of Bridget's neck and fire. Perez testified that he was shocked because he expected Olivieri to threaten her with the gun, but he had just shot her. Olivieri ran towards Perez, who cursed at him for a while. Olivieri told Perez to shut up and run towards the car while he got his shovel, flashlight, and Bridget's cell phone. Then they left the crime scene and drove to Perez's house, before they reached their destination. They smashed Bridget's phone with a shovel before hitting it. After this, they drove home to Olivieri. They moved everything from the Suburban into Alexander's room. According to Perez, he and Olivieri arrived at the bus station around 4 a.m. to pick up Bridget's boyfriend, Zach Richards. Perez invited Richards to spend the night at his house. So the three of them drove to Perez's home and went to bed. They told Richards nothing about the crime. Olivieri informed Perez that they needed to be each other's alibis when questioned by police. Perez had to explain that he stayed at Olivieri's house, hung out, watched a movie, and then they went to pick up Richards together. Alexander Olivier persuaded him that saying the same thing and providing each other with an alibi would not put them in danger. Olivieri also told Perez that he was going to get rid of the gun he used to kill Bridget. Bridget was upset because Jonathan Larson, with whom she was in a relationship, cheated on her. Olivieri offered to exact revenge on him by shooting at his home. However, he had not anticipated what would happen next. Bridget failed to keep the drive a secret, which concerned Olivieri. This incident may put an end to his plans. He wanted to be a military man, but now his dream was hanging by a thread. That's why he went to great lengths to keep Bridget quiet. He decided that the only way out of this situation was for Bridget Frisbee to die. During the investigation, the police heard the name of Bridget's boyfriend, Zach Richards, several times. So they decided to speak with him. They wanted to know whether Richards would confirm Alan Perez's testimony, or if the latter was attempting to absolve himself of responsibility. The situation seemed perplexing. Bridget's boyfriend Richards testified that in March 2011, Alexander Olivier Airy said he was going to deal with something, grabbed his AUK-47 and left with Bridget in her car. Later, Olivieri told Richards that he shot at Bridget's ex-boyfriend's house from her car as she drove by. Olivieri told Richards that he participated in the drive, 
by as a favor to Bridget and simply because he could. Richards testified that Bridget continued to brag about the shooting, and Olivieri confronted her and told her to stop telling people. On April 3, 2011, Olivieri agreed to drive Bridget to the Houston bus station to pick up Richards around 1 a.m. When Olivieri did not show up, Richards took a ride to Denny's and finally called Olivieri at around 2.30 or 3 a.m. Olivieri informed him that he was at home but would come pick him up. Alexander finally arrived several hours late, and Perez accompanied him. When Richards inquired about Bridget Olivieri, he stated that he attempted to contact her and visited her house, but she was not there. Richards stated that he went to Bridget's house after sleeping for a few hours. Her father answered the door and explained that Bridget had been out all night, and he had no idea where she was. Richards spent the next few days attempting to locate her through friends before learning of her body's discovery. Richards told the investigators that he had previously visited the woods, which have now become a crime scene, with Bridget and Olivier. According to him, Olivieri was familiar with this area, and it was not unusual for him to carry a weapon at all times. Thus, everything pointed to Alexander Olivieri being responsible for Bridget Frisbee's death. Four days after her death, police issued an arrest warrant for Olivieri. Given that the suspect possessed a variety of weapons and was proficient in their use, the police requested assistance from SWAT teams in apprehending him. After the surveillance team confirmed that Alexander Olivier was at home, the SWAT team began their work. Fortunately, they did not have to use weapons, and Olivier surrendered without resistance. He was calm and emotionless. He understood why he was arrested, but he denied having any involvement in Bridget Frisbee's death. Alexander's father, Samuel Olivieri, agreed to a search of the house and car. The police discovered neither the AK-47 nor the Beretta, but they did find an instruction manual for a 9mm Beretta pistol. It matched the shell casing discovered at the crime scene. In Olivia Rivery, police discovered a blanket, a shovel, a rifle, and shotgun shell casings, as well as trace evidence samples such as fibers from the passenger seat and floorboard. Ballistics testing revealed that the shell casing from the Suburban match was recovered during the drive by shooting at Larson's home. Fibers lifted from the car's passenger seat matched Bridget's new Rave Fox fur outfit, which she was wearing when her father last saw her on the night of April 2. During his trial, Alexander Olivieri claimed that he did not see Bridget on the night she was killed. Olivieri's defense claimed that fibers discovered in their client's car matched the fibers of Bridget's new Rave Faux outfit and arrived there a few weeks before her death, but this theory was rejected. During the trial, Robert Frisbee provided a credit card statement that showed Bridget's outfit was purchased on April 2, 2011. She died several hours later. It showed that Bridget was undoubtedly in Olivieri's car before her death implying that he was lying when he claimed he hadn't seen her that night. The court saw a video posted on YouTube in 2010. Approximately a year before Bridget died, it was called Me and My Beretta 9mm. It shows Alexander Olivieri firing a variety of firearms, including a Beretta pistol. Alan Perez testified at the trial that the video showed the same gun that Olivieri used to kill Bridget. On August 1, 2012, the court sentenced Alexander Olivieri to 60 years in prison. He will be eligible for parole in 30 years, but Robert Frisbee believes Olivieri will be imprisoned for at least 50 years. It is critical that this man be removed from the streets and remain so for the rest of his life. Robert Frisbee stated that after spending so many years in a small cell, he will be a broken man when he gets out. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On an ordinary November day in 2003, a chilling mystery began to play out in the peaceful town of Grand Forks, North Dakota. Druce Joden, a vibrant young woman known for her compassion and community service, went missing after leaving Victoria's Secret. What followed was a harrowing journey through cryptic phone calls, shocking revelations, and a never-ending pursuit of truth and justice. Drew, a vibrant and ambitious 22-year-old, had deep roots in the town. She worked part-time at Victoria's Secret while attending the University of North Dakota and majoring in visual arts. Drew, however, was much more than her academics and work. She was a unique combination of creativity and compassion. Her passion for art knew no bounds, and she expressed herself in a variety of ways. 
from sketching to painting to capturing the world's beauty with her lens. However, it was her unwavering commitment to assisting others that truly distinguished her. Drew, affectionately known as Doodles in her younger years, had a heart as big as her dreams. She was an athlete who enjoyed volleyball and golf, but her volunteer work exemplified her exceptional spirit. She devoted her time to underprivileged children, organizing bowling parties and teaching them the joys of reading. She also focused her efforts on fundraising for organizations such as the American Diabetes Association, leaving an indelible impression on her community. On Saturday, November 22, Drew finished her shift at Victoria's Secret at 4 p.m. Her vibrant spirit has not diminished. Little did she know that her workplace, a stepping stone to her dreams, would soon become the setting for an unfolding mystery. Drew had her sights set on an upcoming adventure, a trip to Australia in the spring of 2000, and each paycheck brought her closer to achieving her goal. As the clock struck 5 p.m., Drew exited the mall, carrying a purse she'd found, and began walking towards her car. It appeared to be a normal end to the day, but fate had other plans. Unbeknownst to her, the next few moments would be shrouded in mystery, triggering a chain of events that would captivate an entire community. As Drew approached her car, she had no idea that her life was about to take a terrifying turn into the unknown. She was scheduled to work that evening, but when she didn't show up, her friends and colleagues became concerned. It was unusual for Drew to miss work without notice, and her absence raised concerns. Drew's boyfriend, Chris Lange, was one of the first to notice that something was wrong. He stated to the police that he had not seen her that afternoon, but he did receive a phone call from her shortly after she left the mall at 5 p.m. The conversation ended abruptly, leaving him with a strange feeling. In the background, he heard Drew say the words, okay, I understand. Then the call was abruptly disconnected. At the time, he dismissed it as a dropped call. But as the evening turned into night and there was still no sign of Drew, worry turned to fear at 7, 42 p.m. The same night, Chris received another call from her phone. This time, he only heard static and the sound of someone fumbling with the phone's buttons. It was far from reassuring. The alarms rang louder and the police took action. They started searching the parking lot where Drew's car was still parked outside the mall. What they discovered sent chills down their spines. A knife sheath was discovered beside her car. The ominous prospect of an abduction loomed large. Desperation grew and the police contacted Drew's phone service provider in the hopes of getting a lead. The information they received was both perplexing and disturbing. Drew's phone had pinged off a cell tower near Crookston, Minnesota, indicating she had been transported across state lines. Drew's normal day had turned into a perplexing and ominous mystery. The search for Drew, led by volunteers and law enforcement, demonstrated the community's unwavering determination. The fields and forests were scoured. Every lead was diligently pursued. However, the young woman remained elusive. Three days after her disappearance, a chilling discovery shook the investigation to its core. One of Drew's shoes was discovered along a bypass road near Crookston, Minnesota. The fact that she was so close to where her phone had last pinged added to her sense of unease. It was a cruel reminder that Drew had been in this area, and the circumstances surrounding her disappearance became increasingly mysterious. The atmosphere in Grand Forks became heavier with each passing day. Hope was still present, but it was fragile, like a flickering candle in the growing darkness. Drew's family, friends, and the entire community held on to the hope that she would be found safe and sound. However, it was during this period that the investigation took a dark and disturbing turn. The police received a tip from a concerned citizen who directed them to a man named Alfonso Rodriguez Jr., who lived in the area and was in Grand Forks on the day Drew went missing. Alfonso Rodriguez Jr.'s background sent shockwaves throughout law enforcement. He had been released from prison only six months before and was living with his mother in Crookston. Even more concerning was his classification as a level three sex offender, the most dangerous category with a chilling history of 23 years in prison for multiple rapes and an attempted rape. The police immediately contacted Alfonso. He admitted to being in Grand Forks on November 22nd and even claimed to have visited the same mall where Drew worked. However, when pressed, his story began to unravel. When questioned about the movie Once Upon a Time in Mexico, which he claimed to have seen in the mall theater, the theater records and local listings contradicted his account. There had been no screenings of the film in Grand Forks that day.
Suspicion grew, but the evidence discovered in his possession sent shockwaves through the investigation. When the police searched his 2002 Mercury Sable, they discovered a knife concealed in the trunk. Even more incriminating, they discovered blood traces on the car's rear window, and DNA testing proved conclusive. It was a match to Drew's DNA. The evidence against Alfonso was overwhelming, but the most haunting truth remained. The location of Drew Jodan. Despite the chilling evidence against Alfonso Rodriguez, Jr., Nigma Alfonso was arrested and continued to deny responsibility for Drew's disappearance. Several months later, on April 17, 2004, a tragic event occurred when Drew's lifeless body was discovered in a drainage ditch near Crookston. The bleak scene revealed Drew partially naked from the waist down, her hands cruelly bound behind her back, and her lifeless body lying face down. The area where her body was discovered had previously been searched, but it remained hidden under the snow until the thaw revealed the horrific truth. Disturbingly, there were signs of brutality or rope, as well as remnants of a plastic grocery bag around her neck. The autopsy performed on Drew's body sought to determine the exact cause of her death. The findings suggested that she died as a result of asphyxiation or suffocation caused by the slash wound to her neck or exposure to the harsh elements. The fact that Alfonso was accused of transporting Drew across state lines prior to her tragic death added to the gravity of the crime. As a result, he faced federal charges, allowing the prosecution to consider seeking the death penalty, which they made abundantly clear. Throughout the trial, the prosecution maintained that there was no room for doubt. Drew was kidnapped outside the mall, transported across state lines, and eventually murdered. They also expressed their belief that she had been violated. The jury was presented with compelling evidence, including a knife found in Alfonso's car and a knife sheath discovered near Drew's vehicle. DNA analysis linked Alfonso to the crime, as did the recovery of hair and fiber samples from Drew's body and belongings. Dr. Michael McGee, the medical examiner, was an important figure in the courtroom drama. He testified about Drew's injuries and the circumstances of her death. He identified significant cuts on her neck as the likely cause of her death, though he couldn't rule out suffocation or exposure, Dr. McGee's expert opinion, based on his extensive experience and thousands of autopsies, suggested that Drew died violently during the assault. The condition of her clothing, particularly a torn pink sweater and displaced peacoat, indicated a struggle. The defense's perspective differed significantly from the prosecution's. Alfonso had offered to plead guilty in order to avoid the death penalty, but this was declined. The main point of contention was whether Drew was raped, as well as the critical question of where she died. The latter would decide whether to impose the death penalty. The defense claimed that there was insufficient evidence to support a rape allegation and that Drew died from suffocation mere minutes after being abducted. Alfonso was eventually found guilty in federal court of kidnapping, which resulted in Drew's death. After considering both sides' arguments, the jury unanimously recommended the death penalty, marking a historic decision for North Dakota, which had not seen a death sentence in nearly a century. Because the death penalty is illegal in the state, it is only considered in federal cases. The sentencing was a difficult moment for Judge Ralph R. Erickson, who acknowledged the gravity of the situation, saying it was the worst day of his life. Alfonso and his attorneys immediately requested a new trial, which was denied. They appealed and asked for a stay of execution until the appeal was heard. In 2020, one Ralph R. Erickson, the same judge who sentenced Rodriguez to death, overturned his sentence and ordered a new sentencing phase due to misleading testimony from a medical examiner and limitations on mental health evidence. Michael McGee, the Ramsey County medical examiner testified in court in an untrustworthy, misleading, and inaccurate manner, and Rodriguez's attorneys did him a disservice by limiting Rodriguez's mental health evaluation, which could have resulted in their client using the insanity defense. On March 14, 2023, prosecutors announced that they would no longer seek the death penalty for Rodriguez, who had been sentenced to life without parole on May 18, 2023. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On Friday, June 9, 2017, Ying Jing Zhang, 
a 26-year-old from Nanping, China, was on his way to meet with the manager of an apartment complex to inspect a prospective residence. Having recently relocated to the United States in April 2017 to pursue further education, this marked a significant transition for Ying Ying Zhang. She had never been to the United States or traveled outside of China before. In her home country, she lived with her parents and younger brother, and she meticulously planned her life, including an engagement and plans for an October 2017 wedding when she returned to China. Yang Yingjing's trip to the United States was inspired by an invitation from the University of Illinois, where she had previously earned a degree in China. The university invited her to visit as a scholar to continue her crop science research with a focus on photosynthesis in soybeans and corn. Her long-term goals included earning a doctorate and returning to China to teach. Yang Ying moved into an on-campus apartment at the University of Illinois and lived independently at first. However, she planned to move to a different apartment on the opposite side of campus in order to get a lower rent and possibly find a roommate. The timing for apartment hunting was ideal, as many students were in the process of relocating, with some having finished their classes and others returning home for the summer vacation. As a result, by June 9, only a few students remained on campus. Yin Jing Zhang spent the morning working before returning to her apartment for lunch. She had planned to meet with Ron Treadstone, the marketing manager for the One North apartment block, around 1.30 p.m. to secure a new residence. Ying Jing Zhang texted Ron Treadstone about a delay and said she'd meet him at 2.10 p.m. Five minutes later, she left her apartment and boarded the Tuline Miti bus. Because she did not drive, she chose to take the bus from the south to the north side of campus. The bus route took her from the orchard to her on-campus residence at Springfield and Matthew Streets. Yin Jiang Zhang disembarked there with the intention of connecting to the 22 Limited, which would take her to the north. However, when she got off the bus, she found herself on the north side of Springfield rather than the south side, where the connecting bus was located. Consequently, she missed the connection. Even though I waved and ran after the bus, it did not stop. She chased it to the next block, but her efforts were futile. Yin Jing Zhang then proceeded to the next bus stop, Clark and Goodwin Avenue, to wait for the next bus. At 2, 10 p.m., Ron Treadstone waited for Ying Jing Zhang, but she did not arrive. Concerned, he tried to contact her, but got no response. Later that day, her professors attempted to locate her without success. Eventually, Professor Guan reported Ying Ying Zhang as missing to the police. Following the last sighting of hangings on campus, police collected CTV footage from the surrounding area. The video shows Yang Yang running after the bus and later waiting at the bus stop. However, before she could board the bus, she got into a black Saturn Astra that had pulled up alongside her. The driver's identity remained unknown as the license plate number was not visible in the footage. However, Investigators discovered that only 26 cars of that specific model were registered in Champaign County, and only 18 of those were hatchbacks, which matched the car scene captured on Cux TV. This reduced the number of people the police could track down the following Monday. Three days after Yang Ying's last known appearance, police began contacting the owners of the identified vehicles. One of the people they interviewed was Brent Allen Christensen, a 29-year-old who lived with his wife, Michelle Zickerman, Brent had previously attended the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point and the University of Wisconsin at Madison before being admitted to the University of Illinois' doctoral program in physics. During questioning, Brent informed the police that his wife was away on the weekend of June 9 when asked about his whereabouts between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. and 3 p.m. on that Friday. He claimed he could not remember. Brent willingly gave the police permission to search his car and apartment, which yielded nothing. The police ended their search and left. As the FBI and local police intensified their search for Ying Jing Zhang, a critical discovery was made while reviewing CTV footage from the incident. They discovered a flaw in the front hubcap of a black Saturn Astra that matched the description of Brent's car, which they also remembered having a sunroof, acting on this information. They obtained a warrant on Wednesday, June 14th, and seized Brent's vehicle and computer. Brent volunteered to accompany them to the police station as part of the investigation. During questioning at the station, Brent initially claimed to have spent the entire day playing video games on that particular Friday. However, the FBI confronted him with evidence indicating that he had picked up a girl. Brent's demeanor changed visibly, and he began shaking. 
He then admitted that he may have confused the days, but insisted that if he did pick up a girl, it wasn't Yang Zhang Zhang. According to Brent, the girl he gave a ride to appeared distressed, spoke in broken English, and asked for transportation to a location a few blocks north of where they were. Brent claimed that after making a wrong turn, the girl panicked and exited the car, and he had no idea where she was afterwards. A search of Brent's apartment uncovered three stains on his mattress, and further investigation with Luminol revealed an additional stain on a baseball bat. These items were sent for DNA testing, which revealed that, despite her marriage to Michelle Brent, she had a girlfriend named Tara Bullis. Law enforcement asked Tara to record Brent, and based on that recording and the evidence gathered during the apartment search, Brent was charged with kidnapping, which resulted in Yang Jiang's death, as well as making false statements to the FBI. Despite the FBI's belief that Yin Ying Zhang had to meet her fate, her remains remained undiscovered at the time, until December 2016. The prosecution portrayed Brent as a highly intelligent and accomplished individual. When they argued, he began living a double life. According to their argument, Brent developed an unsettling obsession with serial killers, particularly Ted Bundy, around that time. They specifically mentioned his interest in the novel American Psycho, which features a protagonist who lives a double life as a serial killer. The prosecution claimed that Brent's descent into criminal planning began in the spring of 2017. They presented evidence from his phone searches, which included queries about serial killers and downloads of images of women in bondage. Brent was discovered to have visited websites about kidnapping, abduction, and consensual abductions. The prosecution claims that by June 9, Brent's marriage had completely disintegrated. He had abandoned his doctoral studies and was struggling with heavy drinking and prescription drug use. The jury was informed about his troubled marriage, which led Brent and Michelle to opt for an open relationship, with each having their own romantic interests. In March 2017, Brent sought counseling for the dissolution of his marriage. During this session, he admitted to having dark and troubling thoughts, including plans to abduct and kill someone. While acknowledging that these thoughts were more like plans, he claimed to have moved on from them. The prosecution argued that Brad's story about overcoming his dark thoughts was fabricated. Instead, they claimed that on June 9, he actively pursued making his fantasies a reality. According to their case, Michael left her apartment early that morning to spend the weekend with her boyfriend, providing an opportunity for Brent to carry out his plans. Before 8 a.m., Brent stopped by the Schnucks grocery store near his apartment and bought a bottle of Admiral Nelson's spiced rum. Around 9.30 a.m., Brent approaches Emily Hogan, a graduate student near a campus bus stop. He claimed to be an undercover cop, showed her his badge, and asked her to answer a few questions. When he asked her to get into his car, she declined because she felt suspicious. Emily reported the incident to the police and issued a warning on Facebook, warning other students to be wary of a man impersonating a police officer. Or later, at 1.30 p.m., Brendan drove around campus once more. I saw Yin Jing Zhang running after the bus while driving in the opposite direction. He turned around and pulled up alongside her at the bus stop, yanking Zhang into the car, and she was never seen again. Notably, Yang Ying Ying phone was disabled at 2.28 p.m., highlighting the gravity of the situation. The court heard chilling details as Brent recounted the horrifying events surrounding his disappearance while being recorded by his girlfriend Tara during a memorial walk for Yin Jing Zhang on June 29. Despite being questioned by authorities after Ying Jing Zhang was reported missing, Brent attended the memorial walk in terror and unintentionally shared the shocking account during their conversation. In the recorded conversation, Brent described Yang Ying Zhang's fierce struggle for her life, describing her refusal to surrender as valiant and almost supernatural. He went on to describe the horrific sequence of events, revealing that he kidnapped Ying Jing Zhang, bowed her hands, and led her to his apartment and bedroom, where he sexually assaulted her. Disturbingly, he described how he became bored with the initial actions and strangled her for an agonizing 10 minutes. Brent went on to explain that he used a baseball bat to deliver a devastating blow to Yang Ying head, striking her as hard as he could. He then carried her into the bathroom and placed her in the bathtub. In a grisly turn of events, Brent revealed that he stabbed Ying Jing Zhang, who attempted to defend herself by grasping the knife. He killed her with the same knife. The court proceedings revealed more disturbing details, including the fact that Brent meticulously cleaned the apartment after committing the heinous act against Ying Jing Zhang. 
On Sunday, June 11th, he purchased cleaning supplies such as Drano and Swiffer pads in an attempt to erase any traces of the crime. He disposed of her hanging belongings, including her clothes and backpack, and continued to tell Tara that she was missing and would never be found. In the recorded conversation, Brent shockingly claimed that Yin Jiang Zhang was not his first victim, claiming that he started killing women at the age of 19 and that she was his 13th victim. However, despite police and FBI investigations, no evidence supporting Brent's claim of previous killings was discovered. Despite Brent's efforts to thoroughly clean the apartment, a forensic examination revealed traces of Yang Yang blood on a variety of surfaces, including the mattress, baseball bat bed, baseboard drywall, and underneath the bedroom carpet. The prosecution urged the jury to convict Brent of seeking the death penalty. They claimed that his actions, combined with his revealed thoughts during counseling, the recorded conversation with Terror, and his activities on the website FetLife, where he detailed plans for abduction and assault, constituted a premeditated kidnapping. Notably, just three days before Ying Yang Zhang went missing, Brent ordered a large green duffel bag from Amazon, and it was delivered to his apartment. The defense's argument revolved around the admission that Brent was responsible for Yang Ying Zhang's death, which they stated clearly in their opening statement. However, they argued that the prosecution's case did not provide a complete picture of the events or Brent's mental state. Their goal was to present a more complete picture to the jury during the trial, emphasizing Brent's life was at stake and arguing against the death penalty. The defense focused on Brent's mental state, urging the jury to consider it during their deliberations. They informed the jury that Brent was heavily involved in alcohol and Vicatan use, and that he was dealing with dark thoughts. They emphasized his academic decline, which ranged from receiving top grades in the first three semesters of university to failing all subjects in the fourth. His personal life was in disarray, with his beloved wife Michelle filing for divorce after meeting someone else, Ryan Vela. During the trial, the defense revealed that Michelle was Brent's only confidant when they moved to Champagne. They revealed that Michelle had given Brent an ultimatum to stop drinking or face her departure. In response, Brent sought counseling right away, motivated by the prospect of losing his wife. During the counseling sessions, he admitted that alcohol and prohibited substances had a negative impact on his life, leading to negative thoughts about himself and others. The defense also mentioned Brent's participation in a counseling session on March 30, which resulted in a referral to a local addiction treatment center. During the trial, Brent's family and friends described him as a highly intelligent individual with a bright future. However, over the course of a few months, his life changed dramatically and he frequently expressed feelings of failure. The defense emphasized his mental health issues. Although the mental illness defense was eventually dropped before the trial began, the defense made a passionate appeal to the jury, imploring them to recognize that the Yang Ying murder, while unquestionably horrific, was only one tragic incident in Brent's otherwise bright and promising life. They asked the jury to spare his life. Although the jury convicted Brent of kidnapping and making false statements to the FBI, they were unable to reach a unanimous decision on the death penalty. As a result, he was sentenced to life in federal prison with no possibility of parole. The Yinjing family was deeply distressed by the circumstances surrounding the trial. Not only did they deal with the disappearance of their only daughter, who was brutally assaulted, raped, and murdered away from home, but the agony continued as her remains remained undiscovered. Her mother, Liang Yai, confronted Brent at a pre-trial hearing, demanding that he reveal what he had done to her daughter. However, Brent refused to share any information. Liang Yai found the emotional weight of the situation to be overwhelming, and she was unable to attend the trial on a regular basis. Following Brent's sentencing, as the family stood outside the court, Liang Yai struggled to stand unaided and needed assistance from a relative. The brutality inflicted on her daughter and their family had a huge toll and the grief was palpable. All the Ying Ying family wanted was to find her and bring her back to China. In November 2018, Brent admitted to putting hanging dismembered bodies in three garbage bags and dumping them in the dumpster outside his apartment. Unfortunately, the dumpster's contents were collected and transported to a landfill in Vermilion County. The sheer scale of the search makes it highly unlikely that her remains will ever be discovered. The area is approximately 50 yards wide and has at least 30 feet of garbage. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more.
In November 1997, the Nists of Trenton, New Jersey, were preparing for their annual cruise, a tradition they had enjoyed since their wedding six years earlier. Julie, 29, and her husband Tim, 40, decided to change things up this year. Their main goal for their Christmas voyage was to strengthen their bond, so they left their one-year-old daughter Katie with grandparents and traveled to San Juan, Puerto Rico. On November 1st, as they boarded their cruise ship, George Skiadopoulos, a crew member, was struck by Julie's vibrant and attractive presence. A colleague teased him, saying he was out of his league. George bet he could romantically engage with Julie. George, a 22-year-old junior engineer fresh out of college, carried himself with enough poise to pique Julie's interest. He misrepresented himself as the captain, exaggerating his age to 28 and making up achievements to impress her. Julie and George quickly became close, meeting on deck every day and engaging in captivating conversations. Julie, enthralled by the cruise's romantic atmosphere and George's captivating stories, was unaware of his true identity. Tim, who was used to his wife's sociable nature, observed their interactions but felt no jealousy. One evening, during a lively party on the ship, George invited Julie on a tour of the ship. She initially hesitated, but eventually agreed. In the deserted engine room, a spark ignited between them, resulting in a kiss. However, their relationship did not go beyond kissing. Julie confided in a family friend, Tony, about her feelings during the cruise back home, expecting her attraction to fade because she and George would most likely never meet again. Unexpectedly, George, the captain, sent Julie a message, and their daily phone conversations began, with George insinuating that Tim was unworthy of her. Tim occasionally overheard them conversing but trusted Julie enough not to investigate further. Julie, torn between her stable family life and the thrilling new emotions George elicited in her, became distant from friends and even cold to her daughter. Tim was concerned about the changes in her and hoped to rekindle their relationship. Tim organized a surprise 30th birthday party for Julie on January 3, 1998. It was a lavish event attended by numerous friends. Julie's request for another cruise on a specific ship and date was an attempt to reunite with Georgia. Tim reluctantly agreed, and they embarked on February 13th. On that voyage during a dark night, George won a bet with his crewmates. Julie's intimate encounter with George on the cruise had her head over heels. Back home, she excitedly confided in Tony, a close family friend and Katie's godfather. Tony struggled with the burden of keeping her secret, eventually admitting it to Julie, despite the risk of exposure. Julie decided to meet George in secret, for whom she had a strong desire. She made up a story about a family vacation and invited her mother and daughter along. Julie had to confess her secret affair to her mother, despite her disapproval, but she remained undeterred. Initially, they traveled to Florida, but on March 26, 1988, Julie left her mother and daughter behind to continue her romantic adventure with George in Puerto Rico. When Julie returned, her conversations with George became almost public. They talked constantly on the phone and sent risky love letters via email. Julie even recorded videos showcasing her life for George, all while living and spending money with her husband, Tim. She also resumed partying and drinking. Tim couldn't help but notice the changes in their family dynamics and suggested they consult a marriage counselor. Julie announced her desire for a divorce during their first session after seven years of marriage, which Tim opposed because their shared business interests were generating significant income. Julie knew she needed money for her plan to relocate to Greece with her daughter and begin a new life with her lover, who was scheduled to serve a mandatory 20-month military service there. Julie tried to help him flee and get a U.S. visa, but she didn't have enough money for her new boyfriend. Julie started a fitness regimen, but she had trouble sleeping and had to take strong sleeping pills. During her emotional turmoil, she began taking antidepressants. When George learned about this, he was furious and forbade her from using them. Julie lost about 10 kilo with the intention of returning to modeling to earn money, but George, unlike Tim, was extremely jealous and opposed the idea forcing Julie to abandon her plans. Almost everyone, including Cheryl, who once helped Julie break into the modeling industry, disapproved of her relationship with the Greek man. 
They had followed Julie and Tim's lives since they met at an exclusive yacht club party. In July 1989, Tim, her 11-year-old senior, was a successful businessman with his own company and a new yacht. He founded his landscape design firm in the early 1980s, which grew alongside the U.S. real estate market, boom. Initially, their relationship thrived, but Julie's jealousy became apparent when Tim waited for her at a bar with another woman. When Julie arrived, she assaulted Tim, leaving a bruise on his face and attacking the woman. It turned out she was Tim's longtime business partner's secretary. The conflict was resolved at that point. Tim was taken aback one day when he arrived at his office and found Julie sitting at his secretary's desk, smiling charmingly. She announced that the former employee would no longer be working there, effectively taking over her boyfriend's job and leaving him little choice but to accept her as his new assistant. This enabled her to work from home, giving her more financial flexibility. Julie had always wanted to be a model. One day, she saw a beauty contest advertisement in the newspaper and decided to enter, confident that she would win and supported by her loving partner, Tim. They compiled Julie's best photos and sent them to the magazine that organized the contest. However, the publishers used a scam to obtain free photos for their men's section at the back of the magazine. Julie eagerly awaited the publisher's response to the contest, but it never arrived. Determined, she went to the magazine office and confronted the editor about her prize. He accepted her photographs and promised to include them in the next issue. Julie told this story to everyone preparing for the competition. The event was held at an elite hotel and featured 12 finalists, including Julie. Despite her efforts, only one judge supported her. However, this experience helped her become friends with the magazine editor Cheryl, which led to Julie becoming the magazine's face and appearing on billboards throughout the city. Julie began receiving modeling offers as her fame grew, and she soon became a local celebrity. Until the autumn of 1990, she continued to work for Tim and won some smaller beauty contests, but struggled on the bigger stage. Julie and Tim, both 23 at the time, decided to marry on November 16, 1991. The couple lived an active life without any restrictions. Julie's modeling career was thriving by 1997, increasing her earnings. She began appearing on television, but soon began abusing alcohol. Their marriage had its ups and downs, but they were generally compatible and loving. Tim wanted children, and they were financially secure enough. Julie refused to put her modeling career at risk in order to provide for a child. Julie became pregnant in February 1995. Her friends claimed she continued to drink and smoke during her pregnancy. On November 26, 1996, the Nist family welcomed a daughter, Katie Scarlett. Becoming a mother had a profound impact on Julie. She embraced her new position. During this time, Katie's mother, Julia, actively assisted with her upbringing though they frequently disagreed on parenting strategies. Julie quickly developed postpartum depression, which was caused in part by the significant changes in her figure that occurred after pregnancy. She retreated into herself, not attempting to revert to her previous state. Around this time, her relationship with Tim started to deteriorate. In April 1997, they sought family therapy. Julie believed the therapist sided with Tim, but the specialist genuinely attempted to address her issues and complexes, revealing positive aspects of her past. The therapist eventually stated that Tim was not paying enough attention to his wife, which was putting their marriage at risk. Julie, who was lonely, began spending more time with her friends and frequently returned home intoxicated. Tim decided to take Julie on a cruise during this difficult time, following the advice of the family therapist in the hopes of rekindling the warmth and passion in their relationship. However, his hopes were dashed as Julie's newfound passion for another man wreaked havoc on their family life and her own well-being as a result of her secret affair. Julie's mental condition worsened. Julie refused to let Tim into her room one day, preventing him from accessing important business documents. The situation became so serious that he had to call the cops, and despite Julie's active resistance, Tim was able to get what he needed. Julie became paranoid, 
believing Tim had hired a private detective to follow her. The household atmosphere became tense, and it was clear that divorce was unavoidable. In midsummer, George and Julie met in the United States and secretly got engaged. Julie made no secret of her desire to relocate to Greece, which she planned to do the following year. Around this time, Tim discovered international phone bills ranging from $6,000 to $7,000 per month. He eventually realized his wife was having an affair with the cruise ship engineer and was communicating with him behind his back. Tim was furious and decided to divorce Julie, eager to cut all ties with her. Julie attempted to limit Tim's access to their daughter in response, hoping for full custody so that he could freely move to another country. But Tim refused, as the couple attempted to resolve their differences. Julie's new lover, George, announced that he had quit his job and would be visiting her in New Jersey. Julie's constant arguments and conflicts with Tim caused her hair to fall out, but she blamed it on being separated from George. She was also envious of George's interactions with other women and required constant contact with him. When George arrived in New Jersey, their relationship descended into chaos. He was constantly inquiring about money and persuading her to spend more, forcing Julie to ask Tim for money, further limiting her interaction with her daughter, which irritated Tim. George frequently lied about his financial situation, and it was surprising how unremarkable he appeared, making Julie's obsession with him even odder. Friends and family strongly advised Julie to end the relationship, unable to understand how she fell for a balding, unemployed, hopeless man with bad teeth who was also manipulative and extremely jealous. Regardless, Julie was smitten. She even intended to use her divorce settlement to cover George's hair transplant and dental work. When Tim learned about all of this, he was furious that Julie had involved their daughter in the situation. He threatened that if she attempted to flee, he would take Katie and Julie would never see her daughter again. This threat seemed to dampen Julie's enthusiasm. She even told her friends that her relationship with George was over, but it wasn't for long. Within a few weeks, she and George traveled to Greece to put their relationship to the test. They met his parents, and Julie thoroughly enjoyed the weekend, despite having to conceal her marital status, daughter's existence, and modeling career due to George's parents' religious beliefs. Julie dreamed of completing her divorce and starting a new life with George. On December 6th, she received the divorce decree and was ready to leave the house she shared with Tim. She abandoned KDA and checked it into a hotel where she consumed copious amounts of drugs. Julie traveled to Greece on December 8th to marry George A and begin a new life together. George quickly persuaded her to open a joint bank account, citing his limited knowledge of the Greek language. Julie, blinded by love, deposited $80,000 in the account, giving George an additional $188,000 in cash for additional expenses, all of her money. She then vanished, leaving no trace behind. On January 8th, George called Julie's friend to inform him that she had disappeared. He said they were supposed to meet outside McDonald's for a meal, but Julie never showed up, leaving him waiting for hours. With no cell phones, he was unable to contact her and reported her missing to the police shortly after. Julie called the same friend and told him about her feelings for Katie and issues with her fiance. The friend assumed Julie was going to leave George and return soon, but she never did. And George's call raised serious concerns. He claimed Julie had vanished without her passport, allegedly left in her car, and was then apprehended by police. However, he couldn't find any witnesses to confirm that the police had taken the passport. It all sounded suspicious, so the friend turned to Tim, the only person who could help. Tim realized immediately that his ex-wife was in serious trouble. She had last contacted relatives in the United States. Since January 7th, there had been no word from her, adding to the fears. The police began combing the neighborhood and interviewing potential witnesses but Julie had no contacts in the new location, so they questioned her relatives in New Jersey and investigated her background. Julie Scully, the daughter of Julia and John Scully, was born on January 3, 1968. She developed a close relationship with her father and was willing to do anything for his approval. Father and daughter spent a lot of time together, frequently going fishing. 
However, on November 10, 1969, Julie's younger brother, John Patrick Scully, was born, capturing all of the parental affection while leaving Julie feeling neglected. Julie's mother was from a Native American reservation in New Mexico, which is one of the country's largest tribes. Life was difficult there, with no electricity or running water, high unemployment, and widespread alcohol and drug abuse. Julie's parents sent her to a boarding school at the age of 12, hoping that an English education would help her live a better life. Julia moved to the city as an adult, attempting to fit in with mainstream American life while working at a psychiatric facility. She became involved in the drug trade. During this time, she encountered a police officer named John. Their romance blossomed quickly in 1964, and they married on July 2, 1965, two days before their anniversary. John later worked as a patrol officer in one of North Philadelphia's most dangerous neighborhoods. Julia became pregnant and gave birth to a daughter. John lovingly cared for his daughter, leaving Julia feeling isolated from family life. She kept her drug addiction a secret, but her erratic and unpredictable behavior was occasionally revealed. Her situation worsened as she experimented with more dangerous drugs, leaving her exhausted and unable to quit without experiencing severe withdrawal symptoms. Julia soon became pregnant again, and a younger son joined the family, which was already depleted. Julia Scully found it difficult to care for him. She overdosed on sleeping pills in 1973 while suffering from depression. John discovered her in time and called for medical assistance, saving her life. This incident exposed her problem within the family, complicating matters even further. She was once a beautiful Native American woman, but now she looked like a shadow of herself. She attempted suicide again, but was saved. The elder daughter, who was nine years old at the time, was acutely aware of the turmoil in her parents' relationship. On Julie's birthday, her father abruptly left, leaving behind his wife and the guests with whom he was having an affair in order to escape Julia's addiction, which repulsed him. He stayed solely for the benefit of their children. His mistress arrived to pick him up, and Julia and their daughter noticed them as they followed John outside. John's flagrant disregard for the privacy of his affair deeply harmed both his daughter and his wife. Julie blamed herself for her family's problems, unable to comprehend the full scope of the situation. Julie, who had always been an excellent student, began experiencing academic difficulties. She gained popularity among her peers and fell into a bad crowd. Her school attendance and performance declined. Her father saw this and decided to transfer her to a new school in Kensington. At 12, Julie's attractiveness drew a lot of attention from boys. The Scully family lived in a troubled neighborhood, which raised her parents' concerns about her future and the possibility of her succumbing to substance abuse like her mother. Julie's friends were supposed to sleep over one evening, but she disappeared from her room along with them. When her mother discovered their absence, she became panicked and called the police, who located the children in downtown Philadelphia. Julie's relationship with her mother deteriorated, resulting in frequent conflicts and scandals. Despite their close relationship as police officers, her rebellious spirit manifested itself towards her father as well. He always knew where and with whom his daughter was spending her time. Seeing his wife's failure to raise their children, he took custody of them and sent Julia to rehab for drug addiction. Despite Yuli's efforts to please her father, the family environment calmed down during her absence. Her rebellious spirit grew as she matured, and she continued to spend time with her friends, resulting in missed classes and poor grades. Her father, enraged upon learning this, was shocked, especially since Julie was only 14. The close and warm relationship they once had appeared to have vanished. Julie expressed a desire to drop out of school, possibly as a cry for attention, which she had begun seeking on the streets. Her beauty made her the center of attention at every gathering. Julie earned her high school diploma in 1982. Her parents wanted her to get a specialized education, so her father, a police officer, helped her get into an engineering college. He asked the college director for special admission conditions, citing Julie's Native American heritage. His efforts paid off, and Julie was accepted to college. 
She was already living a sexual lifestyle in the fall of 1983. Despite their similar upbringings, Julie's brother took a different path in her 18th year. He enlisted in the Navy at the age of 16. Julie made the decision to leave college around the same time in order to achieve financial independence. She soon met Neil Ziegler, six years her senior. Their relationship grew quickly, and they secretly married. Julie's father, who was initially unaware of her marriage, eventually supported it, believing it was better for her than staying with her dependent mother. Nonetheless, the marriage ended in divorce. Julie returned to live with her mother in 1988, having found a new job but reluctant to contribute to living expenses. Her striking appearance drew attention everywhere and many mistook her for a model. Julie gradually began to use her beauty to connect with wealthy men. Despite her outward confidence, she was vulnerable and desperately sought love, but only found fleeting relationships. During one such social gathering, she met her future husband, Tim Nist. Julie's mother went to therapy for years after moving out and eventually overcame her addiction. When Julie and Tim had a daughter, the grandmother eagerly took on childcare responsibilities, staying involved even when Julie fled to Greece with a new lover. After Julie's disappearance was revealed, her mother described George as truly pitiful. He was unattractive and unpleasant to look at, and he appeared to have no control over his actions. The missing woman's mother described how she fell victim to George's aggression during an argument with Julie. George shouted and insulted the woman before grabbing her by the throat and pinning her against a wall, refusing to let her go until he heard threats of police involvement. Julie attempted to end their relationship and called the police following the attack, which resulted in George's expulsion from the country. Despite this, she soon joined him in Greece. She actively defended her lover even accepting blame for the assault. Julie's mother suspected George was involved in her daughter's disappearance. Following Julie's disappearance, George continued to participate actively in the search. Julie's close relatives attempted to contact the American embassy in Athens, but were unable to do so due to a language barrier, as the Greek police stations handling the investigation did not have English-speaking staff. The FBI from the United States joined the investigation. At this point, it was revealed that George had been carrying Julie's passport the entire time. He initially claimed to have found it, but after learning of the FBI's involvement, he changed his story to one of theft. His behavior became more suspicious. He attempted to withdraw funds from their joint account, but was unable to do so. On January 23, 1999, the couple was supposed to marry. During this time, news of the missing American woman was broadcast on television and radio. George angrily called Julie's friend, who had approached the media about the case. He claimed innocence and even made a public statement in the press, actively giving interviews in an attempt to defend himself. However, 16 days after Julie's disappearance, George was brought in for questioning as the primary suspect. George explained, that after moving to Greece, Julie quickly became disillusioned with both the country and him. She grew to miss her homeland and daughter and wanted to return. George tried to help her, but the situation deteriorated, leaving him deeply concerned in her final days. She cried constantly, and George's mother eventually learned about Julie's former husband and daughter in America. She began to despise Julie and openly expressed her dislike for George, urging him to abandon the woman with a troubled past. The lovers' conflicts became more frequent and severe, prompting their eviction from a hotel. Julie wanted to call her family, but her lover prevented her from doing so and even physically abused her. The police discovered that George's mother had schizophrenia and was frequently hospitalized as a result of her condition. George inherited some of these issues. He had high self-esteem and was always arrogant. His ability to manipulate others was noticed by the missing woman's family and friends. At the slightest disagreement, he aggressively attacked his partner. Aside from Julie's mother, who had been victimized by his violence, Julie herself suffered serious hand injuries but claimed they were accidental and continued to live with her tyrant. After four hours of questioning by the police, 
George was unable to maintain the story he had told the media and admitted to killing his lover. He claimed that it was an accident. Apparently, the lover deeply regretted what had occurred. He even cried during the interrogation. However, his confessions were perplexing and riddled with contradictions. Initially, on January 8, 1999, the couple embarked on their long-awaited trip to Athens. They were driving down a deserted two-lane highway, enjoying the peace and quiet. A calm conversation turned into a serious conflict. Finally, George decided to pull over on a stretch of road with no one else around. In a fit of rage, he jumped out of the car and attacked his loved one, choking her as tightly as he could. He wanted her to remain silent and stop screaming. George told the police that he seemed to be watching everything from the outside and had lost control of himself. He couldn't stop himself until Julie stopped breathing. The lover claimed that the horrific moments lasted only a few seconds, but investigators were aware that strangulation takes at least three minutes. George was shocked afterwards. He devised the plan of burning his beloved's body, scattering her ashes in the sea from a cliff, and jumping after her to reunite with her. George explained that he attempted suicide by shooting himself with a pneumatic gun, jumping under a truck, and taking an overdose of medication. However, all of his attempts were unsuccessful. However, he was now at the police station for questioning, implying that all of his thoughts were a fantasy. In reality, he treated his beloved's body differently. Following the murder, George simply threw it in his car's trunk and drove to the nearest gas station. He bought gas and returned to the crime scene. George dragged the body away from the road near two small lakes, doused it with gasoline, and set it on fire. But the rain prevented the body from completely burning. At one point, he considered throwing it into the lake, but instead stuffed the charred corpse back into the trunk and drove to his grandmother's house. He found a large travel bag and decided to pack Julie's body in it, but it had stiffened and he couldn't bend it anymore. Furthermore, the head would not fit in the bag, so George decided to simply cut it off. He described how he took her head by the hair and lifted it to his face. He remembered seeing terror in her eyes, but she was still beautiful, so he kissed her on the lips before packing the body into the bag. Then he burned the bag and threw it in a swamp, leaving the head behind. Later, George drove to Kavala and threw Julie Scully's head into the sea. Nineteen days after Julie disappeared, her ex-lover and would-be husband assisted detectives in locating the murder site and the remains. Tim and the victim's family were informed by police that George had admitted to the crime. The victim's ex-husband traveled to Greece to bring Julie's body back home. <laughs> Meanwhile, the criminal revealed what he had done to the woman in a live broadcast. When the murderer's mother found out about his crime, she had a stroke, and his grandmother was shocked. The Greek authorities described it as one of the most horrific murders they had witnessed at the time. Tim's father stated that the lover should have died alongside his beloved. Despite this, numerous articles have emerged blaming the victim for what occurred. The victim's family believed her lover had initially used Julie for money. When he learned about her wealthy husband, he persuaded her to divorce and win a large settlement in court, which she was supposed to put into his business. However, prior to her death, Julie realized his true intentions and refused to fund his projects, resulting in her becoming a victim. The trial for George Skiadopoulos began on November 27, 1999. In the Greek justice system, trials are conducted concurrently by three judges rather than a jury which significantly speeds up the process. Furthermore, there were no defense witnesses present during the hearings. George made horrific confessions that lasted approximately five hours. His lawyers attempted to argue insanity, claiming that the criminal's mother suffered from schizophrenia and that he may have inherited mental illnesses. Meanwhile, the accused requested the death penalty, despite the fact that capital punishment was prohibited in Greece. On December 6th, the court unanimously sentenced George Skiadopoulos to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for all charges. However, the Greek legal system was not flawless. In 2002, George filed an appeal, claiming he was insane at the time of the murder. As a result, his sentence was reduced to 23 years with the option for further appeal. 
By 2007, the criminal had been released and was living with his new family in Kavala, United States. Julie's ex-husband, Tim Nist, became a source of strength for all of her family and friends. Despite her betrayal, he proved to be a dignified man by accepting responsibility and organizing Julie's funeral. Following the funeral, Tim received a diary of memories about his ex-wife written by Julie's friends for their daughter, Katie. The entries attempted to portray her life in a positive and kind light. When her daughter grows up, she should know that her mother adored her and was a wonderful woman. Love is a complex emotion that can be both beautiful and constructive, but it can also cloud judgment and lead to dangerous behavior. In most cases, people can recognize the reality and protect themselves. Unfortunately, Julie's circumstances differed. Her story serves as a reminder that everyone's safety and well-being should always be a top priority, even when it comes to love. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Add to the channel for more. Add to the channel for more. Add to the channel for more. On Wednesday, September 14, 2016, a fire broke out early in the morning at a cornwoods near Grapevine Lake in Texas, United States. Firefighters successfully extinguished the fire, and during their investigation, they discovered what appeared to be a melted child's paddling pool with a charred body. The individual's gender could not be determined at that point. A subsequent fingerprint analysis identified the deceased as Jackie Vandergriff, a 24-year-old licensed esthetician studying nutrition at Texas Women's University in Denton. Because she had not been reported missing, law enforcement believes she died shortly after her last known sighting. Jackie was last seen on September 13, one night before her charred body was discovered. That evening, she went to two bars in Denton, Fry Street Public House and Shots and Crafts. Jackie had been mutilated as well as burned. She'd been dismembered. The need to apprehend the perpetrators of such brutality was paramount. Following numerous tips about a man seen near the fire, law enforcement obtained footage of Jackie on the night of September 13. The footage showed her interacting with a man. Further investigation revealed that this man had given his business card to one of the women in the bar that night, claiming to be a fitness instructor and offering his services as a personal trainer. His name was given as Charles Bryant. Jackie and Charles had only met on the night of September 13 through a chance encounter. According to police, Jackie had gone to the bar with the intention of looking for work and meeting someone from Tinder that night, but she changed her plans. While at the bar, she conversed with the bartender and Charles, a 31-year-old man. They eventually joined a group of women and spent time together. Jackie's friends described her as sociable, frequently interacting with people she met on a night out. Charles had been at the Fry Street public house since around 7 p.m. That evening, he had been with friends earlier, but he was alone in the bar when Jackie arrived around 8 p.m. She asked the bartender about job opportunities and lingered for a while, speaking with both him and Charles. The footage obtained by the police from inside the bar suggested that Jackie was having a good time. Surprisingly, just 45 minutes after her arrival, she tweeted, I'm glad I decided to leave Tinder and walk to a bar. Jackie, the bartender, and Charles left the original bar around 9 p.m. and went to another nearby establishment. At the next bar, they met a group of women who stayed for about 45 minutes. As inclement weather, including heavy rain, set in, the patrons began making their way home. Jackie then left the bar with Charles and went to the store. This was Jackie's final appearance alive. Charles Bryant had a troubled past, which Jackie was unaware of on that fateful night. In the weeks before their meeting, Charles had been arrested three times. His only reason for being in the Denton area was Caitlin Mathis, his ex-girlfriend, despite living 20 miles away in Hazlet. Charles's ex, Caitlin, had recently moved to Denton to attend the University of North Texas and was living on campus. Caitlin had taken legal action, filing a restraining order against him. Caitlin ended the toxic relationship in August 2016, just a few months before the tragic events unfolded, citing Charles' manipulative behavior and narcissism. Even after Caitlin ended their relationship and relocated to Denton, Charles continued to disrupt her life. Police stopped him on campus, resulting in a ban. After yielding, he kept attempting to communicate with Caitlin, 
Despite the campus ban, he showed up at the restaurant where she worked on August 31 and at Catelyn's door on September 6. Caitlin refrained from answering, fearing for her safety, and immediately contacted the police. Charles left flowers and a letter on her doorstep, prompting authorities to arrest him for trespassing. Charles posted a bond shortly after being arrested, which secured his release. Almost immediately, he contacted Caitlin via a newly created email address, writing, Here I am, heartbroken, and with a criminal record for bringing the girl I love flowers. In response to these concerning developments, Caitlin obtained an emergency protective order to protect herself from further harassment and potential harm. Despite previous stalking arrests, Charles continued to attempt to contact Catelyn after another stalking arrest. He was released on bond two days later. On September 13th, a week after his most recent release, Charles returned to Denton, specifically to the Frey Street public house, which Catelyn frequented. Although law enforcement was aware of Charles and Caitlin's troubled history, there was insufficient evidence linking him to Jackie's murder. While it was determined that he was with Jackie on the night of her death, more evidence was required. The opportunity to question him arose shortly after Jackie's body was discovered when Charles attempted to contact Catelyn again, violating the restraining order. He was brought in for questioning on September 18, 2016. In the case of Jackie's death, the police had already gathered surveillance footage, interviewed people who were present at the bars, and tracked Charles' movements. Their investigation revealed that on September 14 at 4.41 a.m., Charles went to Walmart and bought a shovel. In addition, a children's paddling pool was discovered missing from his backyard, adding to the concerns surrounding the investigation. When questioned by the police, Charles initially claimed that he had only seen Jackie at the bar. However, as the detective presented a comprehensive and chronological overview of the evidence, it became clear that Charles understood he couldn't deny being with Jackie that night. Eventually, he admitted that Jackie died accidentally while they were together during a consensual but unconventional sexual encounter. Charles told the detective that after they left the bar, Jackie asked him to choke his car with a zip tie. Despite having a zip tie in his vehicle, the police questioned his story, leading to charges of murder and tampering with or fabricating physical evidence against him. The prosecution claimed that Charles and Jackie met that night, went to a second bar, and then returned to his home. During the trial, the medical examiner informed the jury that tests on Jackie's remains found no evidence of sexual assault. The prosecution claimed Jackie's death was not the result of a sexual encounter, but rather of a brutal assault that included strangulation with a zip tie, dismemberment with a knife, and subsequent incineration. According to the prosecution's narrative presented to the jury, the evidence would show that Charles and Jackie met at a bar on September 13th and left together in his car with no one else present. The prosecution emphasized that various pieces of evidence, such as items discovered and DNA testing, would confirm Jackie's presence inside Charles' home. The jury was shown surveillance footage from the bars, and testimonies from bar patrons and employees corroborated the claim that Charles and Jackie were together. The footage showed them leaving the bar at 9, 46 p.m., getting into Charles' car and remaining in the parking lot for another 30 minutes before leaving. Subsequent surveillance footage from a dented gas station showed Jackie inside Charles' car at 10.30 p.m., the last confirmed sighting of her alive. Furthermore, Jackie's phone activity indicated a connection to a cell tower in Hazlitt, Texas, at approximately 1.30 a.m. on September 14th, as well as the area surrounding Charles' residence. The jury learned that Jackie was carrying a Texas Woman's University bag at the bar, and a matching two-bag was discovered at Charles' home. A hair-covered zip tie was also discovered in the trash can outside his home. Notably, in Charles' backyard, there was a blue children's paddling pool similar to the one found burned. A circular barren spot near the pool hinted at the presence of another pool. Police discovered a knife inside Charles' home, which they believe was used in Jackie's stabbing and dismemberment, as well as a stun gun in his car. Both items were officially recorded as evidence. During the court proceedings, the medical examiner stated that Jackie died as a result of homicidal violence. It was noted that there was no soot in her airways indicating that she had died ceased before her body was set ablaze. The medical examiner also testified that Jackie's hyoid bone had fractures as a result of upper neck force. 
A forensic anthropologist explained to the court that the hyoid bone is a U-shaped bone deep in the throat that acts as an anchor for the tongue. The forensic anthropologist testified that Jackie had a broken hyoid bone and fractured ribs. The injuries were found to be more likely to occur near the time of death and were not related to dismemberment. The anthropologist determined that the hyoid bone injury was consistent with strangulation as it required direct pressure, which is typically caused by manual strangulation or the use of ligatures. However, because Jackie's soft tissue burned during the fire, it was impossible to say definitively whether the fracture was caused manually or by a ligature. The expert agreed that a zip tie could result in such an injury. Furthermore, Jackie sustained a head injury from blunt force trauma that was ruled unlikely to be post-mortem due to significant hemorrhaging stab wounds on her body that appeared unrelated to the dismemberment procedure. And the state's expert claimed that the wounds appeared to have been inflicted while Jackie was still alive, the expert explained. The fact that there was some bleeding around those stab wounds indicates that she was alive when they were received, so they could have bled. The jury discovered that Jackie's body sustained injuries after her death, including the opening of her chest and the removal of her heart, as well as multiple rib fractures. A DNA profile extracted from the zip tie, stun gun, and knife made it nearly impossible that the sample came from anyone other than Jackie. The DNA analyst testified that DNA analyst testified that DNA was found on the stun gun, recovered from his car, and Jackie could not be ruled out as a major contributor. The defense presented its case, arguing that there was no evidence to support the claim that Jackie's death was caused by Charles' violent actions. Instead, they claimed Jackie died during a consensual sexual act. According to the defense, Charles, in a panic, attempted to dispose of Jackie's body. During the trial, defense witnesses discussed the concept of erotica asphyxiation, claiming that those who engage in such activities derive pleasure from depriving their brains of oxygen. The defense argued that a zip tie was used around Jackie's throat as part of a consensual sexual act, which led to her death. According to their account, Jackie's body went limp, which caused Charles to freak out. The defense argued that the subsequent dismemberment and burning of the body were impulsive and chaotic actions motivated by panic and intoxication. Joette Keene, Charles's attorney, acknowledged in her closing arguments that Charles made a terrible mistake, stating that he is guilty of making a horrible mistake when something goes wrong. There was no reason for a good-looking guy to kill that good-looking girl. In contrast, the prosecution's closing statements called into question the defense's narrative claiming that there was no evidence to support the claim that Charles and Jackie engaged in sexual activity. They dismissed the defense's argument that Charles' panic is illogical, emphasizing the gravity of his actions. The defense claims he freaked out, but their own experts determined it was homicidal violence. Why cut out the heart? What is the significance of body disposal? He slashed her heart out. I want that image to sink in. The jury had to decide whether Jackie was murdered, killed on purpose, or died as a result of a consensual sexual act. They convicted Charles of murder and tampering with evidence. He was sentenced to life in prison for murder and 20 years for tampering. The sentences will be served concurrently. Prior to the trial, there was much speculation as to the possible motive. Prosecutors are concerned if there is no clear motive as jurors prefer to hear a complete story and explanation of what occurred. They must be certain of their verdict before being convicted. And in many cases, a motive strengthens the prosecution's case. In this case, the prosecution had no motivation. But does it matter? When does the evidence become clear? Do we require a motive? In cases like this, the motivation is usually sexual. However, the prosecution argued that there was no evidence of sexual activity. We don't need to know what went through Charles Bryant's mind that night. Did he want to do it? And he did. Jackie's parents have partnered with Texas Woman's University to establish an endowment in her memory. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Today we'll look at a case involving a very unusual plot that occurred in London in 2011. Alice Adams and Tibor Vass's bodies were discovered in a house near Heathrow Airport. They were both 20 years old. 
The investigators working on this case will describe it as one of the most unusual for someone who works full-time in law enforcement. Alice Adams and Tybor Vass worked for the Radisson Blue Edwardian Heathrow Hotel. Alice was a local, and her family home was approximately six miles from the hotel where she worked. She had started the job three weeks earlier, and had made friends with other hotel employees, particularly her peer Tybor Vass. Tibor was born and raised in Budapest, Hungary. He was his parents' second child, and he had a younger sister, Tibor, who enjoyed being around other people. He could play almost any musical instrument, with the piano being his favorite. He taught his sister Isabella how to play the piano, and they sang and played together while their parents listened. His mother Rosalia struggled to move on after his father died unexpectedly in 2007. Tibor spent the majority of his free time with his sister. He was both her brother and father. He wanted to share his mother's burden, so he started working full-time when he was 15 years old. In 2008, he applied to the University of Budapest, hoping that a college degree would help him get a good job and better support his mother. Despite his exceptional abilities, he was denied admission to the university. Tibor discussed with his mother the possibility of moving to Great Britain and finding work there. Tibor's mother must have supported the idea, as he moved to the United Kingdom in July 2010. At the age of 19, he relocated to London. He began working at the Radisson Blue Edwardian Heathrow Hotel. He enjoyed his job, his responsibilities, the people he worked with, and the new clients he met each day. Alice was an accomplished musician who quickly bonded with Tybor. They never ran out of topics to discuss. Tibor Vass and Alice Adams were the hotel's receptionists. Another receptionist was Attila Ban, who was 31 years old. Attila had been with the hotel the longest of the three, and he was named the best employee in 2010. Both Attila and Tibor were from Hungary, which brought them closer together. The hotel provided company apartments to its new employees. Attila and Tibor lived in a house behind the hotel. It was extremely convenient. On the one hand, it was more cost-effective. On the other hand, you did not have to spend much time getting to work. Despite Tibor's happiness to be in England, he did not abandon his plans to pursue higher education. He applied again to Budapest University, and this time he was accepted. He was very happy, but he had to return to Hungary in August 2011. Tibor's departure was marked by a small farewell party, which was held on August 9, 2011. Other hotel employees attended the party alongside Tibor Attila and Alice. The next day, this trio was supposed to work, but none of them showed up. Colleagues raised the alarm when they failed to arrive for work at 7 a.m. The police were notified at 7 a.m. The police were notified at 7.53 a.m. The police arrived at the house and knocked on the door. No one opened the door and everything was quiet inside. The door was unlocked. When one of the officers opened it, he discovered a terrifying sight. Alice lay on the living room floor, her face hidden by a pillow. Later, the medical examiner who performed the autopsy found 22 stab wounds on her body. The naked body of the man who had died from stab wounds to the heart lay on the bed in his bedroom. The tiller was nowhere to be found. The police cordoned off the house and investigators and forensic experts quickly began their work. When investigators examined the crime scene, they discovered that the bed on which Tibor lay was not where he died. It was to clean. The perpetrator had wounded him elsewhere before removing his clothes cleaning him up and placing him up and placing him on the bed, alcohol bottles and illegal substances, which appeared to have been consumed at the party, were discovered in the apartment. Police officers searched the house, the surrounding area, and the attic but found no Attila bands. His personal belongings, including his papers, remained inside the apartment. As Attila became the prime suspect, investigators began interviewing his co-workers while experts worked the crime scene. Hotel employees claimed that as soon as Tibor started working at the hotel, Attila took him under his wing because they were both from the same country. It wasn't long before Attila asked Tibor to live with him in an apartment near the hotel. He even planned his work schedule so that they worked the same shift. Tibor was young and attractive, and he received plenty of female attention. The problem was that prior to falling in love with Tibor, Ban made no secret of his preference for male relationships. According to the hotel staff, Tibor rejected his advances, which made him unhappy. Alice had taken a job at the hotel three weeks before her death, and Tibor began to show interest in her, which naturally irritated Attila, who was jealous despite knowing Tiber was only interested in women. Investigators began to wonder if Attila had committed the crime out of jealousy and unrequited love. 
Even before police discovered Tibor Vass and Alice Adams' lifeless bodies, a Bane had posted an ominous message on his Facebook page. He wrote, I want to wake up from that nightmare. This was posted at 6.23 a.m., and several friends expressed their concerns to which they received no response. The message convinced investigators that Attila Ban was involved in his colleagues' deaths. This was also demonstrated by the number of wounds. Alice was stabbed 22 times and Tybor twice. In addition, Alice was lying on the floor with a pillow against her face while Tybor was on the bed. The investigators interviewed the other party members, who stated that when everyone left, only Attila T, Boher, and Alice remained in the apartment. This indicated that something had occurred between these three people in the time remaining before dawn. Alice and T, Boers' deaths were reported to their families. What happened was devastating for both the Adams and Vass families. In a statement released by the Adams family, Alice's mother, Sarah, honored her daughter with the words, My heart is broken and my life will be forever tinged with sadness. I miss Alice so much. I'd give anything for one more Alice squeezy hug and smile. Alice's death has caused my family to experience extreme emotions such as grief, anger, and overwhelming sorrow, and it has forever changed our family. As a mother, you are supposed to protect your children, and every day and night, I have to face the fact that I failed. The most difficult thing to deal with is not knowing exactly what happened to my beloved Alice that night. As horrifying as it would be to learn the truth, it would be preferable to the constant struggle in my mind to figure out the sequence of events leading up to Alice's murder. There are no words to describe what an amazing and unique personality she had, or how much love, joy, passion, and compassion she brought into so many people's lives. Her passing is a tragedy beyond words. Alice's mother told investigators that shortly after midnight, her daughter texted that she was spending the night at a friend's house. The police issued an ab for Attila ban, but he simply vanished. They attempted to track his phone, but it was detected by cell towers in the same area as the hotel. This was extremely strange. As soon as it became clear, Attila had been closer than anyone had imagined all along. The investigation team spent two days at the scene before leaving the house. A few hours later, the forensic team decided to return to the house and conduct additional tests. They noticed that the door they had left open had been locked from the inside. When they entered the room, they noticed Attila Ban lying on the bed. He was drunk and attempted to injure himself with scissors and a knife. He had wounds on his neck and wrists. When they asked him questions, he acted strangely and attempted to demonstrate something with gestures. He was transported to the hospital, where doctors ensured his life was not in danger. The police were perplexed when they discovered where Attila Ban had spent the previous two days. He had cut a slit in the base of the sofa bed where Tibor's body was discovered grabbed a phone and several bottles of water, and climbed inside. While the cops were on the scene, he remained inside, listening and watching through the holes he had made. The primary suspect, Attila Ban, was arrested right inside the hospital. The trial started on July 9, 2012. During the trial, some details about the brutal crime were revealed. The party spiraled out of control after Alice, Tibor, and Attila were left alone in the apartment. Prosecutors accepted there was sexual activity between all three, as DNA from both men was discovered on Miss Adams' breasts, until a band stated that he remembered the three of them being in bed and that there was a connection between them, but he had no recollection of what happened after that. He insisted that he only realized he had committed a terrible act after waking up in the morning and seeing Alice and her lifeless bodies. When he realized that his actions had killed two people, he made the decision to commit suicide. However, he stated that he was afraid to do it alone, so he removed his keyboard's clothing and climbed into the bathtub alongside him. Unable to hurt himself, he moved Tabor to the bed, knowing they would be sought after. He opened the divan bed's base and hid inside, while he was hiding there. He was even able to update his Facebook page. He sobbed loudly in the dark as prosecutor Richard Widom explained the facts of the case to jurors. According to Mr. Widom, Two young people were killed violently and unjustly by this defendant. Although other cases have been discussed, it is difficult to find words to describe what happened in this case, other than to say that it was tragic that young people met their deaths in this manner. According to Mr. Weedham, Tibor Vass had relationships with hotel employees, and there is no evidence that he ever had a sexual relationship with an Attila ban. However, Attila ban appeared to have feelings for Tiber Vass and acted slightly possessively towards him. 
The court heard that band was jealous of you, and that just days before the crime, he threw a temper tantrum at his victim during a team building session when he took a picture in which band was not present. The situation reached a climax when the band learned that Tibor Voss had been accepted to a university course in Hungary and would be leaving Britain at the end of the month. The final straw may have been that an Attila band couldn't bear the sight of Tibor and Alice kissing, and in a fit of jealousy, killed both of them. In addition, prosecutor Richard Whittam stated in court that Attila Ban was found naked on the single bed. He had wounds on his wrist, forearm, and neck. It was clear that he had been hiding in the divan base of the double bed. He must have been present during the pathologist's visit, the removal of the bodies, and the crime scene examiner's examiner's examination of the scene. He had the foresight to effectively conceal himself and remain undetected throughout their stay on the premises. Following the case, Detective Inspector John Finch stated outside court that the police had not been negligent in not looking under the bed. He stated, I've reviewed this with senior management several times. It was an unusual and bizarre thing for a person to do. It defies belief. He claimed that lifting up beds to look for people who were not present would result in the loss of critical forensic evidence. Tibor Vass and his mother, Rosalia, paid tribute to their son. Her statement included the following words. Tibor was a young boy who enjoyed music and the arts, repairing gadgets, and practicing freestyle tricks on his Bamex bicycle, Daisy. At home, he was always creative and enjoyed experimenting with computers, such as building stereo speakers out of cardboard and old cables. He had a passion for photography and spent his first paycheck on a professional camera. Tibor was consistently friendly, helpful, supportive, approachable, outgoing, and trustworthy. He had many friends in Hungary and the United Kingdom. On August 11th, I learned that two innocent 20-year-olds, my son Tibor and his friend Alice, were murdered. I learned that his friend had taken their lives. It was impossible and devastating to believe that such an event could occur. Previous to that, it gave me comfort to know Tibor had made a good friend in London who was mature, friendly, and intelligent. His friend promised me personally that he would look after my son and not let anything happen to him. I trusted him and saw him as one of my own. That's another reason why the news of my son's murder was so heartbreaking. Throughout the police investigation and trial, I had to relive the horrors of that night, which only added to my sadness. There are no words to describe the agony and loss that our family will experience for the rest of our lives. Until he pleaded guilty, Attila Ban claimed he couldn't remember the events of that horrific night. On July 18, 2012, on August 17, after only five hours of deliberation, the jury convicted 32-year-old Attila Ban. He was sentenced to two lifetime sentences. He will have to serve 26 years in prison before he can apply for parole. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On December 20, 2017, a press conference was held during which Mark Perez, special agent in charge of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, announced a breakthrough in the disappearance of Mike Williams, a Tallahassee real estate appraiser who was originally presumed to have drowned while duck hunting on Lake Seminole. An alligator ate him on December 16, 2000. The truth is that Mike Williams did not drown in the lake. I can tell you that because I am here now. Perez said. Animals that eat people did not eat him. He didn't leave his wife and 18-month-old daughter behind when he left town. He was killed. We can't say more about it yet because the investigation is still going on, but I'm happy to say that. This morning, investigators told the Williams family about new information they had found in the case. Today's story is about love, betrayal, cheating, and greed, but it's also about a mother who has been strong for 17 years and four days. Mike's mom, Cheryl Williams, didn't believe that her son had drowned in Lake Seminole. She pushed hard for police to look into her son's disappearance. And she really thought that the people who did it would be punished, even when no one else did. Either he was alive or he was dead. I chose to believe he was alive, and I think that's what helped me, Cheryl said on December 20th, 2017. A lot of people told me I was crazy, but we would never have found him if I gave up. Brian Winchester was given a 20-year prison sentence the day before the press conference. He was a close friend of Mike and his wife Denise, and later married Brian. In a strange way, 
Those who did what happened got what they deserved when the truth came out in 2000. Mike's mother was right. In 1997, Brian and Denise started having an affair, which turned into a murder. After a few years, they went from being lovers to strangers who didn't trust each other. Brian was afraid that Denise would tell the police about what happened to Mike after the divorce, so he beat her up. On the other hand, Denise did everything she could to get him a life sentence. When she asked the jury for the harshest sentence, she was very convincing. Because of this, Brian felt he had nothing to lose, so he made a deal with the prosecutor. In 2017, Brian got 20 years in prison for kidnapping Denise Williams. He avoided getting a life sentence, though. Denise was happy about the win and didn't know that Brian Winchester, 49, actually agreed to plan the murder and a 17-year cover-up of it in exchange for not being charged with any crimes related to his part in the case. In exchange, he showed police where Mike's body was and told them the whole truth. In just a few months, on May 8, 2018, Denise Williams would be caught and charged. Things look a little fuzzy at first glance, don't they? Let's look at this case in more depth. She was born on October 16, 1969, in Bradfordville, which is north of Tallahassee. His father drove a bus and his mother taught kindergarten. He was known as Mike by family and friends. His family didn't have much money, and he and his older brother lived in a trailer as kids. Those were good times. Because the parents cared about their son's future, they didn't build a house. Instead, they saved money for both boys' college education and worked part-time in supermarkets at night. The sons signed up to go to North Florida Christian High School. Mike did great. He played soccer, led the student council, and was active in the key club. Mike began duck hunting as a hobby when he was 15 years old, and that's how he met Denise Merrill. It was a girl who played soccer and was president of the student council. As a cheerleader and council secretary, Denise met him and started dating. Their friends thought they were a great match while they were still in high school. Denise put Mike in touch with Brian Winchester, who became his best friend. Katie Thomas became Brian's friend after a while, and the two couples stayed friends for the rest of Mike's life. Following high school, Mike went to Florida State University and majored in both political science and urban planning. The lovers graduated at the same time. Denise went to school to become a public accountant, and Mike learned how to value real estate. Mike did a good job at work. His job went well, even though he worked 15 hours a day most of the time. The young well-off man married Denise in 1994. Around this time, Brian also got married to Kathy. They all stayed in close contact with each other. Mike was very energetic and loved his wife very much. He worked hard to provide for their family as best he could. Mike Williams had a lot of success as a real estate appraiser when he was 31 years old. He was making almost $200,000 a year. In 1999, they had a happy child and were able to afford a house in a small, nice neighborhood on the east side of town. The name they gave their daughter was Ansley. His friends told me that he was always smart. The young man was doing some pretty dangerous things, so he wanted to make sure that his family would be taken care of if something went wrong. It was no surprise that Mike went to his best friend, who worked as an insurance agent at the time. Brian sold him two insurance policies, the first for $250,000 and the second for $500,000. Mike's dad died in the year 2000. Williams was shocked by how quickly this happened, that he turned to a friend again to get money for his family. For $1 million, Brian helped Mike make sure he would live. Denise says that the loving father of the family had almost $2 million in life insurance about six months before he went missing. They were married on December 16, 2000. Her husband got up early to go duck hunting on Lake Seminole, a big lake that is connected to the Apalachicola River. Today was their sixth wedding anniversary, and they had planned to spend the night in Apalachicola, a small town on the bayou. Mike's wife and daughter were waiting for him at home at noon, but he never came back. Of course, Denise was worried, so she called her dad, who then called Brian Winchester, Mike's best friend. Brian drove to Lake Seminole with his dad. They found Mike's Ford Bronco car near the boat dock, but Mike wasn't there. There was no boat to be found, so the men called the police. They looked in all the places Mike liked to hunt. 
police from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission were called to help look for Mike. After a few hours, a helicopter pilot saw the boat drifting away from the boat ramp about 225 feet. The boat was searched, and Mike's shotgun was found still in its case. It looks like he never got to use it. The search turned into a mission to save lives. People in the area thought that the reservoir used to be an orchard before the three rivers were dammed up to make the lake. The lake was named Stumpfield because there were so many stumps left. The water level had stumps that stuck out above and below it. Because of this, any motorized boat in the area had to be handled carefully. People looking for Williams thought he hit a stump on his boat, fell out, and went under the water. His wading boots filled with water and he probably drowned when he couldn't get out. A dive team from Montgomery, Alabama, and the Jackson County Sheriff's Office were among the other groups called in to help, but the thorough search turned up nothing. Mike was never found. After a week, the search for bodies turned into a rescue operation. Dogs were brought to the site and probe poles were given to the teams to use to look into the lake's bottom. Ten days into the search, people found a hunting hat with a camouflage pattern that could not be linked to Williams. Fish and Wildlife Conservation officials in Florida thought that Mikey's body had been eaten by alligators, which is why it couldn't be found. Most of the alligators that lived in the lake were male. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement agreed with this theory because they didn't see any signs of a violent death. The search was over after five weeks. Denise held a memorial service for Mike the day after the search was over. This was less than two months after the alleged accident. Everyone thought Denise was okay with losing her husband, but Mike's mom wasn't. In June 2001, six months later, an angler found wading boots floating in the lake. Divers searched the area around the lake and found a light hunting jacket and flashlight at the bottom. Williams had signed and written on a hunting license that was in one of the jacket pockets. The find made a lot of people wonder. There were no teeth marks on the hunting jacket or the boots that would have been made by an alligator. The things that were found didn't look like they had been in the water for six months. The flashlight still worked and the boots weren't slimy. But after a week, Denise's lawyer asked the court to declare Mike Williams dead, based on the things that had been found. He said that alligators and other animals that live in water had eaten the body whole and the motion was granted. The death certificate said Mike drowned while duck hunting on Lake Seminole on December 16, 2000, which was an accident. The body hasn't been found yet. For Mike Williams, this is how things might have turned out if Cheryl Williams hadn't given up and kept looking for her son. All I know is that I can't stop looking for him until I find him, she stated. Cheryl's efforts made things very difficult between her and her ex-sister-in-law. Denise told her to stop looking and face the truth. She told them, I'm sick of reading about Mike's disappearance. I just want to move on with my life. If you keep pushing this investigation, you will never see your granddaughter again. Denise kept her word, and Cheryl couldn't give up on her son. If the mother hadn't been so determined, her son's story might still be at the bottom of a dark, algae-covered lake. Three years passed before Cheryl Williams could get the police to start looking into what happened to her young son. Cheryl will tell you years later, I called, put up signs, wrote to the governor of Florida every day, put together my notes into an evidence book, asked people to post on social media, and talked to reporters about my missing son. The mother was so determined that she finally called alligator expert Matthew Oresco. In his answer, he said that alligators don't eat in the winter because it's too cold. The water temperature drops when it's cold, so alligators don't eat in the winter. They only keep their bodies at the right temperature. Alligators don't care about food at all when it's 14 degrees outside. Oresco also wrote that forensic evidence is always left behind after an alligator kills an animal. After three years, Cheryl Williams finally got the police to drop the crazy alligator theory and start a real investigation into her son's disappearance. Investigators decided that Williams' death was not an accident after learning some little-known facts about what alligators eat, talking to people, and looking at some official records. All the police agencies working on this case agree with my gut that Mike did not drown in Lake Seminole, said Ronnie Austin who used to work as an investigator for the second district state's attorney's office and prosecuted Mike's case. At first, 
the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Agency took over the case because Williams was thought to be a hunter who had gone missing. Police spent 735 hours looking for the body in a 10-acre area of the lake, but they didn't look for any signs of wrongdoing. The Jackson County Sheriff's deputies who were brought in to help with the search also didn't look at any other options. Investigators talked to everyone who helped with the search. Years later, police officer David Arnett, who was at the scene that day, said that some things seemed odd right away. Williams didn't usually hunt alone. His truck was found in an undeveloped area from which he would have had to drag the boat over mud, not on the nearby concrete boat launch. He usually used. The terrible storm that night should have pushed the boat to the east shore, but it was found on the west shore. The boat's motor wasn't running, but it was full of gasoline. If Mike had been driving the boat and fell out of it, it would have continued to float in circles until it ran out of gas. Sadly, law enforcement started to doubt too late that they were dealing with a straightforward drowning. A lot of volunteers and searchers had already walked all over the crime scene. A car that could have been a clue was taken by the family without any checks being made. Possible witnesses were not found. When police learned that Winchester had divorced his wife Kathy and married Denise, they became suspicious of both Denise Williams and Brian Winchester. They also found out that Denise got an unexpected windfall of almost $2 million from the life insurance policy of her late husband. Investigators found that Winchester was the one who sold Mike the policy. They also thought it was odd that Denise, Mike's wife, didn't want to be involved in the investigation and tried to stop Cheryl from doing anything, even telling the grandmother she couldn't talk to her granddaughter. They were called in for questioning in 2005, but it didn't add anything new to the investigation. Brian made up an excuse for what happened the morning of the disappearance of Mike Williams. Based on what his ex-wife Kathy said, he was 60 miles from the lake and in bed at home. He told her that he had planned to go hunting with his dad in the morning, but had slept in instead. Even questioning Denise didn't turn up any new clues. In 2008, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement said they didn't think Mike's disappearance was an accident and that they thought he had been robbed. Unfortunately, they can't bring charges because there isn't enough evidence. We have suspicions, but we need proof, Cheryl Williams said, after another investigation failed to find out what happened to her son. She did not give up, though. Because of her work, the Discovery Cable Channel did a story on Mike's disappearance and the investigations that followed. By late 2011, Cheryl had lost faith in the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and thought it was either not capable of solving the case or not interested in doing so. Since 2012, Mike's mother has sent Governor Rick Scott about one letter a day, asking him to either give the investigation to another agency or name a special prosecutor to do it. Over the course of nine years, Cheryl wrote 2,600 letters to the governor. Brain and Denise broke up after Denise caught him cheating on her in 2012. After a few more years, Denise asked for a divorce. An evaluation of the old family home was to happen. After that, not even property issues would hold them back. This event changed the course of Mike's case. Brian and Denise didn't want to get a divorce, but they also didn't want to stay together. They fought all the time, and the Williams investigation made fun of them. Brian called Denise, but she stopped calling him back. He was too stressed to handle it. Denise left her house on August 5, 2016, to drive to work at Florida State University. That day, a real estate appraisal was due because of a court order. She saw someone get into the back seat of her car while she was on the phone with her sister. Winchester was the one it was. Denise was told to keep going straight ahead by Brian, who put a loaded gun to her ribs. He said he had to do it because she wasn't home when he called. Denise tried to make Brian feel better, agreed with everything he said, and said she would give him a chance to save their marriage. Brian thought so. He got out of the car after Denise told him she wouldn't call the police to report what he had done. The brown sheet of plastic, the bleach sprayer, and the tools were with him when he left. As time went on, it became clear that Denise had miraculously lived. Denise called the fire department. Brian was quickly arrested and charged with kidnapping, which in Florida is a first-degree felony with a maximum sentence of life in prison. Besides that, 
he was charged with assault and armed burglary. The judge decided that Brian should stay in jail without bail. Cheryl Williams said she was hopeful that this new information would help solve the mystery of where her son went. Brian will not leave Denise with all the cash by herself. I pray that he will tell us what really happened, she told the New York Daily News. Brian did tell, and he was able to get a very good deal from the prosecutor. That kept him from getting a life sentence at first. Brian started his story by saying, I think we were all doing really well, but I wasn't a good husband. I found a note in my first wife Kathy's purse one day and knew she was cheating on me. I was after revenge. Denise and Mike and I often went to bars and concerts together. Denise and I had been friends since high school. I've never really liked her, but after Kathy cheated on me, I changed how I felt about other women. Brian and Denise started seeing each other in October 1997. What started as drunk sex at a rock concert quickly turned into regular secret meetings. We started getting together at hotels during the workday and did so whenever we could. Brian said he didn't want to get a divorce. Denise made it loud and clear that she would never leave her husband. She cared about what other people thought, and she didn't want to share custody of her daughter. Over time, the relationship grew into more than just meeting up for sex. Denise and Brian sent each other gifts and love letters because they saw themselves as a couple. It was clear that things could not keep going this way. They couldn't live without each other, and Denise didn't want them to get a divorce. It wasn't okay to hurt her image of a religious woman. Around this time, Mike almost died in a hunting accident, but Brian saved him. Denise saw an escape route all of a sudden. After the deal with the prosecutor is over, Brian will tell us the year 2000, which will lead us to talk about how Mike and Kathy died. For Denise, she wanted everything to be blamed on me and not on her. She also wanted it to be an accident instead of a murder so she could deal with it. Brian and Denise chose a boating accident after thinking about other options. By doing this, they planned the murder to get the most money from Mike's life insurance policy. They both knew that Mike had to be killed before the end of December 2000, when one of the three policies ran out. The plan was set. Brian told his friend that he had found a great place to hunt on the shores of Lake Seminole. Mike planned to go with Brian and get back home by noon so he could spend his anniversary with his wife. I told him that we were going to go to a special place and that he absolutely had to bring his wading boots with him. I had to make sure he took them with him because it was believed that if you fell overboard in wading boots, you would drown very quickly. The plan was to make death look like unplanned drowning. Brain pushed Mike out of the boat once they were in the water. He almost drowned, but he climbed up on the stumps and started wading through them to get to the shore. Brian became scared. I didn't know what to do. Mike started calling loudly for help. I didn't know how to get out of this situation. I had a shotgun. I was panicking, and I shot him in the head. I didn't think about what I was doing. Things didn't go according to plan, and I needed to cover up what happened. There was hardly any time left. I should have been back home by now and getting ready to go hunting with my father-in-law. No one knew I was at the lake with Mike, so I decided it would be best for me to drive home and pretend like I had overslept. I drove home and hoped that Kathy was still asleep. Katie was asleep. My phone was on the floor. I went to bed, called my father-in-law and apologized. Brian did all he could to make an excuse for himself. Then he concealed the corpse. Denise didn't know that Brian had killed Mike with a gun and buried him. He tried to tell her, but she didn't want to hear him. She was happy that her husband was dead. For as long as Denise lived, she thought that God had kept him from swimming out and let him drown. Brian says that they promised each other that they would never talk to each other again. It was okay for Denise and Brian to do what they did because they said Mike was killed because they couldn't live together. Brain would say in court, we said the money was just the cherry on top. It turned out that Brian was the one who put down the hat, boots, flashlight, and license. First, he had to keep the searchers from leaving a lake. Then, he had to find a reason to declare Mike dead so Denise could get insurance. Usually this takes five years, but the lovers got it done in seven months with social security and other benefits added in. Denise got around $2 million. Denise Williams was charged with first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, 
and accessory to a felony on May 8, 2018. She could get life in prison if found guilty. Denise said she wasn't guilty of all three charges. She was given a life sentence in prison in February 2019. Five months later, Ansley, Mike, and Denise's daughter got all of her late father's property and the insurance money that Denise was owed. Denise Williams appealed her conviction and life sentence in January 2020. Her lawyer told Florida's First District Court of Appeal that there was no proof that she had anything to do with the murder. In November 2020, the murder conviction was thrown out, but the 30-year sentence for planning to kill someone was kept. Denise is being held at the Florida Women's Reception Center right now. When she gets out, she will be 78 years old. To serve the rest of his sentence, Brian Winchester was sent to the Madison Correctional Institute in Florida. His current date to be freed is July the 30th, 2036. He'll be 67 years old. The daughter of Mike and Denise, Ansley, says her mother is not guilty and blames Brian Winchester. The woman wouldn't talk to any reporters about the case or her personal life. Cheryl and Nick Ansley's uncle says that they haven't been able to get in touch with Ansley. Cheryl is very sorry that she lost both her son and her granddaughter. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. The Mysterious Disappearance of Maya Militi In January 2021, the city of Chula Vista, California, had not been quiet for days. During lunch, office workers discussed city news. By late afternoon, they had consolidated what they'd heard over a family meal. Have you heard that? They stated that a young woman, a mother of three, had mysteriously vanished and each of them gave their own version of what had happened but none of them wanted to be in her shoes personally. Maya Militi, a 40-year-old Filipino-American woman, disappeared from her own home on January 7, 2021. Outdoor surveillance cameras captured my return home. Outdoor surveillance cameras captured my return home around 5 p.m. Following that, the woman was not seen again. The relatives of the missing woman who were knocked down, stunned by grief, distributed leaflets with Maya's of photos and hung posters throughout the city. Their concerns were understandable. My eldest daughter's birthday was on January 10, and she would never, ever miss out on this holiday. According to the woman's relatives, they all spoke in the same voice. She last contacted him on January 7, at 8.15 p.m. Dozens of volunteers and police officers searched for Maya Milite. They searched the wooded area, nearby neighborhoods, the creek, and an abandoned golf course, but found nothing. Larry Milete, the missing woman's husband, never participated in the search for her. Furthermore, after some time, he severed all ties with her relatives. For a long time, the police assumed that Maya had left her husband after another argument. However, when she left the house, she may have been caught on the neighbor's CTV camera. So she either stayed in the house, climbed out the window, or left in another way. What could be the reason for such strange behavior on the part of a man? Maya who stood out from the crowd due to her unusual beauty, most likely had a lot of admirers and possibly more than one affair. It is possible that she lost her feelings for her husband without informing anyone. She ran away from him, but not alone. Perhaps this is why he was angry and did not take action. Larry claimed that I believed she was still alive because she voluntarily left our home at least twice in 2020. Without saying goodbye to myself or our three children, we prayed for her safety and well-being. God blessed Amitabha Alonzo with six children. Maya was born fifth. The girl was born in May. Her parents gave her the name May. She was successful everywhere. The girl's determined nature aided her in this endeavor. Thus, it is an elementary school. Following her family's immigration, she was among the top five students in her class. In March 1995, the girl enrolled in Redford High School in Honolulu, Hawaii, and began to express herself. She actively participated in a variety of school and extracurricular activities, with a particular emphasis on drama club and dance lessons. After graduating from high school with honors at the age of 17, Maya got a job at McDonald's, where she met her future husband Larry Millett, and they developed a relationship. 
When Maya turned 19, they married. At the same time, the girl enrolled at the University of Hawaii at Manila, a land-grant state research university. Life was boiling for the youth. While Maya was attending university, her husband Larry was training in the Navy in Virginia. The couple eventually decided to relocate to Chula Vista, California. Maya continued her studies at the University of San Diego because she did not want to stop. After graduating with honors, she became a civilian contract specialist for the United States Navy. Where are the strange noises coming from? What are my thoughts? Am I already going crazy? And are they unreal? The phrases I love you, love me echoed slightly throughout the house. They kept the young woman awake all day and night, haunting her in various locations throughout the house. My family did not stop looking. They immediately hired a private investigator to focus the attention of those who cared. The family repeatedly asked the public to assist them in their search for her. On February 5, 2021, the Chula Vista Police Department and the Millet family held a briefing to encourage as many people as possible to search for her. Soon after, skeletal remains of Maya Millet were discovered in Orange County. However, this was not the case. It was later claimed that the remains belonged to a man. It was later discovered that the remains were actually animal bones. Good Morning America covered Maya's disappearance on April 6, 2021. The missing person case sparked national attention in April 2021. My sister appeared on Dr. Phil's talk show to discuss the situation, and Maya took everything very seriously. Despite coming from a large family, she had a strong attachment to children. She was in no hurry to get them. She did not want to give birth until she and Mary had a consistent, stable, and high income. That is the American dream. After all, they had to give their children the best possible future in order to make it happen. They had to work extremely hard and diligently. The right moment arrived in 2010. Then my son Larry had a daughter, Laura. A year later, Milani, her second daughter, was born. In 2016, Maya was an excellent mother to her heir son Lazarus, Tristan. She dedicated all of her free time to her children, giving them her all. She attended all of their school events and accompanied them in her SUV. Some women's children become the center of their universe, intelligent, indulgent, and caring. Maya was one of these women. By the end of 2020, the couple's relationship was strained. Larry assumed Maya had a lover. Her husband's jealousy knew no bounds, and while she could previously tolerate these attacks, she could no longer. Later, the D8's office reported that Maya had warned Larry about his anger. Police say Maya texted a friend just two days before his disappearance to end their marriage. I informed him that I was filing for divorce, whether he liked it or not. She claimed that I was no longer trying to make peace for the sake of the children. Larry frantically controlled his wife's every move. The jealousy was turning into complete paranoia. Larry could visit her office at any time to ensure that Maya was not alone with another man. Larry was also irritated by the fact that there were so many men on his wife's team. Larry once had the audacity to email my former boss, Derek Soft, and request that a male colleague be transferred to another division. He followed her around the clock and even got the kids involved in their arguments. Larry once hit a child's cell phone in his wife's car to track her movements. Larry became increasingly violent. He nearly strangled Maya after the couple separated, but not for long. Maya moved in with her brother in early 2020, but she and Larry rekindled their relationship after about six weeks. On August 12, 2020, Maya texted her brother, Junior, he never left me alone. He checks all of my emails, messages, messengers, and Facebook updates. He even checks my Venmo app. And then what happens? He simply tightens the reins harder. Larry was not initially a suspect, but police are now very interested in discovering his identity. Investigators contacted my relatives, who stated that shortly before the disappearance, the couple had gone camping and spent the entire time fighting. Maya returned from her camping trip and informed her family that if anything happened to her, Larry would be notified. According to the case file, my friend informed police that Maya had made a different statement in December 2020. I don't think he would hurt me, but I believe he would hurt the kids to get back at me. Prosecutors say the mother of three did not elaborate on what she meant at the time. When we fall in love, for better or worse, we only see the object of our adoration in rosy light. Frequently, we project our personality traits and outlook on life onto our partner without noticing the red flags 
as they are known in psychology, that may indicate the presence of an underlying problem or a potential threat to the well-being of the relationship. We justify abusers, manipulators, narcissists, and aggressors by citing deficiencies in upbringing and stress, but we should look deeper. Apparently, nature is so laid down that families were created mostly in youth when the whole world is presented in rose-colored glasses, so to speak for a great sometimes blind love, so that the human race did not stop. Hmm. And after a while, having gained the necessary life experience, we see in a partner what was so carefully hidden from us at first glance, and we consider re-educating, smoothing out all the sharp edges in order to reconcile. But you can't change an adult man. It only remains to prevent him from expressing his negative traits. This is the case for jealousy. If a person experiences certain traumatic events, paranoia is not far behind. Returning to the sound Maya heard, it's possible that the woman had developed hallucinations as a result of her family's problems, but this was not the case. The situation took an unexpected turn. Maya remained sane, which is not the case with Larry. A police detective named Lorenzo Ruiz told the public the story of Larry's internet search, releasing screenshots of queries such as subconscious wife training and subconsciously training your wife to give pleasure. Larry began to exert influence over my subconscious mind after we were unable to reach an amicable agreement. By installing various devices throughout the house that produce this sound, Maya discovered Larry's cutting ruse. According to Matthew Grindley, an investigator for the San Diego County District Attorney's Office in late 2020, Maya sent Larry messages demanding that he stop playing audio messages, demanding that he stop playing audio messages that harm people's mental health. This is a type of influence that causes a person to take specific actions. Maya heard the sounds every day. My sister-in-law, Genesis ter in law Genesis Tab Alonzo, later told investigators that Larry had independently recorded all of these words and confessed to Genesis about it. Who could have motivated Larry to do such a thing? Perhaps the job specifics and the training he received while serving gave him the idea. The answer will astound many. The investigation discovered that Larry sent over 1,000 messages to various spellcasters and psychics between September 2020 and Maya's disappearance. He spent more than $1,000 with dollars with them on approximately 70 spell charms. During a home search, police discovered a book titled Magical Love Spells. Larry sent messages to similar witches and warlocks at least once a day. He requested a spell to cause Maya to suffer some kind of physical injury that would render her unable to move around on her own, possibly becoming disabled in general and completely dependent on her husband. Larry hoped that Maya would appreciate his concern at such a difficult time, as well as the fact that he had not abandoned her in her hour of need. After all, he is a very good man. This is what he wrote in his messages. I'd like a powerful spell to bind my wife, Maya Milite, to me forever, causing her to love me unconditionally as I love her. I hope you can cast a spell that causes bodily harm or maiming, but not killing. Maya was finally convinced of her intentions after witnessing everything that was going on, including Larry's gradual mental breakdown. Maya and her husband decided to divorce in December of 2020. Every life event, including actions, has an initial mechanism known as a trigger. According to police, Larry's desire to lose his beloved grew stronger with each passing day on January 7th. The day authorities believe Maya contacted a divorce lawyer, he was desperately trying to overturn my spouse's decision to file for divorce. I'm shaking inside, ready to snap, he wrote to one of the spellers earlier in the day. Maya contacted a divorce lawyer. By the way, attorneys reported that Maya planned how she would serve Larry with divorce papers because she was concerned about his reactions. She considered moving elsewhere, then suing him, and even made a backup plan to stay in a friend's vacant apartment. However, Maya did not want to leave her children behind. When the defendant learned she was seeking a divorce, she did not want the children with him, according to prosecutors. Larry's extreme behavior triggered by jealousy of his spouse could also be attributed to the man's mental health issues, which had been dormant for some time. Perhaps he always behaved differently than others. Larry, on my end, did not put out the trash. Larry's behavior was increasingly reminiscent of a psychopath. Larry has an absolutely horrible temper. Maya sent a text message in June, according to the case file. In his own home, he built a small altar in the center of which he placed a joint photo with his wife. Larry smeared his own blood on the photograph and surrounded it with four candles. On January 23, 
police officers obtained a search warrant for the Millet family's home. They discovered 16 firearms in Larry's home, two of which were illegally possessed. Larry's four licensed guns were missing. When police officers asked where the weapons had gone, the man explained that he had loaned them to his friend and uncle. Larry received a restraining order for the weapons in May 2021, and he was required to surrender them to the authorities. This was justified by the fact that police discovered peace chairs in Larry's young son surrounded by guns in his home. It was possible that the children had access to it, so the court issued the order the day after my disappearance, around 6.45 am, out of fear that they would harm themselves. A neighbor's surveillance camera captured the Millet family's black Lexus Gex 460 SUV. Larry drove the man home at around 6 p.m. Where he had been all that time is unknown. Another suspicious moment, the car was originally parked in such a way that the back of it was not visible to the neighbor's security cameras. As we mentioned at the beginning of this story, my family was planning a birthday party for her oldest daughter on January 10, 2021. So when Maya stopped answering calls and texts, one of her siblings went to Chula Vista to make sure everything was fine. When my brother met with Larry, the latter informed him that the night before, following their argument, his wife went to one of her rooms, locked herself in, and was not speaking to anyone. Larry took his son to Solana Beach, a coastal town in San Diego County. When he returned, Maya remained in the locked bedroom on the second floor. On January 9, Larry repeated the story about the locked room to my relatives, but no one believed him. The relatives demanded that Larry give them access. My family entered the room, and it was empty. Maya was nowhere to be found inside the house. However, her car was parked outside the house. Only her credit card and driver's license were missing. Following that, around midnight, Maya's older sister Chris filed a missing person report with the police. Larry Miller expressed concern about his wife's fate on January 15, after she missed his oldest daughter's 11th birthday. Furthermore, on January 8, the day after my A disappeared, Larry did not text any of the psychics. According to prosecutors, on January 9, he requested that all spells on Maya be lifted and spells be cast on a man with whom Maya with whom Mayla was allegedly having an affair. Maya was unlikely to have left her home. Otherwise, the security cameras would have captured it. On the unfortunate day, another strange thing occurred. Larry and Maya's children were playing in the yard around 10 p.m., which was noticed by the Millet family's neighbor. He was surprised because it was late and cold outside at 9, 57 p.m. The neighbor's surveillance camera caught the sound of nine loud bangs. Police speculated that they could have been gunshots. Police were unable to determine the nature of the sounds based on audio analysis of the video. Larry had a large gun collection, including a 40 caliber Smith Wesson pistol, which police were unable to find in the house. According to court records, Billy Liddell, a junior attorney working with my family to investigate the case, discovered one incident from 15 years ago, specifically on the evening of April 30, 1997. In San Diego's Bay Terrace neighborhood, Maya met Larry Millett in high school after he relocated to Hawaii from San Diego with his family. Larry's arrest in 1997 for a juvenile gang. Related assault may have prompted the move. I have reason to believe Larry was involved in a gang, the attorney argued as a juvenile. Larry was arrested following a stabbing. The victim of the attack received multiple stab wounds and was transported to Mercy Hospital, where he eventually recovered. Criminal records, on the whole, tend to resurface in later life. Larry admitted in a January 2021 interview that he and Maya had an argument in 2020. Larry's cooperation with the police ended on February 3, 2020. On July 22, Larry was officially identified as a suspect. Investigators assumed that the 41-year-old man murdered his wife on the night of January 7 and then disposed of her body. Larry told the same story during interviews that my relatives had heard about the argument in the room his wife had locked herself in. By strange coincidence, his phone was turned off for approximately 11 hours on January 8. Larry did not show up for work that day, and no one was sure what he was doing. It was impossible to track his movements. Unfortunately, the neighbor's video surveillance camera is a silent witness to the events that occurred and is unable to communicate. The camera captures Larry driving his car up to the garage in such a way that the rear of the vehicle is not in view. Larry may have known which part of the scene the camera was capturing and positioned the car accordingly. During this time, he was able to safely carry his body through the garage before loading it into the trunk and driving away to dispose of it. 
Following his arrest, the man was kept in custody and denied bail. Larry Millett was arrested on October 19, 2021 for the murder of his wife Maya based on circumstantial evidence and his parents were granted legal custody of the children. The court barred Larry from having contact with his children in order to prevent further emotional trauma. However, the man violated the injunction more than once. He called his relatives who allowed him to speak on the phone with his children. He made over 100 phone calls and spoke with his children for more than nine hours, according to prosecutors. During some of the calls, Larry made disparaging remarks about my family or requested that news headlines be read to him. He asked an 11-year-old girl and her 10-year-old sister to watch a movie called Shot Caller, which is R-rated and contains a warning, according to Deputy District Attorney Christy Bowles. Essentially, it's the story of a businessman who goes to jail. Larry suggested that children watch it to determine the type of environment he was in. Result of the court. Larry was prohibited from making any phone calls other than those to his attorney. However, Larry was granted permission to communicate in writing with his children as early as October 2022. He was still prohibited from communicating with them via personal visits or the telephone to ensure that the children continue to attend their current Chula Vista schools. They were given custody to their paternal grandparents on October 19, 2021. My sister also sought custody of her nephew but was denied. My family was allowed to visit the children, but they still wanted to seek full custody of them in court. The judge directed Larry Millett's parents to facilitate maternal visitation with the family and work to obtain mental health services for the minors. When visiting the children, relatives are not permitted to discuss any details of ongoing criminal or probate cases with them. In fairness, the children were left in the care of the parents of their mother's alleged killer in a town where everything reminds them of the tragedy. Perhaps the court should have sided with my sister and granted her custody. Larry's lawyer filed an appeal in June 2022, claiming the man lacked the mental capacity to stand trial. However, after a psychiatric evaluation, Larry Millett was found competent. It is unlikely that an insane man would have been aware of his actions in cleaning up his tracks. When Larry's seized cell phone was examined, all of the text messages he sent to his wife were found to have been deleted. When asked where the correspondence had gone, Larry explained that he just wanted to free up space on his phone. That's an unusual response, because the messages don't take up much space on the device. During trial, it was discovered that Larry had taken a large sum of money from his bank account. Larry may have been planning his escape with the money in hand. Perhaps he simply wanted to relocate to another city and begin a new life with his children after being charged with murdering his wife and possessing illegal weapons. Larry Millett's trial is set to take place in 2024. However, the trial has been postponed and rescheduled several times. Could it be a case of so-called circumstantial evidence? After all, circumstantial evidence is evidence based on inference linking it to a fact. For example, fingerprints found at a crime scene, direct evidence supports the truth of a statement directly. That is, without the need for additional evidence or inference, it is easy to become perplexed without the necessary legal knowledge and experience. In any case, the situation is unfolding before our eyes and picking up speed. One thing remains constant and tragic. The seemingly prosperous family is destroyed. The mother has vanished and is presumed dead. The father is in prison and appears to be the perpetrator of the atrocity. The three kids are left without parental love. Three innocent souls permanently traumatized, left to live in a society that will repeatedly remind them of what happened, whether in reproach or out of pity, breathing the wound. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Detective Jeremy Ogden from the Hobart, Indiana Police Department gazed upon a manuscript that had kept him busy for months. It revealed an emotionally wrenching tale involving 53-year-old Christopher Reagan's tragic story. Born in Detroit, Michigan, and receiving his education there, Christopher decided at the age of 20 to join those willing to protect their country by enlisting as an active duty soldier. Upon being accepted into service with honor and devotion by standing guard over citizens' peace, he forever changed his destiny with his choice to join. 
Christopher was sent to a military base near Marquette. While there, fate brought Christopher together with Terry from Iron River. Their friendship developed over time after meeting as young people often do on city streets. Shy people may hesitate to say hello, but they eventually began walking together and became closer friends over time. They remained close for years since Christopher's service prevented any chance for more meaningful relationships to form between them. At one point, Chris decided to leave military service and move to Traverse City, located nearby but far from where his beloved lived. But this did not become an obstacle to their feelings. On the contrary, communication became even stronger between them. Christopher proposed to Terry that they start an extended romantic relationship, knowing each other for years but never violating any boundaries or ethical rules. She readily agreed, and their long-distance romance began shortly afterward. Soon enough, Christopher and Terry realized they shared many interests, from appreciating nature to preferring an organized lifestyle to yearning for peace. Iron River became their ideal location, and they decided to move together. Christopher moved in with Terry while finding employment at a factory producing parts for military ships. Soon enough, he even had subordinates who reported directly to him. Life was finally looking bright, but after two years, complications arose in their relationship, with passion slowly diminishing as Christopher and Terry failed to address its difficulties. It eventually became evident that this could not continue, and they took the difficult decision to part ways peacefully and remain friendly toward each other. Christopher realized he could no longer continue living at Terry's house, so he decided to rent his own place instead. As time progressed, Chris realized he wanted a change of scenery as well. Iron River seemed too small, so Chris began looking for more dynamic cities like Asheville in North Carolina. Fate presented Christopher with the chance to start over and embark on an entirely new chapter of life. Not only would Asheville provide him with job opportunities, but it would also offer picturesque, natural attractions, perfect conditions to launch himself into life anew. Christopher told Terry on October 14th that he had taken off work due to a doctor's appointment, suggesting they meet and go for a walk as they often did while living together. Christopher then proposed they meet later that afternoon and join her. Terry became worried when Christopher failed to contact her after October 15th and didn't return any calls or text messages from her girlfriend, Terry. Concerned for Christopher, Terry reached out to mutual friends, but they knew nothing. Ten days later, she filed a police report regarding Christopher's disappearance. Terry filed a report, but police quickly comforted her, assuring her that people often disappear for periods of time, only to return at some later point, sometimes even ending up somewhere new. Additionally, Terry revealed to police officers that Christopher had recently received a job offer in North Carolina. For them, this was another indicator that Christopher may have reached his new residence and begun living a completely different life after having cut all ties with the past. Investigators quickly launched an extensive investigation to disprove speculations. To do this, they identified Christopher's newly hired company and spoke to one of its employees to discover any information regarding Christopher. However, none could be obtained as Christopher hadn't shown up at work for over 10 days. Police speculated he might have been injured due to frequent trips outdoors alone. Search forces heated into nearby woods looking along routes Christopher had used. Specially trained dogs were deployed, yet no sign of Christopher was ever discovered. Terry suggested visiting Christopher's former apartment to ensure no accident had taken place, or perhaps find any traces that may give an idea as to his current whereabouts. Agreeing with her suggestion, investigators went directly to his former place of residence. They were shocked at what they found. Items scattered across the floor and closet doors open. Their initial thought was likely Christopher was just being disorganized. However, Terry quickly dismissed this theory, asserting he wasn't as messy. Detectives began to suspect that all these circumstances might be linked to Rand's disappearance. So, after inspecting her home, it was decided to expand their search efforts and locate him on an even wider scale. Police searched carefully through the neighborhood before eventually discovering Reagan's car outside the city limits, about eight miles from Iron River. Since it appeared unlikely, he left it there intentionally. One door needed to be broken open for entry into it. At first, there was nothing suspicious in the vehicle's interior. On its seats were ordinary clothes typically found among locals, a hat, coat, and gloves. 
But one of the policemen noticed something peculiar on the front passenger seat, a small piece of yellow paper bearing an illustrated map describing an itinerary for travel. No specific addresses were indicated, only an itinerary, so they decided to follow it closely. Terry explained to Christopher that despite living in Iron River for years, he still hadn't learned the names of streets and roads, so he wrote down directions like turning at a bus stop or passing gas stations as guides for navigation. Terry noted that Christopher had indicated in his notes that this was his first trip to this location. Terry and her colleagues followed the route indicated on a piece of paper and stopped in front of a house listed in Christopher's notes before heading toward their final destination in a neighboring town. Investigators knocked on the door. They needed to establish who lived there and why Christopher had traveled this way. Jason Cochran was surprised when uniformed men appeared outside his home. Shortly afterward, his wife Kelly appeared, and they were informed by officers of Christopher Reagan's disappearance that his abandoned car contained a piece of paper that pointed toward this address as part of their investigation. Kelly candidly revealed that she and Christopher worked at the same plant and were close. Although they hadn't spoken since mid-April, Kelly did manage to reconnect with Christopher in mid-June. Kelly Cran attempted to reach Chris via text messages between September and October, but received no reply. She assumed he had moved to North Carolina in search of employment, or possibly due to health concerns. Kelly also mentioned Christopher was having health problems and may have decided to start over somewhere new. When investigators found an address written down on a piece of paper found in Christopher's car, they became confused. Nonetheless, the couple remained willing to cooperate in any investigations that came their way. After brief questioning at Christopher's home without finding what they needed, detectives decided to head out. Their next phase involved speaking with Christopher's co-workers at work before proceeding to interview workers and supervisors at his factory. One supervisor made mention of an affair between Christopher and Kelly Cochran, a rumor circulating among workers. After hearing this claim, investigators decided to re-interview both parties involved so as to gain clarity as to their true natures and establish exactly what had transpired between them. Kelly ultimately acknowledged her affair with Christopher but could not tell him due to Jason being present. According to Kelly, their open relationship was fine with Jason being aware of any such affairs on the side. However, discussing such sensitive topics might hurt his feelings and be painful for both parties involved. Christopher's co-workers refuted Kelly's statements claiming Jason approved of their affair or there being any loose connections among their family as she claimed. Jason followed Kelly into the police office and their conversation revealed his opposition to Kelly's infidelity vehemently, thus making him an obvious suspect. However, due to a lack of evidence linking Jason with Christopher's disappearance, it became impossible for officers to conclude anything conclusively against Jason or Kelly. They had no choice but to release both from detention. The investigation continued for five months without yielding any clear resolution of its mystery. On March 5, 2015, Hobart Police Department Detective Jeremy Ogden took on the case immediately and began actively working it. Ogden began by conducting a comprehensive analysis of Kelly Cochran and Jason Cochran's history, meeting in high school before moving in together post-graduation. Their personalities couldn't have been any more different. Kelly was open and loved talking, while Jason preferred listening more than starting conversations first. Despite these differences, Jason and Kelly decided to marry. Following their wedding, the two started their own company providing swimming pool maintenance services. It was modest, but provided them with a decent income. Most of Jason's pool maintenance duties fell upon his shoulders until overwork and strain took its toll. Jason began experiencing back problems and felt heavier every day. Eventually, Kelly took over running the business. When it became clear he couldn't continue running it himself, Though this period proved challenging, she remained hopeful that Jason would soon recover and resume his duties once more. Kelly searched for ways to help Jason recover since medical drugs weren't providing enough relief. One day she learned of a plant that offered hope for Jason's recovery. Unfortunately, its use in medical practice hadn't started yet and wasn't available everywhere they lived. It had even been banned in their state. To get this drug, they moved from Florida to Michigan's Iron River Township. Jason could visit his doctor and receive his prescription for this miracle plant. Suddenly, his agony would finally end. 
Early in 2014, a plant that specializes in manufacturing parts for U.S. warships hired 34-year-old Kelly Cochran, who had moved with her husband, Jason. Kelly made every effort to secure financial well-being for herself and Jason. Therefore, they accepted employment at Christopher Reagan's plant, where Kelly also worked. Over time, Christopher and Kelly discovered commonalities of conversation that helped foster their friendship. This proved particularly vital, as Christopher had recently experienced difficulty with Terry in his relationship. After reviewing all available evidence, the prosecutor made a strong argument to a judge in Michigan in support of obtaining a search warrant for Cochran's residence. After successfully receiving a ruling from the judge on March 5th, she sent investigators straight away on March 6th to locate Cochran's address. Searches were carried out of the Cochran home with extreme care, looking for any signs that Kelly and Jason may have played any part in Christopher's disappearance. Unfortunately, all efforts proved futile. The only significant discovery was a book written by Jason under a pseudonym from video gaming culture. Although its title may cause amusement, its content was truly disturbing. Jason detailed horrific murder scenes of everyone who had wronged him. One character matched up perfectly with Christopher as they read through this dark and violent work. Suspicion increased surrounding Jason. Perhaps his crimes weren't made up, but instead stemmed from actual incidents he had committed himself. With these concerns in mind, investigators decided three weeks later to conduct another search of the Cochrane House, hoping to unearth the evidence missed during their previous search. When police officers drove up to their home, they noticed no vehicles present and that both the yard and driveway were empty as no answer came when knocking at their door. No one answered the door when knocked. As soon as Kelly and Jason had left town after the initial search, they moved quickly into Indiana prompting investigators to become concerned they might never find evidence they needed for months, especially DNA samples of suspects like Jason Cochran. Michigan police officers reached out to their Indiana counterparts, asking them to collect samples instead, prompting Indiana officers to head toward Cochran's new address to take DNA samples instead. Ready to assist their Michigan colleagues, Indiana officers then traveled directly to Cochran's new address where DNA samples would be taken before heading directly toward Jason, Cochran's new address. The couple didn't object, seeing no legitimate basis to charge them with murder, nor evidence of Christopher Reagan. Meanwhile, investigation gradually disbanded, leaving little hope of solving his disappearance. Time passed until, on February 22, 2016, an alarming phone call arrived at Hobart Police Station from Kelly Cochran, who was clearly distressed over what had transpired. She attempted to explain that Jason wasn't breathing, but her emotions rendered it impossible for her to provide concrete details. Rescuers arrived quickly on the scene where Kelly attempted to prevent doctors from treating Jason due to her extreme terror and panic. Soon enough, however, it became evident that Jason no longer required assistance. Sitting in a chair, with his face lit up like it had been from extreme overheating, doctors were forced to confirm his death and send his body for forensic examination while Kelly was handed over to a police patrol who took her back home with relatives living nearby on her street. Investigators were determined to ascertain what had transpired, so they conducted a search of Cochran's new home and discovered evidence in the form of a syringe needle at the foot of the marital bed. After inspecting Jason's body, an investigator concluded that his death was due to illegal drug abuse. However, this report came as a shock for detectives. Jason had an excessive amount of illegal substances in his system. However, the results from forensic tests indicated something more disturbing. His death had been caused by strangulation as evidenced by bruises on his neck and face. So Jason, who had been suspected of kidnapping Christopher Rian himself, became himself the victim of crime. This revelation raised new questions and necessitated a thorough re-examination of evidence. Immediately thereafter, forensic specialists turned their focus onto Kelly Cochran, whom many suspected as being linked to both incidents. She became suspect not only for Christopher's disappearance, but also in her husband's murder. The investigation became even more complex. On February 23, 2016, Kelly Cochran was summoned to testify in Jason's murder case at the police station. Investigators directly interrogated her about her possible involvement in his death, 
and whether she administered excessive doses of illegal drugs to him. Regardless of the lack of concrete evidence and pressure from investigators, this young woman did not confess to either the murder of Jason or the kidnapping of Christopher. Investigators were unable to find sufficient proof of Kelly's guilt and were unable to arrest him, leading Detective Jeremy Ogden on a trail that eventually brought him face to face with Walter Hammerman, one of Jason's closest allies. During this investigation process, Detective Ogden met up with Walter Hammerman. Walter immediately ran to the police upon hearing of Kelly's shocking story of Jason's tragic death from illegal drugs, emphasizing how close they were. Walter assured his partner that any changes would certainly have been communicated. Jason had been taking medicinal herbs with the sole aim of relieving his back pain for quite some time now, yet Walter noticed his friend had fallen into an unstable situation recently. In March last year, Jason revealed his concerns with him regarding travel arrangements to Indiana due to Iron River police involvement in a disappearance case. All this had had a lasting impactful impression upon Jason. Walter witnessed Kelly become severely depressed and attempted suicide, necessitating medical intervention and therapy. Walter noticed a distinct change in Kelly's behavior as he took more control over his life. Jason seemed on edge, while in the past, the boys could spend hours playing video games together. Now he would avoid parties whenever his wife returned from work. This information became crucial in understanding what was transpiring within the Cochran family. After learning that Jason had died by strangulation, Detective Ogden devised an intricate plan to force Kelly Cochran to reveal the truth regarding Christopher Rian's fate. Walter, Jason's close companion and close ally, was chosen as bait, intended to lure Kelly into an incriminating trap and cause her to make mistakes that could potentially compromise Christopher Rian. Walter accepted a difficult role within this investigation while playing out this performance before Kelly Cochran. On March 12, 2016, Walter called Kelly while under surveillance by police officers with listening devices, intending to present her with a letter purporting to come from Jason that contained something important and urgent. Walter explained to Kelly that Jason gave this letter shortly before his death with instructions not to open it and send it immediately to police should anything occur. This came as quite a shock, both to Walter and to those watching over their situation. Yet even with this development, detectives had no direct evidence against her husband's killing. Investigators conducted numerous interrogation sessions with Kelly in an attempt to extract the truth. She denied her guilt throughout. On April 26, 2016, however, it became evident that Kelly Cochran had managed to slip away from their scrutiny. It seemed a mockery of justice and detectives immediately joined forces with police officers from Iron River and Hobart in launching a federal manhunt against Kelly Cochran. Walter Hammerman was both shocked and alarmed that Kelly hadn't yet been apprehended. He worried she may get away with this crime once more and later attack him in return. Her phone had also been disconnected as though she were playing a cat and mouse game with the police. Detective Jeremy Ogden managed to piece together after two long and hectic days of trying, that Kelly Cochran had managed to avoid detection by fleeing to Kentucky's Wingo Town, more than six hours away from Hobart. On April 28th, Kelly was located at her cousin's house by police officers who issued the same warning. As soon as they received this information, an arrest team quickly proceeded to the house, knowing Kelly could be dangerous and likely attempt to flee. They moved swiftly without warning, and Kelly was apprehended and taken into custody that afternoon. Later that same evening, Detective Ogden arrived in Wingo, where he resumed interviews with suspect, alongside investigators from Indiana and Michigan. Once I spoke with Kelly Cochran, everything became crystal clear. Christopher Rian and Kelly's relationship went deeper and further than anyone imagined. Kelly truly loved him and dreamed of leaving this cursed city together and starting a new life together. But everything changed on October 13, 2015 when Jason learned about her cheating. They began fighting, and Jason remembered their wedding night pact whereby anyone found out cheating would be required to kill their partner as punishment. Kelly asserted that she never intended to take their agreement seriously. It had always seemed more like a joke to her. Jason warned Kelly if she didn't keep her vow, threatening that he would carry it out himself if necessary. 
Although Kelly didn't wish for this responsibility, she nevertheless helped Jason commit a horrifying crime. On October 14, 2015, Christopher Rian traveled to Kelly Cochran's house, hoping to take full advantage of their first meeting. Rian wanted every moment to count, their encounter, and every memory he would create together with Cochran. Kelly took full advantage of his absence from home to offer him dinner and an intimate time together. All plans went according to plan, their evening promised to be memorable. After dining together on the first floor of Kelly's house, according to Kelly, they moved up onto the second. But their solitude was abruptly interrupted when Jason burst in with a rifle in hand, panicked and terrified. Christopher quickly recognized he was trapped, while Jason took aim and fired one shot directly at Christopher's head without delay. Chris was mortally wounded by Jason's bullet and died instantly. Following this event, Jason instructed his accomplices to bring Christopher's body down into the basement where they dismembered it with a hacksaw. Eventually, all his limbs and head had been severed from its torso. The perpetrators then placed Christopher's remains into several trash bags before disposing of them by dumping them in the woods near Crystal Falls Village. Christopher's car was moved away to avoid suspicion while they thoroughly cleaned Christopher's house to erase evidence of crime. They had become accomplices in an awful crime. Kelly Cochran was open about her involvement in Jason Cochran's tragic death, saying the plan to commit the act came about after learning of Kelly having had an affair and Jason becoming jealous that Kelly had chosen someone else as his partner. According to Cochran, this idea of revenge came when Jason learned of Kelly having another lover and decided on taking drastic measures against Kelly in revenge for what had transpired between them. Kelly wanted revenge against Christopher for taking away their happiness together and feeling betrayed by Kelly's spouse. Kelly revealed how deeply in love with Christopher she was and felt that his absence had prevented them from living life fully. Kelly struggled to cope with both her loss and its accompanying pain on a daily basis. Kelly loathed Jason for forcing her into doing what he forced her into, realizing she couldn't continue living peacefully with it. An opportunity presented itself when Jason complained of backache on February 22, 2016. Kelly decided it would be time for action against Jason. Kelly convinced Jason to give her an overdose of medication. Unfortunately, however, its effects weren't instantaneous and Kelly covered his mouth and nose with her hands to ensure suffocation occurred before squeezing his neck to make sure Jason was dead, thus leading to bruised body parts on him. Kelly Cochran provided testimony that assisted law enforcement authorities to identify where Christopher's remains were buried. On May 18, 2016, Detective Jeremy Ogden, along with investigators and canine team, went to a site near Crystal Falls Village. This rarely visited neighborhood had become the site of an astonishing mystery. A team of investigators set off a thorough search around Lake Erie's surrounding woods, penetrating between trees to ensure no spots had been missed. One of their canine dogs suddenly sensed an odor and led the officers toward it. Officers were following the dog closely, expecting to discover something soon. Instead, it led them to an unassuming hill covered with fallen leaves and branches. Upon clearing this area, Investigators found objects including what looked to be human remains, unmistakably identifiable skulls. On closer examination, it was evident that Christopher Reagan had been murdered. A bullet hole attested to this. Investigators knew they had found Christopher's severed head. Additionally, there was evidence such as a 22 caliber bullet and broken gun found at the scene, as well as glasses belonging to Reagan that may have belonged to her. Dental records helped identify his remains, solving an investigation that had perplexed investigators for two years. Kelly Cochran was officially charged with murdering Christopher Rian and Jason Cochran in April 2016. On February 13, 2017, Michigan State Court officially arraigned this 34-year-old individual in Michigan State Court. The prosecutor noted Kelly was significantly reduced her role by being behind both crimes. Christopher only saw Kelly as a casual companion. Kelly, however, genuinely loved Christopher and planned for their future together. 
Christopher's refusal of her romantic advances resulted in fury, and Kelly decided to kill him by fabricating a story of an alliance between herself and Christopher's brother-in-law. Kelly confessed in court, yet presented another version. As per her allegations, she had been subject to abuse at the hands of her jealous husband, who orchestrated this act of violence. On November 9th, he hid in their basement and caught their lovers off guard before seizing an opportunity and using it as an excuse to grab a weapon in a fit of anger and shoot Christopher. Jason suggested dismembering Christopher Rian's body, and Kelly agreed by being threatened to kill Jason Cochran. When presented with this new version of events, however, the jury began questioning Kelly's guilt. After three hours of deliberation, they reached their verdict of premeditated murder of Christopher Rian, resulting in life imprisonment without parole for Kelly and 65 years for Cochran. Kelly Cochran was taken directly from the courtroom and sent directly to Crown Point Correctional Facility in Ypsilanti, Michigan, where she is serving her sentence with only regrets regarding her personal life. Kelly stated in one phone interview, I tried my best at doing what was expected, from school through college and marriage, but ultimately all my efforts went in vain. All I ever did was work while my husband entertained himself with computer games. At prison, Kelly Cochran continues to reveal details of her crimes and claims she and Jason committed additional offenses. Christopher was just one of their many victims. Unfortunately, due to Kelly not disclosing additional crimes committed or victims she claims existed at this point in time, it's difficult for anyone to corroborate Kelly's statements. Her brother heard from Kelly that there may have been others, yet there is no concrete proof to back that up yet. Detective Jeremy Ogden from Hobart, Indiana Police Department is carefully scrutinizing every aspect in hope of uncovering clues or uncovering evidence pointing towards any additional crimes committed by either of Kelly or Jason Cochran. Hopefully, it can close another chapter in this twisted tale. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. 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 Donna Ellen Brown was born November 10, 1963, in Florida. Donna was the eldest of three girls. She was attractive, intelligent, and successful in her job as an operating room technician. She met nuclear engineer Mark Winger, and the two married in a traditional Jewish ceremony in 1989. Donna and Mark appear to be the picture, perfect couple. They were successful and had a nice house in a nice neighborhood. However, not every story ends perfectly from the start. On Tuesday, August 29, 1995, at 4.27 p.m., Mark Winger called 911 to report that a man was harming his wife, Mark, who lived in Springfield, Illinois. His 31-year-old wife, Donna Winger, called the dispatcher to report that he had shot the man. When the cops arrived, Donna was in critical condition after being hit in the head with a hammer seven times. A 27-year-old man named Roger Harrington was found beside Donna in critical condition, having sustained two gunshot wounds to the head. Both victims were immediately transported to the hospital, where Roger died shortly after arrival and Darla died a few minutes later without regaining consciousness. The police secured the residence and discovered no evidence of forced entry. Mark, visibly distressed, told the police that he shot the man after witnessing the attack on his wife. Mark described how he was in the basement on the treadmill when he heard noises upstairs, prompting him to investigate. He found their adopted baby Bailey on the bed in the master bedroom, but no sign of Donna. When Mark heard more noises downstairs, he grabbed his handgun from the bedroom nightstand and headed for the dining room. Mark saw a man in the hallway wielding a hammer and assaulting Donna. Mark shot the man, and as he attempted to rise, he fired a second shot. The police discovered the bloodied hammer used in the assault which belonged to both Donna and Mark. The house also contained a .45 caliber semi-automatic handgun, which Mark confirmed was the weapon used. When Mark asked about the identity of the man who had attacked his wife, the police confirmed that it was Roger. Mark then said, that's the man who has been harassing my wife this week. According to Mark, Donna had traveled to Florida to visit her parents six days before. Her mother dropped her off at the airport and a driver named Roger 
hired through a limousine company in St. Louis, Missouri, drove her back to Springfield. According to Mark Donna, Roger was excessively talking and flirtatious during the two-hour drive, expressing a preference for older women and inviting them to intimate parties. The conversation took a dark turn when he revealed hearing a disturbing voice named Dom instructing him to harm others. Mark called the cops, saying the guy scared her. She stated that he was extremely frightening. He threatened to kill people, set car bombs, and mutilate them. Dawn has returned to Springfield. She informed her family about the unsettling encounter, expressing fear and discomfort as a result of the disturbing conversation and erratic driving. Mark told the police that, despite safely returning home, the situation persisted. Donna received several strange phone calls, and based on the timing, she suspected Roger was the caller. The police found a note in the house that described Donna's unsettling car ride. Mark also told the police that he reported the incident to Roger's employer, which resulted in Roger's suspension, which Mark believed could have exacerbated the situation. The police discovered Roger's car parked outside the Winger house, facing the wrong direction. They discovered various weapons inside, including a knife and a tire iron. Authorities concluded that Mark acted in self-defense and they chose not to press charges due to the traumatic circumstances. The case was closed with an acknowledgement that Mark had already experienced significant distress. Mark appeared deeply affected by the events. Mark and Donna had moved to Springfield shortly after their wedding, where they discovered happiness. Donna worked as an operating room technician at Memorial Medical Center, and Mark was an engineer with the Illinois Department of Nuclear Safety. Despite facing challenges, such as Donna's initial distress at learning she couldn't conceive, their lives took a positive turn when a doctor informed them of a teenager willing to place her baby for adoption. On June 1, 1995, Donna and Mark happily welcomed Bailey, their adopted daughter. Following Donna's tragic death, Bailey, now responsible for the infant, chose to remain in the same house. To help with childcare, he hired a nanny, Rebecca Simic. Rebecca unexpectedly became pregnant a few months into her job and gave birth to a daughter named Anna. Mark and Rebecca married just over a year after Donna died. Mark decided to sell the house and sever ties with Donna's family. The new family, Mark, Rebecca Bailey and Anna, relocated to a different town. They gradually expanded their family by adding two more children, Maggie and Ben. Donna's close friend Donna Schultz told the police in 1999 that she had an affair with Mark while Donna was still alive and that Mark made troubling statements that she remembered. Donna Mark believes it would be easier for us to be together if Don had just died. All you'd have to do is enter and find the body. Donna also provided disturbing information that raised concerns with the authorities. When Mark learned about Donna's unsettling experience during the car ride back to Springfield, he allegedly told her that he needed the driver in his home. This revelation prompted the police to reopen Donna's case. However, they were disappointed to find that some evidence had gone missing. Mark filed a civil lawsuit against BART Transportation, seeking accountability for Diana's death as a result of Roger's actions. Roger's attorney requested access to the civil suit's evidence and files because he worked for BART Transportation at the time Diana died. Despite this, the police were able to save some files and access photos taken on the day of the incident. Donna and Roger are shown on the ground before being transported to the hospital. However, the positions of the bodies appeared to contradict Mark's earlier account given to the police years ago. Mark told the police that he saw Roger kneeling beside Donna's head, assaulting her with a hammer, which prompted him to open fire. Mark claimed Roger fell backward and in an attempt to get up, Mark shot him again. According to Mark's description, Roger's feet should have been near Donna's head facing the opposite direction. However, after reviewing the photos taken by the police upon their arrival, it appeared that Roger and Donna were both on the ground facing the same direction. This inconsistency prompted the police, for the first time, to suspect Mark of being involved in his wife's murder. The question of why Roger was at their house that day remained unanswered. Simultaneously, during the civil suit involving Mark, a possible explanation emerged. Bar Transportation hired a blood spatter expert who concluded that the blood spatter expert, who concluded that the blood spatter patterns indicated Marx's involvement in the deaths of Donna and Roger. As the police dug deeper into the case, they discovered more incriminating evidence. Susan Collins, Roger's roommate, informed law enforcement 
that she overheard Roger arranging a meeting with someone on the day he was killed. Furthermore, a note written on a bank deposit slip inside Roger's car was discarded, which contained Marx's name, address, and a time. Susan informed the police that Roger had mentioned agreeing to meet with Mark to resolve issues raised by Marx's complaints about Roger's driving and the concerning conversation he had with Donna. Roger left the house around 3.30 p.m. And the note indicated a meeting time of 4.30 p.m., which corresponded to the prosecution's belief that Mark had asked him to come to the house at that time. On August 23, 2001, Mark was arrested and charged with two counts of murder. The prosecution claimed that Mark was responsible for Donna and Roger's deaths. They claimed that Mark wanted to remove Donna from his life, but did not want to risk losing custody of their adopted daughter Bailey, so he avoided divorce. Mark allegedly saw an opportunity when he learned about Donna's problems with Roger, seeing it as an ideal opportunity to eliminate Donna and frame an innocent man. The prosecution proposed that Mark contact Roger, whom he had never met before that day, and invite him to the house. When Roger arrived, Mark allegedly led him inside and fatally shot him. This narrative was supported by the fact that there was no forced entry at the residence. The prosecution also claimed that Donna, who was in the master bedroom with Bailey when she heard the gunshot, went downstairs and was beaten to death with a hammer by Mark before dialing 911. The prosecution used a note found in Roger's car, which contained Mark's name and address, to prove that Mark had lured Roger to the house. The jury discovered that despite having weapons in his car, Roger did not bring them into the house and instead used Donna's hammer to attack. This raised questions about Roger's intentions, assuming he had gone there with the intent of assaulting Donna. The court was also made aware of inconsistencies between the location Mark claimed Roger was in when he shot him and photos taken on the same day, which contradicted Mark's account. Dean's testimony was crucial in shedding light on Mark's alleged statements, expressing a desire for Donna's death. The court learned that on August 25, 1995, four days before the murders, Mark inquired with his co-worker Candace Bolden about the fate of his adopted daughter if Donna died. Later that day, Mark complained to Ray Duffy, the president of the transportation company where Roger worked, about Donna's ride. Mark called back a few days later, asking for the driver's full name and expressing a desire to speak with him directly about the situation. During the trial, the court was informed of Donna and Roger's severe injuries. When the cops arrived at the house, Donna was found face down on the floor with Roger on his back. Donna died from brain trauma caused by multiple blunt force injuries to the head, consistent with hammer strikes. Roger died from brain trauma caused by gunshot wounds to the top left side of his head and above his left eyebrow, as well as contusions on his chest from hammer strikes. The defense argued that Roger's erratic decisions that day, such as his weapon choice and unusual parking, demonstrated mental instability. His behavior during the car ride with Donna supported the claim they made concerning the position of the bodies in the photos. The defense argued that while Donna and Roger were critical when paramedics arrived, they were not dead, and they may have moved in an attempt to save their lives. However, the paramedics denied moving them before the photographs were taken, and Mark did not testify at the trial. Regarding Deanne's testimony, the defense claimed she was motivated by personal feelings of rejection. While Mark admitted to having an affair with Donna, he married the nanny he hired shortly after Donna died. The defense claimed Donna harbored resentment for not being chosen by Mark to marry. Despite the defense's arguments, the jury convicted Mark of two counts of first-degree murder and sentenced him to life without the possibility of parole. While still serving time for his first-degree murder convictions, Mark became involved in a failed murder, for hire plot, in 2005. He allegedly attempted to orchestrate attacks on Deanne for testifying against him, as well as on Jeffrey Gilman, a childhood friend for failing to post his $1 million bail. Investigators discovered 19 handwritten pages that detailed Mark's desires for Donna. He allegedly wanted her kidnapped and forced to write a statement recounting her testimony, claiming Mark's innocence before plotting her death. Mark claimed in court that these notes were simply a fantasy he never intended to carry out. Despite Mark's assertion, he was found guilty of soliciting murder and sentenced to an additional 35 years in prison. Donna's mother, Sarah Jane, and stepfather, Ira Drescher responded strongly to the evidence against Mark, emphasizing the brutality of Donna's murder. 
What makes it difficult to understand is how he murdered Donna in such a vicious and violent manner. Throughout the legal proceedings, Mark has maintained his innocence. Donna, who testified against him, was granted immunity and received no charges as a result. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. The case of Sheila Labar, a monster with angelic features. Childhood psychological and physical traumas can have far-reaching consequences in adulthood. Of course, they do not always result in someone becoming cruel and attempting to harm others. However, trauma can sometimes create a true monster. Adrian Rain, a criminal psychologist, believes that there are genetic and psychophysical mechanisms that can transform a person into a cold-blooded killer, which he discusses in depth in his book, Anatomy of Violence. Many serial criminals in history had truly hellish childhoods, and perhaps our heroine today, Sheila Labar, can be attributed to them. This woman had an angelic appearance, which she skillfully used to seduce her victims before brutally murdering them. Despite the fact that the court was only able to establish two of her crimes, criminologists are confident that there were many more. And now let us look at this difficult story from the beginning to see if Sheila Labar was born a monster or if she became one as a result of the cruelty she experienced as a child. Who is Sheila Labar? Sheila Labar was born on July 4, 1958, in the small country town of Fort Payne, Alabama. She was the youngest of her parents' three children, raised alongside her brother and sister Lynn. Her childhood was spent on a picturesque but rather secluded farm surrounded by cornfields. Lynn's older sibling remembered Sheila as an active, inquisitive, and open-minded girl with a creative streak. She enjoyed being the center of attention, had a pleasant voice, and had a cute appearance. So if her life had gone differently, she could have become a famous actress or singer. Instead of bright posters, her name appeared on the pages of criminal chronicles detailing the unimaginable cruelty of her father, Manuel Bailey, the family's head, who had suffered from alcoholism for years although it would be more accurate to say that his addiction was influenced by his entire family. He frequently went on binges, transforming into a true beast who enjoyed abusing his wife and children. He insulted and humiliated them, beat them with whatever he could get his hands on, threw everyone out in the middle of the night in a downpour or frost, and locked himself inside the house. We are not allowing anyone inside. Mothers, daughters, and sons frequently had to spend the night in a barn or outdoors in the field. When Manuel became drunk again, and began throwing dishes and other objects at his family members, the mother did her best to protect the children. However, one of the flower pots thrown by her husband struck her youngest daughter Sheila in the head. Sheila sustained a severe concussion and a permanent scar on her temple, which he painstakingly covered with her hair. However, the insults and beatings were not the worst thing the sisters had to go through in their parents' home. According to Sheila and Lynn's memories, Manuel forced them to become intimate from a young age. The mother may have been aware of what was going on, but the matter was never discussed. Despite the nightmare at home, Sheila did well enough in school. She wished to leave the farm as soon as possible and conquer the big city. The girl was very ambitious and determined. She aspired to be an actress or a pop singer since she was a child, and he had everything for this charisma, a good appearance and a beautiful voice. Adulthood. First marriage. Sheila left her parents' home when she was just 18 years old, but adulthood was not as enjoyable. She was not permitted to enter university with an average score, and she lacked the funds to relocate to major cities. Then she got a job as a maid at one of the hotels where her older sister was already working. It should be noted that Sheila had a slim build and an attractive appearance. She had large blue eyes, a charming smile and thick long hair. She was surrounded by men's attention, which she eventually learned to use to manipulate her suitors. In the late 1970s, Labar Bailey met a man named Jonathan Baxter, and they began a romantic relationship. Jonathan was not yet 20 years old at the time, but he did have a young daughter from a previous relationship. However, the child did not cause any problems, and the couple married soon after. However, this marriage lasted only a few months and ended when Jonathan discovered that the young wife abused his daughter while he was away at work. Sheila was irritated with the child and would raise her hand or lock her in a closet if she began crying or acting up. Jonathan did not organize scandals or listen to explanations. 
He simply wants to file for divorce and leave his wife and his belongings outside his house. He did not want to see or hear from her again. Sheila dated several men after her divorce and mostly lived off of them. However, all of these relationships were fleeting, lasting only a few weeks or months, until she met her future second husband, Ronnie Jennings, in the early 1980s. Their turbulent romance quickly led to marriage, and Sheila adopted a double surname, Bailey Jennings. It was a toxic relationship between two erratic and unstable people who frequently cheated, scandalized, and even fought. Nonetheless, their marriage lasted over three years. In 1984, after another family feud, Sheila demanded a divorce from her husband, but he refused. In fact, Ronnie abandoned the relationship. He just wanted to piss off his wife and make her angry, and he succeeded. Sheila became hysterical, consuming a large number of drugs in front of her husband while drinking heavily. And after this infernal cocktail, he sat behind the wheel of the car and drove down the road. Sheila quickly lost consciousness under the influence of pills and alcohol, flew off the road, and collided with a tree at high speed. She miraculously survived, but with a massive head injury, she was in a deep coma for more than a week, and doctors gave no prognosis. When Sheila regained consciousness and began to recover, she was admitted to a psychiatric hospital for several months. She later complained to her sister that one of the orderlies was constantly harassing her, possibly taking advantage of her helplessness while she was heavily sedated. After all of this, Sheila returned home to her second husband, but she began to behave aggressively and threateningly toward him. During another scandal, she attacked Ronnie and poked him in the chest with nail scissors. Ronnie, fearing for his own life and health, filed for divorce and hurriedly left the madwoman, rich lover. When her second marriage ended, the young woman began looking for love in print media dating columns, where she also placed her own ads. However, no man stayed with her for long because she preferred to dominate everything rigidly suppressing their partners in both intimate and everyday life. Soon, a photo of an attractive girl in the dating section drew the attention of 60-year-old Wilfred, who built the bar. The man had already been married twice and had adult children and grandchildren from previous marriages. He was widowed a few years ago and has since lived alone on his large country ranch. Bill was a reasonably wealthy man. He owned a chiropractic office in Epping, New Hampshire, and raised horses on his ranch. At the same time, he was lonely and desired a strong, powerful woman. In fact, that's what he discovered. Sheila was drawn to her new acquaintance's wealth and decided that it would be the perfect union for her. To completely confuse Bill, she began sending him frank letters via postal mail, supplemented with her nude photos. The trap worked, and Labar soon invited a lovely pen pal to his ranch. Their romance progressed rapidly. An elderly man is generous with expensive gifts for a young mistress who moved in with him in the summer of 1987. This greatly pleased the doctor, who now ventured out in public with a lovely companion who was half his age and fit for him as a daughter. Nonetheless, he did not intend to marry Sheila. Sheila, however, did not wait for a marriage proposal and changed her name to Labar. Bill was surprised by the turn of events, but he did not object. Sheila began to meddle in her elderly lover's affairs, eventually taking control of his business, finances, and property disposition. Furthermore, Bill was getting older and could no longer meet a young woman's intimate needs. Then, according to Sheila, he allowed her to meet other men, whom she frequently brought to their home. One of Sheila's regular lovers in the mid-1990s was a Jamaican night she was a Jamaican national named Wayne Ennis. He was much younger than Sheila and was originally hired as an au pair on the ranch. However, the young man with Bill consent, who was most likely pressured by Sheila, soon moved into the owner's home. Sheila and Wayne officially legalized their relationship in 1995 and the spouse considered him to be her only man from that point forward. But he quickly realized he was mistaken because his wife continued to meet with various men. Wayne wasn't pleased with this and one day he jumped on Sheila and her next lover, causing them physical harm. Sheila, who had grown accustomed to being dominated, had no idea how to deal with her third husband, who got into a fight every time his arrival was announced. Eventually, she filed for divorce and requested a court order to prevent Elaine from approaching her, accusing him of violence and assault. Sheila's turbulent personal life was unaffected by another divorce, and she continued to meet with numerous lovers changing them like gloves. True, 
Her relationship was increasingly ending in lawsuits from men who accused Sheila of not only cruelty, but also threatening their lives and health. As a result, she intentionally hit one of her boyfriends with a car and nearly ran over him, while another nearly broke his head and scratched his face, leaving him permanently scarred. With age, Sheila became increasingly dangerous to others. He demanded obedience from all men and became enraged when they disobeyed. Bill Barr died from heart failure in 2000, when he was 74, although doctors and police officers did not see a criminal case in the death of an elderly man. His family believed Sheila had something to do with it. In their opinion, she had been slowly poisoning Bill for years, driving him into the light, despite the fact that Bill and Sheila were never legally married. Sheila, according to the will, became the sole heir to all of his property. The relatives attempted a legal challenge, but were unsuccessful. They remain convinced that the mistress coerced Bill into writing the wills he desired at House of Temptation. As previously stated, after Bill's death, Sheila gained complete control over all of his property. She no longer had to consider anyone's opinions. She could do whatever she pleased with the estate she had inherited. She herself described her home as a place of seduction and pleasure, with no inhibitions. She met men on the street, in bars and on the internet drew them to her, and then tried to keep them on the ranch for as long as possible. She wasn't concerned about their age, skin color, or physical appearance. She promised them earthly pleasures, but then attempted to suppress and subjugate them to her will. Sheila frequently tried to seduce couriers by meeting them naked and offering an alternative method of payment. But she didn't consider the fact that she was getting older and was no longer as attractive as he was. It got to the point where couriers refused to deliver to her address. Neighbors noticed that different men visited the ranch labar on a regular basis, but some left the same day. Others were delayed, but only for a short period. What was going on in the house itself could only be guessed, as Michael Delage had also disappeared. Sheila soon decided to look for lovers among men who were in desperate need of housing money particularly those suffering from addiction. This category was the most vulnerable, making it an easy target for the cunning woman who posed as a widowed millionaire and boasted about the untold wealth she had inherited. In 2004, Labara met Michael Delage, a homeless man on one of the city's streets. He had a difficult life and had lost everything due to his addiction to illegal drugs. His relatives attempted to send him to a rehabilitation clinic, but he fled and has been loitering ever since. Sheila liked Michael and invited him to her home, offering him shelter, food, and the necessary drugs in exchange for intimacy. Moving to the ranch, the man became completely reliant on his former mistress. He gave in to all of her demands, afraid of being on the street again. But Sheila quickly acquired the taste, and her desires became increasingly sophisticated. She bound beat and humiliated Michael, taking pleasure in it. He attempted to flee multiple times, walking dozens of miles and hiding in homeless shelters. However, he never went to the police because he was afraid they would not believe him. Meanwhile, Sheila tracked him down each time and returned him to the ranch. In desperation, he attempted to contact his family members and inform them that he was in trouble. His loved ones immediately reacted to the disturbing news, but it was too late. Michael Delage vanished in October 2005, leaving no trace. When his family contacted Sheila directly, she confirmed that she and Michael had split up. He had abandoned her, and his current location was unknown to her. Michael did not return to any of the places he had previously visited. Nobody who knew him had seen him, and there was no way to reach him. Contacting the police proved fruitless, and Labara remained behind on suspicion, relying on Kenneth County. Sheila's tales of her exorbitant wealth were greatly exaggerated, and the house and automobile needed to be maintained so she was forced to find work. Naturally, Sheila chose an occupation that suited her, becoming an operator of intimate phone services. Men were drawn in by her enchanting voice and offered to meet her in person. Among these men was Kenneth County, who was only 24 years old at the time they met. The young man had an attractive appearance and was friendly and open. However, he had a low Ike, which made him extremely gullible. This was precisely the type of guy Labar was looking for. Kenny was extremely close to his mother, on whom he completely relied. But Sheila, with the help of clever manipulations, was able to break this connection and literally lower Kenny to herself. She gave him an unforgettable night of love and promised that it would be like this all the time. The young man decided he had met the woman of his dreams. 
informed his relatives, and moved into Sheila's house. But Sheila soon revealed her true face to the guy, having set up a real torture room for him, and each time intimacy turned into a brutal beating, or worse. Kenny's skin was covered in bruises, abrasions, scratches, and burn marks. However, he was unable to leave the house of the mistress who had completely subjugated his will. Sheila forbade him from seeing or communicating with his loved ones, leaving his family to speculate about what was going on with Kenny. The first alarm was sounded by neighbors, who noticed the man and were horrified by his sickly appearance. A few days before his disappearance, a local store clerk took a photo of the young man with her cell phone camera, which was later attached to the case file in court. Kenny's condition appears to be deplorable in the photograph. He was extremely thin, with large bruises under his eye and cheek, and his nose was most likely broken. Judging by the degree of healing, all of these injuries were inflicted at different times, implying that the man had been brutally beaten for a long time. The contents of his cart were equally alarming. He rolled two large canisters of fuel to the cash register, which later turned out to be his own cremation. The store employees were perplexed and even terrified by the man's appearance, so they decided to report him to the police for possible domestic violence. But this time, Sheila got away with it, and they were unable to charge her with anything. Kenny soon stopped contacting his family completely, and when his worried mother arrived at Lavaz's house, the owner became aggressive and advised her to leave Kenny alone. All subsequent attempts failed, prompting Kenneth County's family to file a missing persons report with the police, indicating that he was being held forcibly at the country ranch, which included a home crematorium and gruesome findings. When police arrived at Sheila's home, she claimed that the young man no longer lived with her and that Kenny had fled because his mother, whom he was allegedly terrified of, began paying frequent visits. Sheila provided an audio recording as evidence, in which she asked her lover if his own mother had attacked him, to which he quietly responded in the affirmative. It all seemed more than strange. The very next day, an officer visiting Sheila obtained a search warrant for the estate. Sheila had previously been on the police's radar, and her name had been linked to yet another mysterious boyfriend disappearance. However, Sheila had never been questioned, and her home and grounds had never been searched. When the police arrived, they discovered that Labar was not at home, but there were several fires burning near the outbuildings. The fires appeared strange, and were made of improvised materials such as a mattress, pieces of wooden furniture, hay, and so on. All were doused with a flammable mixture. One of the bonfires contained bones that clearly resembled human remains. The squad requested reinforcements in the form of forensic experts and reported on their findings. But that was only the tip of the iceberg in terms of what they discovered next. Poorly washed blood traces were found almost everywhere in the house. It was so much that it looked like there had been a real massacre. It turned out that the blood was from at least three different people. The bones smoldering in the fire belonged to Kenny who had gone missing, and there were two empty fuel cans nearby, the same ones the boy had purchased at the local store the previous day. But that was not all. Also discovered on the property were the remains of Michael DeLodge, who had vanished a few years earlier, and some fingers of a third man who was never identified, among other things. A large number of items belonging to various men were fished out of the sump at the ranch, the fates of which have yet to be determined. The hostess was not at home at the time of the police visit. She realized what had happened and fled. Sheila hitchhiked to Boston, where she clearly hoped to get lost. Furthermore, on the way, she seduced one of the drivers who gave her a ride, and he kindly invited her to live in his home. However, the following day, after seeing on TV news about the search for a dangerous criminal, the new lover called the police and reported that Sheila was now in his bed. She was arrested there. During the search for Sheila's home, another terrifying discovery was made. A box of videotapes on which Michael and several other men confessed to horrific crimes. However, based on the guy's appearance and condition, it appears that these confessions were made under torture. Since Lavis's arrest, her mental health has sparked numerous concerns. Sheila was diagnosed with a delusional disorder and symptoms of schizophrenia after the court ordered the necessary evaluations. She described herself as an angel sent from heaven to protect children from rapists. Sheila's failing mental health became the foundation upon which your attorney attempted to build a defense. He referred to his client as a gravely ill person and attempted to demonstrate that she was unaware of her actions. The cause of this was the mental and physical trauma she had experienced as a child. The defendant claimed that many years ago, 
when she was involved in a terrible accident that left her in a coma, on the verge of dying. On the verge of dying, she met with God and the latter instructed her to rid the world of men who exploit children. Sheila's ex-husbands and some of her lovers testified in court calling her crazy, unstable, and extremely violent. And Wayne Ennis, the third husband, claimed that his ex-wife repeatedly persuaded him to kill Mr. Labar in order to seize his property. However, despite the defense's efforts to persuade the court that Sheila was insane and in need of treatment, it was established that she was aware of her actions at the time of her crimes. In July 2008, she was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of release. All of her appeals were denied. Sheila is currently serving her sentence in Florida at the Homestead Correctional Facility. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Where is the line that cannot be crossed again? How does an ordinary woman go from being a loving wife and mother to a cruel murderer capable of dividing a country into two opposing groups? And how did her name become a hot topic among locals and make newspaper headlines for years? Roxana Valdez could respond to this question. Murderers do not stand out in a crowd, are unrecognizable at dinner, and may even live under the same roof without revealing their true identity. They are indistinguishable from those who have never crossed the line. Thus, no one could have predicted what Roxana did on the spring evening of April 5, 2014. And when they found out, they couldn't believe it. But let us start at the beginning. Roxanne died, and little is known about her. Despite the efforts of numerous Chilean reporters who competed to tell her story, they were unable to find much information about her. Her criminal record provided little information beyond the fact that she was born in 1957 in a small village in Chile's Punta Arenas province. That was it. Perhaps the lack of information was due to journalistic ethics, as the locals, known for their fiery tempers and unique customs, may have retaliated against Roxana and his relatives for her crime, potentially turning their lives into a living hell. Valdez married a man whose name, for unknown reasons, is either unknown to the press or not disclosed. She had a son with him, but it's clear that her marriage was not the dream every girl hopes for as the couple split up in 2011. As a single mother in a small village with few jobs, Roxana faced significant challenges. In such communities, the primary occupation was growing and selling fruits and vegetables, and even local educational institutions emphasized agriculture Roxana found work at the Don Gregorio boarding school, where students were trained to become agricultural technicians. She worked as a night supervisor at the school, ensuring that students slept and did not engage in disruptive activities. Her responsibilities did not include the actual care of the children. Roxana's son also attended this boarding school because she worked in the fields during the day and was unable to give him the attention he required. Claudio Munoz Ramirez, who worked at the same boarding school as Roxana, was the head of grounds maintenance. His duties often required him to work at night, which is how he met Roxana. Despite being 14 years younger than her, they had a lot to talk about. Roxana would spend entire nights discussing school issues and her own failed marriage to Claudio. They also shared similar experiences in their personal lives. Claudio had two daughters that he adored, but he felt disconnected from their mother and considered divorce several times. However, he stayed in the marriage because of a promise he made to her late father. Claudio appears to have forgotten his promise and began spending his free time with Roxana, away from his family. Finally, he made a decisive move. He did not explain himself to his wife. Claudio gathered his belongings and left the house. He clearly went to Roxana, who gladly accepted him into her life. Their relationship developed quickly and effectively. Roxana invited a man she barely knew into her home, with whom she had only shared nighttime conversations. She seemed to overlook the fact that there were children nearby who required constant attention amid these enjoyable and heartfelt conversations. Roxana failed to notice his true personality. He was actually quite temperamental and sometimes even cruel. However, it was probably too early to say who was more cruel of the two. Claudio's first serious outburst of aggression occurred inside the boarding school. On a scheduled community cleanup day, students were given different areas to clean up. Brooms, buckets, dustpans, and rags were distributed to ensure a thorough cleaning. As is often the case, 
Some students protested and refused to protest it and refused to participate. Claudio, who was in charge of cleanliness, but had no teaching experience, became enraged by these students and threatened to beat anyone who refused to participate in the absence of teachers at night. It is unclear whether he would have carried out this threat, but the students eventually began cleaning and later complained to the principal about Claudio's threats of physical violence. The principal was displeased and requested Claudio's voluntary resignation. It's worth noting that the Don Gregorio boarding school was practically the only place in the area that provided stable and reasonably paid employment. Claudio spent some time looking for work, fields and fruit, but it became clear that his efforts had been in vain. He and Roxana decided to seek a better life elsewhere, leaving her son at the boarding school to complete his education. They thought it was too risky to go on this adventure with him. To avoid relying on employers after being burned once, the couple decided to start their own small business, a fruit kiosk, and relocated to a favorable location, the commune of Molina, a few hours' drive from Chile's capital. This region is well known for its vineyards, which produce renowned wine brands that are exported around the world. Roxana and Claudio bought a kiosk near their new home, found suppliers for vegetables and fruits, and began their small family business. Claudio oversaw the purchase and transportation of products from suppliers to the kiosk. While Roxana was in charge of sales throughout the day, hiring an employee was not feasible due to the additional costs. Furthermore, they feared that an employee would fail to closely monitor the perishable goods, resulting in additional losses. Claudia was visibly upset and even angry when he learned that Roxana was expecting their first child together. Perhaps it was a moment for serious thought. But Roxana, perhaps blinded by her new relationship and their thriving business, did not oppose her husband's viewpoint. She agreed that once the child was born, they would quickly turn it over to her relatives for upbringing. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, there was no child to give away. Cloudy's behavior has dramatically changed since then. He frequently yelled at his wife and occasionally resorted to physical violence. Neighbors from nearby houses, irritated by their noisy new neighbors, frequently called the Chilean police, the Carabineros, to intervene and settle domestic disputes. When the Carabineros arrived in response to a call, they saw Roxana in tears and nearly half-naked running out of the house, followed by Claudio. Roxana confessed to the officers that she had been the victim of systematic domestic violence, which had resulted in a miscarriage. She even required psychological assistance following the incident. However, as time passed, the grievances faded and the troubled couple resumed their normal lives together. Following the incident, Claudio should have faced criminal charges, but a compassionate Roxana decided to give him another chance after obtaining a promise that it would be a one-time occurrence. Claudio promised never to repeat such behavior. His previous actions with his ex-wife, however, suggested that his words may not be taken seriously. Unfortunately, history repeats itself. Claudio temporarily stopped physically abusing Roxana, but he developed the habit of leaving the house at night to binge drink in local bars. He spent a significant portion of their family budget not only on alcohol but also on local women of questionable character. Roxana tolerated her husband's behavior believing that Claudio would calm down once they had a child together. In a sense, she was correct. After Roxana gave birth to a healthy child in 2013, Claudio stopped carousing and fully immersed himself in their business, which needed to expand. They purchased another kiosk in the surrounding area, as well as a vehicle for product transportation. Roxana also invested in firearms for protection because they lived and worked in dangerous areas. The family's wealth rose dramatically, but only on paper. Claudio reverted to his old ways, squandering money on drinking and committing domestic violence against Roxana. In her testimony, Roxanne described the escalating abuse in her relationship with Claudio. Claudio's drinking was infrequent at first, but it quickly became more frequent. He would return home and accuse Roxana of imagined infidelities, resulting in physical and sexual abuse. Despite her pregnancy, Claudia's actions appeared deliberate, culminating in a miscarriage in August 2012 that sent Roxana into a deep depression. Claudio went out to a local bar one night and did not return home until the following morning, as is his usual routine. Roxana was used to his behavior but still worried about him. Claudio had stolen 5 million Chilean pesos, approximately $6,000, from Roxana's sale of her mother's house to spend on alcohol and brothels. This betrayal shocked Roxana because the money was for their joint business and was hidden in their daughter's room. 
Claudio eventually returned home late that evening. Roxana confronted him over the missing money. Claudio, uninterested in discussing the matter, hit her and admitted to squandering all of the money. This was the final straw for Roxana. Without saying anything, she went into their bedroom, retrieved a revolver meant for protection against local criminals, and shot Claudio in the chest. He died instantly, stunned by her drastic action. Roxana, equally shocked by her own actions, attempted to stop the bleeding from the fatal gunshot wound, but it was too late. The close, range shot with a .38 caliber bullet was fatal. Roxanne's desperate act was a tragic culmination of ongoing domestic turmoil. Roxanne's testimony reveals her deep regret and awareness of the immorality of her actions. She admits that when she reached for the revolver, her intention was not to intimidate Claudio, but to kill him. She recalls Claudio abusing and assaulting her numerous times, as well as her failure to report him to authorities or retract her complaint due to fear. She dreaded being alone even before they had a child together. After shooting Claudio, Roxana's immediate concern was the potential impact on their daughter, particularly if Roxana was imprisoned and the child was placed in an institution. That night, Roxana determined that the best way to handle the situation was to dispose of the body and report Claudio missing. He was aware that the police knew about his frequent disappearances during drinking binges. Disposing of the body was a difficult task for Roxana, a delicate woman who decided to remove it piece by piece. She began by severing the limbs and head with kitchen knives designed for cutting meat. This process required five knives because they kept doubling. Then she boiled the dismembered parts in the largest pots she had, all while playing with her young daughter, who was completely unaware of her mother's actions and her father's fate. Roxanne's calculated approach to disposing of the body while maintaining a sense of normalcy for her daughter exemplifies the complexities and desperation of her situation. The day following cooking and cooling of the body parts, Roxana organized them into plastic containers by hand, leg, head, and torso. The containers were then placed in garbage bags. She loaded the bags into her car and drove to St. Lucia, where she scattered them on a vacant lot. Before leaving, she thoroughly cleaned her home with bleach. Despite finding a suitable location, she lacked the courage to dispose of the bags from her car once she arrived in St. Lucia. Roxana's testimony revealed her internal conflict. It's strange that I had the courage to commit such a heinous crime and dismember a human body like it was a piglet, but I couldn't bring myself to get rid of the evidence. I was nervous the entire drive, fearing that police would stop and search my car at any turn. This fear caused panic, despite the fact that I had a backup plan in place, which involved my daughter pretending to rush her to the hospital if she was stopped. I even considered pinching her to make her cry more loudly. Unable to discard the remains, Roxana returned home with them and hid the bags in the garage. She cleaned the interior of her car with bleach again and went to see Claudia's relatives, claiming that he had stolen a large sum of money and hadn't been home in days. They simply shrugged in response. She then went to see her mother and brother. Her mother was extremely concerned about Roxanne's behavior. She was not eating, had a glassy-eyed expression, and kept asking the same questions. The only question she promptly answered was about Claudio's absence, stating that he had gone to buy goods for their store, but was delayed due to a flat tire. Returning home, alone with her thoughts and the hidden evidence, Roxana broke down and called her brother for assistance. When he arrived, she confessed all and showed him the containers. Her brother was understandably shocked. Roxana called her brother to vent and share the nightmare years she had with Claudio, but most importantly, she needed his assistance in disposing of the containers containing the body. However, her brother refused, fearing police involvement and being charged as an accomplice. He urged her to confess to the Caribou Narrows, with Chilean police insisting he would do it if she refused. She was disappointed but realized she had no other option. Roxana complied. That night, Roxana went to the fourth police station and announced her intention to make a significant statement. Officers who knew her assumed she wanted to report her troublesome husband. However, they were taken aback by her confession. Roxana was immediately arrested. The news quickly spread throughout the area, attracting a large number of journalists to the station. They waited eagerly to photograph Roxana as she lay down, hoping to capture a few images, and if they were lucky, ask her some questions in front of the officers. As the journalists waited, 
Roxana was eventually brought out handcuffed and in distress, she stated, I'm afraid he'll kill me one day before being led into a police car. The case appeared straightforward. Roxana had confessed, provided evidence, and voluntarily surrendered. However, Prosecutor Monica Balesteros requested a more thorough investigation. She was skeptical of Roxanne's easy confession and requested an extended arrest to conduct a forensic examination. Balesteros wants to prove that Claudio was still alive during the dismemberment, which would significantly increase Roxana's sentence. The judge authorized a 60-day detention for further investigation. Meanwhile, Roxanne's attorney, Carolina Gutierrez, claimed that Roxana acted out of extreme emotional distress which was likely exacerbated by postpartum depression and chronic domestic abuse. She highlighted Roxanne's cooperation and voluntary confession as mitigating factors. However, the prosecution's theory that Claudio was alive during dismemberment crumbled when forensic results revealed that Claudio died from a gunshot wound to the chest. The bullet from the .38 caliber revolver ruptured the heart and damaged vital organs, disproving the prosecution's initial hypothesis. Given the developments, the aggravating circumstances were dismissed. Another lawyer, Juan Pablo Cardenas, who sought to make a name for himself in this high-profile case, stated that the firearm used in the murder was legally registered. He also mentioned that Roxanne's first report of domestic violence to the police was filed only 20 days after the couple began living together. Following a medical examination, Psychologist Rodrigo Valenzuela presented documents to the court indicating that Roxana was severely mentally unstable at the time of the crime. This meant she wasn't fully aware of her actions and her emotional instability was linked to the deaths of two children, one in August 2012 and the other only three weeks before the crime. Furthermore, a forensic examination requested by the prosecutor revealed that Claudio had a high blood alcohol level of 3 grams per liter at the time of his death on April 17, 2015. Following a year of various examinations, investigations, and evidence gathering, Roxanne's trial began. The media frequently sensationalizes tragedies and dubbed the case the Molina Cooks case, alluding to Roxanne's dismemberment and boiling of her former husband. Some unscrupulous journalists seeking to draw attention to their publications, even made up stories that Roxana had eaten a portion of the remains, despite the fact that this was purely a product of their imaginations. Roxana refused to make any statements during the trial, citing her awareness of the media portrayal and her deep distress over it. The prosecutors attempted to persuade the judge that Roxana committed a serious crime under Chilean law and patricide standards. However, they were unable to prove that the murder was premeditated, the defense attorney argued that his client acted in self-defense, protecting herself from a brute who had brutally mistreated her for years. The court hearing lasted several weeks, and the entire Chilean population followed the case closely. Prosecutor Monica sought a 15-year prison sentence for the accused. However, after carefully listening to the defense and the jury's opinions, the judge sentenced Roxana to six years in a lenient correctional facility. Claudia's relatives, who had already protested when they heard the prosecutor's request for only 15 years, were utterly disappointed by the final court decision. They attempted to deny any family violence and claimed that Claudio, as a businessman and financially independent, could not have stolen $6,000 from Roxana. They also claimed that Claudio had admitted to them that Roxana frequently took out the revolver from the closet and told her husband that she would kill him someday. In an interview with the press, Claudio's sister attempted to blame Chile as a state, claiming that there is no justice and that the judicial system is completely corrupt. Given that such brutal criminals receive such short sentences, equivalent to minor robberies, even Gazelle Claudio, his first wife, defended her ex-husband, assuring everyone that there could not have been any violence on Claudio's part. She had lived with him for years, and he had never dared to touch her. Meanwhile, Roxana frequently instigates arguments out of jealousy and possessiveness. Regarding Roxanne's subsequent imprisonment, she served only two-thirds of her sentence in the colony before being transferred to a semi-open education center in Tulsa due to good behavior. Roxana was able to communicate with her daughter and was eventually released early. The press, of course, became interested in this case again, and the public was outraged that the cook from Molina was released so early. However, there were those who, while considering Roxana a murderer, justified her actions by viewing her as a victim in the overall situation. The case is still being debated in the country today. Overall, 
This story highlights the serious consequences that can occur if domestic violence is not addressed early on. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Today's story is a poignant reminder of life's fragility and the devastating consequences of rash actions. Let this tragedy serve as a call to compassion, guiding collective efforts to prevent similar sorrow from befalling other families. Emily Longley was born on February 22, 1994, in the London Hospital. She was the first child in Mark and Caroline Longley's young family. Mark's friends teased him about becoming a father at 26. He felt completely unprepared for parenthood. He was present at the birth, and when the nurse cleaned the baby and handed her to him, he gently held her in his arms, her tiny head resting in his palms and her legs barely reaching his elbow. The girl opened her eyes and looked at her father. In that moment, Mark knew fatherhood would not be a problem for him. A few years later, the Longleys welcomed their second daughter, Hannah. The two blonde sisters adored each other and brought joy to their father. He was confident that keeping the kids warm and safe would show them how much he loved them. The girls grew up surrounded by their parents' unconditional love. They had an example of prosperity and happiness right in front of them. Mark Longley worked as a journalist for a local paper. Caroline was a teacher, and the girls had a bright future ahead of them, just as any parent would want for their children. Emily and Hannah Longley's lives were turned upside down 10 years later when their parents decided to relocate from their hometown of Bournemouth to the scenic landscapes of New Zealand. This was a huge change for everyone, as moving to another country was a big step. This difficult decision was made for Emily's health, based on the doctor's recommendation that she needed a change in climate. The longtime family traveled halfway around the world in the hopes of providing a better life for their daughters. As a result of its geographical features, New Zealand's climate varies. Most of New Zealand has a temperate maritime climate with four distinct seasons. The winters here are mild, and the summers are relatively cool. The Pacific Ocean and mountain ranges are significant contributors. The English family found the environment and atmosphere ideal. A new chapter has begun in the lives of the Long Leaves and their daughters. Emily attended a prestigious private school, and her life went on peacefully until she was metaphorically stabbed in the back by former classmates. Her friend Sarah Lee Turblanche caused a stir at school when she revealed that Emily had fallen in with the wrong crowd and was involved with banned substances. Sarah gave the school newspaper an interview about a party at Emily's house. After overcoming initial disappointments and betrayals, Emily returned to England at the end of 2010 to further her education. She moved in with her grandparents, Ronald and Zosie Longley, in a large detached cottage near the promenade in South Beach in Bournemouth, and enrolled in a British college, hoping for a new beginning in her life. Emily, who had struggled in school, adapted to a more relaxed student life and thrived. Emily made progress, balancing her studies at Brockenhurst College in Hampshire with a job at the Topshop clothing store. Well, at 16, Emily Longley was a vibrant, cheerful, and ambitious young woman with stunning blonde beauty. Her radiant appearance helped her achieve early success in the modeling industry. Emily's captivating charm and irresistible charisma set her apart in her community. In December 2010, at a party she met 19-year-old Elliot Vince Turner. Elliot was the only son of Lee Turner, a wealthy and successful jeweler. He worked at his father's jewelry store in Bournemouth, and lived with his family in the affluent Queen's Park neighborhood. He was a member of the firm, a group of affluent young men who frequented local bars and clubs in Bournemouth and Poole. Elliot Turner, who drew the attention of many women, appeared almost obsessed with them. Nonetheless, they quickly became a couple. Elliot was deeply committed to his girlfriend, who had begun modeling and earning her first income. She began to attract the attention of many men, and Elliot's jealousy of Emily grew intense. Within four months, their relationship had devolved into a battleground of constant disagreements and mutual grievances. Emotional abuse became the norm in this tumultuous relationship, characterized by Elliot's worrying behavior and unending jealousy. If he didn't like her outfit, he would accuse her of looking like a call girl. He hacked her Facebook account to track her activities and conversations. He also showed up and announced when she was not present. He used his strength and anger to intimidate Emily after she wrote him a note saying, 
Stop acting so aggressive, however. Each incident was followed by remorse and apologies, only for the cycle to continue. Elliot eventually went from verbal threats to physical actions. He grabbed her throat and punched her in public several times. He then justified his actions, blaming Emily for his uncontrollable emotional outbursts. Emily became concerned for her life as a result of the constant arguments and fights. She took a break and went on a holiday with her parents to New Zealand. This was the Longley's best Easter holiday ever. Hannah and Emily hung out as they had done in the past. They walked a lot, laughed a lot, and spent a lot of time together, as if they were expecting to say goodbye soon. Her father hugged her tightly as they said their goodbyes. She agreed to return in September for the Rugby World Cup. Already aboard the plane, she sent her father a message. It was so nice to see you. I love you. They had had a special bond between father and daughter since she was born. Emily was last seen alive by her family. She went back to the UK, intending to end her relationship with Elliot. This occurred. But unfortunately, at the expense of a promising young woman's life. Elliot met his girlfriend not with flowers, but with a new set of accusations and disagreements. Elliot came across photos of Emily with two shirtless young men on social media before she returned from New Zealand. Jealous, he invited her to spend the night at his house. Despite their disagreement, Emily agreed to return to Elliot's family home to talk about their problems, comforted by the presence of Elliot's parents, Lee and Anita. Her arrival at the house was met with a barrage of jealousy and insults. The young couple frequently yelled and argued. A half hour of yelling was followed by silence. On May 7, 2011, Emergency services received a call that 17-year-old Emily Longley had been discovered unconscious in bed. Nina Turner called after discovering the girl in her son's bedroom. Rescuers arrived on the scene and were only able to confirm her death. Following the girl's death, neighbors noticed Turner sitting in the ambulance with his head in his hands. Elliot Turner was arrested immediately following Emily's death, but he was later released on bail pending further investigation. The investigation began following the tragic incident. Turner J.R., consumed by guilt, wrote a confession. His parents, determined not to lose their only son, intentionally withheld critical evidence, delaying the investigation. On the night of the incident, Anita Turner, 51, and Lee Turner, 53, removed a coat from their son's house, retrieved the confession letter from its pocket, and doused it with bleach, destroying vital evidence. During the investigation, it was decided to secretly install listening devices in the expansive Turner family home on May 18th. After gathering evidence from a family discussion about fabricating evidence and concerns about lying to police, the police searched the household computers for additional evidence, which they discovered. A look at the browser's search history revealed searches for death by strangulation and how to avoid a murder charge. In July, all three family members were arrested and charged with being involved in the incident and intentionally concealing evidence. Elliot Turner denied any involvement, blaming Emily for his troubles. A forensic reconstruction of the incident revealed that Elliot and Emily engaged in a struggle on that fateful day. Elliot used force to subdue her, pressing her face down on the bed with a pillow. He then threw away the pillow and continued to strangle her with his hands. When she fell silent, he stood up and exited the room. Pathologists examined Emily's body and discovered injuries consistent with strangulation. Elliot had scratches on his arm, and Emily's fingertips contained his DNA, indicating a struggle between them. Elliot's behavior toward Emily was described in court as threatening, aggressive, violent, controlling, and possessive. These concerning characteristics worsened, and on a fateful night in May 2011, a heated argument broke out between the couple over Emily's choice of outfit and her photos with unknown men. The wealthy family could not afford to lose their son and damage their reputation. Elliot's hired lawyers vigorously defended him. The defense tried to downplay the tormentor's role in the young woman's death, claiming she may have used drugs. However, the Dorset police conducted an independent, toxic, and illogical examination that revealed no drugs or other prohibited substances in the victim's bloodstream. The affluent jeweler and his wife, who disposed of evidence to help cover up how their jealous son ended the life of the aspiring New Zealand model Emily Longley. At 20 years old, Elliot Turner was found guilty by a jury at Winchester Crown Court and may have killed 17-year-old Emily in his bed after a fit of jealous rage. 
Judge Dobbs stated during his sentencing that he intimidated, stalked, threatened, and assaulted Emily in order to maintain control over her as his trophy girlfriend. The judge also advised Elliot to abandon thoughts of Champagne Bentleys and girls as he sentenced him to life in prison, stating that he must serve at least 16 years before being eligible for parole. His parents are live 54 and Nita 51. We were sentenced in the same court after being convicted of obstructing justice by concealing evidence. They concealed the crime by destroying their son's confession letter and removing critical evidence from their Bournemouth home. Their son was sentenced to nine months in prison for obstructing justice by concealing evidence. The prosecution claimed Turner suffocated Emily with a pillow before strangling her after she returned to his home to discuss their situation following a heated argument that night. Emily's father, Mark Longley, called Elliot Turner evil and expressed his wish that Turner would suffer every day in prison. Elliot Turner was found guilty of ending her life in May 2012 and sentenced to life in prison. His parents, Anita Turner and Lee Turner, were both imprisoned. They were sentenced to 27 months in prison for misleading the police about the incident and destroying their son's confession note. Because it was a homicide investigation, the police kept her body, and it wasn't until September that she could be brought home in a closed casket. The Turners were released in 2013. Turner's reduced sentence appeal was denied the same year. However, British judges ruled otherwise during hearings in the High Court of London. It's clear that, due to wounded pride, he harbored thoughts of ending her life for a long time, eventually leading to her death. Lord Chief Justice Royce Justice Globe stated in his verdict that Simon Jones, one of the successful prosecutors, stated following the sentence that Emily's death was the result of domestic violence. Elliot stated, I never wanted to hurt her. I was simply defending myself. Elliot Turner, Emily Long Lee's perpetrator, is currently serving a life sentence in a Kent prison for the brutal murder of the young aspiring model. The court determined that he would not be eligible for parole for at least 16 years. Turner, according to the Daily Star, has decorated the walls of his prison cell with photos of Emily, indicating a disturbing and possibly obsessive relationship with his victim. Surprisingly, while behind bars, Turner reportedly expressed his desire to return to a life of champagne, Bentleys and birds. Such an attitude raises concerns about his lack of remorse and the possibility of continuing harmful behavior after release. Furthermore, Elliot's parents, Lee and Anita Turner, were imprisoned for perverting justice by destroying their son's confession letter and tampering with evidence at the crime scene. This emphasizes the gravity of the situation and the collective impact of the Turner family's actions on the pursuit of justice for Emily Longley. Following the conclusion of the trial, Emily's father began to investigate domestic violence. He portrayed Elliot as an abuser using patterns and behaviors. He was constantly thinking about ending her life. It was simply a matter of time. To love someone means not attempting to control their lives, calling them derogatory names or isolating them from their friends. That is not love. A woman is treated as a trophy. Such relationships are solely focused on retrieving the man from Emily's father's memories. He treated Emily cruelly before she returned to New Zealand, but she did not tell us anything. I'm not sure why, but if she had, things might have turned out differently. Now I don't think of Turner or his family. He is in prison, and I hope he suffers every day. If I think too much about what he did, my anger rises, and it is the type of anger that can consume you. He never thought about the people who had loved, cherished, and raised Emily for the previous 17 years. He stood behind her, wrapped his arms around her neck, and took her life. Even now, years later, it's difficult to believe anyone could do this to Emily. After the tragedy, Emily's parents divorced. However, they continue to struggle with anniversaries and birthdays. Easter is particularly difficult because it was the family's last holiday together. On May 6, 2011, Emily was still alive. She was chatting on Facebook with her father just a few hours before the incident occurred. She appeared normal and happy with no hint of fear. On May 7, everything changed. Emily's father awoke after receiving a phone call. He did not respond right away. By the time he awoke, he had several missed calls from his ex-wife, Caroline, as well as multiple messages on his cell phone. Texts from her were not uncommon, but the volume of calls and messages was concerning. Finally, he picked up an incoming call. It was his younger daughter, Hannah, crying inconsolably on the other end in the background. He could hear his ex-wife screaming, Emily is gone. 
Emily's gone. He broke down while sitting on the same couch Emily had sat on just a week before. What was she going to do after college? This could not be true. How could such a vibrant young girl be gone? He couldn't remember anything else about that night. According to Emily's father's recollections, he did not sleep until he boarded the plane for England. I recall being driven to Auckland, stopping in a small town to refuel, and seeing Emily's photograph on the front page of the Herald. I thought I was going to get sick right there in the station while reading the headline, or at the airport. People were throwing their copies in the trash, and I wanted to tell them who she was and that they should keep the newspaper. It felt like an eternity before Mark Longley arrived in England. He was still shocked, unable to believe that his visit to his once loved England was to identify his beloved daughter Emily. He still hoped there had been an error. They took him straight to the morgue, where Emily's body lay. He stood in a room with Caroline, a police officer, and the mortician, who pointed to a window and announced that the body was in the next room. The mortician pointed to the window the light would turn on, allowing them to enter the room when they were ready. The light turned on. Mark and Caroline, their hands cold with horror, stood unable to cross the threshold of that room. They were prepared to scream that it was not their daughter, but it was her. Emily was lying on the gurney, covered in a purple sheet, and appeared to be sleeping. Her father approached and touched her face. Emily's father remembered her skin as smooth but icy cold, with a beautiful alabaster hue. I wanted to flee and pretend I hadn't witnessed it. But I stood there, holding her hand, staring at the face I had studied so closely when she was born. Except now, her eyes were closed, and I realized this was no joke. She wasn't going to sit up and say, Boo Emily, my daughter, had left. In the midst of such horror, all tomorrows become yesterday. When a flood of emotions pours down, bombarding and overwhelming the soul, you realize your complete helplessness. Emily's parents saw her for the last time that day in the morgue. The pain of losing someone does not get any easier. Time does not heal. It simply teaches you to live with it. Everyone always commented on Emily's beauty, and it continues to be discussed. She had a wonderful, warm, and loving side to her personality. She would approach you, wrap her long arms around you, and give you a tight hug. But most of all, Emily's family misses the woman she could have become. They will never know how her life would have turned out. A life denied to her. Years later, Emily's father remarried. He has a wonderful wife, Hillary, and a lovely son, Hunter, who is growing up in their household. Hannah, Emily's younger sister, has graduated from university and established her own life, free of domestic violence. Their greatest regret is that Emily is not present to share the joyful moments with them. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Today we will examine a case that unfolded in Minnesota in 2013. Kira Steger, a 30-year-old store clerk at a clothing store in the Mall of America, was known for her dedication to her job. She had never missed a shift. So when she didn't show up for work on February 23, 2013, her co-workers grew concerned. They attempted to reach Kira, but received no response to calls or text messages. Consequently, they alerted the police that she was missing. Kira K. Steger was born on November 19, 1982, in Des Plaines, Illinois. She was the daughter of Marcy and Jay Steger, who lovingly described her as a lively, dedicated, and sweet daughter. Kira had been employed at the Mall of America, working at two stores, Wet Seal, and more recently, Delia's. Her co-workers were not just colleagues, she considered them family. Kira had a unique ability to recognize people's strengths, even when they didn't notice them themselves. She had ambitious plans and dreams for a bright and serene future. Tragically, all those dreams vanished in an instant when Kira mysteriously disappeared on Thursday, February 21st, 2013. On that day, she had a shift at work and her coworkers reported that she seemed in good spirits, planning to enjoy a nice dinner with her husband after her shift. Kira and Jeffrey Trevino had met three years prior and had ignited a spark, leading to a romantic relationship and ultimately a wedding. Overall, they appeared to be a happy and stable married couple. Although they had occasional disagreements, these seemed minor and were kept within their private circle. 
Neither their relatives, friends, nor co-workers were aware of any serious issues. However, two days after Kira failed to come to work, on Saturday, February 23rd, her co-workers grew increasingly concerned as her behavior was atypical for her. She was known for her punctuality and strict adherence to her schedule. Unable to reach Kyra, her co-workers contacted Jeffrey, who had no knowledge of her whereabouts. Jeffrey explained that Kyra had left their home the previous morning and hadn't returned. He didn't find it particularly concerning since Kira had a history of occasionally disappearing for a day or two, staying at a friend's or relative's place unannounced. One possible cause for concern was the heavy snowfall that day, which could have resulted in difficulties on the road, such as her car getting stuck or her phone battery dying. Receiving no news from his wife, Jeffrey filed a missing persons report and contacted Kira's family. This mysterious disappearance shocked Kira's loved ones profoundly. Detectives immediately started working on Kira Steger's missing persons case upon receiving the report. Typically, investigations in such cases begin by questioning the spouse and searching the immediate vicinity. This case was no exception and detectives visited Jeffrey's residence to speak with him. Jeffrey told the detectives that on Thursday, he and Kira had spent time together after work, having dinner, playing bowling, and eventually leaving the mall. According to Jeffrey, they went straight home as Kira intended to watch a movie. Jeffrey also mentioned that his wife left their house the next morning, a Friday, around 8.30 a.m., as she had a work event that required her presence. He didn't find her absence unusual, given her history of occasional disappearances, Jeffrey, however, did admit to some relationship problems over the past few months. He considered these disagreements to be minor, typical of any family. When the detectives asked if Kira might have had a lover or been staying with someone else, Jeffrey denied this possibility. He claimed to trust his wife and love her deeply. The investigators gathered information about Kira and her car, and they personally visited the Mall of America to verify Jeffrey's account. The mall, one of the largest in the world, is located in Bloomington, boasting 520 stores, theme parks, an oceanarium, movie theaters, a golf course, and more. Given its size, it had numerous security cameras. After reviewing the surveillance footage, detectives confirmed that Jeffrey's account held true. They observed that he met Kira after work, and they spent time together at the mall before heading to the parking lot and leaving. There were no signs of any arguments and the evening seemed ordinary. However, the anxiety of not knowing Kira's whereabouts weighed heavily on her loved ones as each day passed without any news. Unable to bear the uncertainty, Kira's family traveled to Bloomington to assist with the investigation. They distributed flyers with her pictures in an effort to raise awareness and garner public help. While Kira's family distributed flyers, investigators continued their efforts. During interviews with neighbors, Officers noticed a surveillance camera at one neighbor's house, which partially captured the area around Kira and Jeffrey's home. They asked the homeowner to provide them with the camera footage in hopes of finding clues. Meanwhile, cell phone records provided a new lead. Kira had another man in her life besides Jeffrey, Ryan Went, who managed one of the stores she worked at. They had a significant and ongoing romantic relationship, as evidenced by frequent correspondence. Ryan was out of state at the time of Kira's disappearance, traveling towards Colorado. This raised questions for investigators. Was it a mere coincidence, or was there more to Ryan's sudden move? They had to find the answer, but they eventually cleared him of suspicion, as the timing of their text messages indicated he was not involved in her disappearance. Examining the video footage from the neighbor's surveillance camera became crucial for investigators. The camera's rapid rotation made it challenging to observe anything carefully. Still, they managed to capture a few seconds of Kyra and Jeffrey's house. Jeffrey's account of their evening appeared to align with the footage. However, upon closer examination, they noticed Kira's car reversing into their yard shortly after 2 a.m., although the poor quality of the footage and the camera's constant motion made it hard to discern details. Nonetheless, the car soon left the property. Jeffrey explained that he drove to a gas station because Kira had asked him to fill up her car before her morning commute. 
Surveillance footage confirmed his trip to the gas station around 3.30 a.m. Surprisingly, after leaving the gas station, Jeffrey didn't return home but instead headed towards the highway. The neighbor's camera didn't capture his return, but this could have been due to the camera's constant rotation. Investigators considered the possibility that Jeffrey might have returned home later when the camera was facing another direction. Further analysis of the footage showed Kira's Chevrolet leaving at 9.21 a.m., but it was impossible to determine the driver. A missing persons report had been filed on Saturday, February 23rd. On Monday, February 25th, the police received a call about a suspicious vehicle near the shopping center where Kira worked. Security guards at the multi-story parking lots had noticed a car parked there for several days and called a tow truck. Upon closer inspection, the tow truck driver found red smudges on the trunk lid and reported it to the police. It turned out to be Kira's white Chevy, containing a few small bloodstains. Inside her purse, they discovered divorce court forms that appeared to have been downloaded from the internet. Additionally, a rolled up trunk mat found in the snow behind the car was stained with Kira's blood, confirmed through DNA testing. This grim discovery suggested that Kira was likely no longer alive. It devastated her family and friends, as her last hope of seeing her again had faded. Many questions remained unanswered. How had she died? Had she suffered? And who could have harbored such resentment as to take her life? The absence of Kyra's body made the situation even more difficult to bear for her loved ones. The detective's top priority became identifying the person who abandoned the vehicle in the parking lot. The car left the house at 9.21 a.m., and the mall's cameras captured it shortly after. Although there were no cameras in the parking lot where the car was found, one camera pointed towards the path leading to the car. This camera captured the arrival of the car, followed by the appearance of a hooded man. Given the cold weather, the hooded attire wasn't unusual. The man crossed the street, had a brief conversation with a taxi driver at a nearby stand, and then got into the cab. The police identified the taxi company based on the timing of the interaction and the license plate number. All the taxis in the parking lot were equipped with GPS tracking devices, allowing the police to determine that the hooded man's journey ended near Kira and Jeffrey's house. He paid cash and left the neighborhood, passing by the same camera that partially recorded the couple's home. Two minutes later, another hooded man entered the frame. Although the footage had low resolution, they noticed a white logo on his hoodie. As they continued watching, the hooded man entered the house where Kira and Jeffrey lived. Kira was still missing at this point, making it highly likely that the hooded man was Jeffrey. With a search warrant secured, law enforcement officers headed to the house. At first glance, it appeared to be an ordinary home. But upon closer inspection, forensic experts discovered dark red stains in the bedroom. Stains were found on the wall next to the bed and approximately a hundred on the mattress. Luminol revealed more hidden bloodstains on the carpet that extended from the bedroom into other areas of the house. Forensic analysis confirmed that it was Kira's blood, strengthening the investigator's belief that she was no longer alive. The police also examined Jeffrey's car but found no blood or signs of a struggle. However, they did discover something interesting, a gas station receipt in Jeffrey's car, issued an hour and 40 minutes before Kira's car was discovered in the mall's parking lot. The receipt showed that Jeffrey had used his card to make a purchase at the gas station, followed by a cash withdrawal from an ATM. To gather more evidence, detectives reviewed the gas station's security footage, which showed Jeffrey filling his car with gas, going inside the station, and withdrawing cash from the ATM. The footage briefly revealed his face, as well as a logo on his jacket that resembled the logo on the man seen in the earlier surveillance footage. Based on this new information and the evidence found in the house, Jeffrey Trevino, 39 years old, was arrested. He was taken to the police station for questioning and became the prime and only suspect in the case. During questioning, Jeffrey immediately invoked his right to remain silent, seeking advice from his attorney. The police had enough evidence to charge him, but locating Kira's body was crucial to further cementing his guilt. Everyone believed Kira was no longer alive, 
As the police, Kira's family, and volunteers conducted extensive searches, they made a disturbing discovery in late March. Near Keller Lake, a few miles from Trevino's house, volunteers found a peculiar bag by the roadside and contacted the police. Inside the bag were a bloodied pillow, a shirt, and a bra, all linked to Kira through DNA analysis. Although divers searched the lake, they found no remains in the water. The area around the lake was also scoured multiple times using search dogs specifically trained to find bodies, yet their efforts yielded no results. After two and a half months on May 8, 2013, the St. Paul Police Department received a troubling call. A caller reported seeing what appeared to be a dead body in the Mississippi River. Police retrieved the body, and dental records confirmed it was Kyra Steger. Kira had suffered severe blunt force trauma to her forehead and a fractured index finger on her left hand. Due to the advanced state of decomposition, the exact cause of death could not be determined. With this new evidence, investigators sought to reconstruct the timeline of events leading to Kira's death and its aftermath. It was speculated that upon returning home and discovering Kira's romantic correspondence with someone else, Jeffrey grew increasingly angry. When Kira refused to show him the messages, he forcibly took her phone, resulting in a broken finger. As his rage intensified, he tragically took Kira's life and attempted to hide the evidence. Using Kira's car, he transported her body to the house, then later used the car to dispose of her remains in the river. He made a stop at a gas station and withdrew cash, knowing he would need to pay for a taxi after abandoning Kira's car at the mall. Returning home, Jeffrey attempted to create the impression that Kira had left on her own that morning and was fine. However, surveillance cameras foiled his plan. In October 2013, a jury convicted 39-year-old Jeffrey Trevino. His defense argued that the act was not premeditated and resulted from a heated and sudden argument sparked by the discovery of his wife's infidelity. Before sentencing, Kira's family members made statements in court. Her sister, Carrie Ann Steger, referred to Jeffrey as a calculated criminal and expressed that he deserved no mercy. Marcy, Kira's mother, pointed out that Jeffrey had shown her daughter no mercy and had discarded her like trash in a polluted river. Jay, Kira's father, emphasized that no punishment could ever compensate for the pain Jeffrey had caused their family. In November 2013, Jeffrey Trevino was sentenced to 27 and a half years in prison. He became eligible for parole in 2031. The exception was Cassandra and her twin brother, Rob. When they were younger, they would often spend an entire day telling each other scary stories in a dark room. Rob considered himself to be a natural storyteller. Every time he told a scary story, Cassandra would scream and he would scatter on his bed, mumbling to himself, you can't even scare the neighbors, little Joey, with stories like that. No, scary stories are not your thing. Together, they also watched the animated series Scooby-Doo, and during that time, they argued over which of the characters was really a vampire disguised as a ghost. Her brother was anxious because Cassandra's intuitive guesses were frequently more accurate than his. Even though Mary Smith did not have the twins' enthusiasm for reading, she nevertheless bought her kids' books by Robert Wall because she wanted them to grow up to be lifelong readers. The brother and sister's love of scary stories was a lifelong passion that they developed as children. Even as adults, they entertained the idea of launching a horror-themed store and even gathered figurines of villains. Cassandra joined the set in 2004 due to her interest in horror films, and she made a cameo in a scary film that, while not very successful, still caused a lot of jealous looks. I'm ready to play anyone. Rob, you must have made some acquaintances there, right? Cassandra, maybe we should talk. Rob's sister responded, I'm pretty close with the head of the cast. Maybe something will come out of it, but no promises. I got the part by accident myself. Rob continued to beg his sister to broker a deal on his behalf. Rob was overjoyed, but even in an episodic role, he was unable to land a role. Colin Dudley was the leading man in that film, and chemistry blossomed between him and the newcomer on the set. None of them dared to take the first step, but that all changed at a Halloween party at the office. Colin dressed as Alex from A Clockwork Orange 
and Cassandra dressed like Velma from Scooby-Doo. Colin perceived the cartoon character as more than just a costume, while Cassandra saw it as just that, a costume. Like his character in the movie, he strolled around with a glass of milk and gave everyone a glare. He read passages from the book as well. He would look at Cassandra and say, Beauty invariably caused my only desire to destroy it, for it did not fit at all into our ugly world. Cassandra took this as a compliment, and they soon started dating. But their brief relationship lasted only a few months. Colin began dating Rebecca, another actress, after finding her. The pair eventually moved in together. 2020. August 25th. Cassandra Cannell vanished. Without giving anyone any notice, she took off from home in her car, in an unknown direction, and didn't pick up the phone. For a very long time, the police refused to accept her mother's report. Attempting to console the distraught mother by explaining that kids grow up and don't always tell their parents when they go out with friends. But Mary Smith was certain that something horrible had occurred. And perhaps she could still see her daughter alive if the indolent police would finally get to work. It took two days for the police to start looking for Cassandra, and on the third day, they discovered her car in an undesirable location beneath a bridge. The bad news gets even worse. The keys were inside the unlocked car. It was hard to know what Cassandra was up to there. This area was thought to be a homeless community, and the police regularly discovered bodies there that had either overdosed on illegal drugs or been killed in domestic violence. The police had to patrol the neighborhood questioning a large number of homeless people who attempted to flee when they saw them. All of them were unaware of the time the car appeared there, though, and none of them had seen Cassandra. It was difficult to have any higher expectations of the people who lived beneath the bridge and consumed alcohol all day. As directed, the detective working on Cassandra's case asked to see her cell phone bill, but he knew from past experience that this would not help him in any way. And so it did. The signal indicated that the phone was in the body of water closest to the bridge, making it impossible for the investigators to retrieve it and obtain the information they required. Still, a group of divers started combing the shoreline. To see how far they could throw the phone, they picked up rocks from the shore and tossed them into the water before doing so. Cassandra's mother claimed that since her daughter's phone case was adorned with rhinestones, it would be easy to locate. While it is true that the phone was located quickly, Cassandra's body was not in the water. Although her mother was told this was good news, she did not feel any better. Her daughter's death appeared to have become second nature to her, and all she wanted was for her body to be discovered and for this terrifying period of uncertainty to end. She replied, I was looking forward to my granddaughter. I wanted to be a grandmother sooner, and I didn't even have time to give her a crib. It's just sitting in the garage in a box. What should I do with it now? The mother was saddened to learn that this became crucial information for the inquiry. Pregnant women are frequently the victims of crimes committed by their partners, the expectant fathers, according to statistics. However, Mary Smith was unaware of the identity of her future granddaughter's father. Cassandra had not even met anyone and was single, even though her age was already apparent. It made sense that she had become pregnant through a male partner, but Mary was unaware of the child's possible father. Even so, according to her mother, her daughter frequently called and corresponded with someone. However, for some reason, her interlocutor's phone number was not entered in her daughter's book, and the mother, understandably, could not recall the numbers. She had just realized that it was kind of weird to talk to someone so frequently and not get his phone number down. It was common knowledge that girls could not maintain complete confidentiality in their relationships, so Cassandra should have at least one friend with whom she could share her secrets, particularly if those secrets involved a pregnancy. One found a friend like that. She disclosed that Cassandra had revived her romance with her ex-boyfriend Colin Dudley in a chat with law enforcement. Yes, their 2004 relationship was brief, and they had already broken up 15 years earlier. In general, it was odd that they could still recall one another after all this time. Colin, as it happened, contacted Cassandra in 2014. He discovered Cassandra on Facebook, wrote her some kind words, and revealed that he and his wife Rebecca had a tense relationship before his father's recent death. Thus, he had no one with whom to commiserate. 
Cassandra made the decision to get together purely out of friendship and speak with her ex-boyfriend to help him feel better. However, the cordial get Tagatha evolved into something more. Colin started leading a double life in 2014, with Cassandra acting as his mistress. The young woman did not want to tell Colin Dudley that she was pregnant when she found out. She remembered their conversation, in which Colin declared emphatically that he wanted no children at all and that he was delighted Rebecca was infertile every time she felt the need to tell him so. Cassandra didn't want to hurt her lover, so she kept the possibility of his having a daughter or son a secret because she knew it could destroy a real family. In the meantime, her tummy continued to swell and protrude beyond the baggy sweaters. Cassandra stopped seeing him so that Colin couldn't figure out anything. But how can one go on? She knew that hiding it would not last long, and that lying to Colin about having another boyfriend would be hurtful and lead to their breakup. Cassandra told Colin over the phone that she was expecting a child with him after deciding that the bitter truth was preferable to a charming lie. After a long period of silence, Colin finally expressed his happiness at the news. Though it sounded very strange, Cassandra deduced that Colin was actually happy. When the detective knocked on Colin's door upon arriving at his residence, his wife answered, resolving that discussing a missing mistress with Colin's legal wife wasn't entirely moral. The detective presented himself as a longtime friend of Dudley's. Colin emerged at once, closed the door behind him, and left the house accompanied by the detective, who had not even made an introduction. He appeared to have been anticipating this encounter. Thank you for not making your credentials public in front of Rebecca. You're a man of honor, a true officer. My compliments to you, Colin said in brief phrases. I heard Cassandra is missing. It's weird, bloody weird. I can't even guess where she might have gone. She told me she'd had a big fight with her brother and was really worried about it. I advised her to stop by and make up with him. I don't know if she listened to me or not. Rob had told him about the fight as far as the detective knew. It was just a family dispute, nothing serious. Still, Cassandra's twin brother had been devastated by her disappearance because the day before, Cassandra had called him and asked to come talk to him. But now that his arrogant brother had declined, he held himself responsible. His sister would not have vanished it if she had visited him that day. You know, officer, I'm not the nicest person. I think you realize that dating my ex-girlfriend in secret from my wife for such a long period of time. I'm sure I'll be punished for it in the next world. But the human heart doesn't decide who you fall in love with. In 2014, my father died. He literally hated Rebecca with all his soul, and the feeling was mutual. But he really liked Cassandra. He often remembered her, reproached me for the fact that we broke up with her almost immediately after Christmas. We often fight with our parents, accusing them of not understanding, and then it turns out that it's us, their children, who don't understand, and it hurts. My father was right, of course. And after he died, I just wanted to fulfill one of his wishes, and so I resumed my relationship with Cassandra. Rebecca needed to be broken up with. It was a conversation I kept putting off, you know. This family stuff sucks you dry, so I kept stalling. I've been living a double life for five years. It was hell. I had to make excuses for coming home late all the time, to hide it. I'd tell her about some fictitious business trips, and even bought a fishing rod, even though I hated fishing. A stupid pastime, and I'd tell Rebecca I was going to the lake while I went to Cassandra's. Before coming home, I'd buy fish at the supermarket for extra convincing, and Rebecca would bake it in the oven, and I'd eat it even though the smell of fish makes me sick. Did you know Cassandra was pregnant? What? Pregnant by whom? I don't have that information, but she told a close friend of hers that it was from you. That can't be true. She's been adamantly refusing to see me lately, and I guess I understand her and can't blame her for that. Naturally, she was tired of being in the background and wanted a family, which unfortunately I couldn't give her. I guess that the reason she refused to see me was because she had found someone else. Detective asked, when was the last time you saw her? Honestly, I can't even remember. I think it was about three months ago, maybe four, if you don't count the time we literally ran into her at the mall by chance. But that was fleeting because my wife was in the fitting room, and I just got tired of waiting for her, 
Anne decided to take a walk to the coffee shop. Tell me, officer, is there any chance you'll find her alive? Dudley continued. We're doing everything we can, believe me. Colin had more interactions with the detective after this one. Despite the fact that Cassandra's phone was recovered from the bottom of the pond, the police still asked for the missing person's call logs. The unsigned number her mother had informed her about actually belonged to Colin Dudley. Cassandra called him most of the time, and they even spoke on the day she vanished. Furthermore, the CCTV footage from the train station near the bridge, where Cassandra's abandoned car had been discovered, was given to the police that day. A strange man who stood out among the other passengers on the platform was observed by them. He had on a long cloak, gloves, a scarf covering his face, and a hat with the sides pulled down over his eyes. The detective claimed that although he couldn't see the man's face, Colin Dudley's gait was strikingly similar to that of the man. Regarding the hat, it bore a striking resemblance to the one donned by Alex in A Clockwork Orange. The investigators noticed that the strange man actually entered the cafe for a short while before exiting and heading toward the parking lot, where he got into his car and drove off. After they kept tracking him down through the CCTV cameras, the stranger never revealed his face to them during this entire time, but they were able to see the car's licensee plate number, which belonged to Colin Dudley, that the stranger got into. A search warrant was used to send a unit to his home. It was the detective's hope that Cassandra was still alive and in Dudley's home's basement. Initially, there was no proof of a homicide at Colin's residence. However, they discovered the exact hat Colin was attempting to conceal himself in the closet. After that, they descended to the basement, where they found no sign of the crime and no sign of Cassandra. But when the service dog sniffed the couch, it was trained to search for bloodstains. It barked, and that raised red flags right away. Colin affirmed that he hadn't broken any laws. The police were attempting to blame him, an innocent man for the crime because they had no other leads and no evidence. When the detective spoke with his wife, she was naturally horrified to learn about the activities in their home, the charges against her spousey, and the years-long deception. She had a lot to say about her husband and her feelings, but after giving it some thought, she responded negatively when the detective asked if her husband was capable of murder. Rob and Mary Smith were furious that Colin could not be imprisoned despite the abundance of evidence against him, and the detective was simply raising his hands. Colin was brought in once more for interrogation. Considering that he had an alibi for every accusation, he gave the crime considerable thought. Colin visited a hardware store early on August 25th at 6.30 a.m. and bought trash bags and household cleaning supplies. The store's cameras did, in fact, verify this, but this whole thing was overshadowed by the big garbage bags. Then Cassandra texted Colin to let him know that she was almost at his house, but Colin quickly deleted the message. But it stayed in the cell phone carrier's memory, and the call and message dump gave it to the police. Additionally, the couple did not leave the house for several hours that morning, based on their cell phone bill. Subsequently, Colin switched off his phone, but unintentionally left his mistress's phone on. This allowed the police to track Colin's entire path of movement, including his location as captured by the station's CCTV cameras. It was already known by the police that he had visited the cafe, likely using the restroom to clean up after the murder. Colin hopped in his car and headed to the pond where he had thrown Cassandra's phone, which was where the cell phone's last signal had come from. Now was the time to find Cassandra's body. The GPS tracker from Colin's car was taken by the police so they could follow the route precisely. The gadget accurately mimicked Cassandra's mobile signal movement. However, his actions the next day provided fresh evidence in the case. When the police followed his route through the woods, they came across a large trash can that was rope tied in a ravine. Blood stained the entire area surrounding it, making it obvious what was inside the container. It was a month after the murder by that point, and the body was hard to identify. The description of Cassandra's tattoo in the search notes proved helpful to the police. The same day, Colin was arrested and accused of murder. After performing a forensic examination, forensics determined that blunt force trauma to the skull resulted in a fracture that caused death. The police discovered bloodstains in the basement of the Dudley house that were impossible to remove entirely. Rebecca was unaware of the homicide. 
She spent the entire day in a different area of the house where the sounds from the basement were muffled. She also stated that Collins' claim that she was infertile was untrue and that she had never desired children. This was seen by the police as the crime's motivation. The absence of witnesses and tangible evidence, like the murder weapon, made it impossible to persuade the jury that Colin Dudley was the murderer during the trial. The murderer was then offered a reduced sentence by the court in exchange for his guilty plea. Colin received a 26-year prison sentence. The fact that the murderer would probably live to see the day he could be freed caused great distress to Cassandra's mother and brother, who were still upset about his refusal to meet with his sister prior to her death. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The Jared Bridegan case from love to the end of life. No matter how long a couple has been together or how happy their marriage was, divorces frequently result in the breakdown of amicable, or at least respectful, relationships. However, former husbands and wives may part ways as true adversaries close partners intentionally make each other's lives miserable, inflict harm, or wish for the other's death. In rare cases, it goes beyond mere wishes and escalates into actual physical confrontations. Today, we'll look at such a case. To begin, it is important to note that the case involving the death of 33-year-old Jared Bridegan, a Microsoft employee and father of four young children, has yet to be concluded. Currently, three people have been arrested on charges of conspiracy to commit a planned confrontation that resulted in Reagan's death, and they will face the death penalty. This sensational story, which unfolded in the sunny state of Florida, has, without a doubt, shaken the entire country. The protagonists are parents with multiple children. Once married, the motive for the crime is alarmingly simple a refusal to split jointly acquired assets and custody of their children. However, the approach to ending Brigham's life is reminiscent of a complex detective plot. Let's look at how former spouses and deeply religious people turned into the worst of enemies, and why it all ended so tragically. Who was Jared Bridegan? Jared J. Bridegan was born in 1989 in Florida into a modest family as the second of two sons. He grew up with his older brother Adam, with whom he was practically inseparable since childhood. The brother's parents were devout followers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Bowden later referred to Jared as her first true love. However, their relationship did not lead to marriage because cohabitation was frowned upon in their religious community. As a result, when Jared graduated from Florida Arts High School in 2007 and decided to continue his education in another state, they parted ways. Jared moved to Utah, where he attended college and met his future first wife. At a friend's birthday party in 2009, Jared Bridegan, then 20, met Shanna Gardner. She was two years old and came from a wealthy family. She was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as previously stated. Shanna was born in 1987. Her parents, Starling and Shelley Gardner, were co-founders of Stampin' Up!, a major company that manufactured and sold decorative and craft items. By 2010, their family business, headquartered in Salt Lake City, was reported to generate $100 million in annual revenue. Shanna has a sister named Sarah, who is currently a manager in the family business. As the heir to such a wealthy family, Shanna grew up in luxury and was used to living a leisurely life, never having to work in her trained profession as a chef. She was described as enthusiastic and fickle. According to Mallory, who was mentioned earlier, Jared was initially uninterested in his new acquaintance. Shauna, on the other hand, went out of her way to entice him with her extravagant lifestyle, implying that together they could travel the world and do whatever they wanted because her parents would financially support them. Family life and the birth of twins. The couple became engaged just a few months after their first meeting, and less than a year later, in early 2010, they celebrated a lavish wedding in a temple in Salt Lake City, Utah, with the Gardner family covering all expenses for the ceremony and reception. The couple's religious beliefs, which frowned on cohabitation and long engagements, influenced their quick decision to marry. Following their wedding, the newlyweds relocated to Utah, where the bride's parents assisted them in purchasing a comfortable home valued at approximately $1 million. Each spouse also owned their own Mercedes. Despite the fact that Jared was still a student and Shannon was not working, 
The couple traveled extensively around the world, posting numerous photos of their exciting trips, expensive purchases, and leisure activities on their social media accounts. According to close friends, Shannon's parents gave the couple around $10,000 per month for various expenses and gave them full access to their accounts. Furthermore, after Jared finished his degree, his in-laws generously gave him $100,000 to launch his own business. In 2013, the couple gave birth to twins, Abigail and Liam. The family relocated to Connecticut for a while, but Liam was soon diagnosed with a heart condition and lung issues. Doctors advised the child to move closer to the sea, citing health benefits. The Brits moved to Florida, where they purchased a two-story comfortable home near the coast in Ponte Vedra Beach, south of Jacksonville. Shana was actively managing her own social media blog at the time, portraying herself as a loving wife, a caring mother of twins, a professional chef, and a woman who enjoyed travel and sports. She took fitness seriously, going to the gym almost every day. Seeing her dedication, Jared decided to surprise his beloved by hiring a personal trainer for her. Following the scandalous divorce shortly after moving, clear issues arose in the marriage, despite the couple's stubborn insistence that everything was fine. Shana became disillusioned with their religion and almost stopped attending church, while her husband remained a devout and exemplary member. This difference in religious commitment resulted in disagreements, misunderstandings, and tension. Shana reportedly became disillusioned with Jared, whom she saw as too lazy, having gained weight, and only half-heartedly attempting to get his business off the ground. After completing online programming and design courses, Jared secured a position at Microsoft and began earning independently. After a few years, he was promoted to senior manager. Nonetheless, the couple grew apart and disagreements became commonplace in their home. The situation worsened when Jared discovered intimate conversations between his wife and her personal fitness trainer. According to some sources, Shana had an affair which the trainer confirmed over the phone with Jared, though Shana strongly denied these allegations. Jared then emailed Mallory Bowden, lamenting how his wife had become distant and emotionally attached to her gym trainer. Despite this, he expressed a willingness to forgive the infidelity and keep their family intact for the sake of their children. The couple began a contentious and scandalous divorce process in 2015, nearly six years after they married. They had a heated argument about shared assets and custody rights for their children. Jared publicly accused his ex-wife of infidelity, which she categorically denied, claiming that the marriage had simply lost its romance. In response, she accused him of being cruel and defensive. Shana refused to divide their home, cars, and bank accounts, claiming that nearly everything they had acquired over the years had been purchased or gifted by her parents. Jared had only begun working less than a year before, having previously focused on his studies and failed to establish his business with funds from his in-laws. Jared challenged this viewpoint, claiming at least half of their Florida home. Custody of the twins sparked numerous disputes. Shana claimed that whenever Jared was with the children, he tried to turn them against her. He allegedly coached them on what to say about their mother and recorded their statements for use in court. Jared, for his part, accused his ex-wife of extensive surveillance including the installation of hidden cameras in their home, the tapping of his phone calls, and the placement of a tracker in his car to monitor his movements. Shana sought sole custody of the children, as well as exclusive ownership of their seaside home. She also claimed Jared threatened to take all of the money from their children's trust funds for personal use. Jared responded by alleging that his ex-wife evaded taxes by working off the books at her parents' company and receiving tens of thousands of dollars, by the end of 2015, the court had ordered joint custody of the children. But that did not put an end to Jared and Shana's disputes. Even after their divorce was officially finalized, they continued to appear in court for nearly seven years, culminating in the tragic end of their story. By this point, both had moved on to start new families and have additional children. In 2016, Jared met Christina, a Microsoft employee who lived and worked in North Carolina. Initially, their interactions were strictly professional, but they gradually became closer. A few months later, Christina relocated to Florida to be with Jared. They married in February 2019, having met in the fall of 2017. They welcomed their first child, a daughter named Bexley, in August 2021. Shauna remarried in 2018, marrying Mario Fernandez, a man a year younger than her who owned a real estate business. That same year, they welcomed their son, Michael, 
The family lived in the same house Shauna had shared with her first husband, Jared, which had been the site of their court battles. The arrival of new families did not calm the tensions between the ex-spouses, who continued to file lawsuits against one another with new demands. Jared insisted that Shannon's new husband, Mario, should not be allowed to be with the twins while their mother was away. In contrast, he wanted his new wife, Christina, to be fully involved in the upbringing of his older children. The last court meeting between Jared and Shana took place four months before Jared's death and was extremely tense. They exchanged more mutual accusations and argued over their property rights. Shana claimed that Jared was preventing her from using the family's larger, more comfortable vehicle to transport the children because he was more concerned with humiliating the mother than with his own children's comfort and safety. At this point, the court granted Shauna exclusive use of the larger vehicle and ordered Jared to pay her $600 as compensation. The tragic end to a secluded road for the ex-spouse's agreement. On Wednesdays, Jared picked up the twins for a family dinner, which included their younger sister, Bexley. Christina occasionally joined them, but after the birth of London, she spent the majority of her time with the newborn, preferring not to leave him with babysitters. Jared picked up the children on Wednesday, February 22, 2022, and took them to a coastal cafe per his routine. After dinner and a stroll, he dropped the twins off at their mother's house and returned home via his usual route. The journey typically took about 40 minutes, with part of it spent on a deserted stretch of road with no street lights. Bridegan came across an unexpected obstacle while driving slowly and cautiously, aware of his three-year-old daughter asleep in her car seat. It was about 9 p.m. and the sun had set when he noticed a tire in his lane in the headlights. He came to a stop, turned on his hazard lights, and got out to move the tire to the side of the road. That's when the shots went off. Jared had no chance of escaping. The perpetrator, acting with deadly precision, fired several close-range shots before fleeing the scene. The child sleeping in the car was unharmed. A passerby heard the shots and approached cautiously, discovering Jared lying in a pool of blood. He immediately contacted the police and paramedics. Unfortunately, it was too late to save the victim. The investigation and initial suspicions Christina called her husband just minutes before the incident, and he said he had just dropped off the children and would be home in 15 minutes. However, 30 minutes had passed into an hour and Jared was nowhere to be found and stopped answering his phone, anxiously dialing his phone number again. Christina was greeted by a police officer who informed her of the incident and requested her immediate arrival at the Jacksonville Beach Police Station. The investigation team at the scene determined that Jared's vehicle came to a halt due to a road obstacle, specifically a tire. They concluded that he got out of his car to remove the obstacle but was then shot. His three-year-old daughter, who was asleep in the car, was unharmed, indicating that the mysterious shooter did not target her. Furthermore, there were no valuables missing from the vehicle. A wallet containing cash, a phone, and a tablet were left, effectively ruling out the robbery theory almost immediately. When asked if her husband had any known enemies, antagonists, or recent conflicts, Christina stated that she was unaware of anyone wishing harm on her husband except his first wife, Shauna. However, she avoided making direct accusations in the absence of incontrovertible evidence. The absence of cameras resulted in a lack of surveillance footage, according to police. Whereas on the stretch of road where the incident occurred, a witness who heard Tay, however, they did hear the sound of a car speeding away. There was nothing visible in the darkness. Investigators found Christina's suggestion of Shannon's involvement in the crime plausible. However, detectives knew she was unlikely to act directly, especially given her solid alibi of being at home with her husband, twins, younger son, and her parents who were visiting. The police decided to check the nearby surveillance cameras. The video captured an old, dark blue Ford F-150 with brown trim entering the area about 15 minutes before the incident. Again, a few minutes after the witness reported the shots, detectives asked the public for assistance in identifying the vehicle of interest. The Jared family made television appeals, urging anyone with any information about the case to come forward. The first suspect arrested, Shauna, and her current husband, Mario, were repeatedly questioned but denied any involvement in the murder. Shauna did not hide the fact that her relationship with her ex-husband was complicated, but she insisted that she would never harm the father of her children. She also told the media how the nine-year-old twins reacted to the news of their father's death. According to her, 
Abigail cried uncontrollably for several hours. Liam was stunned and silent for a long time. It's worth noting that neither the ex-wife nor the older children attended Jared's funeral. Christina had told Shanna that her presence at the farewell ceremony was extremely unwelcome, to which Shanna responded that if she wasn't allowed to attend, neither would the twins. The first suspect was arrested in January 2023, nearly a year after Mr. Brigham's murder. The police had remained silent about the investigation's progress, only stating that it required significant resources and effort. After a lengthy search for the dark blue Ford F-150, Lux smiled on the investigation when the vehicle was involved in an accident but fled the scene before police arrived. This time, the incident occurred in a crowded area with a large number of witnesses, and the offender was identified the same day thanks to multiple camera footage. The car was owned by Henry Tenen, a 62-year-old unemployed man with prior convictions. He was charged with second-degree premeditated murder with a firearm, involvement in a criminal conspiracy with the intent to commit murder, and planning an ambush with an obstruction for the victim. Jacksonville Beach Police Chief Jonathan Paul Smith and City Prosecutor Melissa Nelson announced the charges at a press conference. Tenen was also revealed to have not acted alone and was testifying against his accomplices, though no other names were released at the time to protect the integrity of the ongoing investigation. Given the gravity of the charges against him and the lengthy prison term he faced, the tenant decided to make a deal with law enforcement, hoping that his cooperation would be considered favorably during sentencing and potentially reduce his punishment. The criminal trio discovered information that quickly leaked to the press that the accused tenant was renting a small house with a friend owned by Mario Fernandez. Tenant's housemate was also brought in for questioning, but he was unable to provide any useful information about the case. He had no personal dealings with the owner of their rental, instead passing his share of the rent through Henry. However, a thorough search of the house revealed a hidden pistol in the accused room, which ballistic tests determined to be the murder weapon. This further implicated 10 people in the crime. On March 16, 2023, Mario Fernandez was arrested after pleading guilty and agreeing to testify against Mario, whom he identified as the crime's contractor. Fernandez was charged with first-degree murder, criminal conspiracy, and incitement to commit a serious crime. Rumors circulated that Shauna was the mastermind of the murder. This was supported by her former lover, a fitness trainer, who revealed that she had a long-standing dislike for her, then husband and wished for his death. A tattoo artist Shana frequented also testified, recalling Shana complaining about her ex-husband's endless legal battles, wishing to silence him forever, and asking if she knew anyone who could assist. Shana repeated her inquiry months later, clearly indicating her seriousness, after it was initially misinterpreted as a grim joke. Shana Gardner Fernandez vehemently denied all allegations made against her. She stated her intention to stay in town and assist with the investigation. However, a few months after her husband's arrest, she relocated to Washington with the twins and her youngest son on August 17, 2023. She was facing the same charges as her current husband, who was arrested in her Washington apartment. She was extradited to Florida, where she would face trial alongside the criminal trio. Her actions were motivated by complicated relationships with her ex-husband, a desire to avoid sharing custody of their two children, and a desire to own all disputed assets outright. As of now, the ongoing legal battle continues, and legal proceedings against all conspirators are underway. Tainan has pleaded guilty to all charges, is fully cooperating with the investigation, and is hoping for leniency. According to reports, he faces at least 15 years in prison, which is a long time for someone his age and could be equivalent to a life sentence. Mario Fernandez has only partially admitted his guilt and, exercising his legal rights, has declined to testify against his wife. Shanna Gardner Fernandez, on the other hand, has vehemently denied all charges against her. Nonetheless, prosecutors are seeking the death penalty or life in prison with no possibility of parole for the couple. Shannon's three children are currently in the care of their maternal grandparents, Starling and Shelley Gardner, and Aunt Sarah. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Today's story takes place in the small town of Sarasota, Florida, a resort town on the warm Gulf of Mexico where people felt safe until one day. 
It all begins with Carly's 11-year-old life, which, like any other child's, is full of events. The girl's parents divorced years ago, but she still loved both of them. Every weekend, she flew to New York to see her father. But Carly lived with her mother and stepfather. She was one of the most delightful children, kind and optimistic, and she always tried to convey her eternal optimism to those around her. She was this way because of her father. Carly had blonde hair, blue eyes, and an upturned nose. Friends, relatives, and others recognized her beauty and character. Everyone predicted that she would one day become a well-known model or actress. However, Carly's relatives and she were unaware that this would not occur. January 31, 2004, was an ordinary day. On her weekend, Carly decided to spend the night at a friend's house. When the girls spent the night at each other's house, they did everything that any girlfriend would. They painted one another's nails, listened to music, and gossiped about their classmates. The girls were so engrossed in their visits that they didn't realize it was already evening. As is customary in all families on Sunday nights, the entire family gathered to watch the Super Bowl game. Carly desperately wanted to get home by then, so she informed her friend's mother that her parents were waiting for her at home and that she could go home alone. The friend's mother was concerned, but Carly insisted on going home at 6 p.m. for 13 minutes. That is how long it took to get to the street with the brushes. It was just 750 meters. After Carly left, the friend's mother contacted the parents because she was concerned and informed them that Carly had left alone. Susan Carly's mother was very concerned about her daughter, who had gone alone, despite the fact that the distance was only two blocks. So a concerned Susan asked Stephen, her husband's stepfather, to come out and meet her. Stephen immediately goes outside to meet Carly. They were to meet halfway and enter the store. Stephen was always spoiling his stepdaughter, and the night before the match, he promised to buy her a bunch of sweets. Stephen walked the entire route several times but could not locate Carly. She vanished. Carly and her parents' lives are plunged into horror from that point forward. The feelings of concern and excitement were not futile, because in the future, they anticipated events that would shock the entire city. Stephen searched for Carly for more than an hour. He drove past the route a few more times, hoping that he and Carly had simply diverged. However, it was clear that something had happened to her. After all, the distance between the houses was manageable, and everyone was familiar with the route. Susan and Stephen set out again to find Carly. They walked the streets and drove through neighborhoods, shouting and searching for the girl by name. They looked through all the suspicious areas, including a wooded landing, and then noticed something strange. A red tow truck was driving slowly past them, so they decided to follow. Susan and Stephen continued to follow the tow truck and discovered that it was headed to Carly's friend's house, which surprised them. The same red tow truck that they had seen earlier was parked outside her friend's house, where Carly had exited a few hours before and vanished. It was parked outside Carly's friend's home. The red tow truck struck the parents as unusual. Susan calls 911 after realizing Carly is nowhere to be found. When an adult goes missing, police typically wait 24 hours before conducting a search. Searching for children always necessitates immediate action. As a result, the officers immediately divided into teams and began interviewing Carly's friend's family and Carly's own parents, Steve and Susan. Detectives investigate the route in the immediate area. However, she could not be found. Stephen and Susan are desperate and have no idea what to do. During the search, friends of Carly's family can find flyers with a photo and the inscription missing Carly on all of the city's walls and poles. When people began to doubt Stephen Carly's stepfather while he was handing out flyers at a local company, he asked one of the employees if he could buy illegal substances for him. The employees were suspicious because his stepdaughter had only gone missing for a few days. Employees reported the incident to authorities. The detectives also kept an eye on Stephen, believing he was suspicious. The police decided to bring Stephen in for questioning. During the interrogation, Stephen stated that he had been with Susan at home the entire time, which she confirmed. Furthermore, while walking down the street to meet her from a friend, he was on the phone with Susan the entire time, as phone records show. Stephen reported that he did not find Carly despite walking her route for more than an hour. Stephen remained a suspect even after his alibi had been thoroughly investigated. However, Stephen remembered a suspicious red tow truck that he and Susan had seen the day it went missing. 
Its owner was Ron Shokit. Ron had been dating his friend Carly's mother for months. Stephen told police that he saw the truck driving slowly near a wooded area shortly after Carly's disappearance, and then stopping near Carly's friend's home. Investigators began testing that theory as well. They called Ron in for questioning. Ron stated that he had left for work before Carly did and had noticed nothing unusual. The police also tracked Ron's movements that day, checked his alibi, and ruled him out as a suspect because he was at work when Carly went missing, as confirmed by his employer and surveillance cameras. The day after Carly's disappearance, the police decided to contact Susan again. She claimed to the police officers that her daughter had never run away before, and she had no reason to believe Carly would have run away. However, the information provided by Carly's friends differed significantly from Susan's version. Carly's friend reported to the police that she had been extremely depressed and upset the day before. In her conversations, she expressed reluctance to return home, claiming that she had too many responsibilities. This new information prompted law enforcement officials to consider the possibility that Carly had left voluntarily. However, given her young age, investigators cannot completely rule out the abduction of Dory. In order to provide complete clarity, investigators have asked Susan to contact Carly's dentist and obtain dental records, which could be useful if identification is required. The next morning, police officers used police dogs to search for Carly. Susan and Stephen allowed the dog's canine handlers into their daughter's bedroom. The dogs sniffed the bedroom linens and the girl's clothes before picking up the trail. They followed Carly's planned route from her friend's house to her own. Carly's tracks led police to a car wash, where she apparently attempted to take a shortcut. The dogs lost track of Carly near the car wash's back entrance. Fortunately, the area was equipped with two cameras, one capturing cars closer to the entrance and the other capturing cars farther away. Unfortunately for the cops, there were some blind spots that remained hidden. Police recognized that if Carly was taken away by a criminal, it is unlikely that he did so under camera surveillance, but they sat down to examine the footage. The camera at the entrance did not record anything. Officers reviewed all footage from 6 p.m. There was no footage from 9 p.m. onward. However, a second camera in the far corner caught some interesting moments. At 6, 20, 1 p.m., it captivated Carly. She walked with a calm stride toward the house. Carly wore the same red t-shirt and blue jeans, with her hair styled in a small bundle. Suddenly, a man appeared in the frame, white-skinned, stocky, of medium height, with dark hair and a unique tattoo on his forearm. The stranger wore dark blue work overalls with a name tag, as if he worked at a gas station or car service. The alleged perpetrator approached Carly and said something, grabbing her wrists and dragging her toward the camera's blind spot. This was likely the last person to see Carly alive, criminal or not. He should have been found as soon as possible and learned what happened in that parking lot on February 1 at 6.21 p.m. The poor quality of the security camera footage made it impossible to see the man's face, let alone his name tag. The only hope was to involve the public in the search. The CUC TV footage had been widely publicized for 24 hours and had been published in newspapers. They needed to spread the word as widely as possible. Maybe someone could recognize a person based on their shape and construct in our gate. The police set up a special call center in the hopes of learning more about what happened to Carly, or at least some information from potential eyewitnesses. Within 24 hours, they had received over 700 calls. Operators recorded every statement, but they were all unsuccessful until late in the evening, when they received a lead that led them to the perpetrator. On Tuesday, February 3, police received a call from a man who claimed to know the man on the videotape. The caller introduced himself as one of his business associates. He stated that the man's name is Joseph Smith, and he is easily identified by his peculiar uniform and awkward gait. Police officers immediately grabbed a long-awaited lead. Operators continued to answer the phone. Detectives checked Joseph Smith's information. The man moved to Sarasota County from Brooklyn, New York, in 2003. He was an auto mechanic by trade and had been married but divorced twice. His three adult daughters were college graduates. The newest suspect was 37 years old. He had a long criminal record dating back to 1993. There were several charges, including solicitation of minors. Joseph Smith, who had back problems for most of his life, was severely addicted to illegal drugs. He'd been arrested several times, including three for assaulting women. Carly's disappearance occurred while he was on probation, 
One of Smith's co-workers reported that he had been acting strangely since Carly's disappearance, and the day before, he had not shown up for work at all. He also stated that Smith had used illegal substances. This co-worker confirmed that the man on the videotape closely resembled Smith in appearance, demeanor, and clothing. Another co-worker confirmed that the man in the videotape closely resembled Joseph Smith and stated that the day after Carly was kidnapped, Smith arrived at work under the influence of illegal substances. Smith's co-workers claimed Joseph was having problems at work due to illegal drugs and debt. The police decide to re-examine all of the car wash videos from shortly before Carly's abduction in an attempt to connect the kidnapper to one of the cars passing or stopping near the car wash. Joseph's co-workers said he drove a brown Lincoln. However, at the time of the abduction, it was being repaired. Police investigated a light-colored Buick station wagon that pulled into the car wash parking lot about three minutes before Carly was abducted. The car briefly stopped in the parking lot before driving away. The quality of the video footage prevented the police from determining the license plate number or identifying the driver. The police decided to go to Joseph Smith's home. Officers arrived at Joseph's friend's home where he was renting a room after his wife kicked him out. Joseph opened the door, surprised and shocked that he had been mistaken for the kidnapper. The police officers continued to question Joseph, focusing on the specifics of his alibi. Joseph insisted that he was at home watching the Super Bowl when Carly went missing and that his friends confirmed his presence at the time. However, when shown a video camera image of a man who closely resembled him, Joseph abruptly admitted that the man looked like him. Yosef abruptly admitted that the man looked like him. However, he insisted that he was at home that evening and couldn't have been near the car wash. The detectives decided to conduct additional checks by having Joseph show his hands and roll up his sleeves. During this check, it was discovered that Joseph had tattoos on his forearm that matched those seen in the surveillance footage. Additionally, investigators discovered several fresh scratches on his face and hands. During subsequent interviews with investigators, Joseph admitted that he did borrow a light-colored station wagon from his friends that day. However, he claimed that he only drove it to a nearby marina to enjoy the water view before returning home. The investigation continued. The police were certain that Joseph was involved in Carly's disappearance. However, the owner of the apartment from which he rented Mimi confirmed his alibi, which perplexed investigators slightly. The police searched Joseph's Lincoln thoroughly and discovered several syringes inside. Joseph was arrested for using illegal substances and spoons, as well as violating his probation terms. A few hours following Joseph's arrest, Jeff Pincus, Joseph's friend and Mimi's husband, contacted police and informed them that Mimi had mixed up the dates in her statement. They stated that they had indeed lent him their car, but that he had not returned in the evening as promised and had not arrived until shortly before dawn. They also testified that before Joseph left, they checked the odometer, and when Joseph returned, they discovered that it had traveled more than 300 miles, and the car inside appeared shabby. The back seat was down. The officers then asked Joseph's friends if they remembered what Joseph was wearing when he left the home. Jeff replied that he was wearing a mechanic's uniform. The police officers knew it, but they needed to find indisputable evidence of Joseph's involvement in the case. The police obtained permission from Joseph's friends to search their home, or Joseph rented a room. However, they found no evidence linking Joseph to Carly's disappearance. In addition, the police were still unable to locate Carly. Police searched the wooded areas near where Carly was last seen on videotape. However, the search produced no results. While the police were searching for Carly, one of Joseph's longtime acquaintances visited the police station. He confirmed that the man on the videotape looked a lot like Joseph and provided some critical information. The man stated that Joseph had recently spoken about his growing desire to assault women. Following this conversation, police officers took Joseph from the jail to the station for questioning. Joseph entered the interrogation room. He wanted to talk to his mother or brother. The detective persuaded Joseph to contact the public defender's office and have an attorney come to him. During the interrogation, the officers were unable to extract any information from Joseph, so he was returned to jail. He was finally able to speak to his brother John. What he told his brother confirmed all of their worst fears. Five days after Carly disappeared, Joseph's brother John decided to contact the police and reveal a terrible secret. He showed the police where Carly's body was. He led them to the church on Proctor Road in the woods. John revealed that his brother had confessed to kidnapping and brutally attacking Carly. 
John claimed that Joseph had killed Carly, beaten her, and strangled her with a shoelace. He admitted that he wanted to use sharp instruments but was afraid he'd be unable to wash the car afterwards. The confession was so cruel and disgusting that the brothers were unable to express their feelings and were deeply shocked by such a terrible secret. Here's his brother's secret. John suspected that he had used forbidden substances or committed theft, but he never imagined that he would get to this point. Then Joseph's mother informed the police that her son had contacted her and confessed to his actions. The police discovered Carly's remains precisely where John had pointed. Carly was clearly struggling and fighting for survival. The investigation determined that the death was caused by strangulation. Detectives also confirmed that Joseph assaulted Carly's body. A forensic examination revealed traces of Joseph's DNA on Carly's body, as well as fibers from Joseph's clothes and hair. That is, the perpetrator's guilt was fully proven in the car that Joseph borrowed from friends that day, as were Carly's hair and several fibers of clothing that matched the one she was wearing at the time. Joseph was charged with murder. The defense attorney attempted to argue that the police officers framed his client, but Joseph's bodily fluids and hair were discovered on Carly's body. According to the prosecution's version, Joseph Smith took a large dose of psychotropic drugs that day. The public was then outraged that a man with such a criminal past and criminal tendencies had been released so quietly from prison, where he had been imprisoned 13 times in the previous 10 years. Also, about a month before Carly's kidnapping, Local authorities asked a Florida judge to issue a warrant for Joseph Smith's arrest for a probation violation. The judge, however, denied issuing the warrant, citing the police's failure to complete the required paperwork. And so it was argued that if this man had been shielded from society from the start, this terrible case might not have occurred. Little Carly would be alive, and her mother would not have to go through all of these traumatic events. The day everything was decided, was October 24, 2005. Joseph Smith was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death via lethal injection. He remained in prison, waiting for his death sentence. Smith was also suspected in the 2000 murder of Tara Riley, 25, who was discovered dead and naked in a pond behind a Walmart store. But the case was never solved, although John, who opposed his brother in court, claimed that Joseph was the one who killed Tara. He is a coward and refuses to admit it, John was certain that his brother was also guilty of this. John stated, My brother is the ultimate coward. He has spent his entire life insulting and humiliating those who are weaker than him. He will never admit what he has done. And if he is released, who knows how many innocent lives he will take. He's always been like this, which is why his wife left him. But his parents believed until the end that he was a good man. On July 18, 2017, Joseph's death sentence was overturned and a new legislation was signed. It stated that the jury would vote 10 out of 10 in favor of the death penalty. Joseph was scheduled to have a new sentencing hearing. However, it was postponed. Susan, Carly's mother, began using illegal substances immediately after learning of her daughter's death. She was devastated by the death of her only daughter. Susan tried to pull herself together, assisting the Children's Defense Fund and other parents in their search for the missing. With all of her might, she tried to help others avoid such traumatic events. After all, Susan knew what it was like to go through such an experience. But after learning that Joseph would be pardoned and possibly released, Susan lost the meaning of life, couldn't take it anymore, and died by taking a lethal dose of forbidden substances. Smith was awaiting a sentencing review hearing scheduled for 2019, which could have saved his life. Joseph Smith managed to avoid the death penalty. However, in March 2020, one, the Attorney General's office confirmed that he should face a new sentencing hearing. Smith died in prison on July 26, 2021, aged 55. His cause of death could not be determined. At the end of the story, we'd like to state that the perpetrator killed little Carly and ruined the lives of Susan, Carly's family, and friends. He also committed other heinous crimes that can never be justified. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Mom is an important figure in each of our lives. Across all languages, this word sounds warm and tender because it conveys only goodness and understanding. 
In times of pain, fear, or joy, a person's only words are mommy. Unfortunately, children are not always the most important part of a mother's life. A high-profile crime committed in one of the nation's largest states, Texas, has spread across the country. Christy Sheets, a young and successful 42-year-old woman, shot and killed her two adult daughters in her own backyard. But why? Let's start at the beginning and try to figure out what possessed a loving mother to commit such a cruel act. Christy Bird was born in Decatur, Alabama, in 1974. Rebecca Bird's parents separated when she was very young, and her mother Christy had to work hard to provide a poverty-free existence for her child. Christy was raised primarily by her grandfather. The girl adored her grandfather because he spoiled her and taught her unusual skills, such as how to handle a gun. The retired officer had an impressive collection of weapons the two of them would lock themselves in a semi-dark basement room and spend hours looking at the treasures hidden beneath her grandfather's intriguing stories. From early childhood, a person seeks to understand his place in life, learns to form relationships with others, and receives education for the purpose of applying what he has learned in real life. Christie, however, did not strive for knowledge. Despite attending one of the best schools in the state, the study was uninterested in the young rebel frequent clashes with peers severely traumatized her childhood psyche. As a result of repeated attacks and conflicts with classmates, Christy barely finishes school. It's after school. Christy relocates to Lawrence County in North Alabama to attend university. She begins working as a secretary for a transportation company, where she meets Jason Sheets, a young and promising specialist. The young people walk for hours around the city. They hike together, take a vacation to Christy's hometown, and form a strong and lasting bond. After a few years, they married and moved to Kathy's hometown, located on one of the city's quietest streets. On April 19, 1994, the young family purchases a house. Taylor, their first daughter, was born. Jason was overjoyed because he had always wanted a small daughter. The Sheets family was very well done and pleased. Jason has successfully worked as a consultant for a large oil and gas company. Christy raised her daughter and was an outstanding housewife. On October 21, 1998, Christy and Jason welcomed their second daughter, Madison. Family life proceeded in a calm and measured manner. Jason was at work. Christy was caring for the children until tragedy struck, forever changing the family's way of life. When Christy's grandfather died in 2012, she loved him as if he were the father she never had. The woman had a difficult time dealing with such a significant loss. Psychologists and antidepressants took the place of family idols. However, even two months later, she had not fully recovered from her grandfather's death. Christie's mother dies another tragedy morally kills her, and she enters a mental health clinic for the first time. One clinic is replaced by another, and antidepressants are substituted for hard alcohol. Christie's internal state has been unstable and vulnerable for a long time. Husbands and daughters have long tried to help a loved one in any way they can. After a while, they appear to be successful. Christie returns to her former life. She gets a job as a manager at a laser cosmetology clinic that specializes in tattoo removal. Work consumes all of her time, while her beloved husband and daughter have attempted to occupy her heart and thoughts. Christy shared a photo of Taylor and Madison on Facebook on September 25, 2015, her daughter's birthday. She captions it with a statement of maternal love. Christy summoned her children. These girls are incredible, sweet, kind, beautiful, and intelligent. You have no idea how much I love and cherish you. Christy wrote at the time to her daughter. In January of that year, she wrote another strong post in support of her right to bear arms, a post with a photo of a polished gun on a table next to seven bullets. I own 10 guns. Obama wants eight of my firearms. What number of guns do I have? Responding to her comments. That is right. I own 10 guns. Christy Sheets has been a vocal supporter of legislation that would make firearms more widely available to the public. She was particularly opposed to the Democratic Party's initiative to prohibit the free trade of semi-automatic handguns. Christy claimed that it would violate her family's right to self-defense. It's ironic that Christy Sheets' love, admiration, and staunch defense of guns, as well as her belief in the right to bear arms, ultimately led to the tragic loss of her two daughters and her own life. On Jason's birthday, June 24, 2016, Christy invited her daughters over for dinner. That night, the whole family congregated in the living room. Instead of a celebratory dinner, 
Jason wanted to inform his daughters about his upcoming divorce. Christy had overheard their conversation. In the living room, there was an uproar. She was yelling and cursing. Then she departed. Jason tried to calm the girls down. I promised that things would get better. But Christy returned with a gun in hand. Jason covered the children and panic spread throughout the house. Madison hid behind the couch and made a discreet call to 911. When the dispatcher answered, the girl had been overtaken by her mother. Mommy, please do not shoot. A wheezing, moaning, and silenced voice was heard again. Don't shoot. There are kids. I'll do whatever you want, don't shoot. The call was cut short. Taylor, 22, is unable to speak or relay information to the dispatcher during her second phone call. She was completely perplexed by the incredible chaos that was unfolding in the family home. Taylor was shot twice by her mother, who fired the fatal shot while her daughter lay dying on the ground outside the family home. At 5 p.m., Christy simply fired several shots at Taylor and Madison. Police responded to several 911 calls near Christy and Jason's home. Police discovered the bodies of Madison Sheets, 17, and Taylor Sheets, 22, on the ground. Christy was standing over Madison's body, holding a gun. She was clearly about to take another shot at the girl. The police officer, unsure if the victim was still alive, ordered her to drop the weapon immediately. Christy ignored the officer's demand, and they opened fire at point-blank range. The woman was killed on the spot. An examination of the victims revealed that Madison, 17, died instantly from her injuries, while Taylor, 22, was injured. She was transported to the hospital via helicopter. Unfortunately, she was unable to be saved. As a result, the injuries inflicted by their mother proved fatal to both daughters. Jason Sheets, 45, was the massacre's only survivor. Christy also shot him, but he was able to seek refuge in the home of neighbors who asked him to call the cops. The neighbors overheard him pleading with Christy, please do not hurt them. There are kids. Christy, however, did not heed those words. Instead, she fired a few bullets at Jason. Only a lucky break saved his life. However, the police were unable to question Jason about the incident's circumstances right away. When the police arrived, he was immediately taken to the hospital in a state of deep shock. The area around the house where the family tragedy took place was cordoned off. Surprising neighbors and random witnesses were repeatedly questioned. As the interviews began, it was most accurately established that there were initial sounds of bickering coming from the house. Then, according to witnesses who were concerned, Christy began beating the girls before grabbing a .38 caliber shotgun. She fired at Madison and then Taylor from point-blank range. The bleeding girls ran out of the house. Madison managed only a few steps before collapsing in agony. The mother saw this and fired another shot in Taylor's direction. Christy went inside the house, reloaded the shotgun, and shot her dead at point-blank range. According to witnesses, Christy acted coldly and without movement. They returned to their home's living room after the first shots were fired. All family members dashed outside. A family argument turned into a shooting, but we're still trying to put everything together. That was the first version of what happened, told to TV news crews who arrived on the scene of the tragedy. What drove Christy Burn Sheets, 42, to commit such heinous crimes? The detectives are unsure of the exact reasons all they have are dry facts. According to police, there was trouble in the Sheets family home for several years due to disagreements among family members. Police have called Sheets over a dozen times. In the end, Christy's father and husband were both female. Jason Sheets, 45, couldn't take it anymore and left his wife. But he recently returned to her. On the day of the tragedy, Christie's invitation brought the entire family together for dinner. Taylor, a college student who recently had a fight with her mother, returned home to celebrate Jason's birthday with her family. What happened astounded observers and family acquaintances alike. How and why did a mother murder her own daughter's neighbor, Gino Hernandez, according to the Sheets family? I've known both girls since they were 10 years old, the man said, wiping away tears. They were always pleasant. When outgoing girls passed, they would always wave and say hello. Then there's Christy. She refused to attend the barbecue. It was always as if she were one of her own wonderful girls, and Jason was a good guy to another neighbor who voiced their concerns. We are completely focused on Christy. The investigation also supports the neighbors. Christy's previous conflicts with both daughters have already been revealed. 
Furthermore, official authorities have already stated that Christie suffered from a mental illness on June 29, 2016. Sheriff Troy Nils told reporters at the first press conference that the 42-year-old mother was depressed and had attempted suicide multiple times because she was about to divorce her husband. According to the police spokesman, the couple's marriage began to fall apart in 2012. Just then, Christy Sheets' grandfather committed suicide in order to kill family members. Mrs. Sheets used a gun that she inherited from a deceased relative, one of the possible causes of the family's serious discord. The sheriff referred to Christie's refusal to put up with her eldest daughter Taylor's upcoming marriage. A couple of days before the shots were fired, Christie Sheets had an argument with her oldest daughter, Taylor, and attempted to place her under house arrest and prohibit her from seeing her fiancé. Nels observed that Jason disagreed with his wife on whether house arrest was an appropriate punishment for a 22-year-old girl. Juan Sebastian Logo, 23, and Taylor Sheets, 22, were in the same art department during their college years. The two young people had been dating for four years through social media. They demonstrated how much they loved each other and how they were planning their wedding. A small wedding ceremony was set for June 27th. It has been suggested that Taylor's mother objected to his marriage to Sebastian, who was of Hispanic descent. Jason Sheets disagreed with his wife and insisted that incarcerating their eldest daughter was inappropriate punishment for an adult. Later, Jason Sheets would testify, telling investigators that his wife had called their daughters to inform them of their divorce. She had been informed of it, but instead of explaining it to the children, she pointed a gun at them and shot them several times. But she didn't shoot her husband. As Mr. Sheets stated, the wife's motivation was to make him suffer. According to Jason Sheets, his wife's downward spiral began in 2012 when she lost her grandfather and continued two months later when she lost her mother. Apparently, the gun she used to kill her daughters was a gift from her grandfather. Jason Sheets revealed that his wife applied for a gun permit but was denied due to her mental illness. This begs the question, what did Christy Sheets believe triggered the need to punish and torture her husband? Was it a breakdown in their marriage? The feeling that she had lost control and valor in her life. Christy alluded to this in a series of Facebook rants where she discussed protecting herself and her family. Or could Christy Sheets' decision to kill her daughters have been influenced by medication or a deterioration in her mental state? Jason Sheets admitted to the police that his wife suffered from depression. She was taking her prescribed pills by the handful and seeing a therapist. She had been to a private psychiatric hospital three times in recent years after attempting to commit suicide. Sheriff Nels made a report, Christy Sheets had enough time and opportunity to murder her husband. But she did not. Jason realized Christy wished him to suffer. Sheriff Nell echoed Jason Sheets, who was recounting the incident for the first time. Mr. Sheets revealed that Christy was aware of how much he loved Taylor and Madison, as well as their love for him. Nels continued, possibly exacerbated by the complete schism in the family and the realization that she would be losing not only her husband but also her daughters. Christy was already in a difficult emotional state when she grabbed a gun, foreshadowing her tragic end. Madison Davey, a close family friend, gave an excellent interview discussing family relationships. He was the absolute best father in the world. I used to hang out with them, and he enjoyed being around us. They were so funny together that you would expect the sisters to fight. But no, Davey responded. They were deeply in love with each other. And we are always laughing. Davey went on to say that both daughters were very close to each other and their father. Jason was willing to do anything to protect them, and he tried. However, Christy planned to kill that day, according to Davy. Christy, perhaps only intimidating, pulled out a gun and screamed and cried as she said goodbye to her family in an attempt to commit suicide. But she did not get the desired result. Jason answered differently. If you just want to shoot yourself, don't come near us. Shoot yourself. But Christy said, no, that will be your punishment family, friends, and acquaintances were certain that something had to happen in this family. But no one could have predicted that a woman would kill her daughters. Christy was doing harm to her family. She lacked mental stability. The sheriff's department stated that police officers were repeatedly dispatched to Christy and Jason's home, where they were having violent arguments. Since January 2012, police have received 14 requests for service. Christy, who had previously been diagnosed with mental health issues, threatened to commit suicide on three occasions. Sebastian's heartbroken sister Maria described the Sheath sisters as some of the sweetest, most sensible, 
and kind-hearted girl she had ever met. Maria found it difficult to believe that not long ago, she and Taylor were having a good time at a party and planning her wedding to Sebastian. You've already joined our family and will remain so, she speaks to her friend. You were a beacon of light in this crazy world. We'll always remember you. The brutal crime that took the lives of young girls with everything ahead of them has long sparked public outrage. People shared Jason's grief. Taylor Sheets attended school, worked as a caregiver for Care.com, and hoped to live a long and happy life with the man she loved. Madison studied in school while also working as a nanny. The entire city mourned on the day of the girl's funeral, and social media and television news channels covered the tragedy once more. Is it possible that the availability of firearms contributed to such a horrific tragedy? The failure of states to finally address the issue of firearm sales has resulted in yet another tragedy. Christy Sheets, an ordinary Texas woman, shot and killed her own two daughters in a domestic dispute. Such cases are not surprising in the United States. People will die as long as Republicans and Democrats continue to pull the cat out of the bag and refuse to compromise. The exact causes of the conflict that resulted in such tragic consequences will be unknown. However, the fact that the police visited this house multiple times due to frequent conflicts is sufficient. That is, it was already obvious that the family was dysfunctional, but they were still left with guns. To summarize, I would like to return to the beginning of this story. A mother is the closest and most important person in her children's lives. Christy Sheets' case is an exception rather than a reality. Amidst her internal heartache, her maternal instinct appears to have completely shut down and no one could stop her. Christy's plan, however, has been fully realized. Jason Sheets will be haunted by the memories of his daughter's murders for the rest of his life. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell, doomsday spouses. Religiously motivated crimes are common in criminal practice. According to statistics, religious fanatics kill over 100,000 people each year around the world. Frequently, these victims do not share the fanatics' traditional beliefs. The case of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell, a deranged couple, shocked the world a few years ago and has yet to be resolved. The story has been covered by media outlets in multiple countries, shocking and perplexing people. It's a story about corrupt passion, belief in one's own superiority, greed, and a complete lack of moral principles. This couple harmed five members of their own families, two of them children. The legal proceedings against the so-called spouses from hell are still ongoing. They face the death penalty for their heinous actions. However, they not only deny their guilt, but they also sincerely hope to avoid punishment or receive lenient sentences. But let us begin at the beginning and try to unravel this horrifying and complex story in order to understand how people who claim to have discovered God have completely lost their humanity. Who is Chad Daybell? And how did he become the head of a religious movement? Chad Guy Daybell was born on August 11, 1968 in the small town of Provo, Utah, 18 miles south of Salt Lake City. He grew up in a simple, even modest family and was a quiet, shy child. Chad was an average student at school with no notable talents or athletic accomplishments, and he was self-conscious about his weight. Chad not easily enrolled at Brigham Young University by U in Utah after graduating from high school, and he earned a bachelor's degree in journalism in 1992. During his college years, he married a modest woman named Tamara Douglas, or simply Tammy. The couple quickly had five children, sons Seth, Mark, and Garth, as well as daughters Emma and Leah. After finishing his studies, the young father worked as an editor for a local daily newspaper. However, due to the family's constant financial difficulties, he also worked as a night watchman at a small church and a gravedigger at the cemetery next door. Tammy did not work outside the home and was solely responsible for household chores and raising their children, so the family struggled to get by. Chad decided to use his journalism background to write his own religious-themed book. His debut work, published in 1999, resembled a collection of religious stories or religious stories or religious. Themed fantasy. Surprisingly, the book was a success, and he made a good living from it. Chad immediately left his jobs at the cemetery and the newspaper to pursue his writing career, 
A year and a half later, he released a book called One Foot in the Grave. This was a popular science book in which he described his experiences as a gravedigger and discussed death, the afterlife, and soul reincarnations. Daybell founded Spring Creek Books in 2004, through which he self-published his works. These works discussed his beliefs regarding the impending end of the world, Judgment Day, and other topics. According to some, Chad's religious beliefs have become increasingly extreme over time. Chad Daybell has written dozens of fiction and popular science books with religious themes. He began giving podcasts, audio, and video lectures to help people prepare for Christ's second coming. Chad referred to himself as an apocalyptic writer and claimed to be able to see into the future, hearing voices of the dead deliver prophecies intended solely for him. Lori Ryan Vallow Nicox was born on June 26, 1973, in the beautiful city of Loma Linda, California. She grew up in a big family, with two older brothers and three sisters. Her parents, Denise and Barry Cox, worked tirelessly to provide for their numerous children from a young age. Lori was especially close to her brother Alex, with whom she had a trustworthy relationship. He always stood up for and protected his younger sister. Lori developed into a true beauty with many admirers, as well as an attractive charismatic blonde with a slim figure and a captivating smile. She enjoyed being the center of attention and was an outgoing and adventurous person. Lori married Nelson Giannis, her high school sweetheart, in the spring of 1992 when she was 18 years old. However, the young couple quickly realized they had rushed into marriage and were unprepared for family life, resulting in the dissolution of their marriage in less than a year. They did not have children together. Lori remarried in the fall of 1995 to a man named William LaJoya. A year later, the couple welcomed a son, Colby, but their marriage ended in 1998. Only two years later, the boy remained in his mother's custody. Lori married Joseph Anthony Ryan for the third time in early 2001, and he officially adopted her son from her previous marriage. A year later, the couple had their daughter, Ty Lee, but this marriage too ended in 2005. Notably shortly after her divorce from Joseph, an incident occurred when her ex-husband arrived to see the children. He was assaulted by Lori's brother Alex, who claimed in court that he was defending his sister's honor after Ryan insulted her. As a result, Cox was sentenced to a fine and a short-term prison marriage with Charles Vallow. Lori met Charles Anthony Vallow shortly after divorcing her third husband, and the two married in February 2006. He was 17 years her senior, but their age difference was not an issue. Charles had been married before and had two teenage sons from previous relationships, Zachary and Nicholas. The couple initially lived in Nevada with Lori's children from previous marriages, with Charles and his sons visiting on holidays and weekends. Charles owned a small business that provided a steady income for his family. Lori, who had not pursued further education, did not work, and her husband never approached her about it. Charles' grandnephew, Joshua Jackson, or simply J.J. Vallow, was officially adopted by the couple in 2014. J.J. had autism and needed expensive therapy, which a relative could provide. Toward the end of 2014, the family decided to relocate to the Hawaiian Islands, specifically the island of Kauai. By this point, Colby and Charles' older children were adults living independently, so the Vallos relocated to the island as a group of four. Lori, Charles Ty Lee, and J.J. settled in a popular tourist area and decided to open their own beach bar that served fresh juices, smoothies, refreshing drinks, and non-alcoholic cocktails. Despite their best efforts, the availability of raw materials and Charles' experience in trade, the business failed quickly due to fierce competition. Lori developed an interest in religious literature around this time, and she was particularly drawn to Chad Daybell's Standing in Holy Places series of books. She became fascinated by the occult writer's ideas and became almost obsessed with them. She bought all of his works and read them every day. Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell met. In 2016, the family was forced to leave Hawaii and relocate to the mainland. They settled in Arizona, and while Charles worked hard to provide for the family, his wife Lori became increasingly involved in religion, drifting away from reality. Lori and her close friend Melanie went to a neighboring town for an event called Preparing People for the Second Coming of Christ, which was led by Chad Daybell. Lori, a devoted fan and follower, jumped at the chance to meet him in person. Lori sat in the front row, her gaze fixated on Chad. 
He also noticed the attractive blonde, and when the writer and religious speaker decided to personally interact with his followers, Lori, as expected, stayed behind. She hung on his every word and asked to touch his hand. After that, Daybell looked into her eyes and revealed that they had been husband and wife in seven previous incarnations. Chad and Lori exchanged contact information. Chad and Lori exchanged contact information and started communicating every day. Lori's husband went to Nevada for work a few weeks later, so she invited the preacher to a gathering at her home. That day, about a dozen people gathered at the Vallow's house to discuss God's judgment day and the second coming. Lori and Chad also agreed to work together to prepare people for the dreadful judgment. The pair began producing podcasts about the event, as well as leading sermons and writing articles. Lori became increasingly detached and hatched from reality in her family, but Charles did not notice the change. He expected it to be a passing fad. It was too late when he realized how far things had progressed. Lori soon began discussing dark spirits and zombies telling family and friends that God had chosen her for a special mission. Part of this mission entails eliminating the spirits of darkness, demons, and all evil. Charles' attempts to bring his wife back to reality failed, and she began to see him as one of the evil entities that needed to be destroyed. Charles Vallow's tragic end by the end of 2018, Lori and Charles Vallow's marriage was about to collapse. Lori changed all of the locks in their shared home in February 2019 while Charles was away on business for a week. When Charles returned, he found himself locked out of his own home, his personal car, and the family truck missing, and a significant amount of $35,000 had been withdrawn from his account. Charles loudly called out for his wife and attempted to enter the house. Lori stormed outside, hurling threats and curses. She screamed that her husband's soul had long died and that his body had been possessed by a demon, repeatedly saying, I don't know who you are or what you've done to my husband. Without hesitation, Charles went to the police station and reported Lori for theft and interference with his home and children. He expressed concerns about Lori's threats of physical harm against him, which resulted in the issuance of a protective order prohibiting her from approaching him. The statements made by Charles that evening were recorded in accordance with standard procedure. He discussed his wife's excessive religious zeal her belief in the impending end of the world and her tendency to categorize people as light or demonic beings. While asking clarifying questions, the officers openly mocked him but issued the protective order. The following day, Charles filed for divorce and changed the beneficiaries of his $1 million life insurance policy from Lori to his mother and sister. His lawyer stated that Charles was concerned about JJ's well-being as he required special care. He was confident that his mother and sister would handle the insurance payout responsibly and care for the boy in the event of his death. Tylee's stepfather had not legally adopted her, so the documents could not include a legally unrelated minor. A few months later, Mr. Vallow made the fatal mistake of revoking the protective order, hoping to reconcile with Lori and save their marriage. He began paying visits to his ex-wife's home, missing the children, and hoping for a family reconciliation. On July 11, 2019, Charles arrived to see his children and was fatally shot twice in the chest. Lori's brother, Alex Cox, called emergency services and admitted to the shooting. He claimed self-defense, alleging that Charles had attacked him first with a baseball bat. In response, he drew his pistol and shot twice without aiming. The homeowner and children witnessed the incident. Their testimonies were somewhat consistent, and the court ruled that the killing was unintentional and in self-defense. Notably, Alex's head injury was minor, Despite Charles's previous experience as a baseball player capable of inflicting serious harm with a bat, Lori threw a party at her house with music, many guests, and a poolside disco on the same day Charles' body was taken to the morgue, right where her husband had been shot and where traces of blood could still be seen. She did not arrange for his funeral or tell anyone about the incident. Charles, his son's mother, sister, and other relatives learned of his death only a week later when his unclaimed body was still in the morgue, the latest in a string of mysterious disappearances and fatalities. Lori sold their Arizona home shortly after her husband's death and moved with her children to Rexburg, Idaho, near Chad and his wife Tammy's home. Lori's brother, Alex Cox, relocated with his sister and settled in the same housing complex. Lori enrolled her son in a special needs school, but her 16-year-old daughter, Ty Lee, never went to school. She was rarely seen outside. So many neighbors were unaware of her second child's existence. 
Lori described her daughter as a dark entity to a friend over the phone around the same time. On September 8, 2019, the children, their mother, and Uncle Alex traveled to Yellowstone Park, where Chad Daybell joined them. Tylee appears in a number of photographs from that trip. After that day, she was never seen alive again. On September 24 of the same year, Lori withdrew her son's documents from school, claiming he would now be homeschooled. The seven-year-old boy was also not seen again. Less than a month later, on October 19, Chad's 49-year-old wife Tammy died suddenly. Chad claims she had a cold and cough before passing away in her sleep from respiratory failure. Her death was ruled natural, as there were no signs of violence on her body. Chad categorically refused an autopsy to determine the exact cause, an odd decision that raised no suspicions. Following his wife's unexpected death, Chad received approximately half a million dollars in insurance payouts. Two weeks later, Chad and Lori traveled to the Hawaiian Islands to marry in a beachside ceremony. Daybell's children, who were still mourning their mother, were completely taken aback and unable to understand their father's actions. When the couple returned to Arizona, they lived together and misled others by claiming Lori's children were with relatives or that she had no children at all. They also rented a small unit at a local storage facility and later moved all of the children's belongings as if they had never existed in the house. Another month later, on December 12, 2019, Alex Cox died unexpectedly at home. The cause of death appeared to be a heart attack, but due to his sister's insistence, no autopsy was performed, and the incident was ruled a natural investigation, arrest, and horrific discovery. As time passed, more people continued to question Lori about the whereabouts of her children. She deceived neighbors and acquaintances with ease, but lying to relatives proved more difficult. Her eldest son, Colby, who had little contact with his mother after moving away, made an earnest attempt to contact his younger sister. Lori initially answered from her daughter's phone, pretending to be Ty Lee, but Colby quickly realized something was wrong. Meanwhile, Charles' family members demanded access to GJ. They wanted to take the boy on vacation or weekends or just talk to him on the phone, but Lori consistently refused or made absurd excuses. Eventually, the boy's grandmother reported his disappearance to the police. Colby then approached the police to find his younger sister, when law enforcement officers knocked on Lori's door and asked her to bring the children for a conversation, she lied, claiming they were visiting relatives. This information was proven false, and the police returned to her home. They gave her one week to appear at the police station with the children. Instead, she and her husband fled to Hawaii. Lori was arrested on the Hawaiian island of Kaiwai on February 20, 2020, and returned to Arizona. A search was conducted in her and Chad's home, but no children or signs of their presence were discovered. Her husband, Chad, who had been defending her and insisting she had no children, was now under suspicion. On June 9, police discovered human remains buried in the couple's backyard. The bodies of the missing Ty Lee and her younger brother, JJ, were identified through forensic analysis. Chad was immediately arrested for concealing evidence and complicity. The authorities then decided to exhume Tammy Daybell and Alex Cox's bodies to determine the true causes of death. In both cases, traces of chemicals capable of causing heart failure were discovered, implying that these people did not die naturally. The trial process. The trial of the spouses began in January 2020. 1. They were accused of conspiring to commit first-degree criminal acts, grand theft through deception, and insurance fraud. Furthermore, Charles Vallow's death was reclassified as premeditated criminal action rather than self-defense. According to witnesses in court, Lori referred to her children as dark entities and promised to save their souls. There were suspicions that the deaths of Ty Lee, 16, and GJ, 7, were ritualistic in nature. Specifically, the adolescent girl's body was partially burned. Weeks before Chad sent Lori an email rating people, he assigned Ty Lee A as a dark spirit. Given the totality of the charges, both spouses face the death penalty. However, in May 2021, Vallow's defense team was successful in having her declared incompetent, which halted the trial process. Simultaneously, all five of Daybell's adult children maintain their father's innocence, believing he was framed by Lori and Alex in 2022. After receiving treatment in a psychiatric facility, 
Vala was deemed fit to stand by her and answer for her actions. In March 2023, the judge ruled that the woman would not be sentenced to death, a decision that the prosecution is still contesting. In July of the same year, she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Chad's trial continues, and he still faces the death penalty. This story inspired the book When the Moon Turns to Blood by investigative journalist Leah Sottle, as well as the Lifetime Movie Network's 2021 television film Doomsday Mom, the Lori Vallow story starring Lauren Lee Smith. In addition, Netflix will release a three-part documentary series called Sins of Our Mother in 2022, with one episode dedicated to Lori's eldest child, her son Colby. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. The tragic story of Lacey Peterson, a young school teacher, not only shocked the public with its unimaginable cruelty and inhumanity, but it also set the stage for the passage of the Lacey and Connor Act. Connor was the name of her unborn son, who died alongside his mother, and the law was intended to protect children from violence before birth and punish those who endanger their lives and health. The case is far from unique, but the fact that a pregnant woman was abused by someone close to her, who was supposed to protect and care for her, is shocking and puzzling. Several television documentaries have been produced about the case. Despite circumstantial and controversial evidence, no one questioned the defendant's guilt. And he, in all of his appearances, demonstrated that he is not sorry or repentant for what he did. This is one of those stories that gives you chills all over. But let's try to figure out how the guy who was considered a model family man decided to commit such an atrocity. Who was Lacey Peterson? Lacey Denise Peterson, maiden name Rosha, was born in May 1975 in Modesto, a small town in the central part of California. Dennis Rosha and Sharon Anderson had known each other since high school, and their teenage romance resulted in marriage and the birth of two children, Brandon, the eldest, and Lacey, the daughter. Curiously, the mother named her daughter after a local beauty queen that she admired. The family owned their own farm, so the children learned to work in the fields and care for animals from a young age. The girl was extremely close to her mother. They worked together to create a beautiful garden filled with flowers and fruit trees. Then Lacey considered connecting her future life to this occupation and pursuing a specialized profession. When the kids were still small, the family faced a crisis and no matter how hard the spouse tried, they were unable to save the marriage and soon divorced. By mutual agreement, the children continued to live with their mother in their hometown. Two years later, Sharon remarried. Her chosen one was a childhood friend named Ron Grant Ski. Ron treated his wife's children as his own and in fact replaced their birth father, who was uninterested in the heir's lives following the divorce. The girl even started calling daddy. A few years later, the couple had a daughter named Emily Lacey, who grew up to be a kind, sociable, and open girl. She always had a large group of friends. She always had a large group of friends. She did well in school and was a member of the cheerleading team. After graduating from high school, the dark-haired beauty passed her exams and was accepted into the prestigious California State University. She decided to pursue her childhood dream of becoming a landscape designer. Lacey has always been a creative person who enjoys drawing, so she found her chosen profession, which is Scott Peterson. Scott Lee Peterson is also a California native, but he was born on October 24, 1972, in the large metropolis of San Diego, in the southwest of the state, to Jacqueline Helen Latham and Arthur Lee Peterson. The boy grew up in a fairly well-to-do family, and from a young age, he knew nothing to refuse. His father owned a business that produced packaging materials, and his mother ran a designer clothing store. By the way, her boutique was located in Hollywood, among the regular customers were several celebrities. Scott's difficult personality began to emerge in childhood. He enjoyed being the center of attention, did not tolerate bans or refusals, and was described as a spoiled, capricious, and even arrogant child in school. The boy began playing golf at a young age and considered pursuing a professional career in the sport. He was friends with Philip Mickelson, also known as Lefty, the future professional golfer who was ranked second in the world in 2012. 
As a teenager, Scott was one of San Diego's best athletes. Following graduation, the young man enrolled in one of Arizona's universities, where a promising athlete paid for half of his education. However, Peterson was unable to receive a diploma because he was expelled for inappropriate behavior following a raucous potluck, already consuming strong alcohol in the presence of other students. After months of deliberation and searching for a suitable location, the young man applied to the University of California, where he initially intended to study economics but later changed his mind and transferred to the Faculty of Agriculture. By the way, Scott took the educational process very seriously and responsibly this time, becoming an exemplary student because his parents threatened to leave him without a job if he was expelled again. Scott and Lacey, a love story. Young people met while studying at university. Scott began working part-time in one of the local coffee shops, where he also worked as a waitress alongside a former classmate and close friend of Lacey. Lacey frequently stopped by to eat and see her friend, and when she noticed the handsome young man, Scott noticed the smiling petite brunette and began to give her his full attention. One day, Lacey went to the coffee shop but didn't see her friend. She decided to ask Scott what was wrong. They quickly started talking. However, because Scott had to work, Lacey wrote her phone number on a napkin so they could contact each other later. Scott called her back that evening, and Lacey was thrilled. After speaking with him, he informed her mother that she had contacted her future husband. A few days later, he asked his new acquaintance out on a first date, and Lacey readily agreed. It's worth noting that Peterson had another passion besides golf, fishing, so he invited Lacey to go deep sea fishing in an open body of water. She accepted the offer, but she became seasick on the boat forcing the couple to quickly return to shore and family life. Nonetheless, after that not so great first date, the couple began to meet, and a few years later, they decided to move in together. Scott had finally abandoned his dreams of a professional sports career and decided to start his own small business. In the summer of 1997, he used the startup capital to help his parents. After Lacey received her diploma, the couple held a traditional wedding with a white dress veil and vows at the altar. They only invited family and close friends to the celebration. And as a venue, they chose the popular Sycamore Mineral Springs Resort, which is located on the ocean in Western California. Following their wedding, the couple moved to San Luis Obispo, a small resort town between Los Angeles and San Francisco. They decided to open their own sports bar, but the idea was doomed from the beginning. There were rumors that Scott's parents once again assisted with the execution of the business plan. However, they later denied it, claiming that their son was a poor businessman who they discovered while he was still attending university. Anyway, the couple's business was not very successful. They initially had constant problems, first with the institution itself, then with the management, but they eventually managed to spin the number of visitors up over time. And by 2000, when the Petersons decided to sell the institution, it was already a well-known and popular destination. The couple decided to settle in Lacey, their hometown, and start a family. They bought a small cozy house in a good neighborhood, a car, and a dog. And about a year later, the young woman told her husband the happy news that they would soon be parents. Lacey had already decided to change her career path and accepted a position as an art teacher at a local school. Her husband was having difficulty finding work and was forced to accept a position with a fertilizer and organic fertilizer company. Lacey tried to be the perfect wife in order to bring comfort and peace into her and her husband's new home. She kept everything in perfect order, loved cooking, entertaining guests, and had a lovely flower garden on the lawn. Scott appeared to be supportive of his wife in all aspects, and from the outside they appeared to be the perfect couple. He accepted the news of the upcoming addition to the family with joy. When the couple discovered they would have a boy, they actively began to choose a name for him. The future parents chose the name Connor for their son, and everyone was sure that they were looking forward to the child's birth as a pregnant teacher. Lacey, who was eight months pregnant at the time, mysteriously disappeared on December 24, 2002. Lacey's mother and stepfather, who had been unable to contact her throughout the day, raised the first alarms. She did not answer the phone or return calls, which was unusual for her. As it turned out, the husband had been unaware of his wife's whereabouts the day before. She had visited her parents as well as the beauty salon where her sister Amelia worked. 
She was cheerful as she prepared for the Christmas and New Year's Eve celebrations. Lacey allegedly went for a morning walk with her dog, but a few hours later, neighbors discover the Peterson's dog wandering down the street, dragging a dirty leash behind him. At the time, no one suspected anything wrong. The neighbor, he said, simply thought the dog had escaped, so we took him to the owner's backyard. For the evening, the concerned parents called the police and reported him missing, requesting that they begin searching immediately because Lacey was pregnant, and if she was in trouble, she required assistance as soon as possible. However, she was never found that day or the next. A day later, word of the missing teacher spread throughout town, prompting hundreds of volunteers to join the search. People combed the area, pasting flyers with portraits of the girl and organizing search pages and social networks where they posted detailed information about the missing mother and stepfather. The older brother and younger sister appealed to all concerned on television, requesting assistance in the search and sharing any useful information for which a reward was even announced, except that Scott behaved strangely and even suspiciously, refusing to participate in press conferences, showing little interest in the search results and appearing unconcerned. Mr. Peterson's behavior, according to the investigator in charge of the case, raised suspicions from the start. He was frighteningly calm and the police officer's questions annoyed him. He asked no questions, acted arrogantly, and most interestingly confused his statements by changing them multiple times. Scott was the last person to see his spouse on the day she went missing. He went to the golf course in the morning to get some exercise and play while his wife stayed at home, intending to walk the dog and do some cleaning later. When he got home, he found the dog in the backyard, but Lacey was nowhere to be found. Scott did not go to the police because he believed his wife was visiting her parents. However, when she still did not show up, he became concerned and called his mother-in-law's house, where he was informed that Lacey had not arrived. And that's when the first inconsistencies in Scott's testimony became apparent. First, no one could confirm his alibi because he hadn't been seen on the golf course. Second, the father-in-law claimed, as confirmed by the taped conversations, that he had called Scott himself while looking for his stepdaughter. But he replied that he had no idea where she could be. Peterson then abruptly changed tactics, stating that he had changed his mind about playing golf and instead planned to go fishing at a secluded location in Berkeley Harbor. He explained the confusion over the phone calls by stating that all of the relatives were on edge and couldn't remember who had called whom or when during the inspection of the couple's home. A strange and frightening detail was discovered. Lacey's purse, which contained her house keys, phone, and some cash had gone missing. She wouldn't have left the house without at least taking her dog for a walk to the nearby park. How would she lock the front door? This nuance was alarming, raising suspicions that Lacey had not vanished on the street, but rather from her own home. A grisly discovery. I April 13, nearly four months after the pregnant teacher went missing, Local fishermen noticed something strange on the rocky shores of San Francisco Bay and decided to investigate further. As it turned out, their attention was drawn to the body of an infant that had washed up on shore. The boy's body had hardly decomposed, but it was severely disfigured, apparently as a result of the body being battered by the waves against the rocks for quite some time. His umbilical cord appeared to have been torn rather than cut. A day later, in a different part of the bay, a few kilometers from where the infant was discovered, a severely decomposed body of a young woman was discovered. The corpse was so disfigured that it wasn't immediately identifiable as human remains. But the most gruesome aspect was that the body was missing its head and most of its limbs. There were only a few fragments of clothing left on the body, including a special maternity bra. It was simply impossible to identify the body, so only DNA testing could determine that it belonged to the missing teacher. According to criminalists, the baby was well preserved because he was in the womb the entire time, but the body rejected the fetus during the decomposition process. According to eyewitnesses who discovered the boy, something strange resembling a ribbon or rope was wrapped around his neck and he had a large cut on his body. Although the autopsy results were never officially released, the experts claimed that the cut was caused by a wave hitting the body against a sharp rock and that the noose around his neck was simply trash. Scott evaded capture during the investigation and search. Furthermore, Lacey's parents actively defended their son-in-law for the first few days, describing him as an ideal husband and their marriage as happy and built on love and trust. But the more the police learned about this man, the more suspicious he appeared to them. 
Peterson began cheating on his wife almost immediately after the wedding, even before the couple moved to Modesto. Later, he had numerous mistresses with whom he lied about not being married or recently widowed. Thus, in the fall of 2002, Scott went on a blind date with a lovely blonde named Amber Frey. The girl worked as a Seuss and raised her young daughter alone. She was looking for a life partner who would love and accept her and her child, and Scott was handsome and polite. She knew the feelings were mutual. Scott almost immediately admitted that he had recently been widowed and that the upcoming Christmas would be the first without his beloved deceased wife. Amber consoled him as best she could, and from that point forward, they communicated almost daily. Scott soon told his mistress that they could move in together after the holidays, and the couple began to plan their future together. True, Scott stated that he has never wanted to have his own children and plans to undergo a sterilization procedure known as a vasectomy, but he was also prepared to raise daughter Amber as his own. Everything was fine until Amber happened to see a TV report about the disappearance of a pregnant local teacher. Despite the fact that the missing woman's husband did not give an interview or appear in front of the cameras, the broadcast featured photos of her and Lacey together, and Amber recognized her lover. Another intriguing feature was Scott's drastic change in appearance following his wife's disappearance, which included growing a beard and bleaching his naturally dark hair on his head and face. Amber couldn't believe what she was seeing and hoped it was all a dream. However, she soon realized that she was dating the same guy. She went straight to the police and told them everything, even agreeing to record their phone conversations. Amber wondered why Scott had told her he was a widower a couple of weeks before his wife vanished, but he must have sensed something was wrong. Despite his evasiveness, as soon as the bodies of the deceased mother and child were found, the question of immediately arresting Scott as the main suspect arose. Despite the fact that the investigation lacked hard evidence, there was a good chance Scott would try to leave the country. In fact, that was exactly what he planned to do. But, fortunately, he did not have time. On April 18, 2003, the widower was taken into custody, but he refused to admit his guilt. Simultaneously, his house, garage, and car were thoroughly searched yielding frightening results. Microparticles of Lacey's dried blood were discovered on tools in the garage, the trunk of the car, and the bottom of the fishing boat. Experts discovered several hairs from the deceased woman. The clothes Scott was wearing on that fateful day had long since been discarded. The house had undergone several general cleanings with the assistance of cleaning services, and the building itself had already been listed for sale. But the most difficult aspect of the investigation was the inability to determine the exact date of Lacey's death, which made it impossible to verify the suspect's alibi. Traces of cement were discovered in the garage, trunk, and Peterson's boat, further complicating the investigation. The material was thought to be the foundation for a homemade anchor, with which he intended to dispose of the body so that it would never be discovered. However, there was no direct evidence against Scott. He was found guilty of two counts of first and second degree murder. Despite the lawyer's vigorous and confident defense, almost no one doubted Scott's guilt. His actions were the most obvious indication of this. He was neither excited nor upset. He took no part in the search. He was in a hurry to get rid of the evidence, selling his wife's house and car almost immediately after her disappearance, changing his image, and leaving the country with his mistress. Investigator Jonathan Bueller who had been working on the case since Lacey's disappearance, stated in court that he had no doubts about Peterson's guilt from the beginning. He realized this after his initial conversation with him. The court first imposed the death penalty as a punishment. However, after an impressive number of appeals, the sentence was changed in 2021 to life in prison with no chance of parole. In addition, the court redirected the deceased's mother to receive a quarter of a million dollars in life insurance for Lacey, which was originally assigned to Scott. This high-profile case horrified the public and highlighted the importance of protecting unborn children from violence, as they may become victims of similar crimes. Thus, in the spring of 2004, the Lacey and Connor Act was signed in the presence of the deceased woman's parents and sister. Three years after the tragedy, Sharon Rocha wrote a biographical book called In Memory of Lacey, A Mother's Story of Love, Loss and Justice, in honor of her daughter and grandson. All proceeds from the sale of the publication were donated to charity. The book was one of the top bestsellers in American nonfiction, 
Lacey, Sharon's husband and stepfather, died of a heart attack in the spring of 2018, just before another court hearing. He was buried next to his beloved stepdaughter and grandson. By the way, Lacey's father died in December of the same year. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Greed, envy, and the desire to accumulate wealth with little effort frequently drive people to commit the most heinous and cynical crimes. It's difficult to imagine how cruel a person can be in the pursuit of quick riches. As an example, consider the murder of a close relative. The story of Elizabeth Vasquez is truly shocking and terrifying. This kind and hardworking woman dedicated her entire life to the betterment of her family, striving to provide her beloved daughter with the best possible education. But the greedy heiress and her boyfriend did the unthinkable. For several years, this complex case sparked controversy and shocked the public with its inhumanity, demonstrating how a young woman can easily decide to murder her own mother. Let us try to understand how a prosperous and well-off family produced a true monster devoid of any feelings of pity, remorse, or conscience. The Vasquez family is large and happy. Elizabeth Lillian Vasquez Muvia was born in Catamarca, northwestern Peru, in 1967. She was the oldest of six children born to Ernesto Vasquez and Maria Muvila. Her parents were hardworking, simple people who worked hard to provide for their large family, including an education and a chance at a better life. The Vasquez family was friendly and happy. Elizabeth began helping her mother care for her younger siblings at a young age. She was an excellent student who graduated with honors, allowing her to easily gain admission to the prestigious university's Faculty of Law and Economics. While attending university, she met a young man named Alejandro Espino, who was also studying law and was regarded as one of the best students in his class. The two developed a romantic relationship that grew quickly, and they were officially married in 1987. Elizabeth's parents supported her decision from the start and happily welcomed her son-in-law into the family. Alejandro was a serious, intelligent, ambitious, and purposeful man who could properly care for their eldest daughter. Initially, the newlyweds lived in the Vasquez family home. However, after six months, Elizabeth became pregnant, and they decided to move into their separate home with only their daughter about a year after their marriage in 1988. The couple welcomed their only joint heir, whom they named Elizabeth Vasquez Espino, affectionately known as Alita in the family. The girl became the focus of all her numerous relatives' attention, as well as her parents' greatest joy. Several years after the birth of their daughter, the couple, whose careers were steadily improving, decided to relocate to Peru's capital, Lima. Alejandra was then vying for a prosecutor position in an anti-corruption department, while Elizabeth had started her own legal consulting firm. Both worked tirelessly for the benefit of their family, but were unable to devote enough time to their young daughter, confronted with an unsatisfactory experience hiring a nanny who did not perform her duties diligently. The young mother decided to send her daughter to her parents' entire market so that they could care for the heiress. Maria and Ernesto readily agreed and were overjoyed to have their granddaughter stay with them for a while. Notably, their youngest daughter, Giovanna, is elite. His aunt was only a few years older than Alita, so they got along well and interacted like sisters. Because of their complete dedication to work, the parents rarely saw their daughter and compensated by showering her with gifts during visits. Alita's stay at her grandparents' home lasted several years, and when her parents decided to bring her back to Lima, she had already begun school. It's worth noting that the abrupt change in environments did not help the girl, and she took some time to adjust to life in the bustling, noisy capital after the quiet, almost provincial Catamarca and the difficult parent-daughter relationship. As a child, Elita was quiet and well-behaved. She strived for academic excellence by studying music and foreign languages. She had a close and trusting relationship with her parents, who tried to make up for the years of forced separation. Elizabeth aspires to be more than just his mother. She wants to be his best friend, someone with whom she can share her most intimate thoughts. This remained true until Elita turned 15, when her elitist turned 15, when her elitist personality deteriorated rapidly. Tantra transformed her into a rude person. I stopped listening to her parents. She abandoned her studies, 
became involved in bad company, and worst of all, began stealing money from her parents' wallet. Elizabeth tried a variety of methods to connect with her daughter, hoping it was just a phase that Alita would outgrow. However, the girl frequently instigated heated arguments with her mother, resulting in hysterics and tears. During these times, Alejandro usually remained neutral, but if Alita sought his help, he frequently took her side. Alita was deeply hurt and offended by being constantly compared to her smart, beautiful, successful, and hardworking mother. Next to Elizabeth, Elita appeared to be the ugly duckling, completely opposite of her mother in every way. She lacked striking features, was overweight, lazy, and temperamental, frequently lied, and did not hesitate to steal. Alita had numerous complexes about her appearance, and when she expressed a desire for plastic surgery, Elizabeth, eager to please her daughter and mend their relationship, did not stop her. Elizabeth paid for her daughter's first rhinoplasty, followed by several more surgeries. When Alejandro and Elizabeth decided to divorce in 2007, their 18-year-old daughter reacted with a hysterical outburst, screaming, insulting, and blaming her mother for driving her father away. At the time, the family was in the United States, and the divorce caused some complications for citizens of other countries. Nonetheless, they returned home as divorced people and started living separately. By mutual agreement, the now adult but still dependent daughter remained at her mother's house. They continued to have heated arguments, and Alita would call her father crying and begging him to take her in. However, Alejandro, who had moved on with a new love, was reluctant to do so. He always persuaded the leader to reconcile with her mother and wait a little longer until she completed university and began her independent life. Despite her poor academic performance, bad character, and provocative behavior, elitist parents enrolled her in the law faculty of one of Peru's most prestigious universities. Our father and mother decided not to skimp on their only child's education, despite the cost. Elite has an untrustworthy boyfriend, and Elita has had her fair share of teen romances. But at 19, she felt truly in love for the first time. It all began on a Sunday morning at church, where she met a charming young man named Fernando Gonzalez. He couldn't take his gaze away from her during the service, and afterward, he approached her to introduce himself to Elita. Fernando appeared like a prince, handsome, attentive, and pleasant in voice. He invited her for coffee and conversation. As it turned out, he had a habit of scouting churches for young, well-dressed girls who arrived in luxury cars, then striking up a conversation, charming them, and playing on their emotions. He'd tell stories about his difficult childhood in a large family abandoned by their father, and how he was now supporting his mother, brothers, and sisters while working multiple jobs. Wealthy and naive girls would sympathize and offer him money. He occasionally managed to keep a wealthy girlfriend for a few months, but they usually left him once the truth was revealed. He was just an unemployed slacker who enjoyed the high life. Elita fell easily into Fernando's trap because she had complexes and always considered herself unattractive. She couldn't believe such a handsome man had noticed her and was willing to give him everything she had or rather, everything her mother possessed. She told her mother everything, resulting in their first candid conversation in yours. Elizabeth believed she had a chance to mend their relationship, especially since the leader had met the boy in church, which appeared promising and assumed he was a good person. Fernando made a good first impression on Elizabeth. He told her his dramatic life story, and she believed him, concluding that such a good boy deserved help. She rented him a cozy apartment near central Lima and agreed to pay 70s of the monthly rent. She also paid for his business school tuition, promising him a job with her company later. Fernando appeared to appreciate her generosity and was eager to begin studying. He was not interested in attending boring lectures or working. He only wanted to have fun and spend someone else's money. He gladly moved into the rented apartment but never paid anything for it, claiming to be broke and promising to repay later. It soon became clear that Fernando had only attended a few business school classes before quitting. Following a serious conversation with Elizabeth, he appeared to be sorry. She decided to give him a second chance and hired him as a courier for her company. On his first day, he not only failed to complete a simple task, but also betrayed other employees who had trusted him with sensitive documents. Elizabeth finally realized that this young man had charmed her daughter only to exploit her for his own gain. He had no intention of studying or working. She then forbade Elita from seeing him, causing her daughter to become angry and resentful. The leader screamed and cried, 
Accusing her mother of attempting to destroy her life and steal her happiness, she refused to listen to reason and insisted on continuing to see Fernando despite the couple's failed separation attempt. Elizabeth decided to send her daughter to her parents' house for a while, naively believing that if Alita didn't see her boyfriend for a few months, her feelings would subside and Fernando would find another wealthy fool to exploit, but Elizabeth was gravely mistaken. Alita continued to communicate with her boyfriend via phone and social media, and her resentment of her mother only grew. Fernando had to leave the rental apartment because Elizabeth refused to pay for it. However, he found a smaller place rented for him by his young lover using her mother's money. As a spoiled child, Alita had some financial freedom and was able to use some of her mother's accounts. When summer vacation ended and university resumed, Alita rushed to see her boyfriend, who once again asked for money. She withdrew a significant amount from her mother's account and gave it to him, resulting in a heated argument with her mother later that evening. When Elizabeth noticed the missing funds, she decided to block access to her accounts, leaving her with only a small weekly allowance for personal expenses. This decision strained an already tense relationship. They barely spoke, mostly arguing, and Elizabeth's attempts to contact her daughter were unsuccessful. The monstrous plan. Fernando became enraged during one of their romantic dates when a leader failed to deliver the money he demanded. He cursed Elizabeth, screaming that she had a lot of money but wouldn't give it to her only daughter, and add that if Elizabeth died, adult Alita would inherit all of her wealth and they could live lavishly. This terrible idea took root in the minds of the elitists and grew stronger with each day. She was constantly complaining about how much she despised her mother, blaming her for all of her misfortunes, and fantasizing about how wonderful it would be if she disappeared. The young lovers began to devise a monstrous and cynical plan to eliminate Vasquez, including who they could recruit as accomplices. At the time, Elizabeth had nearly $3 million in her accounts, a successful business that could be sold, a large house in an affluent area of the capital, several cars, and significant life insurance coverage. If she dies, her only child will inherit everything. Alita Elizabeth seemed to sense danger, and she realized she couldn't keep her daughter away from the mercenary and deceitful young man who had a negative influence on her. The situation was escalating and could end in the most unexpected way. Elizabeth, an experienced lawyer, drafted a will stating that in the event of her sudden disappearance or untimely death, all money and property should be transferred to Ernesto Vasquez, her father. She even managed to visit her parents and inform them of her decision. Meanwhile, Alita intends to stage her mother's kidnapping and murder by suspected criminals who will never be found. She and Fernando decided to enlist the help of a tough guy, or, at the very least, a court nay holder, with the promise of generous payment for his services. He accepted the offer without hesitation, a crime against his own mother. On January 24, 2010, 21-year-old, Alita met with her 23-year-old boyfriend to finalize the plan for the crime that would occur the following day. She remained calm and collected already planning how she would spend the millions she had inherited. The next morning, January 25, Elita chose to stay at home rather than attend university due to illness. When her mother left to work, Fernando and Jorg were already lurking outside the house, waiting for a leader to distract the guard and let them in. Elita approached the guard on duty and asked him to get pain relievers from the nearest pharmacy, which was only a five-minute walk away. This brief absence allowed the young men to enter the house and hide in the master bedroom. When Elizabeth returned, the leader loudly dropped the glass in the kitchen, signaling her attackers to assemble. When Elizabeth entered her room, Fernando knocked her to the ground and began choking her, while George held her down. Elizabeth miraculously managed to break free and run into the hallway, where her own daughter kicked her in the head. They restrained Elizabeth while she was conscious. However, their plans were thwarted by Maria Celine, a young servant girl who Alita tricked into another room and locked inside. When Elizabeth regained consciousness, her daughter, boyfriend, and accomplice brutally tortured her in an attempt to obtain the safe code and bank account passwords. Terrified, Elizabeth knew her daughter was in trouble, but she had always blamed it on Gonzalez as a negative influence. She now saw her only daughter's monstrous nature. Elizabeth was able to loosen the restraints and fight back against her daughter, scratching and punching her until Fernando knocked her to the ground. Elita became enraged and kicked her mother, eventually smothering her with a pillow until she stopped breathing. The trio then bound Elizabeth's lifeless body, duct taped her mouth shut, 
and placed her in the trunk of her own car. Staging a kidnapping, Elita then dispatched another guard to get medication, allowing her accomplices to drive off the property. She released her to terrified Maria, falsely claiming that she and her mother had quarreled but reconciled and that her mother had gone to bed. A strange story about a kidnapping during the search for a missing woman. As was customary in the morning, the maid prepared breakfast. But Alida entered the kitchen and informed her that her mother had gone to work early due to an important meeting. Elita then left the house to visit her mother's workplace. She walked into the office of Jessica Hippo, her mother's best friend and accountant, and broke down in tears, reporting that her mother was missing and that she was receiving strange, threatening, and ransom calls. The accountant immediately began blocking the accounts to prevent the intruders from accessing them, reported the incident to the police, and then left the office for a while. When she returned, Elita had left, and the office was in disarray, as if someone was searching for something. Later, it was discovered that Elizabeth's will had gone missing, which Alita had learned the day before by overhearing a phone conversation with a key she had stolen from her mother. Elita had also taken a copy of the will and cash from the safe while her mother was studying. Police arrived and inspected the house, interviewing both the missing woman's daughter and the office staff, but found no useful information. Everyone claimed that Vasquez had no enemies and that no one had threatened her, so no one was initially named as a suspect. The primary hypothesis was that it was a kidnapping for ransom. All that remained was to wait for a call from the criminals to receive additional instructions and demands, a terrifying discovery, and the initial suspect. Elizabeth's disappearance was discovered the following day. It was reported that her car had been abandoned in a vacant lot outside of town. The inside was empty, but when law enforcement officers opened the trunk, they were astounded by what they discovered. Inside was the lifeless body of a missing woman with signs of beatings. Forensic experts found dozens of bruises, severe head trauma, and rope marks on the victim's body, indicating that she was tied up and attempted to free herself. It was also determined that Vasquez died as a result of asphyxiation. Particles of blood and epithelium were discovered under her fingernails, indicating that she had resisted. It was now necessary to identify who the blood belonged to. Elita appeared in the lineup as a grieving daughter, crying, wailing, and appearing almost unconscious. However, during the interrogation, she behaves very differently. She was calm, even cold-blooded, and she was visibly annoyed by the investigator's questions. Furthermore, she contradicted herself repeatedly during her testimony when the police decided to check the information about the kidnapper's calls and sent a request to the cell phone company. It turned out that Alita had not received any calls. It also turned out that in the days preceding and following her mother's disappearance, Alicia had been in frequent contact with Juan Fernando Gonzalez, whom they also decided to question. However, the young man either insisted on his innocence or remained silent, resulting in irrefutable evidence and an arrest. Elizabeth's maternal grandparents were in charge of her funeral, while Elizabeth herself was unconcerned, focusing solely on how to get out of the situation, remain free and save money. She called her father, who was already aware of the incident and crying, and told him she was innocent and asked for help. Her father advised her not to say too much and promised to get her out of the situation, despite knowing full well who had committed the crime. However, he did not want his daughter to go to prison because it would have brought shame to Alejandro, who was a powerful and respected man at the time, serving as Justice of the Peace and President of the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, forensic analysis revealed that the blood and skin particles under the deceased fingernails belonged to her daughter. Elita attempted to claim that she had a serious disagreement with her mother, and that they had briefly quarreled before reconciling, but no one believed her. Further inspection of Elizabeth's room with special equipment revealed numerous white traces of blood throughout the house, including in the elitist room, despite her attempts to wipe away the evidence. At the very least, a story that she had an argument with her mother in the evening, but then made up, and that her mother left early for work the next morning and was never seen again, quickly fell apart. She contradicted herself, first claiming that she had not entered her mother's room, and then recalling that the ransom calls were entirely her creation. The testimony of the maid, Maria Solen, was crucial in the case. She described how, on the night of the crime, she was locked in a room where she could hear Elizabeth's screams and sounds of struggle, but could not intervene. After that night, she never saw her employer again, 
and Alita insisted that everything was fine with her mother, who had simply left for work early. All of this culminated in the arrest of Alita and her boyfriend, the criminal trio, and the battle for the inheritance. Alita was arrested at her mother's home. Her boyfriend was apprehended a few hours later at an entertainment venue. The next morning, George was arrested after Fernando betrayed him by attempting to blame him for the crime. It is worth noting that Gonzalez was the first to testify, in the hopes that cooperating with the investigation would benefit him and help to mitigate his sentence. Meanwhile, Alejandro hires the best lawyers for his daughter, but realizes she will not be able to avoid punishment. At the same time, he began dealing with Vasquez's inheritance, intending to claim it for himself, since the will had vanished and the heiress faced a lengthy prison sentence. He claimed that he and Elizabeth never divorced, but instead lived apart while remaining legally married. Meanwhile, Ernesto Vasquez, an elitist grandfather, decided to pay a visit to his favorite granddaughter in prison to look her in the eyes, and he couldn't believe that the girl he had known and raised since infancy could commit such a heinous crime. However, Elita acted arrogantly, shouting, insulting the older man, and stating that she did not want to see him again. This encounter deeply upset him, resulting in a heart attack from which he was unable to recover and died six months later. The Vasquez family was unable to prove the existence of the will left in their Nestos name because the document vanished from Elizabeth's office and the notary's database, seemingly taken care by Alejandro. All documents and references to the couple's divorce have mysteriously vanished, leaving Alejandro with the right to claim the deceased's inheritance, as well as the trial and verdict. Despite Elita Fernando and George's attempts to shift blame to one another, the investigation successfully reconstructed the events of that fateful evening, determining each participant's role in the crime. It was also established that the trio engaged in a deliberate conspiracy, which aggravated their gills. Maria, the maid, testified that Alejandro threatened her and demanded that she give a different version of events, but she refused. In May 2012, the court convicted all three defendants. Initially, the prosecutor requested that each murderer be sentenced to 30 years in prison. While the men pleaded guilty, Alita repeatedly played the victim. Fernando and George were eventually sentenced to 28 years each, but the Alita's trial was postponed. Alita claimed that the perpetrators were hired by relatives on her mother's side, who fabricated the inheritance story to seize Elizabeth's property and money. Her father had the same version of events. Attempts to declare Alita mentally ill and vulnerable to manipulation by criminals were also unsuccessful. Alejandra proposed sending her to a psychiatric hospital rather than prison, declaring her insane and incapable of fully inheriting his wife's estate. Finally, in December 2012, the court issued its final decision, sentencing Elita to a maximum of 30 years in prison. She and her accomplices are still serving their sentences in prison. The disputed inheritance remains unresolved. In the spring of 2021, Ala 100 died without becoming the sole heir. The Vasquez family, through the court, seeks to exclude Alita from the list of claimants to Elizabeth's property, citing her incarceration for murder. Currently, the primary claimant for the Maria Muvila is Elizabeth's mother. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On the evening of August 29, 2014, a Friday, Christina Morris, a 23-year-old, planned to spend the night in Plano, Texas, USA, despite growing up in Plano and maintaining friendships there. Despite growing up in Plano and maintaining friendships there, she had moved to Fort Worth, Texas, with her boyfriend, Hunter Foster. Following up on his job opportunity, Christina had settled into her new life in Fort Worth and was working at a dating service over Labor Day weekend. On Friday night, Christina Morris returned to Plan O to reunite with her high school friend, Paulina Petrosky. The two had met at Allen High School. Paulina lived in the shops at Legacy, and Plano hosted Christina and a few Allen High School friends at her apartment. The group, mostly Allen High School acquaintances, gathered at Paulina's apartment at 9 p.m. After some drinks, around 11 p.m., a portion of the group went to Harry's Tavern for 30 minutes before reconvening at Scruffy Duffy's. As the night progressed, the bar closed at 2 a.m., causing some of the group to leave. However, Christina Sabrina, Enrique, and Stephen decided to return to Paulina's apartment. On their way back, 
Sabrina, Enrique, and Paulina. Enrique and Paulina stopped at Whataburger to eat through the drive, through. Back in Pauline's apartment, the group enjoyed the food from the drive, through. However, Paulina and Steven noticed that Christina appeared distressed. She revealed that she had been texting her boyfriend Hunter all night, hoping he would join the party but then discovering he had gone out with friends. Despite her request that he pick her up, Hunter stopped responding to her text messages. It was now 12 a.m., and Christina sent Hunter numerous messages for the next 90 minutes without receiving a single response. Christina's texts began by asking the hunter to come get her, followed by questions about what was going on. She pleaded with him via multiple messages, informing him of her work obligations the following day, and even informing him that she had misplaced her car keys. By 3, 1 am, frustration set in as Hunter remained unresponsive. Christina texted him, expressing her disappointment, wishing him good night, and conveying the sentiment that you had lost the best thing that could have happened to you. Christina then sent Hunter additional text messages informing him that she was taking a taxi home and saying, see you one day between 3.20 a.m. and 3.48 a.m. and 3.48 a.m. She kept sending messages, letting Hunter know she wasn't angry. Her phone had died and she had found her car keys, so she decided to drive home. Christina's final text to Hunter was sent at 3.48 a.m. Christina's emotional state worsened as she messaged Hunter, Stephen, and Paulina, who all tried to console her. Initially, he considered spending the night in Pauline's apartment. Christina eventually changed her mind and expressed a desire to return to Fort Worth. Despite Stephen's offer to drive her home the next morning, Christina insisted on going home that night. Given that she had not consumed much alcohol and had done so earlier in the evening, the others did not consider her intoxicated enough to drive. At the same time, Christina decided to leave. Enrique also decided to go home, expressing his intention to walk Christina to her car while en route to see his girlfriend. As they left Pauline's apartment, Stephen called Christina to see how she was doing, as she had been crying just before leaving. She assured him she was fine and was almost to her car. However, when the 30th of August arrived, Christina did not show up for work, causing concern among her colleagues. Despite multiple attempts to contact her via text messages, phone calls, and social media, Christina remained unresponsive. This behavior was unusual for her, given her responsible work ethic. Her colleagues saw a Facebook post from a friend urging Christina to call them, expressing deep concern. Fearing that something may be wrong, Christina's colleagues contacted her friend, who then contacted Christina's family, only to find out that they had no idea where she was. Christina's parents and stepmother contacted her friends to find out where she was, and they discovered that the last known location was when Pauline was in his apartment. When they contacted Enrique, he informed them that he had left with Christina, but they went their separate ways down the sidewalk. Enrique mentioned that Christina was on the phone when he parted ways with her, but he had no idea who she was talking to. Christina's parents reported her missing due to concerns for her well-being. During the investigation, the police interviewed Hunter. Hunter was initially uncooperative with the police, but eventually agreed to hand over his cell phone. He did so reluctantly. After deleting several text messages, Hunter informed the police that he was not home on the specified Friday night. Instead, he claimed to have been at Concrete Cowboy in Dallas, admitting that he had received multiple text messages from Christina that evening. He claimed that he hadn't read them and wasn't actively checking his phone. Hunter stated that he only returned home on Saturday morning around 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. or 11 a.m. to discover Christina absent, assuming she was upset and staying with friends. He did not express any concern. On Saturday night, still without hearing from Christina, he went out with friends again. Hunter stated that he only became concerned when Christina's father contacted him on Sunday to inquire about her whereabout. Despite Hunter's claims, some of Christina's friends and her father suggested to the police that Hunter was involved in illegal substance use or distribution. Hunter admitted to the police that on the night of August 29, he was selling and using prohibited substances as well as drinking alcohol. When the bar closed at 2 a.m., Hunter explained that he had gone to the W Hotel with friends. When asked if he followed the plan that night, Hunter denied it but admitted that the events were somewhat hazy. Despite the suspicions surrounding the hunter's account of the Friday night, the police had to carefully verify and corroborate the information provided. 
Despite suspicions about the hunter and a possible connection to Christina's disappearance, there was no concrete evidence that he had harmed her or was involved as part of the investigation. The police went to the parking garage where Christina had left her car on that Friday night. Christina and the group from Pauline's apartment had all parked in the Harry's Tavern parking garage. There, they discovered Christina's Toyota Celica was still securely locked. There were no signs of a struggle or evidence of foul play discovered in the parking garage. In order to piece together the events, police obtained surveillance footage from the area. Christina and Enrique entered the parking garage together at 3.55 a.m., according to security camera footage. On August 30, however, only two minutes later, Enrique's car was seen bapping out of its parking space, leaving the garage at 3.58 a. Unfortunately, the footage did not show Christina or her car leaving the parking garage. During their conversation with Enrique, he told the police that he left Pauline's apartment with Christina and that they parted ways at the end of the apartment complex because their cars were parked in different parking garages. Rene told the cops that the last time he saw Christina, she was on the phone with someone. However, Enrique claimed that he had no further information because he had called his girlfriend at the time. When the police asked to see his phone log to confirm the timeline, Enrique stated that he was texting his girlfriend rather than speaking to her on the phone. When the police asked to review these text messages, Enrique explained that it was not possible because his phone was set to automatically delete older messages. The police discovered that Enrique sent a text message to his girlfriend on the night of August 29 at 8.2 p.m., followed by a brief exchange at 10.38 p.m., followed by a brief exchange at 10.38 p.m. When his girlfriend requested a call, Enrique responded at 10.41 p.m., stating that he was sleepy. Despite his girlfriend's belief that he was at home in bed, Enrique was actually at Pauline's apartment at the time. Enrique's next text to his girlfriend came the next morning at 10.52 a.m. During further questioning, he claimed he didn't know where Christina had parked her car. However, surveillance footage contradicted his statement, revealing that he entered the parking garage at the start of the night, with his car one space across and one space over Christina's. When asked if Christina had been in his car, Enrique claimed she had never been there. He claimed he left the shops and drove home on Highway 75, which contradicted toll road and cell phone records, indicating he took the Dallas North Tollway to Highway 120-121, passing through the Highway 121 toll garage at 4, 8 a.m. When confronted with video footage of him entering the same parking garage as Christina, Ricky claimed his intoxication was so severe that he couldn't remember where he had parked his car that night. In the absence of information about Christina's whereabouts, the police concluded their investigation and believed they had enough evidence to charge Enrique with aggravated kidnapping. Christina remained missing throughout his arrest and trial, and Enrique pleaded not guilty. The prosecution based their case on five key elements. First, Enrique was the last person to see Christina that night. Second, Enrique's car was damaged in the front, and it had been thoroughly cleaned. Third, in any case, injuries. Fourth, cell phone data. Their sales phones communicated with the same cell towers. Fifth, Christina's DNA was discovered on Matt in the trunk of Enrique's car. The jury was told that Enrique and Christina walked to the parking garage together after leaving Pauline's apartment around 3.55 a.m. Their cars were parked next to each other, and the prosecution speculated that the kidnapping happened inside the garage or at a later time. The prosecution suggested that Enrique may have intentionally or unintentionally injured Christina in the garage, possibly by placing her in the trunk. They suggested that Enrique drive out of the parking garage with Christina in the trunk, or that she accept a ride, but later decides against it. Later, surveillance footage from the parking garage was presented as evidence contradicting Ricky's initial statement to the police that they had parted ways. The recorded footage showed that a single car left the parking garage a few minutes later, and no other people were seen leaving for the next 20 or 30 minutes. During the trial, it was revealed that Enrique was set to start work at 8 a.m. On that Saturday morning, however, he only arrived at 10, 51 a.m. According to a colleague, he appeared to be hungover from the night before and disheveled. The co-worker described Enrique as having bruises and scratches on his arm, as well as a noticeable limp. Furthermore, the co-worker noticed what he thought was a bite mark on the inner part of Enrique's forearm, 
and reclaimed to have been involved in a fight at Legacy Shops, claiming that the person he was fighting with bit him while in a chokehold. However, Enrique later changed his story, telling his co-worker later that week that a tire rim had fallen on his hand while attempting to rotate his car's tires, resulting in the marks. Enrique's girlfriend testified saying she saw him on Saturday evening and noticed an injury on his right hand, as well as cuts on his hand and knuckles. During the court proceedings, Sabrina Boss testified that she believed Enrique was romantically interested in her that night. He appeared upset when she chose to lie down on a bed rather than sit beside him on the couch. In response, he said, fine, I'll just go home, and she took his tone at that point as angry. Enrique left, and as Christina was leaving, he offered to walk her to her car. Stephen Nickerson testified that he called Christina after she left the apartment. She told him she was almost to her car and sounded fine. She promised to text him once she arrived at her car, but she did not follow through. He texted her a few minutes later to see if she had made it to her car, but received no response. Despite calling her several times, all calls went to voicemail. The following day, it was called again, but went unanswered. The prosecution used security camera footage from the Kroger gas station as evidence. On September 3, the footage showed Enrique cleaning the passenger side of the car with a rag before cleaning the trunk and washing the car. Police found an odor remover bottle, a multi-purpose cleaner, an all-purpose cleaner, paper towels, and rags in his trash. The prosecution presented evidence about the cell phones, claiming that Christina's and Enrique's devices were connected to the same cell towers when Enrique left the parking garage. Christina's phone pinged off the Spring Creek Boulevard cell tower at 3.46 a.m., according to court documents. On August 30, at 3.00 a.m., Enrique's phone pinged from the same tower. Both phones also received signals from the 5,800 Granite Parkway cell tower within a few minutes of each other. Later, they pinged off a tower on East Bethany Drive near Enrique's home on Harvard Lane in Allen. Details about the Armry case car, a 2010 gray Camaro, were revealed in court. A dent was found on the front passenger side, specifically on the right front fender. When the police searched the car, they discovered that the interior, particularly the front passenger side floorboard, had recently been vacuumed and cleaned. However, what drew the most attention was the remarkably clean condition underneath the car. An accident investigator testified that the car's damage appeared to be the result of a soft impact, possibly involving the body, buttocks, and hips. Nats P provided the jury with DNA evidence, and DNA analyst Christina continued to swab areas of Enrique's car's trunk mat that reacted with blue stars until DNA profiles could be extracted. Both matching Christina's DNA profiles confirmed that the DNA discovered was more likely from a significant source, such as bodily fluid. The defense presented its case, focusing on four main arguments to counter the prosecution's perceived weakness. First, consider injuries. The defense called forensic dentist Dr. Paula to testify about the prosecution's assertion of a bite mark on Enrique's arm after Christina went missing, as well as third and fourth cell phone data. After reviewing photos of Enrique's injuries, Dr. Broom concluded that the marks and scratches did not indicate bite marks. Christy Wilson, the Plano Police Department's evidence supervisor, testified that the trunk mat was removed from Enrique's car and placed in a box. However, the box was too large for the evidence locker, so it was closed as best as possible, but left unsealed for three days, which was recognized as a violation of protocol. The defense attempted to cast doubt on the DNA evidence's reliability, claiming that the trunk mat's unsealed condition compromised its integrity. They also suggested that the person who examined Christina's car prior to the Marie may have transferred DNA. To back up their claim that there were alternative lines of inquiry, the defense called lateral Rince Dunbar to testify. He was a private security contractor who claimed to have met Christina at a nightclub in Uptown on August 22 or 23rd, when she became quiet in front of Hunter Foster. Hunter Foster, who was serving a 33-month sentence for conspiring to distribute Mia, testified during the trial. It was discovered that he sold prohibited substances to an undercover federal officer on the night of August 29, 2014. His cell phone records showed a call from Enrique at 3.50 a.m. on August 30 with a message requesting an ounce of a substance known as that good rock. 
Detective Robin Busby suspected that the conversation was about illegal substances. However, it is unclear whether Enrique or Christina were using the phone at the time. Witnesses at Pauline's apartment confirmed that Christina's phone had a low battery when she left that night. The defense argued to the jury that, despite the lack of surveillance footage showing Christina leaving the parking garage, it was possible that she left by another means. The police acknowledged that someone could leave on foot without being recorded. Regarding cell phone data, the defense presented a cell phone forensics and cell tower data analyst. He testified that records from both Rigay's and Christina's phones showed that after 4 a.m., they were only making data connections to cell towers. He emphasized that data connections were the least reliable method for determining a cell phone's location and that it was impossible to predict the phone's likely location based on this data. Despite the defense's arguments, Enrique was convicted of aggravated kidnapping and sentenced to life in prison with parole eligibility in 2046. Almost two years after the Enrique case, conviction remains were discovered in a wooded area of Anna, Texas, and identified as Christina's. Excavators and construction workers working to clear the air discovered the remains. To date, no murder charges have been filed. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. This is exactly what Kanyong's story is about. You might ask, is this really possible? How could a simple family dinner lead to a brutal murder that will shock everyone in Malaysia? The law will even be looked at by the local government. Let us look at this case. Princess Kani Ong Lake Yang is her full name. She was born in 1974 in Ipoh, Malaysia, into a big family. People from all over the world visit the city, but Kani had her sights set on something else. A better job and traveling. What else could a girl want? That being said, she knew that she had to work for her dream and that nothing good could just happen. First, Kani got a gold medal in high school. Then she went to the University of Hawaii and got a degree in economics here. After the start, more work had to be done to make things better. She went to Los Angeles and got a job at an advertising agency. She was already living on her own. The City of Dreams helped the girl see herself as an expert in her field. In 2001, Kani met Brandon Ong there. He was born in Singapore, like her father, but moved to the United States with his family when he was a child and was now legally an American. Young Kani and Brandon quickly got married and moved to San Diego, which is right next door. But after only two years together, something bad happened. Kani's dad got liver cancer. The surgery her father was going to have in Malaysia was very serious, and it wasn't clear if he would live or die after it. She quickly packed her things and flew to her father on June 1st, leaving her husband in the United States. The surgery went well, the disease got better, and the doctor said that Kani's dad, who they called b Jen, would live a long time and definitely have grandchildren. Kani let out a sigh of relief. At last, she could go back to her husband and her favorite job. In the morning, she took a plane to Los Angeles. That night, Kani invited her whole family to a farewell dinner at Montes, their favorite restaurant that they used to go on vacation when Kani still lived with her parents. During dinner, Kani's mom got sick out of the blue and her sweet daughter offered to drive her home. She spent a long time looking for a parking ticket in her purse in the parking lot. When she couldn't find it, she realized she had left it in her car and forgotten about it. Kani then ran to the car and told her sisters to watch her mother. She wasn't seen for a long time. Her mother went to the car to check on her, but neither Kani's nor her daughter's were there. When one of the sisters tried to call Kani's phone, it was even scarier to see that it was turned off. Her family knew her very well. She couldn't just disappear, and she would always call to let them know what had happened. But what could have happened in a parking lot that was locked up, only 300 feet from her family? The father of Canny asked the security guards to show him the video footage. His daughter was walking toward the car and checking her pockets and purse for her keys. At first, there was nothing strange about it, when they looked back, they saw a stranger moving behind Canny. He was speeding up and slowing down, just like Canny. The guards and Canny's worried father watched her car leave the parking lot from a different camera. There was a man behind the wheel, 
most likely the one who had followed her in the parking lot. It was strange that Canny was sitting in the passenger seat. The family called the police right away because it looked like someone was taking their child. People should praise the Malaysian police for starting to look for the missing woman as soon as they learned that the car had been stolen. After a few hours, a highway patrol officer saw a car on the road that fit the description. The police stopped the car to look at the papers so as not to scare the possible kidnapper. At the time, they weren't sure if it was a kidnapping or not for sure. The driver of the car stopped and gave the police officer his license, even though he looked tense. He tried to show the policeman some signs while sitting next to him, but the officer was busy checking the driver's license. He didn't understand, which is a shame. Kidnapper, on the other hand, paid attention, stepped on the gas, and drove away from the police car. The police shot at the car, but it got away. They still had the kidnapper's papers, though. His name was Ahmad Najib bin Aris, and he was 27 years old. Let me give you a short history of this person. They were born in 1976 and raised in Muar, Malaysia. He was the second child in a family of four. Ahmad Najib went to secondary school until the third year, but then he quit. He didn't go to the last two years of secondary school. In Malaysia, secondary school lasts for five years. He had to work to feed his family, and he worked hard. He went from Muar to Kuala Lumpur in 1998. In the end, Ahmad Najib got married and had two kids. Ahmad Najib was a good man who did his job well, according to people who knew him. Now let's get back to our case. After some time, it became clear that the shooting at the car had an effect. A young man went up to the police and told them a strange story. He told the story of a stranger who approached him at a roadside cafe while he was eating dinner. The stranger said that he was on vacation with his wife but had a flat tire on the way and could not go any further. The young man was happy to help the stranger. He got a jack from the trunk and gave it to the traveler when they got outside. But he saw bullet holes in the car, and in the front seat, he saw a scared woman who didn't look like a wife taking a carefree vacation with her husband. But the so-called husband didn't change the tire himself. He just played around with the jack for a while, complained, and then gave it back. The police knew right away that it was canny, and that Ahmad was the one who took her. But that was the last time anyone saw Kani alive. Not long after on the third day, Kaniyong, or rather her body, was found in a sewer manhole near a construction site. It was almost completely burned to the ground. The autopsy will show that the woman was stabbed several times in the stomach and then choked to death. Another thing that was found nearby the construction site was Kani's car, which had a shot tire and blood on the back seat. Even though the police had the killer's paperwork, they didn't go to Ahmad's house until after the body was found. For some reason, really interesting thing about this story is that the killer was at home, acting like nothing had happened, like he had. It was like he hadn't stolen someone else's car, kidnapped a woman who had come to see her sick father, and then driven away from police officers who were shooting at him. After Ahmad was caught, forensic tests showed that the car also had Ahmad's DNA in it, along with Kani's blood. To be clear, we want to say that murders in Malaysia are very uncommon, especially ones that are so violent. According to the criminal code, someone who kills someone deserves the death penalty, not even life in prison in this case. Ahmad knew that the police had all the information on him, so it's not clear what he was hoping for. He admitted everything, and even agreed to help with the investigation because he thought that would keep him from being put to death. Of course, the cruel criminal hid his identity at the trial, by pretending to be a sheep. In the parking lot that night, he said, he was looking for a different woman, but thought he saw the wrong woman. He didn't realize it until he was in the car with Canny. He even said that they laughed about it together, and he later tried to get her to have sex with him. Again, he said that Canny wasn't even against it, and the marks on her neck from being strangled were just part of the woman's sexual fantasy, which is why she died. Ahmad, who was scared, decided to get rid of the body by setting Kani on fire. From beginning to end, Ahmad's lawyers made up this story because if they had been proven true, they would have only been found guilty of abusing the dead or, in the worst case, negligently killing Kani during the sexual encounter. 
If this isn't true and the defendant's crazy thoughts are all this, the lawyer said, then why didn't the captive run away while her captor changed the tire? If the person hadn't been stabbed in the stomach, this story might even sound plausible. The defense fell apart like a house of cards at this point. It was clear because the investigation had a different, more reliable account of what had happened, which was backed up by the autopsy. Ahmad saw a woman by herself in the parking lot outside of Monty's and followed her. When Canny opened her car door, he pointed a knife at her and told her to sit in the passenger seat. He then got behind the wheel himself. After the incident with the police and the failed attempt to fix a flat tire, he took the car to a place with no one else around, put Canny in the back seat, and used her more than once. When Canny tried to fight back, she was stabbed several times in the stomach and then strangled with a coat belt. Ahmad took her already dead body outside, threw it into the first manhole, and then put tires over it so no one would find it. His plan was to finally hide the evidence of the crime when he came back to this manhole the next day with several gas cans. He put gasoline in Canny's body and set it on fire. It turned out that Ahmad had also raped four women, luckily none of whom died. They did not report it to the police because they were afraid of being caught, though. After what seemed like years, the court finally found the murderer guilty on February 23, 2005. Among other things, they gave Ahmad ten lashes. Was this any better for the parents who had lost their daughter for good? Ahmad tried to appeal his sentence while he was in jail. He even wrote a letter to Salangor, the head of state, asking him to release him, but he was turned down. Ahmad got what was coming to him just 13 years after killing Canny. He was hanged in his cell on September 23, 2016. As I already said, this case got a lot of attention in Malaysia. People in the area were scared, not so much by the brutality of the murder and Ahmad's seemingly false belief that he would not be caught, but by the fact that it is not hard to kidnap someone in a busy shopping center, even if it's in a parking lot. To make sure this didn't happen again, the Malaysian government started to put up as many CCTV cameras as they could all over the country. They also hired more security guards for shopping malls and even made parking spots just for women. For these reasons, it is very sad that the life of an innocent woman who flew from tens of thousands of miles away to be with her father for two weeks had to be sacrificed. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On May 28, 2008, a seemingly ordinary Wednesday, Moira Jones' life took an unexpected and tragic turn. Moira, a vibrant 40-year-old woman, went out on the town that evening with her boyfriend of four years, Paul Thompson. Moira chose Glasgow, Scotland, and the United Kingdom as her home. Her flat overlooks a lovely park in Glasgow South. In 2003, she left her previous life in London to work as an executive at Britvic, Glasgow quickly captured her heart, and she formed strong bonds with the city and its residents. Moira's fondness for Glasgow stemmed from the residents' warmth and friendliness, as well as their infectious sense of humor. The city, with its abundance of outdoor opportunities, proved to be an ideal place for someone who cherished the open air, trails, hills, glens, and beaches of Moira, providing her with numerous opportunities to explore and enjoy her love of the outdoors. Moira had intended to stay at Paul's house that fateful evening. She arrived with an overnight bag ready for a shared night. However, their argument changed her mind. Determined to sleep in her own flat, determined to sleep in her own flat, she set out for home, not realizing it would be a journey she would never complete. On the morning of May 29, 2008, a grim discovery was made in Glasgow's Queen's Park. A park ranger discovered a lifeless woman's body concealed behind a privet hedge. The tragic scene was nothing short of terrifying. The woman lay face down in the bushes, her lower body exposed, wearing only a pair of socks. Her jacket and bra had been torn, and her trousers were discarded between her legs. Moira's name and personal information were discovered nearby, leading the police to her apartment. To their dismay, there was no sign of Moira at home. They were concerned that the lifeless body they discovered could be hers. The authorities took immediate action and contacted Moira's parents, Beatrice, Beatrice, 
Bia, and Hubert Hugh Jones, who lived in Weston, Staffordshire. The agonizing message they delivered was that they believed Moira's body had been discovered, but they couldn't be certain. They needed the bereaved parents to identify their daughter with heavy hearts and unfathomable grief. Beatrice Bia and Hubert Hugh Jones made the somber trip to Glasgow. Their worst fears were confirmed when they saw the lifeless body. It was Moira, their beloved daughter. The unimaginable had become a harsh and cruel reality. Moira not only died tragically, but she also suffered the most horrifying fate. She was raped and beaten to death. Moira's younger brother, Grant, who lives all the way in Perth, Australia, received heartbreaking news of his sister's tragic death. He boarded the next available flight back to the United Kingdom, driven by a desire to be with his family during this extremely difficult time. As the investigation into Moira Jones's murder continued, the police faced a perplexing challenge. They had positively identified Moira, but her assailant remained unknown, elusive and unidentified. DNA evidence found on the lawyer's body had definitively ruled out her boyfriend, Paul, as a suspect. Nonetheless, the DNA profile obtained from the crime scene did not match anyone in the United Kingdom's extensive database. In their search for answers, the police cast a wide net, investigating the activities of 22 registered sex offenders living in the area and conducting interviews. They also spoke with people who had committed crimes near the park and underage drinkers who were known to frequent the area. Unfortunately, none of these conversations resulted in significant progress in the case. However, the investigators were able to piece together a timeline of events and obtain crucial CTV footage showing a man in Moira's company. This unidentified man became the focus of the investigation and police were eager to find and question him. The investigation's turning point occurred during door-to-door, -door, to door inquiries. When the police spoke with a woman named Lucy Pechlova, her information would prove to be the key to unraveling the mystery surrounding Moira Jones' tragic death. Lucy's account to the police revealed the presence of a man named Marek Harkar, a six foot three inch, old former Slovakian soldier. Lucy and Marek previously worked together in Liverpool in 2007. Marek arrived in Glasgow on May 18, 2008. When he needed a place to stay, Lucy offered him her bed on Queen's Drive. Marek's visit to Lucy's house, however, was not productive. Although he was supposed to be job hunting, he instead drank heavily and watched explicit videos. Merrick left the bedside around 10 p.m. On May 28, allegedly drunk, and informed Lucy that he was going out to find a lady of easy virtue. Mark returned to the bedside around 3.15 a.m. According to Lucy, he looked different the next morning and appeared to be afraid of something. Surprisingly, Merrick left the bedside on June 1, abandoning all of his belongings without warning. Later investigations revealed that Mark flew to the Zischirk Republic and then traveled by bus to Slovakia. Lucy handed over Marek's possessions to the police, who conducted DNA testing and discovered a crucial link to the crime, marking a significant breakthrough in the case. A Marek's black leather jacket was discovered to contain traces of Morris blood, providing compelling evidence with significant implications for the ongoing investigation. Marek Harker's arrest and extradition to the United Kingdom marks a significant development in the Moiré Jones case, he faced a number of serious charges, including murder, rape, and robbery, and his trial began on March 12, 2009, in Glasgow. Throughout the proceedings, Merrick maintained a not guilty plea to all charges. The court heard that Marek arrived in the United Kingdom in 2007. Morris had been in Glasgow for only 10 days when he was tragically murdered. The prosecution's case centered on Merrick as the perpetrator. They presented a compelling story, alleging that on the night of May 28, Moira was on her way home from her boyfriend's house, but Marek had completely different plans. He had been drinking heavily, including beer and vodka, and was overheard saying he was going out to find a woman. Moira returned to her flat, where she had originally planned to spend the night, carrying a large black overnight bag and parking her car about 60 yards away near Queen's Park, according to the prosecution. It was approximately 11.30 p.m., the prosecution claimed that at this point, Marek approached Moira and forced her to walk along a path with him. CTV footage obtained from a passing first bus captured two people crossing Langside Road and walking along the perimeter of Queens Park, providing crucial evidence. The jury noticed a stark difference in height and stature between the two figures in the footage. Moira, who stood only five feet, 
four inches tall and weighed less than nine stone, appeared much smaller than the man accompanying her. The prosecution claimed that the towering figure was Marek, who, at six feet three inches and a kickboxing enthusiast, had a significant physical advantage over Mara. The prosecution also outlined the written Marek, allegedly forced Moirado to accompany a witness who reported seeing a man and a woman near a holly bush near the tennis courts, where six buttons from the wiretop and a cigarette buttock bearing Marek's DNA were found. Furthermore, CTV footage captured a man exiting the park near Queens Park Baptist Church on Ballvicker Drive at 2.15a. The prosecution claimed that this individual was Merrick, who had been alone at the time. The prosecution's case painted a bleak and distressing picture of the events at Queens Park. According to their account, Mark Harker forced Moira into the park, assaulted her violently and sexually, and stole some of her belongings. The autopsy findings revealed the horrific extent of Moira's injuries and shed light on the harrowing attack she had to endure. Moira's autopsy results indicated that she did not die from her injuries before 2 a.m., implying that she may have survived her ordeal for about two and a half hours. Moira had sustained 65 distinct blunt force trauma injuries as a result of punches, kicks, and stomps, according to the examination. These injuries were the result of severe and sustained blunt force trauma. A forensic pathologist identified 65 external injuries, including a broken nose and two black eyes. Moira suffered brain damage, fractures to her right cheekbone and larynx, and bruised ribs. She had extensive bruising on her head and face, and one of her front teeth had been knocked out. Bruising spread to her chest, back legs, and buttocks. Dr. Black's compelling testimony, which revealed the tragic details surrounding Moira Jones' death, captivated the courtroom. Dr. Black, an expert witness, revealed that Moira's head and neck injuries were the primary factors contributing to her tragic death. In a chilling revelation, she suggested that small hemorrhages in Moira's eyes indicated a possible asphyxiation factor in her death. The presence of bruises on the backs of her hands and arms raised additional concerns, which Dr. Black described as common defensive injuries. Dr. Black's expert testimony also highlighted the distressing aspect of the case. There was no evidence of a weapon being used in the attack. Instead, she believed the injuries were caused by physical blows to the fists or feet. Moira speculated that the extensive bruising on her neck was caused by an arm, leg, or knee compressing more of his neck while she was on the ground. As Dr. Black described additional distressing findings, the courtroom atmosphere became increasingly somber. Moira's brain was bleeding between layers, and there was a moderate amount of blood in her windpipe, indicating the gruesome ordeal she had been through. It was later discovered that she had swallowed some of the blood during the attack. Dr. Black also revealed that Moira had consumed other items during the assault, including bark fragments, grassy fragments, plant cuticle fragments, and leaf skeleton fragments. The implications were chilling, implying that Moira had been forced to consume these items while alive. The final damning piece of evidence was the DNA discovery. A vaginal swab yielded a semen sample from the boy's body, and DNA found on more of his clothes and body matched Merrick's DNA, with the jury being told that there was a billion to one chance that it belonged to someone other than Merrick. The courtroom was packed with witnesses, each contributing their own piece to the chilling puzzle of Moira Jones' murder. Several residents near Queens Park reported hearing disturbing noises on the night of May 28. One woman who lives in a flat overlooking the park recalled a chilling incident in which a loud scream pierced the night only to be abruptly silenced. Other couples strolling through the park reported hearing Moira's obvious distress. Even a cab driver turned to his partner and said, if there was a murder, we just heard about it. It was a shocking revelation that, despite the busy street and the large number of people who heard a woman screaming and in distress, no one intervened or called the police, allowing the tragic events to unfold in silence. In addition, a neighbor who lived near the bedside where Merrick stayed provided compelling testimony he described how Mara approached him on the night of May 28th, frantically saying, I'm looking for a woman. In her closing statements, the prosecutor urged the jury to convict her based on the evidence presented. The prosecutor painted a chilling picture of the heinous murder witnessed by Moira Jones, pleading with the jury to base their decision on evidence, rather than the overwhelming emotional horror of the event. On the other side of the courtroom, the defense vehemently claimed that the police had charged the wrong man. They claimed that three other men were involved in the murder, despite Merrick's innocence, 
and that one of these men, Jason Mulrin, a convicted sex offender, was at Lucy's bedside during the crime. They pointed out similarities between his previous criminal acts and Moira's attack, emphasizing his lack of an alibi on the night Moira was killed. The defense also claimed that Jason confessed to the murder to his ex-girlfriend, who became so concerned that she reported it to the police. However, when Jason testified in court, he categorically denied any involvement in Moira's rape or death, contradicting the defense's allegations. The defense urged the jury to find Marek not guilty and to consider the possibility that another man was responsible for the murder. They also emphasized the importance of skepticism when evaluating the prosecution's DNA evidence, reminding the jury that scientists can only provide probabilities and that DNA should be viewed as one piece of evidence among many. Marek Harkar's fate now lay in the hands of the jury, which had the difficult task of determining the truth in this complex and chilling case. The trial lasted 20 days and kept the courtroom in suspense. However, the jury delivered its verdict quickly, finding Marek guilty of all charges in less than two hours. The judge imposed a harsh sentence, sentencing Marek to life in prison with a minimum of 25 years. In the aftermath of Moira's tragic murder, her family turned their grief into a noble cause. They founded the Moira Fund, a charity that helps families in the United Kingdom who have been bereaved by murder. The charity provides grants to cover a variety of expenses, including funeral costs and transportation to court, assisting those in need during their darkest hours. Moira's memory continues to provide comfort and support to others who have experienced similar tragedies. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Gail Katz was born March 8, 1956, in Brooklyn, New York. I grew up with two other siblings, a sister and a brother. Despite excelling academically as a teenager and graduating a year ahead of her peers, Gail's life took a different turn when she started college. Instead of focusing on her academic success, she became involved in a partying lifestyle, which led to her decision to drop out. This decision deeply disappointed her conservative parents, who held traditional beliefs about life. They believed Gail's only chance for a successful future was to marry a wealthy man. Gail's mother, who worked in the hospital emergency department, strongly encouraged her to pursue a doctor as a life partner, but Gail refused preferring socializing and dating over a committed relationship. Gail eventually lost control of her life, dealing with depression and attempting suicide several times. Despite her family's initial surprise, Gail introduced them to a man named Robert Bierenbaum, who they had met through mutual friends. Dr. Bierenbaum, a young and promising individual, seemed to be the perfect match for Gail and her family. Coming from a successful cardiologist father, he pursued a career in medicine and completed his plastic surgery residency at Brooklyn Maimonides Medical Center. Aside from his impressive educational background, Robert had charm, linguistic skills, and a passion for skiing. But his greatest passion was aviation. But his greatest passion was aviation. He had a pilot's license and frequently planned romantic airborne dates for Gail. She enjoyed these adventures, and he appreciated her genuine interest in his hobbies. As a result, their bond grew rapidly, ultimately leading to their marriage. However, like many love stories, theirs did not end happily ever after. On July 7, 1985, a Sunday, Robert Bierenbaum arrived alone at his sister's home in Montclair, New Jersey, USA, around 6.30 p.m. It was his nephew's birthday, and his sister had organized a celebration for him. Robert and his wife, Gail Katz, were invited to the event. However, Robert informed his sister and father that Gail would not be accompanying him due to a disagreement they had earlier that day. According to Robert Gail, they left their Manhattan apartment at around 11 a.m. to visit Central Park, and she hadn't returned home by the time he left for the party, so he went alone. On his way home from the celebration, Robert stopped at the home of his friend, Dr. Scott Barron. At this point, Robert appeared distressed and attempted to call his apartment's landline several times without success. He told Scott about the morning's argument with Gail, noting that she had left in casual attire and had not communicated with him since. When Robert returned to his Manhattan apartment, he found Gail missing. He contacted her former psychology teacher, Dr. Yvette Face, to talk about the argument. 
Robert informed Yvette that Gail had left earlier that day to sunbathe at Central Park. Yvette advised him to contact the police and inquire with the apartment complex's doorman about Gail's whereabouts, which Robert agreed to do. The following evening, July 8, at 9 p.m., Robert contacted Detective Virgilio Dalsos for the first time. He informed the detective that Gail had left the apartment at 11 a.m. He had last spoken with her the day before and had not heard from her since. Robert explained that he waited for Gail at their apartment until 5.30 p.m., but she did not return, so he left for his nephew's party at his sister's house. Robert was the last known person to see Gail. The detective urged him to provide as many details as possible to help find her. Robert mentioned to the detective that Gail had previously attempted suicide. He also expressed concern to friends that Gail may have harmed herself, citing information from her therapist, Dr. Sybil Baran, who allegedly informed him of Gail's suicidal tendencies. The search for Gail began, but the police encountered significant challenges due to a lack of solid leads. Despite their efforts to obtain additional information from Robert, he did not respond to their repeated messages until July 10, 10 days after she was reported missing. During his conversation with Detective O'Malley, Robert inquired about the status of the investigation and agreed to meet three days later to go over the details of the last time he saw Gail. As time passed, police became increasingly concerned that Robert was withholding critical information. Several incidents concerned them, including an encounter on July 14, when some of Gail's friends, including Mary and SR, were actively looking for her and distributing missing person posters. During this conversation, Robert mentioned to Marianne that he thought Gail was on a week-long shopping spree at Bloomingdale's, which raised red flags for investigators. On another occasion, he made an odd remark to Gail's mother about the cats becoming ill and the need to clean the rug. They found it peculiar. The details he recounted about the events of July 7 differed depending on whom he spoke with. Interestingly, he did not notify the police about the argument he had with Gail on Sunday morning before her departure at 11 a.m., despite telling his family and some friends. Instead, he told the police that the argument occurred the night before she went missing, citing financial issues as the reason. He claimed that they reconciled afterward. He even mentioned a romantic dinner he prepared for Gail when they returned to their apartment on July 6, stating that she went to Central Park the next morning at 11 a.m. Despite repeated questioning by police to ensure he disclosed all events of July 7, he maintained that he remained in the apartment until leaving for the party at 5.30 p.m. This contradicted what he told Gail's friends, who claimed he searched for her in Central Park between 11 a.m. and 5.30 p.m., even after claiming to have found her towel and suntan oil. Despite the importance of this information in Gail's disappearance, he did not inform the police. Robert informed the detective that he had spoken with the doorman at their apartment complex, who remembered seeing Gail leave around 11 a.m., However, I will not be returning. However, when confronted by the police, the doorman claimed he had not seen Robert or Gail that day. Furthermore, when Detective Dalzis requested a search of Gail's apartment in July following her initial disappearance report, Robert only responded on September 12 and allowed entry on September 30. However, due to limitations, the police were not permitted to search for blood or hair samples. As suspicions grew about Robert's possible involvement in Gail's disappearance, Police investigated their marriage and discovered a far from perfect relationship, described as toxic by acquaintances. The relationship was not always turbulent. They met in the early 1980s while Gail was a college student and Robert was a surgical resident in Manhattan. Robert initially went to great lengths to impress Gail, demonstrating his skills as a pilot and his fluency in multiple languages, which appeared romantic. The relationship was initially described as magical. However, Things changed, and they began arguing more frequently in the months preceding Gail's disappearance. Gail's sister, Elaine Katz, told the police that she witnessed Robert forcefully feeding Gail food at a restaurant, which deeply disturbed her. This was only one of several concerning incidents discovered by the police. Both friends and family described Robert as controlling, and Gail confided in a neighbor that she was uncomfortable at home. Gail had previously filed a police report alleging that Robert choked her unconscious after catching her smoking on the balcony. Although Gail stayed with Robert after he agreed to see a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist later sent her a letter warning her that Robert could be a serious threat to her life. Gail had begun a new relationship and decided to leave shortly before her disappearance was reported. 
Robert told a friend that she planned to inform him of her decision to leave and file for divorce on July 7. She also stated that if Robert refused to cooperate and agreed to a settlement, she would reveal the letter she received from his psychiatrist warning her about the potential danger he posed, possibly even showing it to his colleagues. The police concluded that the accumulation of circumstantial evidence pointed to Robert's involvement in Gail's disappearance. However, a significant obstacle remained. Gail had yet to be found. The search for Gail continued as her family and friends worked to uncover the truth about her appearance. However, Robert seemed unconcerned. He spent a lot of time in the Hamptons, attending parties and developing relationships with other women. In September 1985, a woman named Dr. Roberta Karnofsky moved in with him at their marital home, and they were together for about a year. Despite ongoing efforts, no trace of Gail could be found, and no arrests were made. Although no arrests had been made, Chief Investigator Detective Andy Rosensway was still conducting an active and ongoing investigation into Gail's disappearance. Detective Rosensway revisited the evidence, aware of Robert's love of flying and his license as a pilot, and focused on checking flight logs at the New Jersey airport. It was known that Robert frequently rented planes. An investigation into the records revealed that on July 7, 1985, at 4.30 p.m., he rented a Cessna 172 plane from Caldwell Airport in Fairfield, New Jersey, and returned it after one hour and 56 minutes. However, Robert had changed the date on his own flight log to the next day, July 8. Detective Rosensway's discovery sparked concerns. Why did Robert try to conceal the flight? Detective Rosensway suspected Robert of killing Gail and disposing of her body in the Atlantic Ocean. Robert's flight record showed that he had enough time to fly 165 miles across a portion of the ocean. However, without Gail's body, the district attorney's office believed there was insufficient evidence to secure a conviction. For years, after Gail went missing in May 1989, a torso washed up on Staten Island. At the time, DNA testing was not available. Instead, an x-ray technician compared an old chest x-ray to the torso and determined it belonged to Gail. The torso was released to Gail's family, who held a funeral service for her. Despite this identification, no charges were filed, and Robert moved to Las Vegas, where he established a successful plastic surgery practice, continued to date, and became well-known in the community. He married Janet Sally in 1996, and the couple later moved to North Dakota, where they have a daughter. Despite Robert's apparent departure, Detective Rosensway was haunted by the unsolved case of Gail's disappearance and decided to reopen it a decade later when forensic DNA analysis was available. With Gail's family's permission, the torso was exhumed for testing, which eventually revealed that it did not belong to Gail. Despite the absence of Gail's body, the police and DAs believe they had enough evidence to arrest and charge Robert with second-degree murder. Robert pleaded not guilty to the charges. The case against Robert was based solely on circumstantial evidence. No eyewitnesses, forensic evidence, confessions, or bodies were present. Nonetheless, the prosecution claimed that, despite the circumstantial nature of the evidence, it clearly pointed to one conclusion. They contended that Roberts murdered Gail in their apartment after learning of her intention to leave him. According to police, Robert spent hours dismembering Gail's body before flying it over the ocean between Montauk Point, New York, and Cape May, New Jersey. The prosecution's task was to persuade the jury that Robert could dispose of the body while piloting the plane, claiming that he acted alone. To support their argument, they presented four expert witnesses, as well as a video demonstrating how such an act could be accomplished. The jury heard testimony from four expert witnesses, New York City's chief medical examiner, an experienced New York City police pilot, an aviation safety inspector, and an airline transport pilot flight instructor and FAVE flight test examiner. They claim that Robert, a surgical resident and pilot, could easily dismember a body the size of Gale's 5 feet, 3 inches, and 110 pounds in 10 minutes. They also testified that he could pack her dismembered limbs into a flight bag and transport them through an unmonitored rear exit of his apartment building before walking two blocks to his car and noticing. The experts also stated that Robert could load the flight bag onto the Cessna 172 plane without being detected and fly it over the Atlantic Ocean to dispose of the scale's remains. They noticed that the rented plane was relatively simple to operate. The prosecution presented evidence of motive to the jury, 
revealing Gail's affair and desire to leave Robert. She had made plans, borrowed money, and was determined to leave on July 7. The court learned that Robert did not notify anyone, including his family, of his flying activities on that day. The altered flight log was presented as evidence that he flew the next day. However, the court was informed of the tumultuous nature of Robert and Gail's relationship, including allegations of domestic violence. Thabert had previously described their arguments as intense and volatile. There were reports of him expressing hatred for Gail and making statements implying a desire to harm her testimony, revealing both direct and perceived threats made by Robert in the autumn of 1983. Gail contacted her cousin Hillard Weiss, an attorney, and told him that she and Robert had a heated argument during which he choked her, knocking her out for the first time, though it was not the first time he had choked her. Additionally, Gail's therapist, Dr. Sybil Baran, testified. Despite Robert's claims that Gail was suicidal, Dr. Baran stated that she had never discussed such concerns with Robert and did not believe Gail was suicidal. The defense argued that Robert was innocent, describing Gail as having mental health issues, drug addiction, and unstable relationships with other men. They called a witness who claimed to have seen Gail in a bagel shop a few days after she went missing. However, the prosecution told the jury that the witness's description of the woman did not match Gail's. After five and a half hours of deliberation, the jury convicted Robert of second-degree murder. As a result, he was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. Robert appealed the verdict, but was ultimately unable to overturn it. After serving 20 years of his sentence, Robert confessed for the first time during a parole board hearing in 2020. He admitted to killing Gail and throwing her body out of an airplane which was consistent with the prosecution's theory of events. Robert described how they argued, and he became overwhelmed, eventually attacking and strangling Gail. He then flew an airplane, opened the door, and dumped her body over the ocean. When questioned about his motivation for the murder, Robert blamed it on his immaturity and inability to control his anger effectively. Despite his confession, Gail's body has never been found. Share your opinion with us in the comments, and subscribe to the channel for more. In the tranquil coastal town of St. Augustine, Florida, July 8, 2010, was a day that those who knew her would never forget. A solitary beach house served as the backdrop for a perplexing mystery. Friends and family struggled to understand the mysterious disappearance of a 45-year-old woman who had been a fixture in their lives. Her presence, last seen at a neighborhood gathering on July 6, appeared to have faded into the shadows, leaving a trail of unsettling questions. Brittany Tavar, 45, a resident of St. Augustine, Florida, had a heart as big as the ocean and a smile that could brighten even the darkest day. Brittany had a large family with many siblings, but they all lived far away on the other side of the country. They loved her despite the distance, but life's twists and turns had separated them. People who knew Brittany spoke of her fondly. She was known for her kindness, generous spirit, and unwavering respect for everyone she met. Brittany had a talent for assisting others, which defined her in an intriguing twist of fate. Brittany had once set her sights on Hollywood, hoping to discover her dreams amidst the city's glitz and glamour. After her Hollywood venture failed, Brittany returned to St. Augustine, her hometown. She forged a new path here, eventually becoming a photographer and real estate agent. Her camera lens captured the beauty of the town, and her friendly demeanor helped others. Brittany's love of making friends was what truly set her apart. She had a knack for turning strangers into friends, and her network in St. Augustine quickly expanded. People from all walks of life were drawn to her infectious personality. However, life is unpredictable, and Brittany had no idea what was going to happen next. Brittany's last appearance in the community was on the evening of July 6th, just two days before her mysterious disappearance. She was upbeat as she mingled with neighbors and friends at the lively party. Later that evening, around 9 p.m., she made a routine stop at a nearby gas station to fuel her Toyota RAV4. However, after this seemingly routine pit stop, Brittany became an elusive mystery when friends worried about her disappearance went to her house. It appeared normal from the outside. There appeared to be no activity inside the house. Her car was noticeably absent, prompting a few of them to speculate that she had temporarily left her home for a few days. 
Her family was concerned, however, because they knew it was unusual for her to leave without informing anyone. Police did not launch an investigation right away because nothing seemed out of place and there was no evidence of foul play or that Brittany had suffered any harm. Friends and her partner, Tim Martin, gained entry to her home through a locksmith, and upon closer inspection, a strange scene unfolded before their eyes. The house had an almost unnatural cleanliness, as if it had been thoroughly scrubbed, leaving a distinct odor of cleaning products, particularly bleach. Brittany's two small white Beachon Fries dogs, Cobert and Huey, were also missing, but her cats remained inside the house. The hum of the air conditioning system in the background added to the mystery, which was unusual for Brittany, who was normally concerned about power consumption and would not leave it on even if she was only going away for a few days. Brittany's friends told the police that she had expressed concern and fear to them. She had spoken with some of them about her concerns. This unease stemmed from a contentious dispute she had with her neighbor, and what had once been a cordial relationship had devolved into a cauldron of hostility marked by physical skirmishes, legal skirmishes, legal skirmishes, and Brittany's fervent attempts to obtain a permanent restraining order against Anna. The timing of Brittany's disappearance was especially puzzling because it coincided with a critical court hearing in this long-running dispute. Brittany meticulously gathered evidence and prepared for her upcoming trial, making her sudden disappearance even more perplexing to those who knew her well. She was looking forward to her appearance in court, and did not want to miss it. Brittany and Anne had previously been close friends, bonding, over shared memories and camaraderie. However, Anne's idyllic friendship began to unravel when her boyfriend crossed the Atlantic from Ireland, prompting her to seek accommodations for her roommate in order to make room for her view. Brittany, ever accommodating, agreed to house Anne's roommate, but later changed her mind. This abrupt reversal heightened tensions between Brittany and Anne, laying the groundwork for a contentious dispute. The conflict escalated to alarming proportions, culminating in a shocking physical altercation that resulted in Brittany's arrest on battery charges. Her once welcoming demeanor had changed to one of resolute determination to seek legal protection against Anne's perceived threats. Brittany carried a video camera with her at all times, documenting every interaction with Anne in order to gather irrefutable evidence for the impending court battle. Among these clashes, the day Brittany disappeared emerged as a watershed moment. She had long anticipated the day she would appear in court for the civil suit seeking a permanent restraining order against Anne. She had worked hard to gather evidence and prepare to present her case to her friends and family. The idea of Brittany willingly missing this critical hearing seemed implausible. While Anne naturally became a person of interest in the eyes of investigators, initial inquiries indicated she had a credible alibi. A few days after Brittany's last sighting, her two beloved dogs, Cobert and Huey, were discovered wandering separately in Hopkins, South Carolina, adding an unexpected twist to the case. In the midst of this neighborly feud, another aspect of Brittany's personality emerged, a compassionate spirit who had opened her home to at least eight different homeless people over the years. Brittany welcomed them warmly, offering shelter in exchange for their assistance with various household tasks. Among them was Joseph Dean Roberts, a 26-year-old who had recently lived with Brittany. Brittany had only met Joseph a few weeks before her mysterious disappearance at a local Barnes and Noble bookstore. Despite their brief interactions, Joseph had shared his harrowing story with her. He had become homeless after losing his job at the Kangaroo gas station on St. Augustine Beach. Brittany, known for her boundless kindness, extended her hand and offered him a place to stay. Joseph's first impressions painted him as an unassuming average young man, which was confirmed by his friends. They saw no reason for concern, believing him to be a typical houseguest. However, Joseph had a tragic backstory, telling Brittany's friends that he had lost his parents and that his living situation had become hostile, prompting him to seek refuge under her roof. Brittany went above and beyond when she moved in by purchasing a computer. They shared ambitions to start a web design business together which reflected Brittany's adventurous spirit. The police, who were always eager to try new things, became increasingly interested in Joseph as they learned more about his relationship with Brittany and the events surrounding her disappearance. He was pulled over for speeding in Brittany's car in Evanston, Wyoming, the day after her disappearance. Strangely, he was released without being questioned about her location. However, as the investigation progressed, a more sinister pattern emerged 
Implicating Joseph in the disturbing chain of events as investigators dug deeper into Brittany Genevieve Tavara's mysterious disappearance, Joseph Dean Roberts emerged as a key figure in the unfolding mystery. His actions and connections to Brittany sparked suspicion, leaving a trail of questions that demanded answers. Joseph had become a person of interest for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, he was the last known person to be with Brittany on the evening of July 6th, just before her disappearance. Second, he'd been in possession of Brittany's car shortly after she went missing, which was a disturbing fact that could not be ignored. The circumstances surrounding his encounter with law enforcement in Evanston, Wyoming, were quite perplexing. On July 11th, he was pulled over for speeding while driving Brittany's car. Despite being alone and in possession of her vehicle, the police officer who stopped him made no connection to Brittany's disappearance and released him with a warning. Joseph's actions did not end at the traffic stop. Later that day, he was seen at a Walmart in Ontario, buying items that raised eyebrows. He acquired a tent, a black t-shirt, and tan cargo shorts. These unusual purchases fueled the growing suspicion of Joseph's involvement in Brittany's disappearance. The investigation took an alarming turn when it was discovered that Brittany's credit card was still being used, despite the fact that she had vanished without a trace. Authorities closely examined the credit card transactions and discovered a troubling pattern. Brittany's card had been used in multiple states, including North Carolina, Idaho, and Oregon. This financial trail painted a picture of someone taking advantage of Brittany's possessions, fueling fears that she was in serious danger. With mounting evidence and growing concerns about Joseph's potential involvement, authorities took a proactive approach and issued a public alert. The message was clear. Joseph Dean Roberts was a person of interest in Brittany's disappearance, and he should not be underestimated. Law enforcement warned that he could be armed and dangerous, prompting a nationwide search. The hope of finding Brittany alive persisted, but the details revealed a chilling and ominous picture. The search for Joseph Dean Roberts intensified, motivated by a desire for answers and justice in this haunting mystery. In the never-ending search for answers in Brittany, Genevieve Tavar's disappearance reached a watershed moment on October 12th, when Joseph Dean Roberts was arrested in Seattle for shoplifting. This seemingly unrelated incident would cast an ominous shadow over the ongoing investigation, eventually revealing the grim truth about Brittany's fate while Joseph was in custody. Florida authorities rushed to Seattle to question him about Brittany's disappearance. Their hope remained steadfast that Brittany was still alive and awaiting rescue. They had no idea that the chilling revelation that was about to unfold would put an end to that glimmer of hope. During questioning, Joseph Dean Roberts, the man who had shared Brittany's life and home in the weeks preceding her disappearance, began to reveal the chilling details of what happened that fateful night. According to Joseph's confession, a heated argument broke out between him and Brittany on the night of July 6, 2010. The tension rose, reaching a terrifying climax as anger turned to violence. In a moment of brutality, Joseph had resorted to using a hammer to strike Brittany in the head several times but she had not died immediately. Joseph recounted with chilling detachment that Brittany was still alive, albeit briefly, in a gruesome twist. Joseph described taking a knife from the kitchen, intending to silence the woman who had once provided him with shelter and kindness. Joseph used a sharp object to deliver the fatal blow to the neck. The aftermath of this heinous crime was a scene of unspeakable horror. There was blood everywhere. Joseph needed to act quickly to cover his tracks, so he used bleach and a slew of towels to remove the heinous evidence of his crime. The amount of blood was so large that it required six trash bags to contain the aftermath. In a chilling twist of fate, Joseph's original plan was to hide Brittany's lifeless body in the attic. However, he quickly realized that her remains were too heavy to carry up the stairs. Instead, he resorted to wrapping her lifeless body in sheets and garbage bags, leaving her tragically unrecognizable. Brittany's body was then placed in her own car. However, the question remained, why had Joseph chosen to accompany Brittany's beloved dogs on his sinister journey to conceal his heinous crime? Joseph's twisted logic came to light. He understood that leaving the dogs at Brittany's house would raise suspicions. He needed to buy time, diverting attention away from the atrocities he had committed. Brittany's life was ended. Joseph set out on a grim journey with her body hidden in her own car and her once loved pets by his side. He drove Brittany's car, carrying her remains, and abandoned her body in a desolate wooded area near Interstate 95. Joseph attempted to bury her, 
but the difficult terrain made the effort futile. Instead, her body was exposed. In a disturbingly casual revelation, Joseph admitted that after completing this macabre task, he returned home when asked if he had gone to sleep. His response was chillingly straightforward. Yes, I did. Following this eerie interlude, Joseph embarked on a cross-country journey, crossing state lines. While leaving Brittany's car in a Seattle library parking lot, a stark reminder of the disturbing nature of his actions, the release of these gruesome details sent shockwaves through the investigation and the community, which had hoped for Brittany's safe return. Her body, which was severely decomposed, had to be identified using dental records. She died as a result of apparent blunt force trauma. It was a horrifying reminder of the brutality she'd experienced. Joseph Dean Roberts, the man who had shared her home and her trust, had thrown Brittany into a nightmare from which she would never recover. Following Joseph Dean Roberts' chilling confession, the mystery surrounding Brittany and Genevieve Taver's disappearance begins to unravel. The police discovered that everything Joseph had told Brittany was a lie. He had spent several months living in the woods near the bookstore where they had met. Law enforcement believed Joseph had a habit of wandering along Florida's beaches, attempting to persuade women to give him a place to stay. The strategy had been successful on numerous occasions. Brittany was not the first woman to offer him shelter, and those who had welcomed him into their homes at first thought he was harmless and, in some cases, pitied his situation. However, a troubling shift in his behavior usually occurred soon after moving in. For example, a woman Joseph worked with at the Kangaroo gas station offered him a room to rent in her home. From August 2008 until January 2009, he appeared pleasant and honest at first, despite his inability to afford a motel. He even discussed his mental health issues, such as depression and angry outburst, such as depression and angry outburst. However, within a few weeks, his behavior deteriorated. He became disinterested, neglected personal hygiene, and began using illegal substances in the home. When she discovered this, she immediately asked him to leave, and he left the same day. A month later, another gas station employee named Cheryl Davenport offered Joseph a place to stay after he was fired for theft. Cheryl thought of him as a friend, and she was aware that his mental health issues had caused strained relationships with his family. In exchange for housing, she asked him to care for her three young children. Unfortunately, the destructive pattern repeated itself. Joseph stopped bathing and resumed his prohibited substance use, prompting Cheryl to ask him to leave. During this time, Joseph moved in with Brittany in tragic circumstances. Before she had the chance to request his departure, he committed a heinous act of violence, brutally killing her. Brittany was unaware of Joseph's history of severe anger issues, which led to this horrific tragedy. Joseph's account of Brittany's brutal murder prompted his immediate arrest. The gravity of the crime he had committed was obvious, and the legal system moved quickly to hold him accountable for his heinous actions. Joseph initially pleaded not guilty to first, degree murder, setting the stage for a trial to prove his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. However, as the case progressed, legal discussions and arguments became more prominent. Questions about Joseph's state of mind, the circumstances surrounding the crime, and the pursuit of justice led to a watershed moment in the case. Ultimately, the prosecution and defense reached a significant agreement and accepted a guilty plea to a lesser charge. Joseph Dean Roberts, the man who killed Brittany in an unspeakable act of violence, has pleaded guilty to second degree murder. This plea represented a significant turning point in the case. The court accepted the plea and sentenced him to a 30-year term in a Florida state correctional facility. While this outcome may not have provided the full measure of justice that Brittany's loved ones had hoped for, it did ensure that Joseph was held accountable for his heinous crime. He would spend decades in prison, paying for the life he had taken and the anguish he had caused Brittany's family, friends, and the community that had rallied in her memory Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more.